It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Earl Foreman, Johnny. In Sarasota? That's right. Florida? <laughs> Where else? Well, hi, Earl. How are things in the land of infernal sunshine? What do you mean, infernal? Well, it's getting pretty hot down there these days, isn't it? Makes good fishing weather, Johnny. Yeah, but without a case to work on, what possible excuse would I have? Maybe I have one for you. Oh? Yeah, and maybe it's murder. Earl, I'll be down on the next plane. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Life and Casualty Company Branch Office, Sarasota, Florida. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Parley Baron matter. Expense account item one, $131.50. Transportation and incidentals to Sarasota, Florida. Knowing Earl Poorman, I didn't bother checking into a hotel, but instead took a cab to his office in the Conroy building. Tall, lanky, easygoing, he welcomed me like a long-lost brother. Oh, Johnny, you're looking great. And I'm glad you're here, because you can clear up this case in a hurry, and then you and I can get out in the Gulf and do some real serious fishing. Oh, well, that's okay by me, Earl. Your last trip down here, you remember, they weren't biting so good. But, oh, Johnny, so help me now that... Oh, I see you've got your bags with you. Well, uh, yeah. Good, uh, because you're going to stay with us out the house. Now, I'm not going to take any argument. I told that old battle axe I'm married to to hang out an extra towel for you. How is my... Oh, she's great, just great. I never did understand how I was lucky enough to grab that dame, Johnny. Oh, well, now, I think maybe she kind of cares for you, too, huh? <laughs> now, uh, about yeah, what we women call... show funny tastes sometimes. Hey, maybe the old horse will go fishing with us. Mike? Yeah. Anything over ten pounds, it'd pull her right out of the boat. Oh, oh, oh. But now, what kind Listen, of a problem... she's been getting pretty good with a rod and reel. Look, look, will you? This fishing uh, talk is just making my mouth water. First, I'd, we'd yes, better discuss... Yes, I, I, I know. Once I get started on fishing... I know. It... All right, now. Let's it's... get down to cases, huh? Oh, all right, if you insist. I insist. Yeah, all right. Okay. I was just trying to stall off having to. You know where Lido Key is? Lido? Yeah, a mile or so offshore, just beyond St. Armand's Key, where we live. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, a client of mine, a man I've known for years. He retired, bought himself a piece of property there, built a nice little home on it. His name is Parley Barron. So? Well, I've handled all his insurance for him, including a straight life at 50000 Uh-huh. Beneficiary? His wife, Laura Barron. And what's happened to him? Well, Friday morning, now that's the day before yesterday, he left the house just to do some errands. Well, go on. Yeah, well, he hadn't got back home by about 5 p.m., and his wife started calling around trying to find out where he was, and nobody seemed to know. So finally she put in a call to the police. Who's your man there? Uh, Sergeant Harry Brackett. Oh, I remember him. Sure. Go on. Well, then around 7 p.m., they found Barron's car. Found it parked down by one of the fishing docks. But no sign of him? Not a sign, not then or since. Had he gone out fishing? Police questioned everybody, the boat owners, all the boat deliveries, everybody. Old Will Bright, who runs the dock where the car was parked, he was closed up. Sign on the door saying he'd gone up to Gainesville. Well, could Barron have had any reason to disappear? Oh, no, no. Well, not that anyone knows of. What kind of a person is his wife? No, no, no. No, she's very sweet, Charlie. She's a bit of a bore. But, oh, they doted on each other. All right, how about enemies? Parley Barron? Never. Sweet old guy. I sure hope you can find him. I, that he's still alive. I'm afraid I, I doubt it. Well, so far you've given me no reason to believe he's dead. Well, it's just a feeling, I guess. And I don't like it. Hmm. Well, what else can you tell me, Earl? Nothing, really. Then maybe I'd better talk to Mrs. Barron and to the police. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here. You take my car. Oh, thanks. It's the new air-conditioned cat out in back of the building. What did you do? Oh, Michael picked me up. We'll see you at the house for dinner, huh? Well, that may depend on what I find out in the meantime. Whenever you're ready, there's food and there's a bed waiting for you. And I hope you... Well, I just hope you find Parley Barron. Pretty good friend of yours, isn't he? Oh, yeah, Johnny. He was. Earl seemed so sure that Baron was dead. I was pretty down in the mouth about it. But I wondered. 
Did he know something about the old man that he hadn't told me? Ah, that didn't seem like her own. He gave me the Baron's address on Lido Key, and I drove out there. Laura Baron was a fragile, gray-haired little old lady wearing steel-rimmed spectacles and with, well, with almost a sanctimonious air about her. She sat primly, properly straight in her chair as we talked, a Bible in her hand. Then Mr. Earl Poorman has told you as much as any of us knows, Mr. Dollar. I see. But uh, even the smallest bit of information may hold the key to finding your husband. Only prayer can help us now, Mr. Dollar, or help him if he's gone to the great beyond. How, uh... Well, tell me, how is he dressed on Friday morning when you last saw him? As you see him in the picture there on the table in old gray pants and a rather tattered sport shirt and that old straw hat. That shirt is blue? Yes. He was so happy the day that picture was taken. He just finished making an addition to our dock with his own two hands. He was so proud. Now... Yes, I, I'm sorry. He'd hoped to get his own little boat, too, for fishing. He loved to fish so. Yes, well, uh, tell me, please. Do you know of anyone who might have wanted to harm your husband? Oh, dear, no. No, Mr. Dollar. And you'd had no... No argument or disagreement with him before he left here that morning. Huh? We had had no disagreement even about little things in 41 years of blessed marriage. Oh. Not even about his work. I see. Uh, what did he do before he returned, Mrs. Barrett? Oh, I, I had hoped you wouldn't ask that because I, I've always felt that the good Lord wouldn't approve. Of his work? I'm a very religious woman, Mr. Dollar, and as I say, in 41 years we never questioned one another's thoughts or actions. But... What was your husband's work? I, I won't say that it was sinful, because he wasn't a sinful man. Polly was a good man, and many times he made it plain that his work helped to save lives, too. And I accepted it because he felt he was doing right. Yeah, well, you still he, haven't told me, Mrs. Barron. That... Always deep in my heart, Mr. Dollar. Yes. Have you thought that perhaps it may have been the intercession of divine providence that has taken Polly from us? Uh... <clears throat> no. But no, you I... must consider it, mustn't you? Because the workings of the power that guides our destinies, our birth and our Mrs. death... Mrs. Barron... They are sometimes too mysterious for us mortals fully to comprehend, much less question. Well... And so, if my beloved Polly has been taken from us for some divine purpose or for something he might have done unknowing that was not in accord with the supreme Mrs. will. Mrs. Barron, I'm sorry, but I would like to know what your husband's work was. I know, and perhaps it was my humble mission on earth, the cross I had to bear to guide him away from it to <sighs> chemicals. He was a chemist, Mr. Dollar. Explosives. Explosives? Yes. Heaven, please forgive me for not having led him into some other field. Where did he work? Tampa. Dufresne Chemical Corporation. Dufresne. Oh, yes, I've heard of it. Explosive things to kill in defiance of the Almighty's purpose that we love one another. Yeah, but we... now how, uh, how long ago was this? He retired in 1951. And since then? Here in Sarasota. Uh -huh. And to keep himself occupied. Oh, this lovely home of ours and his fishing. Though he never caught anything. Oh, I see. Never caught anything, Mr. Dollar. Do you suppose that that was some retribution for the work he had done so long? For some error in his living or thinking? Well, I... <laughs> well, who knows, of course. Yes. Who knows? But we should consider it, shouldn't we? Uh, uh, where did he do his fishing? He never told me, but he left here almost every day to try his skill. And always he came home empty-handed. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks, uh, Mrs. Barron. I'm sorry to have had to ask you so many questions. It's all right, Mr. Dollar. My faith will sustain me through this ordeal. I'm sure it will. Thanks again. Here, you must take some of these pamphlets with them. Oh, Read them. Uh, Any aid to piety of the mind is good for all of us. Yes, well, thanks. I... The inspired word may help us all. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I like to think that on the whole I... Well, maybe I'm not too religious in the sense of going to church regularly and that sort of thing, but... Well, at least I try to live a decent sort of life and observe the golden rule and stick to some ideals, and... But in an atmosphere like that, well, I couldn't help wondering if her husband didn't have good reason for wanting to get away for a while. 
In any event, I'd got nowhere on the case, so I phoned Sergeant Harry Braggett. That's item two, ten cents. But the desk at headquarters said he wouldn't be back until about 6 p.m. And since I really had nothing to go on until I could see him, I dropped in on Earl again. You kidding? We'll take the boat, run out into the Gulf, and get some fish for dinner. It's the best time of day. So who was I to refuse? And within the hour, we were fighting the tide through the pass between Lido and Longboat Keys on our way along into the Gulf. Eh, yeah, Johnny, I find I always have my best luck along about this time of day, just before sundown. I still ought to be back there working. Why? Sergeant Brackett won't be back at headquarters until 6 o'clock, you told me yourself. Now, what can you do until you talk to him and find out what leads he may have? Oh, man, you are a funny one. You call <laughs> me long distance to get down in a hurry, then insist I go fishing instead of working. Don't you case. know, fishing's the answer to more problems than anything else in the world. You got worries? Go fishing. You'll forget them. Got a nagging wife? Oh, don't let Mike hear you say that. <laughs> well, she's different. You little shrimp. But you know what I mean. A writer, he wants ideas, he goes fishing. A businessman, a detective, huh? I go ahead and say it, an insurance official. <laughs> sure. I'll bet that more than once when you've been stumped on a case, why, if you had just relaxed your mind by going out somewhere and wetting a line. I wish it were that easy. And so far as this matter is concerned, I haven't even got started on it yet. Well, relax anyway. Who knows? Maybe the answer to what's happened to poor old Parley Barron will, will, well, will just come to you. Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. Oh, sure. Sure. Instead of you chasing... Earl. Me. Huh? Huh? Up ahead. Just to the right there. Where? Oh, yeah. Somebody's old beat-up straw hat. Yeah, and a little further. You know something? The tide will carry that skimmer right smack into the sea. Earl, look. Here. And if the fellow that lost look. it knows... further over to the right. Huh? What is that? Floating there. I don't know. Well, it looks like... Oh, good Lord. Johnny. It's a body, Johnny. We'll drift over to it. That's a body, all right. And that straw hat looks exactly like one I saw in a picture this afternoon. Here. I got it. Can you reach him, Johnny? Here. Here. Here we go now. Oh, good boy. All right, now let's... Oh. Is it? Yeah. Are you sure, Earl? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Johnny, it's poor old Parley Barron. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Everyone loves kids, and every kid loves candy. American servicemen have heard the tearful cries for candy in most parts of the world, in Europe and the Far East during World War II and after. And there's never seemed to be enough candy to go around. Well, more than a dozen years ago, during the Berlin airlift, an Air Force lieutenant from the United States discovered he had no candy to offer some German children. However, he promised to drop them some candy the next day as he came in for a landing. Improvising a parachute out of his handkerchief, Lieutenant Gail Halverson dropped the candy bars the next day as he had promised. Now, this idea caught on among other Air Force men in the airlift, and that's how Operation Little Vittles began. The idea spread far and wide, and soon military personnel, civilians, business firms began to aid the goodwill program by supplying candy and handkerchiefs. Time after time, as the sleek cargo planes of the United States Air Force swooped low over the landing field, a shower of little bundles of sweets dotted the sky as their tiny parachutes carried them safely to the ground. And the hungry German children gathered up these bundles of mercy, which the communists try to keep from them. The men of the United States Air Force did a great job satisfying a lot of appetites, but they did more. By a wonderful sense of understanding, they nourished the cause of freedom, the right of all men and children everywhere. And now, Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Parley Baron Matter. <laughs> Two days' exposure to the elements and the creatures of the sea had made almost unrecognizable the body that Earl Porman and I found floating in the Gulf of Mexico off Sarasota, Florida. But Earl was certain it was the remains of old Parley Barron, who had disappeared two days before. 
The men on duty at police headquarters confirmed the identification and placed the body in the morgue to await the autopsy surgeon. On a hunch, I asked Earl to drive me over to Will Bright's boat dock, where Barron's car had been left parked. It's like I just finished telling the police over the telephone. I wasn't here when poor old Barron come for his boat on Friday. Oh, uh, what a shame, such a nice old man. Where were you, Mr. Bright? I was up to Gainesville, picking up some fishing tackle from a wholesaler. Well, then Mr. Barron must have got a boat from someone else that morning. Oh, no, 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 sir. No? No, him, no sir. Why not, Mr. Bright? Oh, he never took out a boat from anybody else but me. His own boat. Uh, at least it was the one I kept set aside for him. And that's what kind of puzzled me, Mr. Dollar, is it? That's right. Well, you see, when I come back here Saturday night, his boat was right here at the dock. But it weren't tied up in its usual spot where I always tie it up. Somebody had moved it. Must have. And it weren't my helper, Pete. You no, know, Johnny, that means he may have taken it out, but whoever did him in returned it. Oh, possibly. Mr. Bright, which one is his boat? Oh, right here. I'll show you. I always give him the same one. Never let nobody else use it. That's why he kept his fishing tackle just laying in it, always ready to use. Here. Yeah, I see. I've heard he wasn't a very good fisherman. No, no, he never brought in a thing. Of course, maybe he was so soft-hearted he put back everything he caught. Or maybe his daily excursions were just to get away from his wife, Mr. Bright. Now, don't you say nothing against her, mister. Maybe she is a little touched on religion. Sure, she tries a different kind every couple of months. But she's a fine woman. Uh, just like he was a fine man. And everybody knows it. Yeah. The whole town is mourning him. Excuse me. What are you looking for, Johnny? Well, I just noticed something about this tanker lying in the boat. Mm-hmm. Well? Come on. Thanks a lot, Mr. Bright. I'd like to tell you what I think might have happened. Yeah, maybe later. Thanks. Well, what did you what did you find there, Johnny? Earl, did Parley Barron ever go fishing with you? You were good friends. No, no. He always wanted to go out alone. Yeah, but not to fish. Huh? That tackle box hasn't been moved in months. The paint is still dark under it. What? And that reel, I could hardly turn it. Well, then what? I don't know what. But Barron was using that boat every day for something besides fishing. Any ideas? You know him pretty well. Have you? No. Let's get over to headquarters. Earl felt he ought to go back to his office where his wife, Mike, had promised to pick him up. So I borrowed his car again and went over to headquarters alone. Sergeant Harry Brackett, who was assigned to the case, had returned. It was on the phone when I walked in on it. He gets back to town, Mrs. Dana, so please have him call me immediately, will you? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, sir, what can... Johnny. Yeah, hi, Harry. Yeah, Johnny, I'm sure glad you're here. I got a real mixed up case on my hands. The Farley Baron matter, huh? Well, you know about it? That's why I came to Sarasota. Earl Foreman called me. Have you found out anything? Not that much, have you? Well, only what's here, the autopsy report. What's in it, Harry? Doc Snowden says that Farley Baron was dead before he was put into the water out there in the Gulf. Oh. No water in the lungs, you see what I mean? It probably means murder. Have you told anybody this? No, not yet. Why not? Well, I don't know. Maybe because I just can't figure anybody in the world would want to kill Parley Barron. Did you talk with Will Bright down at the boat dock? Just before you came in. You know, it sounds like somebody went with Barron in his skiff that morning. Killed him, dumped him over the side, and then brought the boat back alone, doesn't it? Yeah, except for one thing. Pete Marino, a little kid who plays around Bright's dock all the time, is sort of a self-appointed caretaker when Bright isn't there. What about him? Well, Peter saw Mr. Barron take off in his skiff Friday morning alone. But he didn't see him come back. Pete went home for lunch. When he got back, the dock skiff was in. Uh Uh-huh. Then whoever did it met him out on the water somewhere. Maybe several people, so that one of them could return the skiff. He'd taken an awful change, wouldn't he? How do you mean? Yeah, Doc's in a pretty isolated spot, all right, but the killer showing up in Baron's skiff without the old man long, that's too much of a chance. How else could it be returned? <sighs> Tied. Tied? Little Pete says that when he got back to Doc, the skiff was there, all right, but not in his usual place. So Will Bright mentioned. Well, so it wasn't tied up. It was just sitting there. Oh, then you meant untied. No, I meant T-I-D-E. When the tide's rising, it floats everything from the pass between Lido and Longboat Keys right up to Will's dock. You think the boat just floated back by itself? You got a better idea? Harry. Yeah? Are you sure it was Baron's body we picked up out there? After all, the fish and whatnot disfigured it pretty badly. Johnny, I've known him for years, and didn't Earl Pullman recognize him immediately? Yeah. And the clothes he was wearing, his own straw hat? Well, have you checked on his dental work, things like that? I'm waiting now for Dr. Dana. He was his dentist to get back to You know, that's a funny thing. Why? I called Dana the minute that body was brought in. Yeah. After all, teeth are about as solid identification as you can get. Oh, I thought you were sure anyway. Well, I wanted to be doubly sure. 
Anyhow, when Dana didn't get here right away, I called him again. I got his wife on the phone, and according to her, he suddenly left for Tampa. Urgent call or something. Where in Tampa? She didn't know. At least she wouldn't say, but it, it seems kind of fishy to me. Well, it may just be that one of his patients... Dana. That's right. The man who got so much publicity about atomic radiation studies, effects on the teeth and so on. That's the one. What's the matter, Johnny? Well, when you stumped on a case, says Earl Foreman, go fishing. We did. We found a body. What are you getting at? Me, when I'm stumped, I play my hunches, no matter how crazy they may seem. And the hunch I have right now, man, is the craziest. I'll see you later. I learned a long time ago in this business, when you got a hunch on the line, you play it for all it's worth. Item three, ten cents for a phone call from a booth in the drugstore just around the corner. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Dana? Uh, yes, this is Mrs. Dana. My name is Larkin, Mrs. Dana, from the Federal Bureau. The Federal Bureau? That's right, so you can see why it's important you say nothing to anyone about this call. Well, how can I be sure you I'm are? simply checking to make sure your husband has followed instructions. Oh, I see. Has he left for Tampa? Why, yes, the minute he got the phone call. Did he tell you who called? Why, no, but I did hear him mention the name Dufresne. To Frank. Yes, only he didn't know I heard. And, oh, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned it. Just be sure you don't mention it to anyone else. Oh, no. Goodbye. <laughs> Item 4, 390, at the sign of the Flying Red Horse on the way to Tampa. The least I could do for the use of Earl's car was fill the gas tank. On expense account, of course. The FBI gag had worked before, so I used it again to bowl my way through the gate at Dufresne Chemical Corporation and to the office suite of Dufresne himself. I wasn't at all surprised to see activity in the suite despite the late hour. Sir, are you the man the front gate just called about? Yes, that's right, FBI. Which is the door to Mr. Dufresne's office? Well, I'm afraid he has some people with him, sir. What did you say your name is? Never mind. Is this the door? Uh, sir, please, we'll have to wait. Come in, Mr. Dollar, come in. Oh. I'm Arnold Dufresne. This is Dr. Dana, and this is Mr. McLaughlin of the Federal Bureau. How are you? We've been expecting you. Oh, uh, have you? Sit down, Dollar. I guess this is your show now, McLaughlin. My credentials, Mr. Dollar? First, I suppose I should prefer charges against you for impersonating a member of the Bureau. Uh, yeah, well, I... I can uh... hardly say that I blame you, though, under the circumstances... Incidentally, our man in Sarasota's had quite a time keeping track of you. You mean there was a tail on me? From the moment you arrived. No kidding. Well, we didn't dare take the chance that you might upset things for us. After all, you've a reputation for being pretty sharp. We should have anticipated that you might be called in on the case, but though we planned things very carefully, we, uh, well, shall we say, overlooked you, even as we almost slipped up with Dr. Dana here, who would identify that body. Look, will you please tell me what this is all about? A man named Poorman called you in Hartford and asked that you come here to investigate the disappearance of his old friend and client, Parley Barron. Right? Yeah, that's right. Now, where is he? What happened to Barron? Do you know? We do. And we were afraid you might find out and let the, uh, or shall we say, cat out of the bag. That is why we were all ready to send for you to come here, but, well, as it turned out, you came all by yourself. Uh, Mr. McLeod. Parley Barron, by the way, Mr. Dollar, is all right, alive, healthy, and happy. Then that body we picked up? Dressed in his clothes? Well, during the last war, Mr. Barron, as a research chemist, made vitally important contributions to our, or shall we say, national security. Oh. He was too valuable a man to lose, even though his wife objected to his work for religious reasons. Uh, yeah, I uh, gathered that from talking to her. Or perhaps you even thought she might somehow be implicated in his disappearance. Uh, the thought certainly entered my mind. Well, in any event, so that he could continue to have a happy home and at the same time carry on his tremendously important work, we arranged for the little deception that has been going on for some years now. His so-called daily fishing trips. That's right. But each morning in a small hidden cove, I needn't tell you where, he was picked up and brought here to Tampa to carry on his work. <laughs> Well, I'll be done. No one was the wiser. Even our, shall we say, uh, competitor nations in atomic and missile research who were bound to keep tabs on such a man, they knew only that he was working for the Dufresne Chemical Corporation. They and that... did know that, huh? Well, we must suppose so. International espionage is pretty well organized these days. Mm. But uh, now this disappearance, Mr. Were changes in plans for nuclear developments had made it mandatory that he spend some time in... Uh, well, elsewhere. Where? Well, shall we say somewhere in New Mexico or something like that. 
So to openly send him there would have indicated to our competitors what these new developments could be. That had to be avoided at any cost. Therefore, the plan for his disappearance was carefully worked out and carried out. Then whose body was it we picked up? Well, some poor, unidentified old derelict who was on his way to Potter's Field. I see, I see. <laughs> well, believe me, if the Bureau functions this thoroughly in everything it does... Oh, we try. But what about Mrs. Barron? Oh, she'll bear up. We, of course, made sure of that in the beginning. And then when her dear husband does return... Well, what will that be? When his work is finished. And, of course, that'll be too late for our friends across the sea to catch up with us. And we've worked out a completely plausible story to cover his absence. Oh, I'm sure you have. Now, Dr. Dana here will return to Sarasota in the morning. He will confirm identification of the body that was fished from the sea with only uh, sufficient reservation to protect his professional reputation when Parley Barron reappears. All right. Now, what an insurance claim is filed on Barron? Well, I'm sure Mrs. Barron won't file for some time, unless urged to by your friend Poorman. No, I can prevent that without telling him anything. That's fine. What's more, with the pension that some companies have for... Shall we say slow action on claims? Well, don't let them hear you say that. Well, Baron will be back before you need to worry about it. Now, is uh, that okay with you, Mr. Dollar? Um, Shall we say okay? And once more, I tip my hat to the FBI. Expense account total, including plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford, $421.50. Remarks? For obvious reasons, I have used fictitious names throughout this report and, of course, delayed filing it until obtaining official clearance. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a strange old character... The most beautiful girl I've ever met. And money all over the place. Counterfeit. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, Will Wright, Barney Phillips, Lawrence Dobkin, Stacey Harris, and Harry Bartell. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Reed here. 
Oh, hello, Georgie. How's Floyd's of England doing these days? Uh, if payments keep on the way they started this morning, the company will go broke. What's that mean? One of our old clients. Quite a character, by the oh, way. Oh, no, wait, George. For just once, give me a case involving some nice, ordinary, normal person. No, Johnny. First, but... it was that old fuss budget, Jediah Gillis. Yes, but now... Then big bad Michael Meany, who thought he owned half the state of Louisiana. Well, yes, I know, but compared to them, Durango Laramie Dalhart is as normal as they come. Durango what? Except for one thing, of course. The payment of his insurance premium this morning. What was the matter with it? Forty-five hundred dollars, Johnny, and hundred-dollar bills. They're still here on my desk. Hundred-dollar bills? You call this character normal? Listen, will you? Every one of these bills is counterfeit. Oh. I'll be right over. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Floyd's of England, North American offices, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the funny money matter. Expense account item one, a dollar even, taxi from my apartment to George Reed's office. I found him sitting, staring grimly at a pile of paper money spread around on the top of his desk. Well, there they are, Johnny. Forty-five, one hundred dollar bills, and every one of them as phony as I've ever seen. Look at them. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Whoever it turned these out didn't even have sense enough to use the proper kind of ink. Yeah, it looks like he must have diluted it. Yeah. Have you ever seen such washed-out-looking money in all your life? <laughs> Good tough paper, though. Just like the real McCoy. Yes, yeah, real crisp and new. But, Johnny, look at those colors. Even the black isn't really black. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You'd think they'd at least have tried to wrinkle them up a bit and dirty them. Yeah. This is the most obviously flagrant... What are you looking at, Johnny? Well, uh, this is unusual. For counterfeit, that is. What? Well, they've all been printed up with different serial numbers. See? Here. And here. Huh? How about that? Pretty smart. Funny, isn't it? The thing that usually makes this stuff easy to spot is the same number on all the bills. Sure. And whoever made these was clever enough to think of that. Had sense enough to use good paper, too. Uh -huh. But he certainly slipped up when it came to the color and quality of the ink. As for the press for it, Well, I don't pretend to know much about phony money, George. Who needs to? Heavens knows, I don't see too many hundred-dollar bills. But to me, this engraving looks just about perfect. That's just what I'm saying. Perfect plates, sense enough to change the numbers, good paper. Yet look at the result. Yeah. Has he ever tried anything like this before? What? Durango? Yeah. And just for the sake of the record, what is his real name? That's it. Durango Laramie Dalhart. Oh, I can't believe it. And the answer to your first question is no. Durango is as honest as the day is long. Well, maybe you mean he was. Well, maybe. But if so, I want to know why. There'd have to be a mighty good reason, believe me. Running out of dough is the best one I can think of. But he's always had plenty. After all, $4,500 to spend on insurance year after year. Well, just who is he? And where is he? He lives on a ranch in Oklahoma. What kind of a ranch? I don't know. But it must be awfully big. Where in Oklahoma? A place called Bum Spunk. Bum Spunk? Yes. Oh, now look, George. This whole thing is beginning to get a little too thick. Durango, Bum Spunk, Laramie Dalhart, whatever it is. Look, counterfeit money is for the Secret Service for her, so why don't you just put in a phone call to them no. and let them carry the ball? No. Why? Because of Durango. I simply can't believe he deliberately hand over a lot of phony money. He's been paying on that policy for years. Always in cash? Always in cash. Crisp, new, legitimate hundred-dollar bills. <sighs> Not till now. Were you here when he left these? No. Hello, Johnny. If somebody is trying to take him, it's up to us to protect him. Oh, that's a big if, George, from where I stand. Johnny, we've always tried to give more personal service to our clients than some of the other companies. Look, I want you to investigate this thing for us. Without Durango's knowing, of course, on a fee plus expense account basis. Oh, an extra fee? That's not usual, George. With you, it is. You know as well as I do, the padding that goes on your expense account is plenty fee for anybody. Oh, George, you cut me to the quick. 
All right. Where is Durang? Uh, where is Mr. Dalhart now? Back in Bumspung, Oklahoma. Or at least on the way. But I thought he just left this money this morning. Every year he follows the same pattern. Comes east for a fling. You know, New York and all the nightclubs, that sort of thing. Then, just before leaving, he drops in here, makes his premium payment, and is gone. So? George, I still think you should have called in the Secret Service. But I'll take this on for just one reason. What's that? I want to find out what kind of a place could ever deserve the name of Bum Spung. Since George had already arranged for plane travel as far as Enid, Oklahoma, item two is a mere 855 for incidentals along the way. I arrived in Enid shortly after noon. Item three, 260 for lunch. Item four, $50 deposit on a rental car. And the owner of the Drive Your Own Agency wore a silly little smile as he gave me the directions to Bum Spung. Anyway, I headed due north on Highway 81 across the Oklahoma flatland. Some 26 miles or so further on, after passing through Pond Creek and crossing the salt fork of the Arkansas River, I spotted a rather crude, weather-beaten sign indicating that the place I was looking for was somewhere up a dirt road to the left. Road? That's a laugh. And it twisted and turned for seemingly endless rough miles along the riverbank. I just about decided that bum spunk was a bum steer when suddenly I almost ran into the gate of an old wooden fence surrounding some two or three acres of sandy ground. And there they were. A huge, ramshackle, unpainted building that passed for a house. An even more dilapidated affair propped up with timbers that probably served as a barn. There were a couple of broken-down outbuildings, too. And on a small, irrigated plot in the back, two cows... Steers? Well, anyway, two rather sad-looking bovines munched on the faded grass. There were some decrepit-looking chickens, a mangy old dog. There was a horse of sorts in a small corral. The windmill? Its whole tower sagged with fatigue, and the rudder on it slapped idly against the broken veins. But right next to it, in complete contrast stood a spanking new Cadillac convertible. And on the other side of the house, hanging some flimsy pretties on a clothesline, uh, she was uh, maybe 23 or 4, a brunette, and wearing a pair of well-tailored white riding breeches and a tight flowered silk blouse. She was slim and she was pretty and had a couple of rosebuds tucked in her hair. Hi. And uh, about as out of place as anything I ever saw. Hi. It was like seeing the vision of a goddess and... Hmm? Come on in. Just swing aside that post that you left. It's what Durango called the gate. Oh, yeah. Uh... Durango, did you say? Don't tell me this is bum spunk. It sure is. Didn't you see the sign down the road? The vast acreage within this broken down fence is the cattle ranch of Durango Laramie Dollhart, who happens to be my uncle. I'm Carol Dollhart. Who are you? Why, uh, my name's Johnny Dollar. Dollar? That seems to me I've heard that somewhere. Oh. What are you doing out here? Oh, just, uh, driving around, you know, summer vacation. You look like a city man. I, uh, well, I was intrigued by that sign down the road. You know, curious about what bum spunk could mean. Bad water. Bad spring, so the Indians called it Bum Spunk. Oh. Durango liked the name, so he bought up these two acres and settled here. And this is all there is to his ranch? What's the matter with it? He likes it. But I'd had an idea. Well. Yeah? Uh, nothing. From what you've told me, I think I'd like to meet Durango. Is he around? You trying to kid me or something? I haven't told you anything about him. Now, look, Johnny Dollar. Yeah, now look! Suddenly she turned, drew an old Colt 45, and as I ducked, she let go with it. Holy! I, I got him! I got him! See? She got him all right. A small really snake that had poked up out of a hole in the ground some 25 feet away. And she got him right through the head with both shots. Oh, God darn rattlesnake! Rattlesnakes? That looks to me like a poor old gopher snake. What's left of them? Oh, so, what's the difference? Could have been a rattlesnake. Hey, you were plenty fast with that gun. Yeah, I gotta be. Or old Durango wouldn't have me on the place. There's no use for anybody to... Hand me a couple of those clothes pins, will you? I gotta get these things hung up. Yeah, sure. Here. You, uh, said you're his niece. That's right. 
Only one left to take care of the old buzzard. You live here with him? <laughs> Part of the time. Oh, enough to look after him, make sure he don't get lonely, that he's got enough food in the house, that kind of thing. And I stick around when he goes out on the west coast or back east for a fling. That's where he is now. Yeah, and he's due back. Hand me that slip out of the laundry desk. Sure. Here you are. I take it that convertible's yours, huh? Yeah, that was my birthday present. Oh, your family must be pretty well healed. <laughs> family? In Durango, we're all that's left. Give me them stockings now. Sure. But certainly Durango... Why not? He gives me a new one every year. And this ranch is all he owns? Except for his money. Says he has a barrel of it. Well, he must have. Or else... Uh... Or else what? Uh, nothing. Go on with what you were saying. M- more clothes, then. Yeah, yeah. And when he kicks off, I get it all. And I can give up the filling station. Filling station? Well, you must have passed it. Just the side of Enid. Durango says a woman's no good unless she's got a job, so I got a filling station. Let somebody else run it for me, though, and Durango don't know the difference. Or at least he don't care. The main thing is I'm around to keep him happy and give him somebody to cuss at now and then and... Say, why am I shooting off my face to you this way? I don't know, but don't stop. There. Them clothes will be dry in an hour, and if you're still here, you can help me take them down again. Okay. Carry that basket for me, and I'll give you a cool drink in the house. Hey, great. You say Durango is due back here, huh? Mm-hmm. Why well, don't save yourself time traveling by plane instead of train? I'll never... Johnny, if you're just around here on vacation, I'll eat my shirt. Why'd you come here? And don't give me any guff. All right, come on. Pour me that drink and I'll tell you. Now I'll tell you. If you're here to pull something on... Oh! oh what's that? <gasps> but, dog, blasted... Blasted gopher. Oh, easy now. Easy. Don't you easy now, me. I busted my ankle. Oh, that's just oh. a little sprain. Here, arm over my shoulder. Okay. Okay. Dang fool that I was to kill that gopher snake back there. Yeah, I need it hurts. Then I'll carry you. You know. Oh, that's better. And hey, boy, oh, you got muscles. You know. Huh? What the? Well, take me over to the sofa. What's the matter, John? What stopped me was the inside of the ramshackle old house. Clean, modern, well-furnished. Even the kitchen with its gleaming porcelain, electric range, huge refrigerator and freezer. Modern in every way. Well, don't just stand there staring. Get some water hot and cold for this ankle. While you're at it, pour us a drink at the bar over there in the corner. I could use a good, stiff snort. I did what I could to reduce the swelling in her ankle. But by the time I'd taped it up and she was snoozing comfortably on the sofa, it was getting dark. So I hired myself into the well-stocked kitchen to see what I could scratch up to eat. And I'll be honest about it. With this mighty attractive patient on my hands, I'd completely forgotten about my mission in these parts. The investigation of one Durango Laramie Dalhart. I wasn't allowed to forget it long, though. As I opened and was about to reach into the ample freezer... Stop right there, you. Huh? There's only one way to deal with a thieving, stealing, dirty varmint like you. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Put that thing down. And that, partner, is this way. Holy, no. Hey, no, no, you're out of your... No. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. A number of years ago, it was said that in spite of the large population of this planet, men and women remain the most inaccessible things on it. Today, we see this lack of understanding among peoples of the world reflected in headline stories. But it isn't because the people of the world are enemies. All people want to be friends. Long before the termination of World War II, Reverend Eugene Wood, a Methodist minister from Oceanside, California went into a Scottsdale, Arizona camp where German prisoners of war were interned and offered his services to the imprisoned men. Among other things, Reverend Wood taught the men English, and he taught them about the United States of America. During the following years, after the men had been repatriated to their native Germany, 
Nearly half of the internees corresponded frequently with Reverend Wood. Those men expressed a unique understanding of the people and the country of the United States of America. This great feeling of friendship and understanding prompted the minister to make a pilgrimage to Europe to seek out the men he had befriended in the prisoner of war camp in Arizona. This gesture on Reverend Wood's part gained him a fantastic welcome everywhere he went. In all the places he visited, he spread the gospel of love and friendship and had it returned to him. There were no enemies, only men with the love of freedom, the right of all men, everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Funny Money Matter. Robbing my house, hey, no. thief. Now, wait a minute. Not my old Durango's around. Hey. Oh. Durango, you old maverick. Watch it. Cut out that shoot while I'm trying to sleep. Ain't had a chance like this in years. Well, you cut it up. Uh, quit it. Cut it out, I say. Enough. Me, too. Take a swing at me, will you? Right. Holy moses. Okay, okay. Yeah, and here's your gun. Keep it in your pocket where it belongs. Uh, sure. Now, what was the big idea? Well, whenever you bring one of these fancy boyfriends of yours around to my house, they got a right to have a little fun with them, ain't it? Fun? Is this your idea of fun? crazy gall darn fun. Look what you did to the stove. You blowed it full nah, of holes. Nah, the old wood stove would have held up. Here, buy yourself another one. There's four. Five hundred nice new dollars. Hey, wait, let now, me see Now, what about those. that window and the jars on the shelf? Nah, yeah. okay, here. <laughs> You should have saw him when I started throwing that lid all around oh, him. Oh, sure, sure. Here, Johnny, let me wipe off some of that jam that fell on your head. Johnny? Johnny who? Johnny Dollar. And I take it you're Durango Laramie Dollhart. Yeah, I sure am. Fastest shot in the country, too. My pa learned how in Durango, my ma learned how in Laramie, and I'm better than both of them was. Only thing is, I get no chance to show off no more. Durango, you crazy idiot. What's the idea? Oh, she... uh, no harm, man. No harm. Yeah. Yeah, take a slug of this. You forget all about it. I'll get a glass. Glass a man drinks out of the bottle. Go ahead, Johnny. Oh, well, thanks. Bad enough a he-man has to live around all this feminine fripsy and lace curtains and rugs all over the floor You and know that blame well you like the way I fixed up this old dump of yours, Durango. Mm, yeah. Now, wait a minute. Look, you two. Yeah, you know dang well a man gets tired just sitting around no matter how party pretty it is. Why else do you suppose I got to get away every now and then to San Francisco or New York or some of them places where they got some noise and excitement? Is that right, Johnny Dollar? Just leave him out of it. Why? What's he doing here, anyhow? Well? Well, uh... Well, Durango, I... I'll uh... tell you why. Because he's just driving around on his vacation and he happened to get to the end of the road and I made him come in. That's why. Thanks, girl. You got any objections? Nah, I'll say this. He's got a lot more get up and guts than most of the boys you bring around here. That laugh on the chin he'd give me. Yeah, well, I, I'm sorry about that, Durango. Sorry for what? Because you didn't act like some of them lily livered kids she brings around run for home? No, sir, boy, you're all right. You're. Just... Here, what the Sam Hill you got on your foot? Well, it's high time you noticed. Well, what happened to it? I like to have busted my ankle and I go for hold. If it hadn't been for Johnny, I'd still be laying out in the yard howling with pain. Yeah, me, I'd seen that happen. I thought she'd broke her leg. I'd liable to took her out and shot her. <laughs> but Johnny boy, you done a real good job on my little ticket. Here, honey. I have to get back on the sofa. No, now, that Johnny. He's hmm. a lot gentler. And besides, well, I kind of like him. <laughs> you hear that, Johnny? You better look out when a pretty girl starts talking to you like that. You're sure fixing to get last oot and thrown. Well, I can think of a lot worse things. Durango, you just shut up and fix us up some vittles. We're hungry. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure, sure. No sooner I get back here and some woman starts giving me orders. Take it easy now, Carol. Oh, I don't need help. I'm feeling fine now. I just wanted to talk to you. Hey, you should have stayed on that sofa. I didn't miss all the fun. Fun? You too? You know. Oh, thanks. Hey, sit beside me, Johnny. 
Well, sure. Why not? Ah, now, none of that mush stuff. That isn't what I meant. No, I can't see as I'd mind it with you, Johnny. Well, now, if that isn't an invitation, hey, I... Hey, some nice dates, a couple of chops, maybe some pancakes and uh... beans to fill you up, be all right? Just make it good and take your time. Or shall I do it? <laughs> Woman, I can cook better than you any time. Oh. Uh... Uh... Well... Johnny, before you start that... What's the matter with some lights in there, you kids? It's getting dark. Oh. Just mind your own affairs. And I warn you, Johnny, you better watch out for yourself. <laughs> yeah, I'll risk it, Durango. You don't, uh, want the light, do you, Carol? You know what I want? Hmm? What? I don't know why you come out here to bum spawn. Can't I wait? Mm. Now, I raise you got somewhere else to go, and it's going to be pretty late by the time we met. Or I might as well bunk here tonight. Got plenty of room. What do you say? Johnny? Uh, sure, Durango. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Now, uh, Carol. You haven't answered my question, John. Tomorrow. I'll tell you tomorrow when we can be alone. Aren't we alone now? Oh. Um, not as much as I wish we were. Mm. Mighty cute guy, Johnny. Oh. You don't know me, Carol. I'm really just an old wolf. Oh, I don't believe it. I don't... Ooh. Hmm? Just one of the roses fell out of my hair. Mm, there it is. Mm. With buds of roses in her hair and kisses on her mouth. What's that? Pretty. Just a line from an old boy. I have the roses in my hair. What about the rest? Why don't you find out? Hmm? You kids want to bail down on the jump while you're waiting? Oh, for... oh, why don't you tend to your cooking? Hmm? Johnny? Ah, that Durango, he certainly puts together a meal in a hurry. Too much of a hurry. And the meal itself, enough for an army. And to see him pack it away, you'd think he'd been out on the range for years. Yes, sir. Nothing like coming home to give you an appetite. Here, scoop yourself up some more beans, Johnny. I still hadn't made any progress in my investigation and encouraged him to talk about himself. He did, willingly. And how much of it was true was something else again. Said he left his father's little farm in Colorado to hunt for gold. Said he found it, too, a lot of it. Claimed he'd use that money exploring for oil, wildcatting. That everything he'd touched had turned to money. That he'd made and banked so much he could never spend it all. That's why he'd go on those flings to San Francisco and New York just to get rid of it. Then come back here to this little plot of ground and rest up for the next excursion to the big city. His only regret was he was too old to make the new West like the old West. Yes, sir. If I was 20 years younger, I'd ride a horse into Dodge City and show all them law and order. I'd show them just exactly how it was in the old days. Like I read about in them magazines. But if all this were true, why the counterfeit money? Those phony, washed-out hundred-dollar bills I'd seen on George Reed's desk. The bed in the guest room was as comfortable as my own, but I couldn't get to sleep. Fortunately, for long after the house was dark, it must have been close to midnight, I heard the door of Durango's room open. Heard him sneak out of the house the back way. Quickly, as quietly as I could, I slipped on trousers and shoes, took along my gun, and went after him. From the back porch, I could see that there was a light on in one of the small outbuildings. With my ear pressed tightly to the side of the little shack, I could hear it only too plainly. The printing press on which Durango was turning out the phony money. No question about it. And I was sorry. Kind of began to like the old character. To say nothing, it is beautiful. Johnny. Huh? Carol. What are you doing out here? If it's a walk in the moonlight you want, why didn't Jack Carol, come with you? Carol, listen. I'll lay my cards right on the table. What I really came to this place for was to find out... Well, it was right here inside this little shack. Oh, no. And now that I've found out, I've... Oh, Johnny, you'll break his heart. He thinks nobody knows about this. Oh, of course he does. He's been doing it ever since... And he thinks that even I don't know about it. Oh, bet. It. Oh, Johnny, please, you'll spoil everything. Why not? It's about time, isn't it? And he means no harm to anybody. What do you mean, no harm? Are you kidding? Or maybe you're in this whole thing with him. Are you? 
Oh, no, but I don't see what difference it would make. Johnny, Johnny, baby, don't... Oh, don't, don't pull that stuff. It's time for a showdown. Harry, what's the racket? What's going on? Uh... Oh. Snooping, huh? Why, you ornery low-down sneaking coyote. All right, all right, Durango. Just cut it and stand where you are. Huh? What are you doing with that gun? I only hope you won't make it necessary for me to use it. Johnny. Open up that door, Durango. I want to see what you've got inside there. Go ahead now, open it. Yeah. Now, look, son, there, there, there ain't no harm in what I'm doing in there. No harm? That seems to be a pat phrase around here. Well, it's just that I... Well, ever since I made my pile, everywhere I'd go, I'd spend a lot of money. So you I... told me at great length. Always, sir. Uh... Maybe it was sort of showing off a bit, but when I'd draw it out of the bank, I'd make them give me brand new money. And, you know, to impress the folks. Like a big shot up in Hartford where I pay my insurance for Carol here every year. In brand new hundred dollar bills, supposedly. That's right, and no supposedly. But this last insurance payment to Georgia. Yeah, yeah, I know. But, Johnny, it wasn't my fault the bank didn't have some nice new ones for me. And they couldn't get them in time either, so I, I had to... Well, well, this was the next best. Oh, that's all I can Johnny, story. please. Open that door. Oh, God, I kept hoping nobody would find it. Come me. on, open it. Okay. There you are. What under the... That's the washing machine there. And that's the soap. And plenty of strong bleach. And the starch to make them nice and crisp. Oh, no. And that there is the ironing board where I press them out real <laughs> nice and flat. They'll never believe it. But it, it does make them look real pretty and new. <laughs> Honest, Johnny, I, I, I didn't <laughs> think there was no harm in it. <laughs> Well, there you have it, George. Full report on the funny money that turned out to be only cleaned up a bit. And the next time, call in the Secret Service, will you? No, no, I, I didn't mean that. Just don't question the charges on this account for the extra week I've spent out here. If you can see this pretty little Carol... Oh, that Carol. And if I ever get enough money, so help me, I think I'll retire to bum-spung Oklahoma. Expense account total, including incidentals, and the trip back to Hartford, one seventy one twenty five. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, well, just remember one thing. That old saying about a cat having nine lives. And be sure to join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, G. Stanley Jones, and John McIntyre. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mr. 
Zavala. This is Henry Parker with Continental Assurance out in Reno. Well, how are things in Nevada, Mr. Parker? Terrible, sir. Just terrible. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. What uh, seems to be... Excuse me, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Uh, there's someone here who would like to speak with you. Oh, who? Give me that. Who do you suppose it is, you sloth-eyed Pinkerton? Sounds to me like a cantankerous old character named Jodiah Gillis. Cantankerous? Why, you miserable... What are you doing in Reno, Mr. Gillis? I'll tell you when you get here. When I get... Oh, no, now, wait a minute. I can't wait. If I do, he'll be dead and it'll be your fault. Who? A feline friend of mine. A what? Oh, being uncouth like you, you'd probably call him a cat. Oh, no. Look, Joe Dyer. Also, he's rich. He's what? Rich, yes, sir. Last week, he inherited $60,000. This week, somebody's making sure he won't live long enough to spend it. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Continental Assurance Company, Reno, Nevada. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Felicity Feline matter. Expense account item one, $164, air transportation, Hartford to Reno. En route, I wondered again what Jonia Gillis was doing in Nevada. At Reno, he was on the flight deck waiting for my plane, and standing beside him, wearing a dark suit and expression to match, was a tall, cadaverous-looking gentleman. As I started down the ramp, Jodiah began calling me. Yes, yeah, there he is. Dollar. You who? Hey, just... Oh, hi. Afternoon, Jodiah. Well, you are a sight for sore eyes, boy. Yes, indeed, you are. Johnny, this is my friend and business associate, Henry Parker. Mr. Parker? <laughs> oh, I'm certainly glad you've arrived, sir. That's all? Yes, my, yes. Mr. Gillis has been quite concerned over Felicity. The Felicity? The feline. What do you think you came out here for? Your help? Well, no. Yeah, then give Parker your checks. My checks? So what's the matter with you? The altitude affects your mind? Hand over your claim checks so Parker can fetch your luggage. Oh, uh, uh, sure. Here. Uh, yeah. Go on, Parker. Go on. We haven't got all day. Whatever you say, Mr. Gillis. Uh, we'll be in the waiting room. You hurry up. Yes, sir. Now, come on, Dollar. Come on, come on. Jodiah, before I left Hartford, I tried to check up on this Continental Assurance Company. Nobody ever heard of it. A lot of things those white-bellied clerks in Hartford haven't heard of. But the fact is, Continental ain't exactly worldwide. Oh. Uh-huh. In here, in here. No, sir. It ain't nationwide either. Well, uh, just how wide is it? Well, you know how far it is from Winnemucca to Black Butte? Uh, no. Good. It's just about that wide. Oh. And Parker is one of their agents, huh? Agents? Parker is the president of the Continental. The president? But you just... I mean... Will you look peaked, boy? You better sit down. Phew. <laughs> Jodiah, I shouldn't let the man that's paying my salary run after my bag. Peace, Tash. Here. Take a look at this. It's my new business card. <laughs> yeah. Go on, read it. Uh, Jodiah Gillis, chairman of the board, Continental. What? Yes, sir. But Floyd's of England has always carried your policy. Carried, yes. Past tense. I don't take guff from anybody. Especially a ninny of an insurance agent telling me what I can insure and what I can't. You had a fight with him? Yep. My cousin Rachel, oh, she's a sweet girl. She lives in the Belgian Congo. She sent me an African anteater. Now, all I wanted Floyd's to do was insure it for $15,000. And of course they wouldn't. Nope. So you canceled all your policies and bought the controlling interest in Continental. Same as anybody else would have done. Oh, sure, sure. And uh, naturally, you insured this anteater. Yeah, Archie. That was his name. Was his name. What happened to him? Well, it was a terrible thing, Johnny. Oh, it was just poor old Archie. He overindulged. Over? He did what? Yeah, he overindulged. He found a house full of termites. Oh. Yes, finally died. When chewed indigestion. Too bad. But of course, Continental Assurance paid off. And of course, they paid off. And with a smile. Same as they paid off the $60,000 to my feline friend, Felicity. 
What? 60,000 to Felicity. What do you think? The 60,000 Felicity inherited from Mrs. Hamelmeyer. And who is Mrs... Was, was, was. All right, was Mrs. Hamelmeyer. A client of Henry Parker's had a life policy for 60,000. Felicity was the beneficiary. But didn't she have any children or relatives? She had one brother, a nephew, and a niece. Oh, of course, not counting Mrs. Hawkins, who was Mrs. Hammermeyer's best friend. <clears throat> you see, the two ladies lived together 15 years. And right now, Mrs. Hawkins has been appointed trustee to administer the 60 grand as Felicity needs. Oh, I see. Yes, you meet her as soon as we get settled. Jodiah, what makes you think someone's trying to kill that guy? I don't think so. I know it. There have been two attempts in two weeks. You ask Mrs. Hawkins. She'll tell you. Mr. Gillis, Mr. Dollar. Ah, yeah. yeah it's about time, Parker. Well, come on, Johnny, come on. We'll take you down to the Mapes. The Mapes? The Mapes Hotel. I'm staying there. And if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for you. The Mapes Hotel stands high above Virginia Street, overlooking the Truckee River. After Gillis checked me in and introduced me to the owner, Mr. Charles Mapes, I unpacked and went with Judiah out to the old Hamelmeyer place, where Felicity the Cat, Mrs. Hawkins, and the relatives still live. We rang the old-fashioned doorbell and waited. In a moment, the door was opened by a pasty-faced man of about 28. Yeah? Oh, Mr. Gillis. Yes, afternoon, Oscar. Mrs. Hawkins in? Ain't she always? Who's he? He's a friend of mine who's also an insurance investigator. An insurance? Name's Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Oscar Emmett, the late Mrs. Hammermeyer's nephew. I am. I suppose you're here about that lousy cat. Uh, that's right. Well, uh, come on in. I'll tell the old lady you're here. You know where the living room is at, don't you, Mr. Oh, indeed I do. Oh, friendly sort of character. Uh, Oscar's like the rest of the Emmets. They just can't stand seeing Felicity eat steak when they got to have tuna casserole uh -huh. in here, darling. All right. Well, what kind of work does he do? Work? Oh, Oscar, none of the Emmett's work. No, sir. Not even Mrs. Hamelmeyer's brother? Emmett. Emmett spends all his time in the gambling halls. You know, gambling's legal here. He a professional? Oh, no, no. He's got a slot machine route. He huh? goes around poking his finger in the payoff trays, picking up the nickels and dimes that people overlook. Oh, 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 I see. Yeah, let's sit down here. Let's sit down. Oh, 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 what the hell? Oh, Felicity! That cat has claws. Oh, you stepped on his tail, you stupid... Oh, oh. Tell him you're sorry, Dollar. Well, I didn't know he was there. sorry, Felicity. Oh, oh, bad man didn't see you. What's oh, going on? Oh, oh, oh. You get right down off that table. You hear me. Oh, oh, oh you... Oh, Mr. Gillis, would you use your influence, please? Well, I'll certainly try, Mrs. Hawkins. <laughs> Felicity. Come on now, honey. That's a good kitty. There. Now. I just put out a nice dish of scallops for him. Oh, you hear that, Felicity? Scallops? Oh, yum, yum. Sure. So you run along now. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, uh, I do declare I've never seen a man who has such a way with animals. <laughs> well, I... I and did. that goes for lonely widows, too, Mr. Gillis. <laughs> oh, oh, now, Leo, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Joe Dyer. Oh, oh, yes. Uh... Mrs. Hawkins. Leona is just fine. Yeah, but, but this is the young fellow I was telling you about, Johnny Dollar. Oh, oh, well, this is indeed a pleasure, Mr. Dollar. Your diet told me so much about you. Oh, is that so? You're much more handsome than I imagined, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, now, good gravy, Leona. Now, you just tell him what's been going on around here. You mean about Felicity? Yeah, that's what I mean. Well, somebody's after him. Trying to kill him. Tell me, has an actual attempt been made on his life? Wednesday night, a week ago. I let him out just before I went to bed, like always. Uh -huh. He'd been out about an hour when it started to pour. And knowing Felicity hates to get wet, I opened the front door to call him. Well, just as he was crossing the street, I heard this big car start up. Yeah. And it zoomed straight for Felicity. Whoever was driving it almost turned over, trying to hit him. You didn't get a good look at the driver, huh? I didn't get any kind of a look. It was too dark. Well, what about the car? What make was it? If I knew that, I'd have already told you that. I haven't any secrets from him. <laughs> oh, uh, tell him about last Thursday, Leona. Felicity was poisoned. That's what the vet said. Somebody put arsenic in his lobster. 
Lobster? Oh, yes, he just loves it. According to the instructions Mrs. Hamelmeyer left, he's to have lobster once a week. Steak three times and boiled chicken every Sunday. I see. Yes. And as long as I take care of him and obey her instructions, I can live here rent free. Same as her kin, the Emmets. Uh huh. Same as them. Mr. Gillis, just who gets Felicity's money in case he dies? The Emmett family? We aren't sure. Oh, why is that? Because Mrs. Hammermeyer left a sealed envelope to be opened only in the event of Felicity's death. Oh, the Emmets will get all that's left, Mr. Dollar, I'm sure of it. Oh, no, 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 Leon. You mustn't look on the dark side. Well, I did rub Mildred, uh, Mrs. Hammermeyer's back and bunions for a good many years. Did her marketing. So she got her medicine on time. I do hope she appreciated oh, it. Oh, she did. She did, Leona. You see. You dear, sweet man. Hello? Anybody home? Where is everybody? We're in the living room. Yes, I figured they'd start flocking in. Now it's dinner time. Yeah, Dollar. Yeah? It's Joyce Emmett, the niece. She hates cats. Told me so herself. Oh. Well, evening, Mrs. Hawkins. Do I have time to take a shower before dinner? Oh... I didn't know he had company. Mr. Emmett, Joyce, you both know Mr. Gillis. Yes. Hi, Mr. Gillis. Terrible. And this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. He's investigating the trouble we've had about Felicity. After the would-be cat killer, huh, Johnny? Yeah, that's right. I'll lay eight to five, you never catch him. Or her. Could be a woman, you know. Oh, yes, yes. It most certainly could. Why, Joyce, the way you say that, you act as if you want Mr. Dollar to start investigating you. Maybe I do. How about it, Johnny? Well, uh, how do you feel about Felicity, Miss Emmett? The Emma? same as everyone else in this house. Aunt Mildred had no business leaving all her money to that... that creeping night crawler. Joyce. Well, he is. Mr. Dollar, just what interest do you have in Felicity? He isn't insured. Mr. Gillis sent for me, Mr. Emmett. He did? Yes, I did. Continental has a moral responsibility to see that the funds handed over to widows, children, and dumb animals are protected from swindlers, connivers, and blackguards. Of which I'm sure this house has many. Why, you pompous, wrinkled old Romeo. Joyce, please, if you can't hold your tongue, leave the room. Well, what I said is the truth. Man his age getting romantic. You wait, girl. Thirty years from now, you'll be mighty glad men my age can get romantic. <laughs> oh, that's telling Mr. Emmett. Mr. Emmett, do you yeah. share your daughter's opinion of Felicity? Why, of course I do. I'm a dog man. Besides, I can't see why she left all that money to the critter. Mrs. Hawkins has figured up what it costs to keep him like a king every week. Yes, yes, $23. Uh, maybe a trifle more by the time I get him out of the pretty kitty. The pretty kitty? Well, it's a beauty parlor for cats. Felicity has a standing appointment there every Friday at one. Oh, no. $23 a week. You know how many weeks it'll take him to spend that 60000 not counting the interest that'll add up while he's doing it? No, not exactly. No, 2600 weeks. 50 years. And believe me, the odds in any cat living to be 50 years old, well... I'll lay you ten to one he doesn't live another six months. Joy. Oh, speak of the devil. Well, hello there, Felicity. Oh, did you know we were talking about you? Did you finish up all your dinner, Felicity? He sometimes doesn't eat all his scallops. Last week I gave them to Oscar. Oh, it's disgusting. Hmm? Well, look at him. He thinks he owns us. What do you mean, thinks? <laughs> A few minutes later, Jodiah drove me back to the Mapes. Whether it was the Emmets or Mrs. Hawkins who wanted Felicity out of the way, I didn't know. But I did know we should get him out of that house as soon as possible. I changed my clothes, met Jodiah and his friend Charlie Mapes in the Skyrim for dinner, and did a bit of gambling, then went to bed. Must have been about 3.30 when the phone rang. Oh, Mr. Mm. Dollar, please answer me. Hmm? Uh, who is it? Mrs. Hawkins. I tried to get Mr. Gillis, but he left word he wasn't to be disturbed. Oh, well, what is it, Mrs. Hawkins? What's wrong? Oh, it's terrible. Oh, it's just terrible. Uh, what? What is it? What's happened? Felicity. He. Oh, he. Felicity what? I let him out about ten, but he... He has disappeared. Mr. Dollar, I know he's been killed. <laughs> Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. 
Anyone who has survived the rigors of basic training is familiar with a great variety of milk that is dished out periodically in the armed forces. Now, there's frozen milk, concentrated milk, frozen concentrate, and good old powdered milk. But sometimes, supplying wholesome, fresh, real milk has been a problem when servicemen have been stationed in out-of-the-way places. The United States Air Force came across that problem some time ago in the island of Teixeira, in the Azores, those Portuguese islands that dot an eastern portion of the Atlantic Ocean. The air base there was considered powdered milk country for a long time. Although cattle have played an important role in the economy of the island of Teixeira, the herd was badly inbred and milk production was very low. Modern milk processing was not a part of the picture. And with the help of Portuguese veterinarians, the men in the United States Air Force unit worked out a free breeding service by using a small herd of milk cows acquired in England and the cattle there at Teixeira improved. Then, a complete pasteurizing, homogenizing, sterilizing, bottling refrigeration plant was flown in from the United States. As soon as this activity got underway, milk production began to climb steadily and thirsty Air Force men and civilians were soon buying and drinking the new fresh milk. When economy of the island began to rise rapidly, the people were happy and grateful. You might say that a little milk of human kindness increased understanding on an island of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Felicity Feline Matter. A few minutes later, Jediah Gillis and I were at the old Hamelmeyer home. Joyce and her father, along with Mrs. Hawkins, were waiting for us. Oscar Emmett was nowhere to be found. He's the one, Johnny. Yes, sir, that shifty critter, that Oscar. He stole Felicity, and he's going to do him in. Ah, that poor Felicity. Oh, for heaven's sake, Mr. Gillis, pull yourself together. Oscar could be downtown having a run of luck, Mr. Dollar. Well, if he's gambling this time of night, he shouldn't be too hard to find. Mrs. Hawkins. Yes? When did you first realize Felicity was missing? Why, about an hour ago, I guess it was. I woke up and remembered he was still outside, so I came down and called him. Yeah? Always before, ever since he was a little kitten, he's come back home for me. But tonight, well, he's just nowhere to be found. What time did you let him out? About uh, 10.30, same time as I always do. Were you at home then, Joyce? No, she wasn't. I had a real good day yesterday, collected almost four dollars, so I took it to a movie. A movie? <laughs> That's a likely story if I've ever heard one. It happens to be the truth, Mr. Gillis. What'd you see? Come on, tell me. It was an old one about a giant gorilla. That's right. Oh, I'll bet, I'll bet. Well, Judah. Well. Judah. If anything has happened to poor Felicity, will we? Well... How much time will we be given before we have to move out of this house? Well, that's up to the court, but I'd say a couple of weeks. That's all? Oh, my. Well, it's all they deserve. My. All except you, my dear. Well, Johnny, you've been unusually quiet. What do you think? I think we'll take in the late spots, Judiah. See how our luck's running. We started at the Mapes and went down Virginia Street, stopping in at every gambling casino, hoping we'd find Oscar Emmett. Finally, we found him at one of the roulette wheels in Harold's Club. And in front of him was a large stack of chips. Make your bets, ladies and gentlemen. There's a couple of seats around here, gents. No, thanks. We'll just watch our friend. And a very lucky friend he is, too. Put these on 32 and these on... uh... Good morning, Oscar. What? (laughs) Well, what are you two doing here? We've been looking for you. That's so? What for? You know what for, you catnapper. What'd you do with Felicity? That cat. You know any other Felicity? You know good loafer? All bets are down. No, 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 wait a minute. I wanted these chips on 13 black. Sorry, all bets are down. What? Now see what you two maybe do. If that 13 hits, I... Well, what do you want to see me about? We told you. Felicity. You know where he is? Uh, how would I know? Where have you been since 10.30 this evening? All around town. How long have you been here? Long enough. Look out now. 
Christine, Hard, and Black. Oh, why, you, you see what you two clowns cost me? Take my mind off what I'm doing. Now, get out of my way. I'm cashing in. You're not doing nothing to the answer our questions, Mr. Oscar Emmett. You hear me? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, hey. Just a minute, Oscar. Hold back. Shania, are you all right? Uh, yes, I guess you'll find bodyguard you'd make. Oh, uh, Mr. Gillis, I'm... I'm sorry. I, I didn't really mean to hit you. Well, you sure did. did. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, here. Let me help you up. Uh, uh, Are you sure you're all right, Shadow? Yes, if I could just sit here a minute, I'll be fine. Okay, okay, folks. It's all over. Let's get back to our business. Oh, uh, uh I want to come over here a second, Dollar. If you say so. That crazy old fool. I, I didn't really mean to hit him so hard, but he... Well, you know how it is sometimes. That was the best run of luck I had this year. Well, don't worry about your diet. He sometimes forgets he's not as young as he used to be. Oh, you can say that again. Boy, the way he's been letting that Mrs. Hawkins make a fool of him. How do you mean? Oh, you know. Telling him how much she's in love with him, how nice it'll be after they're married, you know. You heard her say this? Sure. You see, my room's on the first floor just off the parlor. And I can't help but hear what's going on. Uh-huh. Well, what makes you think Mrs. Hawkins isn't sincere? Because she's been given the same line to Mr. Remmett. Oh. Only she's, she really loves him. Oh, yes, sir. Sometimes he argues with her and she breaks out crying. Now, that's something no woman like her could fake. Yeah. Maybe you're right. I didn't tell Jodiah what I'd learned from Oscar. At least not then. The wind had already been taken out of his sails. So I took him back to the Mapes. I made sure he was going to be all right. Then I returned to the old Hamelmeyer house. Joyce, Mr. Emmett, and Mrs. Hawkins were out in the yard hunting for Felicity. Hi, Johnny. Well, hi is so. We've got some coffee inside if you're interested. Coffee? Sure. But have you found any sign of Felicity? Not yet. Poor Miss Hawkins. She's about to go out of her mind. Uh-huh. Did you find Oscar last night? Yeah, yeah. He's been having a session downtown at a roulette table. That's what I thought. Johnny? Mm hmm What will happen if we don't find Felicity? I, I mean, if he's just run away, we won't be able to prove he's dead. And the money... Well, what will happen? Do you know? Well, I imagine there'll be a waiting period, and then the court will declare Felicity dead, and the money will go wherever Mrs. Hamelmeyer has willed it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I sure wish I knew what's in the envelope Mr. Gillis has locked in his office. Mrs. Hawkins! Joyce! Mr. Gillis! Now, what is it, Dad? In here, quick! Johnny, he found something in the garage. Come on, come on! The garage is about 25 yards from where we've been standing. We made it nothing flat. Inside, toward the back and on the ground, was a small hatchet. And near the other hatchet was some blood. And cat fur. Oh, oh Johnny. Oh. No. Poor Felicity. Oh, the poor, poor thing. Well, oh. it, it looks like he met his end here, oh, and then whoever did goodness. it carted him away, oh, huh, Dollar? Yes. Looks that way. Oh. Johnny, I... Oh, take me out of here. Yeah, sure, sure. Oh. My goodness. So ashamed. And you know I hated that cat. I really wanted him dead, but not like this. Not... Oh, hey, hey, hey. Come on now. I know it's silly of me, isn't it? No, no, I don't think it is. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Yes, ma'am. Will you be kind enough to notify Mr. Gillis? I... Oh, I'm afraid I just couldn't speak about it over the telephone. Of course. I'll be glad to. I drove Judea's car back to the hotel. I made sure he was feeling better, then told him what we found in the garage. Naturally, he wanted to call out the police reserves, but I managed to talk him out of it. At 10 o'clock, I made some telephone calls to the local banks. When I got the information I'd been after, Shadaya and I again drove out to the Hamelmeyer house. Well, I expected you two gentlemen a couple of hours ago. Sorry, Mrs. Hawkins. I had some things to take care of. Oh, well, come in. What's the matter with... Why, Shadaya Gillis, you've been fighting. So I have, woman. So I have. Street darling, and at your age... Seems like I've been doing a lot of crazy fool things at my age. Now, just what do you mean by that? You know very well what. Pulling the wool over my eyes. Let me think that I've found a true sweetheart at last. Oh, you... You miserable Jezebel. 
Mr. Dollar, whatever is he talking about? How about you and Mr. Emmett? M- and M- how M- you M- plan to use Jodiah's friendship to get you out of trouble in case your little scheme failed? Well, I still don't understand. No? Well, suppose I tell you that you did away with Felicity yourself. Why, you... You can't prove that. I won't need to. Jodiah's having a copy made of all your bank deposits since the time you moved in with Mrs. Hammermeyer 15 years ago. And started taking care of her by paying her bills, ordering her food and medicine, and pocketing a good share of the money for yourself. Well, why shouldn't I have? She didn't give me one cent of salary. Oh, I know. And your bank balance shows you have $47,000 on deposit. All right. Uh, All right. But I'll pay it back. You'll see. Oh, they won't be able to do a thing to me. No, sir, Mildred Hamelmeyer appreciated me even if nobody else did. Or does. You'll see... My name will be in that envelope. She wanted me to have that money all the time. I know she did. Hi. Ready to read the will? Yeah, just about. Uh, Joyce, you and your father sit over there, huh? Mm-hmm. Wherever you say, Mr. Dollar. Okay, Jediah, open the will. Sure, I will. But if it does give the money to... Jediah. Well, Mrs. Hammermeyer should spin in her grave if it does. Read it if you dare, you... You old... Go to miserable female woman. Yeah. Yes, well, I'll read it now. Here we go. Ah, codicil to the last will and testament of Mildred Emmett Hammermeyer. Witness by... Yes, there's a lot of legal gab here. Ah, here we are. The money's unspent after the death of the cat known as Felicity shall... Well, holy smoke. Well, <laughs> well, Mr. Gillis. This is no time for laughing, Gillis. Read it, your dad. <laughs> yes, <laughs> please. Oh, oh, doggone. I just, yeah, I'll, I'll read this thing again. <clears throat> the monies unspent shall then go to the descendants of the original heir. The what? The descendants? Huh? The descendants? What? Uh, yes. Well, how? The, the original heir is Felicity. Now, the money goes to his descendants. And being as he was a tomcat who loved to go prowling at oh. night, oh. did he no. ever have descendants? Oh! Hundreds of them! Oh. <laughs> well, sir, what happened later proved once and for all that miracles can happen. For at one o'clock on Friday afternoon, we got a phone call from the Pretty Kitty Beauty Shop. A large tomcat with a bad cut on the back of his neck had shown up for his usual shampoo and manicure. Maybe they do have nine lives. Expense account total, including hotel bill, incidentals, and transportation back to Hartford, $407.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, an actor who talked nothing but Shakespeare and who talked himself into his grave. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For the past 55 minutes, you've been listening to the best of radio drama, The Suspense and Johnny Dollar. Be sure and join us again tomorrow night at the same time, 9.05, when FEN presents the Phil Harris Show and the Life of Riley. Hollywood. It's time now for... 
Johnny Dollar. Ah, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Ah, who's that? Garrett Reynolds, Johnny. Reynolds and Trenton? That's right, New Jersey State Mutual Life. Well, what was the quote from Shakespeare about? Hamlet, wasn't it? Alas, I would a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, huh? freeze thy young blood, make thy two eyes like stars dark from their spears, hey. knotted and combined hey. lungs apart. Now, wait a minute, will you? I'm going hair to stand on end like quills upon the fretful porpentine. Garrett, have you gone off your rocker? Why don't you come on down here and see? Yeah, I think I'd better. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Jersey State Mutual Life Insurance Company, Trenton, New Jersey office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Heatherstone Players matter. Expense account item one, $9.80. Train fare, lunch, and incidentals on the trip from Hartford to Trenton, New Jersey. Item two, 70 cents, taxi to Garrett Reynolds' office. Glad you wasted no time, Johnny. Sit down. I'll get right to the point. Big rush, huh? If I read the signs right, yes. Okay. Whom are you expecting to get bumped off this you ever time? Over here of the Heatherstone Players. Huh? Sounds like a summer theater or a traveling stock company. It's Cyril Peter St. George Heatherstone. Cyril And he's Peter. just as bad as he sounds. An old Shakespearean actor, a real ham. Oh, friends, Romans, oh, no, 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 don't, 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 don't do ah, it. Ah, what's the matter? It'll be bad enough when he gets here. Any minute now. What do you mean? Every other sentence, a quote from the immortal bar. Oh. By the time you've listened to him for five minutes, you never want to hear of Shakespeare again. Uh, sounds like he might be fun. Fun? He's poison. And if he gets knocked off, it'll cost the company $10,000. All right, come on, tell me all. Uh, he keeps traveling around, conducting classes in Shakespeare and putting on occasional performances with the local talent. Uh -huh. After he gets all their dough from them, that is. Whenever he pulls out of a town, he leaves behind a lot of unpaid bills. <laughs> no wonder he keeps traveling around. It's no joke. He also leaves behind a lot of enemies and a lot of broken hearts. He thinks he's Romeo himself or Casanova. Oh. Anyhow, he's back here in Trenton. He's putting on a Shakespearean festival over radio station WVGR. Oh, well, hey now, maybe I can join the cast. But soft. What light through yonder window breaks? It is the East, and Juliet is... Will you tongue. cut it out? <laughs> this is serious. Well, so am I. But go on, go on. There is not one of his cast or crew there at the radio station doesn't hate every bone in his body. Except maybe young Joni Carter. And who is she? Oh, she's the girl he picked to play Juliet and Ophelia. Promised her a shining career on the stage and stardom in pictures and that sort of thing. Yeah, well, maybe she's good. Oh, don't kid yourself. It's part of his act to charm her away from Charlie Cubberley. And who is he? He's also in the cast. You're getting nothing but bit parts. Well, I still see no cause for alarm. Oh, you will, Johnny, if you ever attend one of those rehearsals. Well, look, if they all hate him so, why don't they just walk out on him? The old shite has got him tied down to contracts. Must have signed them with their eyes closed. They're stuck with him, Johnny, until the festival is over. Or until somebody kills him. You think it's that serious? Johnny, one way or another, he has taken everybody he's ever come into contact with. Even you? Even me. Number of times I've had to go through the operation of changing the beneficiary on his part. Who is the beneficiary? Uh, oh, as of the moment, Joan Carter. The actress you mentioned. The girl I mentioned. He uses the policy as a come on to charm the poor, unsuspecting young. Oh, people. what has he stayed of her? What has he done that it in golden letters should be set among the high prize of the calendar? What the same? King John, my boy, Act 3, Scene 1. May have for your plebeian ear, I should have asked this churlish fellow next to you why, for he sent for me this hour. Heatherstone, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh? And here's my hand. And mine, sir, with my heart in. 
Unquote. Gordon Madden from the Tempest Act, too. Oh, oh, no, 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 give you a chance. Look, Hatherstone, I've asked Dollar to act as your bodyguard until this play of yours is over play? and you can get out of town. Play festival, dear sir, in which the immortal Shakespeare's work beneath my practiced hand shall so enchant... Yeah, wait a minute, Hatherstone. But Garrett, I'm yes, not going to I any. said bodyguard. I've received three anonymous notes telling me in no uncertain terms that his life isn't worth a plugged nickel around that studio. Threats, huh? Uh, just warning. What matter? To quote the bard, I bear a charmed life. Have you given those notes to the police? Yeah, but I haven't heard back from them. That's why I sent for you in such a hurry. How fitting that my end should come there, on stage, so to speak. What? <laughs> Blow wind come rack. At least I'll die with harness on me back. It is the same, my friend, that I'll die with me boots on. <sighs> yeah, I got that. Has anybody threatened you in person, Heatherstone? Yeah. And what about that girl, Joan, and the way Charlie Coverley... Ah, her beauty makes the vault a feasting presence full of life. Oh, listen. And will you? I'm talking about Charlie, the boy she's thrown over for you and your phony promises. That boy's crazy enough with jealousy to try almost anything. Ah, he is mad. Right. That he is mad is true. Tis true. Tis pity. And pity tis... Tis true. Heatherstone, he's mad enough to kill you. And so are some of the others. Yeah, I've heard you're pretty rough on your cast of actors, on your crew. Well, I must be cruel, only to be kind. Now, what's that supposed They're to They're so mean? ambitious, all of them, but so inadequate, so futilely do they attempt to gain the highest talent of this art with which I am so rich and out. All right, all right, look, please. Apparently, Garrett feels that your life is in danger. I'm sure of it. And as long as I've come all the way down here, I'll take his word for it. That every one of your associates has a serious personal reason for wanting to see you out of the way. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not. Listen, will you? At least I do of us. Featherstone, don't you care that somebody's out to get you? My cast, my crew, you say? Yes. Ah, me? Mm. Stands not within the prospect of belief. Look. The fact remains... And yet, if twere true, then I must bear a countenance more in sorrow than in anger. In gratitude toward me, who've given them so much... Believe me, it is true. That's why I insist you have somebody to look out for you until you can get out of town. These words are razors to me, Walter. That's now. why I sent for Dollar. This man, huh? Yes. Let me have men about me who are Here fat, we go again. sleek-headed men and such a sleeper night. Yon dollar <laughs> has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Will you shut up? And yet, suppose I am. Tonight. Believe me, if it weren't for the 10000 it would cost the company, I sometimes think I'd like to take care of that little matter myself. And you would be found out. That's what you think. Then dollar, look upon his face. I quote, huh? so full of artless jealousy is guilt, it spills itself in fear into this spilt. All right. The fact remains that in spite of what Garrett says, you're determined to go ahead with this play, this uh, festival of yours. I am. In spite of the threats on your life. Why not? All that live must die, passing through nature to eternity. Okay, okay. When's your next rehearsal? Well, this afternoon, but sir. Station WVGR, right? I correct, but sir. And I'm going to be there. To interfere with me at work? No, 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 no. To hide in a corner and see if all this fuss over you is justified. To see if the atmosphere down there is as thick as Garrett says it is. To either take on this case or not. Depending on whether I think your life's really in danger. Oh, Johnny, his life has been in danger for years. Of course. You, uh, admit it? Aye, that I do. So therefore, harm. The harm they could have done... <laughs> Would long ago have caught me in its grasp. Yeah, well, maybe you've just been lucky. Aye. In the past, I quote, Treason has done his worst. Nor steel, nor poison. Malice domestic, foreign levy, nothing. Nothing can touch me further. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and with that thought, I bid thee now adieu. Yeah, well, go on. And yet, perhaps, for best we talk this out, I quote, To fear the worst, of yours the worst. Good day, gentlemen. You want a drink? <laughs> Garrett, that is the craziest clown I've ever met. But I still don't really see what you're worried about. That's because all you've seen is the, is the, <laughs> the amusing side of them. But I tell you, Johnny... Look, did you mean that about going over to the studio? Yeah, sure. And frankly, more to see how a radio show is put together than anything else. Then I'll arrange for you to sit in the control room with the engineer, the fellow who keeps the voices and sound effects and music and things in balance. Great, I'll have a ball. Uh, yeah? 
Well, you'll see why I sent for you. Why I'm so sure somebody's going to murder Heatherstone. Hey, if I didn't know you so well, Garrett, I'd think you were planning to do it yourself and call me in as a cover-up. You know something, Johnny? Well? Uh, I'll, I'll call the studio and make arrangements for you. <laughs> I couldn't help feeling that Garrett's own resentment of Cyril Heatherstone was for a lot more than the mere fact he'd have to revise his policy a few more times. But if so, he wouldn't admit it to me. Item three is our 25 taxi to the studios of WBGR. There I was escorted backstage, so to speak, to the control room. It was a small room, facing into the main studio through a large soundproof plate glass window. And it was loaded with complicated equipment. Before the control panel, with its knobs and keys and dials, sat Gordon Mitchell, the engineer, a nice-looking chap in his 30s. Through the window, we could see Heatherstone and the cast gathered around the table, working on the script. Sit here right beside me, Dollar, and you can see and hear everything that goes on in there. Oh, well, sure. Thanks, Gordon. Yeah. Is, uh, is that microphone sitting in the middle of the studio there the one they use when they're on the air? Yeah, that's one of them. There's one over there beside all that equipment for the sound effects men. Oh, yes, I see. And then there's another one in that booth over against the wall. And what's that for? Two were uh, isolated for special voice effects, like a voice coming over telephone, things like that. A filter mic. Oh, I see. And then the one hanging over the table where they're reading will be for the orchestra when it comes in later. Ah. Uh -huh. Say, uh, you have a lot of stuff to balance when you're doing a show, haven't you? <laughs> More knobs and dials and stuff. You see here... This knob controls the mic over their table out there. Uh, listen, I'll fade them in. What do the lines stretch out to the crack of doom? Well, I... Well, hey, please, uh, I... Charlie Coverley plays one of the small... Well, Paul... Oh. Well, well, it is... Well, you said to get everything we could out of the line. That I did. So we I added a couple of words to make the seat sound... You added your shit? Yeah. Well, I thought... Here we go, darling. No, no. Listen to his own words. To gild a finer gold, to paint the lily, to throw a perfume on the violet, is wasteful and ridiculous excess. Remember that and stop being ridiculous. You heard enough, oh, Dollar? Yeah. Yeah. I'll cut, cut it off. A gentleman, sir. Brother, he really tears into them, doesn't he? Believe me, that was nothing. Dollar, he's the most hated man in this town. So I've heard, so I've heard. Pretty fast dealer, too. <laughs> You're not kidding. He sure nicked me. How do you mean? All my savings. You know, invest in this uh, Shakespearean festival. He'll get a sponsor. We'll all make a million. <laughs> well, if it wasn't for the beneficial finance company, I'd be on my uppers. That way, huh? And poor Charlie out there. Not only lost his shirt to Cyril, but his girl, too. That little blonde beside him? The one who's talking now? Yeah. Well, listen, I'll open their mic again. That's not a mic. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. There's rosemary, that's for remembering. Pray you, love, remember. Go on. And there is pansies, that's for thought. There's fennel for you, and here's some for me. We may call it her break of Sunday. Wonderful. You make the role of Ophelia live. Oh, boy. If you don't get pawing her, I'm going to... Silence! On hand, Miss Lowe, and silence. Yes, Charles, you mustn't interrupt, Cyril. You mustn't. You Why, do, sir? yes. Where's your humility, Charles, before me, the master? Remember, it is common proof that loneliness in young, ambitions lad are. <laughs> Sorry, Dollar. I can't take it. Gordon, that guy is the most egotistical character I've ever seen. He isn't going to live long. Who are you thinking of? <laughs> Any of that group out there. And the sound crew, and the musicians. There isn't one of them hasn't got murder in his eye. I told the insurance. What were you going to say? <laughs> well, I, uh... I sent a couple of notes to Cyril's insurance man. He's an old friend of mine. Oh. I didn't sign them because I didn't want to get involved. But I told him what I'm telling you. Somebody's going to kill that guy out there unless oh. you were... Oh, wait a sec. Who wants you? Yeah. Well, sit and gossip in there when there's work to be done. Oh, sorry, Cyril. Uh, Mr. Heatherstone. Irresponsible out. This is a rehearsal. The talk back's too loud. First, it's too quiet. Now it's too loud. Sounds as though you're shouting at me. And that I will not have. Okay, sorry. Believe me, you will be sorry if this task is done. Believe me, I am sorry. I ever got mixed now, up. I shall rehearse my lines with Hamlet's father's ghost. You may learn how Shakespeare should be read. 
Is the filter mic in order, Mitchell? Yes, sir. Right in the isolation booth. Very well. The hearken, all of you, to the great line from the lips and heart of a great actor. Notice the hair-shaped pose. Baby likes himself, doesn't he? Look at those kids. Look at their eyes. See what I meant a minute ago? There's murder in them. Who's that came in the door? The back door of the isolation booth. Oh, that's one of the sound effects, man. He takes care of it. Hi, boys and girls. How's the old... Silence! Whoops. Now, is this microphone on and working properly? Well, Mitchell. Yeah, it's on, but uh, work a little closer to it, will you? And with a bit less voice. You tell me how to use the microphone. <laughs> I'm quiet, all of you. Well, what's he waiting for? The moon, dollar. The moon. Oh, come on, come on, you old ghost. I am thy father's spirit. Doomed for a certain term to walk the night. <laughs> and for the day, confined to fast empires. Till the foul cry. Down. Don't tell me he's forgotten his lines. That's not the script. My drugs are quick. What is this? My dismal scene I needs must act alone. Past hope, past cure, hey. past help. Wait a minute. I call upon the gods to get them. <laughs> What's happening? I don't know, Dollar. All right. Oh, no, I'm so worried. He's dead. He's dead. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Who among us has not hoped for a better life? Who has not had a desire to help stamp out disease and suffering among more unfortunate people throughout the world? Many have wanted to help, and many have done so. That sort of work is going on everywhere. Everywhere there is hope for freedom and a better life. Outstanding in this field of activity is Project Hope which operates from a converted U.S. Navy hospital ship called, appropriately enough, the Hope. The good ship Hope carries out its mission of mercy in far eastern waters. Wherever doctors, nurses, dentists, sanitation, and public health experts are needed, the Hope steams full speed ahead and gives what help it can. In addition to giving medical aid, the staff of the Hope works with local doctors to acquaint them with the newest of medicines and medical procedures. At the same time, the staff of the Hope learns a great deal about the symptoms and the cures of diseases with which they have had no previous contact. When the Hope was in the United States Navy, it was called the Consolation. And it is certain that the people who now operate her will give both consolation and hope to those who are suffering. Consolation, hope, and a new life. For wherever the hospital ship Hope is anchored, its staff is to make emergency trips to scenes of disasters and epidemics. Their services include a wide variety of skills from removing a tumor from a child's neck to putting a bandage on an old woman's cut finger. But most importantly... With the hope comes friendship and understanding. Good medicine for healthy freedom, which is the right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Heatherstone Players Matter. Cyril Peter St. George Heatherstone was dead. There was no doubt about it. And the old Shakespearean actor had died muttering the words of the immortal bard. There at radio station WBGR in Trenton, New Jersey. 
When he fell on the isolation booth at one side, I immediately rushed into the main studio to check the dead man's body, his clothes. I searched every nook and cranny of the isolation booth and came up with nothing. He's dead. Daryl is dead. Daryl is Daryl. Is it? Well, I'm glad he's dead. He's had it coming for a long, long time. Oh, stop it, Joan. Stop it. But he was going to make me an actress. A great actress. A star. Oh, don't kid yourself, Joan. He was taking you like he took the rest of us. And me, I'm glad to see him lying there. Who are you? Huh? Oh, Don Ringo, sound effects man. I just came in and time to... Hey, wait a minute. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Investigator? That's right. Gordon. Yeah, Dollar? That phone in the control room. Can you call outside on it? Sure. Then call headquarters. Get somebody from Homicide over here. Right, you are. Don. Hey, yes, sir? I want you to stay right here by this isolation booth. Make sure that nobody... Say, who, by the way, opened the door of this booth? Well, I did, Mr. Dollar. Did you touch his body? No. Oh, no. Oh, I hope not, because... What's the matter, Mr. Dollar? Plenty. What is it, Mr. Dollar? Well, at least I know what killed him. Yeah? What? Don, you stay here. Okay. The rest of you, back to the rehearsal table. I want to talk to you. It was so faint, I wasn't quite sure for a second. But there was no doubt about that order that came from the isolation booth. Like peach blossoms, only more delicate and more deadly. It was the odor of potassium paraffin, And I'm glad the trace of it was faint, because one good whiff at full strength would kill almost instantly. Had killed. I'd left Don Ringo there at the booth to watch him, to see if he made any move toward Heatherstone's body. But Don had been the last one near him before he died. All right, now. Officially, there's nothing I can do until the police get here. You, uh, you said you know what killed him, Mr. Dollar. Yes. Potassium paraffin, Charlie. Ever hear of it? Well... Well, no, of course not. One tiny crystal, if swallowed, kills instantly. Or a single whiff of it when it's heated, vaporized. Same thing. You think maybe he committed suicide, Mr. Dollar? What do you think, John? Well, what do you mean? Doesn't sound like Heather Stone to me, Dollar. Kill himself. All right, so he needed help from someone in this room. And, Don, you were the last one near him. Now, oh, wait a minute. Okay, okay. Charlie? Yes, sir? Can you think of anybody here who might have had a better motive for killing Heather Stone than you? No. No, I can't. Charlie. I wanted to see that phony, egotistical shyster dead more than anything else in the world. But I wouldn't have killed him. Well, I would, Charlie, gladly, and I make no bones about it. Police will be here any minute, Dollar. Good. How about your feelings in the matter, Don? Sure. I'm glad he's been knocked off. But don't accuse me of having... I'm not accusing anybody yet. But isn't it kind of funny? The only one who admits he would have killed Heather Stone is Gordon here. But he was in the control room with me. Not only when it happened, but long before it happened. And potassium pyrethrin doesn't wait. The rest of you, though, were right here next to Heatherstone. Any one of you could have slipped the stuff to him before he walked into that isolation booth. Yeah, but how would we have made him take it? Uh, that's a good question. Did you find any of that potassium, whatever it is, in the booth? No, but I got a good whiff of it. Well, you said it had to be vaporized. For the pyrethrin gas to do its work, yes. Dollar, could a capsule of it have been tossed into the booth or maybe uh, left in there for him to step on? Then where's the capsule? Gordon, I went over that booth with a fine-tooth comb. Joan. Yes, Mr. Dollar? Are you the only one who touched him before I came in from the control room? I didn't touch him. I told you. But you were the only one who went into the booth, weren't you? Yes. The only one who could have removed any evidence of the means used to get that vaporized pad in there. Mr. Dollar, I... here, Dollar? If you're saying that Joni had anything to do with... What's the matter with you? Didn't you know that she was a... She was in love with All right, Charlie, all right, take it easy. I I, I thought I loved him, Charles. Honey. I I guess it took this to... to to bring me to my senses. Johnny, oh, Johnny. All right, look, we've got a murder on our hands. And unless the police are able to come up with more than I have... Well... But they weren't. The doctor who came along with Lieutenant Harper agreed with my conclusion that Heather Stone had died from a hefty whiff of pay-it and gas. But neither of them could find any possible source of the gas, even after thorough inspection of the isolation booth, the studio, and every one of us in it. Nothing. Dead end. Finally, after some four hours of futile questioning. Well, it was murder, all right, Dollar. No question about it. Any, uh, suspects, Lieutenant? Any suspects? All of them. Every one of them. Except maybe the guy who was in the control room with you. Lieutenant, that should make him number one in the list. You've been reading too many mystery stories. Oh, look, Lieutenant. 
How much longer are we going to have to stay around here? You anxious to get away? What's your name, Ringo? Well, I mean it after all, you know. Inspector, would there be any harm in putting my equipment away? Uh, what equipment? Oh, mics and mic cables, patch connections on the board in the control room, so on. Uh, you see any reason, Dollar? No. Go ahead, Gordon. Thanks. I'm a little tired of just standing around. What about us, Lieutenant? Is it doing any good to keep us here? Look. Somebody in this place killed Heather Stone. Yeah, but you're not getting anywhere finding out who it was. Are we all under suspicion? Yeah, excuse me, darling. Mm. You're standing on this mic cable. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I asked you a question, Lieutenant. The answer is yes. Yes, you're all under suspicion. But what good is keeping us here? You'd rather be locked up? Hey, excuse me again, darling. <laughs> now this cable. Oh, sure. Hey, now, wait a minute. That's the cable for the mic in that booth? Yeah, that's right. Excuse me. Yeah, you go ahead and take it away. Gordon. Those mics uh, all stay in the studio? Yes, sir. Oh, if you ever want to inspect them... Inspect them? What for? What? Oh, I didn't know. Maybe I know, Gordon. What? This cable to the booth mic. It's thicker than the other. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Probably an old one. Or maybe it's bigger because it has a couple of extra leads in it. Extra wires. Yeah, the old ones did. That's why... Come on, Lieutenant. Huh? You too, Gordon. Got a screwdriver? Sure. In my pocket. There you are. <laughs> Pliers, too, if you want them. If I don't understand why... Yeah, now. You... This mic in the booth. Oh, careful, Mr. Dollar. That's pretty delicate. Then you do it. Take the faceplate off this mic. Sure. But why? Yeah, darling. Potassium pietin. A crystal of potassium pietin. Vaporized in this booth. Oh, sure, but uh, are you going to tell me how? Well, maybe I'm just guessing, but I think so. Go ahead, Gordon. Yes, sir. Well, I still don't. Yeah. There you are. Well, there's the insides of it. Yeah. And that's all. There's a. Look. This tiny ball of fused metal. Yeah. All that's left of a heating element that was melted away inside this mic. Thanks to the extra wires in that cable. Oh, it's probably just a little piece of stuff. Yes, and a... Look at the color. A livid red. Typical of the action of potassium peyotin on fused metal. Huh? On the heating element that was placed in the mic and destroyed by a surge of current through it. Hey, that color. That's right. You're right. Well, then... Gordon. The one man who didn't hesitate to say how he felt about Heatherstone. Who said he would kill him. Who warned us. And the one man with an alibi, because I was there in the control room with him. Oh, is that me? I suppose you disconnected the power leads to that cable when you went into the control room to call the police, didn't you, Gordon? Yeah, Mr. Dollar, you guessed right again. But it was a good try, wasn't it? No flight of angels will sing him to his rest. So, that was it. And the company will have to pay the claim. Expense account total, including incidentals and fare, back to Hartford, fifty-one twenty-five. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the yours truly matter. And I give you one guess about the name of the victim. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Dick Crenna, Sam Edwards, Frank Gristle, Herb Bygren, and Hunt Conried. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have your call to Hartford, Connecticut, Mr. Dollar. One moment, please. Thanks, operator. Hello? Pat McCracken. Hi, Pat. Johnny Dollar. Oh, good. 
Still out on the West Coast, Johnny? Practically. Did you clear up that Kincaid matter? Mailed you the final report two days ago. Oh, good. Now, sit tight, because I think I'll have another case for you out there. Yeah? Well, I've got one all lined up for myself. I what? just want to get your okay for an expense account. Well, it depends. Who holds the policy? Holds several policies with the companies that you serve. Who is he? Or is it a she? Oh, it's a he, all right. The most important client I know. Ah, who, Johnny? And certainly the one deserving the most attention. Well, who is it? Me, Pat. What? Me. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Mr. Pat McCracken. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of and participation in the yours truly matter. <laughs> Item one, $34. Transportation and all the incidentals I could think of. Los Angeles to Las Vegas, Nevada. I needed a couple of days of relaxation after that Kincaid affair. Item two, $31.40 for my room at the Flamingo Hotel, plus two fancy meals and a couple of drinks to go with them. Item three, 85 cents phone call to my old pal Buster Favor down at Lake Mojave Resort on the Colorado River. Sure glad to hear your voice again, Johnny. Coming down here for some fishing? Buster, how did you guess? Big lunk of bass are practically jumping into the boat. How big? Three to six pounds. Ah, oh, I did that well on the Flamingo boat yesterday on Lake Mead. Then I'll arrange for some bigger ones that stand by and wait for you. Want me to drive over and pick you up? No, no, I like to be independent, so I'll rent a car here. Well, in that case, wait for me. Huh? I've got to have three or four days' work done on my car at a garage there in Vegas. So? So I'll drive on up, leave my car, and you and I can come back here together in yours. And when you've had your fill of fishing... Okay, Buster, it's a deal. See you when you get here. (laughs) Item four, $100 deposit on a rental car, a shiny new air-conditioned Cadillac. And remember, Pat, one of your companies holds the insurance on it. Item 5, 2170 for drinks and a big dinner with Buster when he arrived. It was quite late when we hit Route 95 for the drive down to Lake Mojave Resort across the desert. It was still hot after the day's high temperature of 118. You driving so fast to keep up the breeze, Johnny? Maybe you ought to take it a little easier. They patrol these roads pretty good, you know. Are you kidding? I haven't seen a car in nearly ten miles. Yeah, and you mightn't see one of those law boys until he's right up on top of you. Oh, Buster, you mean they hide on the side road? No, not hide. They patrol some of them. Hey, where do all those side roads go, Buster? Some of them are a little more than wagon trails. Mostly to old mines, Johnny. Some of them ten, fifteen, twenty miles away up in the hills. Some of them being worked, some of them just... Now, look. Yeah? Over to your right. You see those lights? Look like they're on the side of the mountain. Oh, yeah. That's Haley's Tungsten Mine up there. Real big operation. A few miles ahead, one of my old friends has a mine. He works it for, uh... Uh Uh-oh. What's the matter? Look in the rear view mirror. I see some other lights. Oh, hey, if you think we're stepping along, that guy behind us is certainly... Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, that flashing red light above the corner of his windshield means a highway patrol car. It also means you better stop. Well, it isn't as though I've been driving all over the road. It's as though you haven't been keeping a sharp enough eye on the speedometer. Okay, start thinking up excuses, Johnny, and they'd better be good. Oh, no, I'll take it like a man. Shall we get out and greet the minion of the law? No, no, don't. You might think you're trying to pull something. And those laddies carry guns. Just sit here calmly, eyes front, and try to look innocent. Yeah. All right, boys. Huh? Oh, there's nothing in the back seat, officer. I... What? That's right, mister. Nothing but me. And this. Hey, now, wait a minute. You're not... Hey, Johnny. Yeah. I take it that thing's loaded. That's right. Now get going. You were flashing that red light. Flashlight. Food are pretty good tonight. You were making like the highway patrol, and man, is that against the law. Uh, you think that's bad? Just wait till you see what I've got for you. Now start her up. Hey, look, mister. Don't argue with a gun, Buster. Yeah, Buster, remember that. And remember it's aimed right at the back of your head. I'll get going, you. Sure, here we go. Oh, hey. Ah. 
car. Uh, Ted, watch it, will you? What's the idea of backing up that way? I'm sorry. It's a rental car. I guess I'm not used to it. Oh, uh, well, watch it. Sure, yes, sir. You know. Uh, take it real slow, buddy, and no funnies are out. Pull this trigger first and figure it out afterwards. Yes, sir. You're the boss. You bet I am. Well, what happens now? Just keep going straight ahead. When I want you to turn off, I'll tell you. Where do you think you're taking us, mister? Where you guys will be a long, long time getting back to civilization. And by then, I'll be loaded and out of the state. Just a plain stick-up, huh? Yeah, that's right. Modern style. Well, look now, just because we're driving a big car doesn't mean... If you got dough enough to gamble big money in Vegas and rent a big car, you got enough for me. You and a few others I'll take over before the night's over. Unless you get tagged first. This car will be plenty easy to identify. You'll find this car back where I stopped you. If you ever get there. Oh, brother, I wish I had a good look at that one of yours. <laughs> Why do you suppose I pulled up behind you and didn't give you a chance to look? Now, let up on that gas. Getting a little nervous? Well, I just want to be sure that if I have to put a hole in the back of your heads, I can get to the wheel before this crate flips over. Pretty smart, aren't you? Yeah. That's why I stay alive and in the chips. Easy now. You see that little side road? Yeah, what about it? Turn off on it. Why not? Hey, Johnny. Yeah. It's the road to old McKinney's mine. Who's McKinney? He's the one. Look, if you guys want to talk, talk up. I'll quiet you down permanently. Talking about this lousy road is all. Yeah, well, that's why I picked it, buddy. And, and take it easy. Hit these bumps too fast and this gun's liable to go off. And you wouldn't like that now, would you? We continued up the rough, curving road on the side of the mountain. Ten, fifteen miles, I guess. And I could see nothing but the road itself and the shadow of the mountain ahead of us. Turn up that air conditioning, buddy. It's a hot night. Yeah, sure. Listen, we go much further on this road, we'll scrape off the drip pan. You know this road? Well, it keeps getting worse and worse is all. This car's built pretty low, you know. Bernie, take it easy, I said. How can I? Do you hear that? We don't stop pretty soon. We'll all get stranded out here. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you got something there. Okay, buddy, that, that wide spot. You turn us around and stop. And take it easy. Okay, okay. Now what? Just leave the engine running and both of you get out the right-hand door. Yeah, sure. Now, look. Shut up. From now on, I'm not going to waste any time. Come on, get out. You're not going to leave us out here, I hope. <laughs> That's right. I figure the temperature's still around 100, so you're going to have to take it easy. It'll be long after daylight before you get back down the highway. If we make it at all. Oh, you will. If you go real slow. And if I don't have to use this on you. <laughs> now, turn around, both of you. Hands up in the air. Now, look, mister, with no water out here in this heat, it'll be murder. It'll be murder if you try anything cute. <clears throat> what? Wait. Nearly a hundred bucks. You don't know this desert heat. Shut up. Now, you. Okay. Here, here, lower that left hand just a little. And be careful. Say, I, I like that watch. And that ring. Yeah. Yeah. Say, you must have done all right at the gambling tables. Well, easy come, easy go. That's right. But, well, well. <laughs> this card fall out of your wallet? Yeah. Johnny Dollar Insurance Investigator. <laughs> oh, boy, that's a laugh. A private dick. Just as big a sucker as anybody else. Yeah, I'm laughing. All right, now, boys. Walk. Ten steps, straight forward. Together. Come on, Buster. No, sir. Now, look, you, if you think that you're going to... Wait, wait, Buster, don't. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, oh. Oh, you dirty oh. rat. Yeah. And one phony move out of you and you're going to get the same. Only right in the back, you hear me? Now, you walk. Walk. Keep going. Walk. Buster. Buster. Why, that 
dirty murdering. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. While her husband was a captain assigned to a unit of the United States Air Force on the island of Okinawa, Mrs. Carolyn Pesaturo went along, but friends and build greater understanding with other people of other lands. A chance to demonstrate her convictions. Her maid, Kikuko Chibana, invited her to her home. Kikuko's mother animated that Mrs. Pesaturo had never done a hard day's work in her life, not with a manicure job like that. Well, that did it. Carolyn Pesaturo volunteered to do a full day's work, just like any Okinawan housewife, and be no more tired at the end of the day. Bright and early one day, she found herself in the Chibana home. And after washing the breakfast dishes in cold soapless water, she scrubbed the kitchen floor, prepared meals on a wood-burning stove, drew 25 buckets of water from the well, and worked in the fields for the rest of the day, carrying 50-pound bundles of cut rice stalks through knee-deep mud. Well, she did such a good job, she was invited back for the rice planting. But more importantly, Carolyn Pesaturo planted understanding so that others could reap the harvest of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Yours Truly Matter. He'd overtaken Buster Favor and me on Highway 95 out in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Gun pointed me to drive my rented air-conditioned car of a rough, winding side road, miles and miles up into the mountains, and finally stop. There, he'd ordered us out into the stifling desert heat. He'd taken out watches and money, and there, in spite of my warning, Buster had turned on him. Then, with a gun aimed at my back, he'd ordered me to walk away from the fallen man. Then he took off in our car. Buster! Buster! Me, the dirty murdering. Just take it easy, Johnny. Huh, what? Buster, you're okay. Yeah, yeah, but I sure had myself worried there for a minute. Pretty lousy shot, wasn't it? Oh, brother, you were crazy to make a dive at him. Only legitimate way I could think of to get down on the ground. What are you talking about? You see these? I can't see a thing, but it sounds like a couple of stones. Yeah, real sharp ones, the kind that cut a tire of ribbons out here, chunks of lava. Oh, what? I shoved them under the right front wheel. Buster, those tires are probably self-sealing. Sure. So just to make certain, I went to work with this old knife of mine that he didn't seem to want. When he hits a few of those washouts, we went oh, over. Oh, good boy. But on that rough road and with power steering... Don't you worry. You'll have to stop and change a tire before he gets very far. Rubber sealant was already leaking out fast. In the meantime, we better get on on after him. Come on. Are you forgetting he still has that gun? Johnny, I'll show you tricks for getting a man in the desert at night that you never heard of. And don't forget, he'll be the one standing in the light from his car. If he's had to stop. He'll be stopped. If you stumble onto any rocks about the size of a baseball, pick him up. Oh? Yeah, maybe I'll show you why I ought to be pitching for the New York Yankees. And while I'm occupying him from one side in the darkness, why... Yeah. Okay, Buster, let's go. Easy. Easy. This heat will get you faster than you think. Then let's hope it gets him when he stops to change the tire. That's what I'm banking on. If he does. Don't you worry, Johnny. He will. Slowly, carefully, we trudged on down the side of the mountain, conserving our strength. I was glad that Buster knew the ways of the desert. A couple of times we left the winding trail to make shortcuts around big mounds and rocks, around old mine workings. And then we saw them. Car lights, Johnny. You see? Yeah, but they're moving down there, winding back and forth. He hasn't had to stop yet. No, no, I guess... He... Hey, wait a minute. Those lights are coming up the trail. Yeah, why would he be coming back here? I don't know. Come on, throw that little hill on the side. When he comes around it, we'll let him have a handful of rocks through the windshield. Yeah, right. Pick up stones, anything you can get your hands on. Right. Hey, look, there's a good spot on that mound, huh? He won't see us, but we'll see him when he pulls around. We'll be practically on top of him. Here. Here we are. Okay. Okay, good. 
And don't forget, our eyes are used to the darkness. His won't be. We'll just... Just aim for his windshield, Johnny, with all we got. But don't forget, he still has that gun. Once we stop him, we'll have the advantage. With the cracked-up windshield, he won't be able to drive. And as long as it stays nice and dark... It... You listen. Yeah. Yeah, I am listening. That's... No Cadillac. It sure isn't. You... Think maybe he's nailed somebody else down on the highway and is bringing him up here? He hasn't had time to get halfway down there yet. Well, then who is? Buster, I'm going to jump down and hail him. But if it is him... have to take that chance. Johnny, Johnny, wait! That's deep. Hey, no, stop! Stop! Hey, you, stop, will you please? Huh? Now, what the howling tarnation are you doing out here? What's the matter? You get lost or something? Hey, listen, listen, mister. Did you pass a big sedan on the way up this road? No, wait a minute, young fella. Just who are hey, you? Hey, Matt. Hey, Matt. Mac McKinney. Huh? Who's that? That's Buster, can't you see? Buster Faber? That's right. Well, <laughs> hey, you gone crazy or something? Wandering around out here this time of night? Look, never mind that. I asked you about a car. Did you pass him? Pass him? I helped him out. Just below that uh, last hill What do you mean? Well, he had a flat tire, so I helped him put on his spare. You what? City dude having a lot of trouble with the heat. So I'll give him a hand. Oh, no. And him, he'd give me a ten spot for my trouble. Doggone it, Mac. That guy stole our car and money from us and left us up on the mountain. No kidding. Who's kidding? Well, hmm. well then, maybe I done right at that. What do you mean? Yeah, I've been worrying about it ever since I left him down there. What are you talking about, Mac? Well, me, I got an instinct. Yeah? The same kind of instinct about everything that I got about oh, finding man. a gold mine. Uh, uh, Buster. Don't you tell the government. But I have took over 40,000 words of war out of my right, mind Mac. up there since the turn of the year. Yeah, well, 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 go on with whatever it is you were getting at. Yeah, come on. Yeah, well, instinct. Now, you take my gate down at the end of the road. Uh, Mac. That wasn't closed when you come up here, was it? No, come to think of it, I wondered about that. But now, Mac... Usually, when I go into Vegas, like tonight, I close it. But you know something? Tonight, I clean forgot. All right, Mac, get to the point, will you please? Well, the point being that I did lock up the gate when I come off the highway just now. Oh. Eh, and I clean forgot to tell that fella I locked it after I fixed his turn. Wait a minute, Mac, wait a minute. You mean he can't get back on the highway? He sure can't. And he can't break down that gate? (laughs) Not without wrecking his car. All right, then. That's what I was worrying about on the way up the hill. All right, now listen. Should I go back on down and let him out or not? Would you listen, But then I remembered that bulge in his coat pocket like a gun. It was a gun, all right. Yes, sir. And my instinct told me... I don't care what your instinct... Told me I'd better get back to the mine and telephone the county police on account of maybe he'd been prowling around my mine. Look, Look back. You've got a phone at the mine? Son, I got everything up there. Electric How far is it? On this road? Ooh, about three miles. All right, then listen. But listen. walking, walking across that ridge, ooh, not more than a half mile. Good. Can you make it on foot? <laughs> I ain't been wandering around these hills the past 41 years for nothing. Then, brother, go to it. Huh? Buster and I will take the jeep. Well, now, You go son. up to the mine and call the police. Tell them to set up roadblocks, whatever they want to do. And stop a 1956 Chevy. It's gray and white, license CGJ 158. You got that? Sure. CGJ 158, a gray and white. Now, look, Mac, now, I'll wait. pay you for the use of this Jeep. Anything you like, 50 bucks, 100. Oh, yeah? He's not kidding, Mac. Huh? You sure? You know him, Buster? His word's as good as mine, better, and, and he's kind of a lawman. Oh, well. Uh, now, why didn't you so tell get me... get on that... up there to that mine. Yeah, Best please. You can. Will tell you... the police what happened to us. Give them that description. 1956 Chevy CGJ 158. That's the car the crook is using. Got it, got and it. And you then go to it. All right, Buster. Come on, One Buster. more Yeah. Right. <laughs> and you better let me drive. Okay, okay. Sir. Okay. Now, hold on to your seat, and I'll show you how one of these things can really take these roads. What do you mean? You've only hit the road every 20 feet so far. Hold on, Johnny. You ain't seen nothing. Buster wasn't kidding. And Max's old Jeep would have put a mountain goat to shame. To this day, it's a wonder to me how he ever held the thing together. To say nothing of how we managed to stay aboard. You think 90 miles an hour on the open road is a thrill? You should try 20 per on that old wagon trail. 
Hey, wait a minute. Wait, nothing. We gotta catch up on that guy. No, what I mean is, how'd you ever know the make and license of his car? There wasn't enough light when he stopped us to see a thing. Why do you suppose I put the car into reverse when we started? Huh? Doing that turned on the backup lights. Backup lights? Sure. Gave me a good look at his car in the rearview mirror. Johnny, you're all right. Oh! Hey, how much more of this is there? We ought to get to the gate any minute. The gate? Buster, we ought to be shot. What's the matter? Oh, Mac didn't give us the key to that gate. We'll be locked in as well as that man. Well, you don't think he's just going to be sitting there, do you? Oh, yeah, you're right. He'll have to go on to his own car on foot. Which gives us more time, Johnny, to pick advantage. Now, look. No, you look. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Either he didn't see the gate or he tried to plow right through it. And look what it did to that nice car. Come on. Okay. Over this way, Buster. All right. Stay out of the Jeep's headlights. Circle around. He may still be in that car. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Okay, we'll take it easy. And pick up a rock or two. I'm way ahead of you, brother. I don't see any sign of him. No. He's probably hooping it down the highway to his own car. We're going to take no chances. All right. That kind of his look for... Right easy now. Uh-huh. Okay. Now well, he's gone. Yeah. Oh, brother, what he's done to this car. Somebody's going to pay a pretty penny. The insurance company. But come on. We'd better light out after him. We'll use the Jeep. But, Buster, if this big car couldn't knock down we'll that We'll drive gate. off the road and cut through the fence if old Mac had a pair of pliers and a toolbox. Come on. <laughs> There were pliers in the toolbox, all right. And a pair of wire cutters, too. But it took us longer than it should have to find a place where even the jeep could navigate through the fence. Finally, though, we got out on the highway. All right, not too fast, Buster. If he's still on foot, I want to be sure we see him first. You know what I'd like to see? What's that? The lights from a couple of patrol cars coming this way. You think they'd have time to get there? Even if Mac phoned him right away? Yeah, that's true. With our little pal with a gun. We ought to come on his car pretty soon. Unless he's already got to it and taken off. I just don't think so, Johnny. He'd try to move too fast in his heat, he'd collapse. Must be somewhere along this highway. Hide, maybe. Under one of those storm bridges along there. No, no, I think he's too smart for that. With a racket like his, he has to keep moving. Maybe he's bummed a ride back to his car. He's on his merry way again. Well, we'll soon find out. The place he stopped is right ahead on the curve behind that hill just beyond that next bridge. All right, then take it easy, will you? Yeah. Maybe we ought to stop the other side of this bridge. The long about here. Buster, yeah? there was something underneath that bridge. Looked like a car. Well, your eyes are deceiving you now. Let's stop right here. Let's keep going. What? Now what? Just keep driving until you get to my car. Get it. Why don't you put that thing down? Listen, how did you get in the back of this jeep? While you two bird brains are prowling around the cab there at the gate playing detective. Uh, pretty smart, aren't you? That's right. Like I told you, that's how I keep alive. There's more than I can say for you boys. What's that mean? Pull up. There's my car. Pull up right beside it. Now, look, miss. Don't argue with them, Buster. Okay, here's your car. All right, now. Give me those keys. Come on, come on. Yeah, and you kill your headlights. Kill them. Okay. Now, look. Things got balled up tonight. I I got held up too long. Now, I heard you say something about getting word to the cops. So I got to get out of here. I got to get out of the state. I don't know how you guys got the jeep away from that crazy old man. I, I, I didn't plan on you getting down off that mountain before daylight, see? But it's too bad you did. Oh, you sure? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Because I didn't take a chance on you getting away now. I can't. Especially you, Mr. Private Eye. Well, thanks. That means you think I might find some way to get the police on you in a hurry. Yeah, that's right. Maybe I have. Ah, no chance. Before I leave here, you're gonna be dead. From this... You're out of your mind. Yeah, Buster, I think he is. Oh, yeah? Oh, stop waving that gun. One shot, just one shot, and you'll be dead so fast. Oh, yeah, wise guy, how? You know, Buster, I was right. Huh? What, Johnny? There was a car parked under that bridge back there, a police car. You're crazy. Oh, why, yeah, Johnny, I see what you mean. What? What do you see? You don't think you're the only one who can hide in a back seat, do you? What are you talking about? Old Mac must have really got that phone call through in a hurry. What are you talking about? That officer there. Oh, that old bluff. The officer waiting there in the back seat of your you're car nuts. with his gun aimed straight at your head. Oh, yeah? Well, there. Oh, oh. Oh. Wow. Boy, that... 
That took a lot of nerve, Johnny, and throwing that rock in his windshield when he turned was just enough... Hey, where'd you get that rock, anyhow? <laughs> For some silly reason, I've been hanging on to that rock ever since we started down the side of the mountain. Silly reason, huh? Not by a long shot, no, sir. Oh, and what do you know? Here comes a patrol car. <laughs> the one you were supposed to see hiding under that bridge. Hey, you know something, Buster? I really did think I saw a car under there. Oh, no. No, no, really, honest. I think I saw it back there. Expense account total, hold your head, Pat, including incidentals and in my fare back to Hartford, $528. And that includes 50 bucks to old man McKinney for the use of his Jeep and eighty-one fifty for the repairs to Buster's car by way of thanks for his help. The car rental agency will present you with its own damage claim on the cab. Oh, and of course the windshield on that Chevy will have to be replaced. You see, it was also insured with one of your companies. So, Pat... You can just charge off this case to recovery of that car. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a small round piece of metal, a coin. Face value, 50 cents. Insured value... $20,000. $20,000. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Barney Phillips, Chet Stratton, and Junius Matthews. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. The count's three to two and the bases are loaded. And Ted Williams is at bat, huh, McGraw? Oh, Johnny, how'd you know it was me? Oh, just psychic, I guess. What's on your mind, Bert? Fellow named Henry Sampson. Ever hear of him? Mm, name's familiar. Well, it should be. He owns about half the newspapers in the South. Which means he isn't exactly struggling for money, huh? Right. In fact, he collects it. Figures. Especially Confederate money. Well, anybody can... What? Yes, sir, Johnny. He has one of the largest collections of old coins in this country. Oh? And a Confederate half dollar he owns has disappeared. Bert, Confederate money isn't worth its weight in salt. That's where you're all wrong, Johnny. Huh? This particular half buck is insured for $20,000. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Providential Assurance Company, 393 Dewey Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Confederate coinage matter. Expense account item one, a dollar and twenty cents taxi from my apartment to Bert McGraw's office. He was seated behind a haze of cigar smoke, reading a magazine. Oh, Johnny, come in, come in. Hey, morning, Bert. Uh, sit down. I was just reading about an old teammate of mine. Oh, who's that? Bob Feller. Feller? Yeah, he was a pretty fair country pitcher. Of course, he wasn't in my class. Of course. Yeah. Many's the time I had to help old Bob out of a spot. Yes, sirree, Bob. That boy could get himself into more jams. Well, I remember... I didn't know you played with the Cleveland Indians, Bert. What? Well, I... (coughs) Blasted cigar. (coughs) You've been reading up on baseball, Johnny? No, but I remember Bob Feller, who doesn't. In 1940, I saw him pitch a no-hit, no-run game for the Indians. Oh. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. You and me, we must be talking about two different fellers. Yes, sir. That's so? Why, sure. This Bob Feller that was my teammate, he played ball for the Apalachicola Alligators. Yes, sir. Good old Bob Feller. Spelled it F-A-L-L-E-R. Feller. Yeah. 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 Now, Johnny, about this Henry Sampson thing. His secretary called here just before I talked to you. Told me the coin had been stolen. Well, now, what makes that particular coin worth 20000 Bert? Well, like I said, it's Confederate money, a silver half dollar, and where it was minted or something, that's what does it, I guess. Where was it minted? New Orleans. Now, during the whole time of the Civil War, that mint only turned out four half dollars. How come? Well, how should I know? I'm only going by what's on Sampson's original policy application. But you're sure about there being only four of those half dollars? Well, no, I'm not sure. You mean you've never checked? You insured the thing on Samson's say-so? Well, Johnny, uh, look, we were glad to get his business. Well, you must have been out of your Oh, mind. now stop balking, Johnny. You want to know how come that mint didn't make any more of them? You go ask him. I plan to. Where'd you say he lived? Right outside Birmingham, place called Shade Mountain. Expense account item two, $107, air transportation, Hartford to Birmingham, Alabama. I claimed my luggage and was about to step into a cab when I was approached by a man of about 30. Crew cut, Brooks Brothers soup. Mr. Dollar? Yeah, that's right. My name is Kopeck. Michael Kopeck. I'm Mr. Sampson's secretary. Oh. Yeah. Your Mr. McGraw was good enough to tell me the time of your arrival. Are you all ready to go to Zora? Zora? According to the Bible, it was the village of Sampson. Oh. Oh, yes. Only I'd like to check into a hotel and freshen up a bit first. That is, if you don't mind. Mr. Sampson would mind, sir. But look, I've been... He instructed the... me to assign you a room in the guest house. I'm sure you will find it more than comfortable, Mr. Dollar. This way, please. Just outside, standing in a no-parking zone, was the Sampson limousine. A uniformed chauffeur took my bag, and about 40 minutes later, we passed through the gates of Zora, Sampson's private domain. Beside the main house, there were two guest houses, two swimming pools, a private zoo, stock farm, turkey ranch, and a number of cottages for the servants and maintenance people. Inside the main house, Kopeck led me down a long hall lined with statues and oil paintings and other art objects. Finally, he stopped and opened a heavy door. Henry Sampson was seated behind a large desk, and standing near him was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. Mr. Dollar, sir. Thank you, Michael. I'll call when I need you. Yes, sir. Well, Johnny, come in. Come in, sir. You had a pleasant journey down, I hope? Yes, fine, thanks. Good, good. Would you like a sample of our southern hospitality, Mr. Dollar? Well, I, uh... Uh, Forgive me, my dear. Johnny, this is Mrs. Sampson. Delilah, Mr. Dollar. Mrs. Sampson. In case my question confused you, Johnny, I meant would you like a drink? Uh, no thanks, not just now. Let the man catch his breath, Delilah. Now, Johnny, let me get on my feet. I I can't give you more than ten minutes of my time. So, let's get right down to business. This here's a display case that was broke into. Mm Mm-hmm. None of your other coins were taken, huh? No, no. Whoever did it knew what they wanted. They got the most valuable one. What about this lock? Was it tampered with? Wouldn't have done them no good to tamper with it. It's the biggest and strongest that Yale makes. 
Reckon he knew that. That's why he broke the glass. Then you think someone familiar with this room and your collection took the coin? If you want to know the truth, he suspects me. Delilah. Um, Mr. Sampson, did anything unusual happen that evening? Did you have any visitors? None. Delilah and I ate our supper. I worked for a couple of hours, same as always. Then we played casino till 10.30. We always play casino until 10.30, John. It's the only thing that relaxes my husband. I see. There were only four people beside myself in the house. Mrs. Sampson, Mary, her maid, Digger, my manservant, and Michael, my secretary. Good old Michael, the trusty troubleshooter. Mr. Sampson, according to your policy application, only four of those Confederate half dollars were ever made. Is that right? Yes, it is. Confederate states didn't have any silver bullion to make more. Dirty Yankee blockade. Yeah. Uh, could you give me a description of the coin, sir? Sure. Originally, it was a regular Union 1861 piece. At the New Orleans Mint, they ground off the reverse side and, and stamped on the shield of the glorious Confederacy... In the words, Confederate States of America. Hallelujah. May the South rise again. Now, that's not funny, Delilah. I think it is. Don't you, Johnny? Well, I'm just... Uh... You just give me your answer later. Right now, I'm going to have another drink. You ready? Not yet, thanks. No, you don't know what you're missing. You'll have to forgive my wife, Johnny. She isn't herself this evening. I haven't been myself in several years. Not since I married this evening. You woman. shut up, woman. Michael! Michael! Yes, sir? Mrs. Sampson is tired. Very tired. She wants you to take her to her room. Yes, sir. Hmm. Well, see you at supper, Johnny. I'll have your supper sent up to Don't you. Don't do me any favors, fat man. Get her out of here, Michael. Get her out before I... I... I'm sorry, but she sometimes... It's all right, she... sir, I understand. Do you? Good. Good man. Now then. Oh, that's better. Now, about the coin. President Jefferson Davis gave it to my great-grandpappy... For his service to the cause. Are you sure of its value? Sure it's worth 20000 Why, shoot, boy. My grandpappy turned down 10000 foot back in 1879. The way things are now, <laughs> he's got to be worth four times that. Well, what's the matter? Don't you believe me? Why didn't say that? Well... Then what are you looking at me so suspicious for? Well, Mr. Sampson, I have a hunch you're holding out on me. Johnny, you're getting paid money to find the person that took it. Now, you earn your pay. I'll try to. Only I'd appreciate some help. I'll give you help. In fact, already have. Like how? Like the gates to Zora. I've kept them locked ever since it happened. And until you find that coin... Nobody leaves here. Those gates stay closed. A few moments later, Kopeck returned and escorted me across the magnolia scented grounds to my rooms in one of the luxurious guest cottages. I unpacked, took a shower, then called Bert McGraw in Hartford. Well, how's it going, Johnny? It is not. Oh, come on now, boy. Sorry, Bert, but it looks like a real toughie. You don't want me to send in a pinch hitter, do you? Nope. But how about getting the dust off your pants and doing some legwork? All right, what kind of work? Find out for sure how many of those 1861 half dollars were ever made and what their value is today. Wait a minute. What'd you say, John? Not you, Bert. Somebody at the door. You check on that coin, got it? Like the Yankees have the pennant. Good luck, boy. Okay, I'm coming. Yeah. Mr. Dobbs. Yeah, that's right. I'm Mary Williams, Miss Sampson's maid. And I'm Digger. Everybody just calls me old Digger. Uh, he's Mr. Sampson's man. We we snuck off and come over here to see you. Oh, well, come in, please. Thank you, sir. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you. 
sure hope nobody saw us come in here. Well, uh, what's this all about, Mary? Mr. Darla, being an insurance investigator, you work for a company instead of the police, is that it? Yes, the company I'm working for now is in Hartford, Connecticut. Way up north. Oh, that's good. Mr. Darla, Digger here, he's just scared to death. Scared of what? If you'd be here a while, you'd know. Yeah, you sure would. Well, can't you tell me? Mr. Sampson's got a big place here. He he needs lots of folks to keep it up for him, and, and he gets them cheap from the prisons. What? Yes, sir. Somebody finds out who's going out on parole, the next thing a man knows, instead of being all the way free, he's here working for Mr. Sampson. Yes, sir. And, and if and he don't like it, Mr. Sampson has him sent back. Oh, come on now. Look, this is 1957. Things like that just don't happen anymore. Tell him, Digger. Well, Mr. Dollar, sir, I don't want to go back to that place. No, sir, I don't ever want to go back. Oh, it's all right, Digger. Mr. Dollar, we wouldn't have bothered you at all, except that we, Digger and me, that is, we want to get married. That's right, yes. But if he's sent back to prison, well, well, he's already spent 15 years there. And you're afraid that Mr. Sampson is going to send him back? Yes, sir. Mr. Sampson or, or somebody else around here. But why? Well, come on. One of you say something. Well, sir, I, I ain't going to tell you. Nobody else, Mr. Dollar. No, sir. I won't tell no matter what they do to me. I won't tell unless you give me your word. Unless you promise me. Promise you what? That you won't let Mr. Sampson or nobody send me back. You give me your word on the Bible, I'll tell. Yes. Well, come on. Tell me what? Well, sir, I... Mr. Dollar... Digger knows who took that half dollar piece. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. The American writer Christopher Morley once wrote, When you sell a man a book... You don't sell him just 12 ounces of paper, ink, and glue. You sell him a whole new way of life, unquote. Now, that goes double when you give, not sell, a book. But the gift of 550 books to little children increases the legacy tenfold. Near the end of 1960, the employees of the Chase Manhattan Bank started a people-to-people -people program with such a gift to school children of a town in Tanganyika. That's on the southeast coast of Africa. And to give you an idea how the books were received by the children, let me first quote from Francis Bacon. He's an English writer of a few centuries back. He said, Some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few to be chewed and digested. In the past, children in Tanganyika may have done a little tasting and chewing and a little swallowing and digesting. But there's one certain thing. They wound up devouring the books they received from the United States. And they did so much of it that they, the ones in high school anyway, were able to reach the level of English children their age and pass the exams at the same time. That takes a lot of book learning, as they say. Now, the gift of these books from the United States of America may have seemed a small thing to the senders, but the boys in Tanganyika who received them know that they've opened a whole new way of life. They've greatly increased understanding in the classroom of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Confederate Coinage Matter. <laughs> I wanted to help Digger, the Samson servant who claimed to have information concerning the missing Confederate half-dollar. But I couldn't promise him anything without first knowing more about the part he had played, if any, in the theft of the coin. I did promise to think over his offer and let him know if I was interested by the next afternoon. Anyway, at eight that evening, I joined Mr. Samson and Kopeck for dinner in the large dining room. After we'd finished our coffee, Samson rose and excused himself. Uh, 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 when you're ready... We got work to do, Michael. Yes, sir. Huh? See you in the morning, Johnny. 
Well, how is the investigation coming, Mr. Dollar? Have you found any valuable clues? Nope, not a thing. Oh, that's too bad. But you you haven't given up. Kopech, I haven't started. Uh-huh. Well, would you care for something else? If not... No, no, I'm fine. Then shall we be? Yeah, sure. Say, uh, tell me something, Kopech. Anything I can. What about the servants who were in the house the night of the theft? Digger and Mary? Yeah. What do you know about them? Everything that there is to know. I have a file containing the record on every one of Mr. Sampson's employees. If you like, I shall have the information on these two sent to your rooms. I'd appreciate it. Now, if you will excuse me, Mr. Sampson is waiting in the den. Uh, you can find your way back to the guest house? Hmm? Sure. Good night. Good night, Mr. Dahl. Johnny. Johnny. Hmm? Oh, Delilah. Well, where are you? Up <laughs> here. On the stairs. No, don't come up. Oh. Johnny, do you like to ride? Well, sure, only it's been a long time since I've had a chance to, and uh, I didn't bring any riding clothes. Well, that doesn't matter. Meet me at the stables before breakfast. You will, won't you, Johnny? What do you think? I went back to the guest house, and about half an hour later, Kopech delivered the files on Mary Williams and Digger. Everything Digger had told me was true. He had spent 15 years in prison on a manslaughter charge. So early the next morning, I crossed the green lawns of Zora and met Delilah at the stables. And a few minutes later, we were riding our horses away from the main house. Where shall we ride, Johnny? You want the cook's tool? Oh, I don't know. What's it include? Oh, the turkey farm, dairy, and zoo. Or would you rather go down to the river? Hey, you know, it's a funny thing, Delilah. What is? I've never seen a river. <laughs> you fool. Come on, I'll race. Come on, boy. Come on. Finally, when we reached the river, we dismounted. And she just stood there for a long moment, looking down into the water. Well? I guess I'm just reaching for something I can't have. Yes. You understand, Johnny? Why did you marry him, Delilah? His money. Only I was fooled. Or made a fool of. How do you mean? Well, he's a collector, Johnny. Coins and paintings and people. Well, hadn't you noticed? I'm just another one of his possessions with all the rights and privileges of a statue. And you know why Samson married me? Because my parents named me Delilah. Well, why don't you leave him? Oh, I'd need money, a lot of it. And I thought I was going to get some. But now... But now? Maybe I'll get another chance. And when I do... Johnny... Johnny, you keep in touch, huh? We rode on back, had breakfast... And I returned to my rooms in the guest cottage. Around 11 o'clock, I picked up the phone and called Bert McGraw again. Johnny, about time you called. Yeah, what'd you find out, Bert? Enough to know that I'm in trouble and you got to get me out of it. Trouble? What kind of trouble? That Confederate half dollar. Do you know what it's worth? Five thousand. What? But you insured it for twenty. I know it, but look, Johnny, it wasn't all my fault. I mean, well, how did Samson know about the dyes? What dyes? The dyes a man named Scott made five hundred of those half dollars from back in 1879. That's what lowered the price of the original half dollar. You mean there are 500 of those half dollars in existence instead of four? 504. The four original ones made in 1861, and the rest were made later. Well, looks like you're out 20 grand, Bert. Oh, don't say that. Unless. Yeah? Unless you're willing to let me try something down here. Anything, Johnny boy, anything. Even if it costs five grand? Well, you know what'll happen to me if the company has to take a loss of 20,000 for something worth only five. Johnny, please go ahead. Thanks, pal. I'll call you later. As soon as I could, I sent word to Digger and Mary, the two servants, asking them to come to the guest house. It was almost three o'clock before they arrived. Miss Dollar, have you decided on what you're going to do? Yes, Mary, I have. Digger. Uh, yeah, yeah, sir? I can't promise that you won't be sent back to prison. 
Well, then I ain't going to tell you nothing. Now wait, wait. Let me finish. But I can promise that I'll do everything possible to help you. Well, sir, I have to ask Miss Mary. You know, she's the one who talked me into coming to you in the first place. I did it as soon as he told me what he'd done. I didn't know about it till afterward, Mr. Dahl. All right. Just what did he do, Mary? Well, it wasn't his fault. He just had to break into that case and, and take that half dollar. Yeah, sir, that's right. I had to. Why? Because she said that she'd tell Mr. Sampson something real bad about me. Something that'd cause him to send me back to prison. She? Mrs. Sampson? Yes, sir. That's the truth, Miss Dollar. I swear it. I... All right, Dicker, go on. What happened after you took the coin? Well, sir, it all went like she said it would. I got hold of the half dollar and ran on down to the river. Late that night, I was on my way back to where I was supposed to meet Miss Sampson and give it to her. Well, sir, then I tripped over something and doggone if I didn't lose it. Oh, wait a minute. Come on now, Digger. You don't expect me to believe that. But it's the truth. Yes, sir. I had it in my hand, and when I fell, it flew out. And you can't find it? No, sir. No, sir. And I, and I looked and looked. There's a good reason why he can't find it, Mr. Dahl. Oh? Yes, sir. And you come with us. We'll show you. They showed me, and I had to agree there was a good reason. I told Kopech I wanted to see Mr. Sampson. While I was waiting for him, Delilah came down the stairs from her room. Johnny, I saw Digger take your suitcase out to the car. You aren't leaving. I will be in a few minutes. Well, I... Johnny, have you found the coin? No, not quite. But I know where it is. And I know how it got there. You do? Why did you do it, Delilah? Why did you make him do it? You ought to know by now, Johnny. I did it for the same reason I've done everything else in my life. For money. I thought I could use the money to get away from here. What do you do now? I don't know. It's up to him. You do have to tell him, don't you? Yes, Delilah. I'm afraid I do. There's no other way. I mean, well... Couldn't you say one of the servants... No, Delilah, don't you say it either. Okay, John. See you around, huh? Sure. See you around. Come in, Johnny. Come in. Honey, here you have news for me. Well, boy, start in. Tell me. I told him as simply as I could. When it was over, he got to his feet and stared out the window for several minutes. When he turned back, he ordered Kopeck to find Digger and take him to the place where the coin had been lost. A few minutes later, we joined him there. I can't believe it. This where you lost the half dollar, Digger? On the turkey farm? Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Sampson, sir. Here, uh... Right over there. Well, why didn't you get in there and find it? Well, I told Mr. Dollar how come I couldn't, sir. Well, Dollar? He couldn't find it because when he dropped the coin, one of those turkeys swallowed it. Dollar, what do you mean, one of those turkeys swallowed it? Well, sir, just what I said. Turkeys will eat anything that glistens or shines that's dropped near them. And since Digger was cutting across this field when he dropped the coin... But, but, boy... Do you realize there are 2,000 turkeys in there and any one of them could have my half dollar? The half dollar Jefferson Davis, president of the glorious confederacy, gave my grandpappy? Any one of them could have it stuck in his skinny redneck? Yes, sir, it certainly could. Well, good, good. Now, you just tell me. How do you propose to get me my half dollar back? You can't do it. You'll have to give me my insurance money. Yes, we know. That's why we're willing to buy the turkeys from you. What? Yes, sir. I'll give you $5,000 for the turkeys and guarantee to return the coin within 90 days, providing... Go on. Providing you allow Mary Williams and Digger to leave here and be responsible for the recovery of the coin. You mean... 
You're going to let them tend the turkey? I'm going to give them the turkey. What? Oh, Mr. Donald, you're a good man. Digger, well, you well, miserable... You... Hush up. Well, well, Dolly, you sly fox. Doggone. Doggone, boy. You just got yourself two thousand turkeys. A couple of weeks after I left Birmingham, I received a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Digger telling me that they'd found the coin in the craw of the bird they'd killed for their first Sunday dinner together. Which proves once again, miracles do happen. Expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford, $405.10. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the story of a tragedy that befell a sweet old widow and the very surprising results. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles B. Smith and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Eleanor Audley, Herb Ellis, Herb Bygren, Forrest Lewis, and Vic Perrin. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. John, this is Harry Branson of Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Well, hi, Harry. What is it this time? Fraud, murder, arson? No, no, none of them. Then what kind of a case has you in a dither this morning? As a matter of fact, John, there is no case. Oh, now, don't tell me you're spending company money on just a social call. Why, Harry? Of course not. John, I wish you to take a motor trip with one of our very important clients. Well, now, that depends. Perhaps you've heard of her. Betty Charlene Winters. Uh, no, but she sounds interesting. She is. She's one of the most charming people. Very wealthy, too. John, you'll love her. Oh, tell me more. I want you to accompany her to her summer place on Lake Wawayande in northern New Jersey. Sounds better all the time. On expense account, of course, plus a fee of $1,000 for the week or any fraction thereof. How can I lose, Harry? I'll grab the first train. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Wayward Widow matter. Expense account item 12150, fare and incidentals, Hartford to Philadelphia. At his office on Walnut Street, Harry Branson looked as though he'd been just sitting there waiting for me ever since his phone call. I'll get straight to the point, John. Well, good, good. You uh, don't mind if I sit down first, though, do you? Oh, no, no, of course not. Ah. As I told you on the telephone, Mrs. Winters is one of our... Mrs.? Mrs. You didn't tell me that. Her husband died just a short time ago. Oh, oh. And you, the old friend of the family, have been consoling the lovely widow, eh? John. Yeah, when you pick him, you really pick him, Harry. Hey, do you remember that little brunette you went for in the last case I handled with you? John, that has nothing whatsoever to do with the matter at hand. Yeah, okay, maybe not. Oh, but you sly dog. I'm betting right now you wish you could make this trip to the lake instead of me. Of course I do. The beautiful forests and mountains up there at this time of the year. Oh, sure. Just for the scenery. All right, now tell me all. Well, the Winters were very wealthy. Betty Charlene Winters still is. Thanks, among other things, to the half million dollars she received on her late husband's double indemnity policy. Half a million? You make this sound more attractive every minute. John, will you... You don't suppose the gorgeous babe helped him have an accident in order to collect that? John, you are being absurd. Am I? Tell me this. Was he older than she? Yes, he was. Uh Uh-huh. And two and two make four. And you are making no sense at all. Hey, you have got a case on her, haven't you? Will you please stop this nonsense and listen to me? Now, as I started to say, their lovely home is out between Ardmore and Bryn Mawr. All right, go on. Their home, which Mr. Winters inherited from his father and his grandfather before him, is a veritable art gallery. I see. But she is going to dispose of most of it to the better-known museums and galleries. She plans to sell the family mansion, too, just as soon as the estate is settled. Doesn't go for the old stuff, huh? You're quite right. Her taste is, uh... More for the modern. Uh, That's the way I like them. Uh, I beg your pardon? Mm, Nothing. Go on, Harry. Uh, Yes. Some of the things, however, she is taking up to the summer home on Lake Wawayanda. Oh, well, now, wait a minute, Harry. Am I taking Betty Charlene up there? Mrs. Winters, John, please. Okay, I'll stay out of your territory for the time being. But am I being hired to take her up to the lake or just some of this junk you've been talking about? Both. Ah. You see, there's one thing in particular, some statue or other, that she wants help with. Statue, huh? So you and she and the statue will make the trip. Now, that's the kind of chaperone I like. When do we start? Uh, I must confess it's quite a relief to get out of that office for a while. Oh, don't try to kid me, Harry. The only reason you wouldn't let me find my own way out to this winter babe's home... Babe! Honestly, John, you sometimes carry this levity much too far. By the way, how long ago did her husband die? About, um, four months ago. Oh, brother, you don't even wait for the ashes to get cold, do you? John, I tell you that... What did he die of? Well, it, uh, it was an accident. Yeah? In the car during a little trip that they were making south of here. He'd taken over the wheel from the chauffeur. They struck the abutment of a bridge over a tidal creek leading out to Delaware Bay. Oh, He was thrown out, and his body was carried into the bay. It was never recovered. And so our tasty little dish was left with a quarter million life insurance, a huge estate... John, I simply will not listen to any more of this sort of nonsense. Besides, this is the driveway up to the house. Ah, lovely place, isn't it? It was lovely. There must have been over an acre of perfectly tended lawns and gardens. And in the middle, atop a slight rise, was the main house, built of solid white stone of some sort. Old, too, but in beautiful condition. This was wealth, all right, and plenty of it. Harry's year-old car looked almost tawdry in this setting. We stopped, went up the broad front steps and across a wide porch and rang the doorbell. Yes? Oh, Mr. Branson. That's right. Uh, Mrs. Winters is waiting for you in the sunroom. Thank you. Come, John. The butler led us through a large reception room, a huge living room. Both of them hung with beautiful prints and paintings through the walnut panel library with its high ceiling and hundreds of leather-bound books. Finally, after passing through a long corridor lined with statues and magnificent vases, we entered the spacious sunroom. There, standing in front of a chair at the window, was a chauffeur. And in the chair sat Betty Charlene Winters. Mrs. Winters, may I present special investigator John Dollar. Well... She was a cute little thing, that I will say. But instead of a young, blonde, and beautiful... 
let's face it, she was 70 if she was a day. All my dreams of a high old time during a week at a mountain lake suddenly vanished into thin air. How nice of you to come, Mr. Dollar. Investigated, did you say, Mr. Branson? Yes. I see. Well, don't just stand there. Sit down and be comfortable, both of you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Is something wrong, Mr. Dollar? Uh, no, no, uh, not at all. Oh, Haskins, here's my chauffeur and general handyman. Hi, Haskins. Mr. Dollar? I've just asked him to get the statue ready for our little trip. Uh, you may go now, Haskins. Oh, thank you, madame. Uh, no, wait, please. I, uh... I wonder if I might see this thing we're taking up to the lake, Mrs. Winters. Well, of course it's right there in the corner behind you, Mr. Dollar. The cherub. Cherub, huh? Oh, I... This? Isn't it beautiful? Well, it was a cherub, all right. Uh, about four feet high with a couple of doves fluttering around its feet. At least that's what I gathered from the garish paint on it. Believe me, it looked like something a third grader had slapped together as a joke on his modeling class. Now, I'm no artist, but so help me, I could have done better myself with a handful of mud and with my eyes closed. No family peak, Mr. Dollar. Antique. I started to say what I was thinking, but then Haskins lifted the atrocity off his pedestal and left with it. Haskins has made a special box for it. He'll place it in the car so we can leave with it tomorrow. You are ready to leave on such short notice, aren't you, Mr. Dollar? Well, uh, now look, Mrs. Winters, yes. I, uh... Yes, his luggage is right outside in my car, Mrs. Winters. Then, Eric, you may fetch it and put it in one of the guest rooms. Uh, very good, madam. By the way, I hope you know how to drive a Pierce Arrow, Mr. Dollar. Pierce? Or did you think perhaps Haskins would drive us up to the lake? Well, I, I don't know. No. Haskins is leaving today on his vacation. And I wonder if he will come back. Why do you say that, Mrs. Winters? Oh, I've been having some trouble with him. Oh? I thought you were always eminently satisfied with Haskins. Until recently. Until the death of my husband. He's been... Well, if he doesn't come back, I shall have to replace him. But now, Mr. Branson... Yes? You're a bit of a rascal. You didn't tell me you were bringing a detective... To go along with me. Investigator, Mrs. Winters. Insurance investigator. Since the company wouldn't permit me to issue any special insurance on that... that thing... But I, I thought you were going to bring me just some stroll. My bodyguard. I have known John for many years, Mrs. Winters, and I assure oh, you... Oh, now, don't apologize. I think this is fine. I just hadn't expected so much. Such a nice, good-looking young... But now come, Mr. Dollar, and I'll show you the rest of the house. We spent the next hour or so on a tour of the place. And Mrs. Winters pointed out the various works of art destined for specific museums and galleries all over the country after she moved out, after the estate was settled. Then Eric caught up with us and announced that Haskins had created the statue and placed it in the car. You know, I was curious about that car, so we went out to the garage and inspected it. It was a Pierce Arrow, all right. Vintage of 1928, complete with headlights on top of the fenders and as bright and shiny as the day it was made. When I tried the starter, it purred like a contented kitten. Uh, with a bass voice, that is. Along about five o'clock, Mrs. Winters, with a sparkle in her eye, announced it was cocktail time. Harry, being a teetotaler, decided to leave, but not before I buttonholed him for a quick conference. What doesn't make sense, John? Oh, that silly statue, Harry. All the fuss over that piece of junk. After all, John, with all the big policies she carries with us on the legitimate artwork, well, we just can't afford to displease her. But if it had any real value... Perhaps it does to her. How can it? Unless she has a lot of jewelry hidden away in the base of it or something. Hmm. What, John? A cocktail, she said. And I'm sure ready for him. Go on back to Philly, Harry, and wait for my final report. Well, I must admit that Betty Charlene Winters turned out to be a charming hostess, a very interesting conversationalist. Even long after dinner, over brandy and cigarettes, we chattered away like a couple of magpies. I didn't question her about the statue because I wanted to find out more about it on my own hook. Finally, about midnight, we decided to retire, had a nightcap, and went to our respective rooms. But instead of going to bed, I sat around and read for a few minutes, turned off the light, waited a few minutes more. Then, quietly, I slipped out of my room. That was a mistake. For as I reached the end of the long hall to the stairway, a door behind me suddenly opened. 
Huh? Who's there? I said, who's... Oh! Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. With the bigger, more impressive kaleidoscopic change of events on the world scene today, we sometimes forget the smaller kaleidoscope, the child's toy, with its ever-changing designs and color. The kaleidoscope is a fantastic experience for any child. That is, any child who can see. But one of those children who cannot experience the ecstatic pleasures of form and color in the ever-changing world about them, this problem has bothered many. And many such people have tried to solve it. One-time soldier in the United States Army, Robert Neiman, is one of them. Captain Kenneth Moyer, also of the Army, is another. Both men, while stationed in Japan recently, set about the task of raising funds for the purpose of providing eye examinations and operations for sightless Japanese children. In return for this gesture, Japanese eye surgeons did not charge for their services. For those children who could not be cured... Braille typewriters were purchased and donated for training purposes in the hope of giving a few more people useful lives. Both Neiman and Moyer worked independently of each other. Neither knew of the other's interest in such a gratifying project. Both have continued the work with enthusiasm. The results of their efforts, when a blind child sees again or perhaps for the first time, that is their reward. For a child, as for an adult, new sight leads to understanding. And understanding is a building block of freedom. The right of all men. Everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Wayward Widow Matter. When I came to, it was morning. And I found myself in my pajamas lying comfortably in my bed in the guest room. But there was nothing comfortable about the lump on the back of my head. Whoever had slugged me out there in the hall had meant business. I got up painfully, went down the hall, and made a quick check of the room from which the attacker had surprised me. It was just another guest room. I showered, dressed, and went downstairs, where I found Mrs. Winters at the breakfast table. She was very much distressed over what had happened and suggested we go out and look in the trunk of the car immediately. There, now... Do you see, Mr. Dollar, the box with the statue in it hasn't been touched. I don't understand it. Where is your chauffeur, Mrs. Winters? Well, Haskins left on his vacation last evening. I thought I told you. But surely you don't think Haskins... Well, you said you were having trouble with him. Maybe we'd better open that box to make sure oh, that... but it hasn't been touched. And I'm the only one who has a key to that little lock on it. Yeah, I see. But now it's pretty logical to assume that whoever slugged me last night was interested in... Hey, Mrs. Winters, how long has Eric, your butler, been with you? Why, Eric, the dear boy, has been with me for nearly 30 years. But good heavens, you surely don't suspect him of anything like this. He's a very fine person, Mr. Dollar, and a perfect gentleman. Oh, certainly more of a gentleman than my late husband ever was, in spite of his money. Oh? I must confess that although his death was a terrible shock, I... Well, life has been a great deal easier for me since he passed away. Just how do you mean that, Mrs. Winters? No, well, why talk about it? Something that... Oh. Oh, why not talk about it? I married Charles for his money, Mr. Dollar. I'd never got any further than the front line of the chorus until he came along. Would you believe that I was a chorus girl? Well, as a matter of... And the wealth and the luxury that he could give me was very attractive. was very satisfying for a long, long time. But for the past 10 or 15 years, maybe more, he insisted that we just stay penned up in this musty old museum he called a home. And what happened? Well, all our friends were traveling around the world, seeing new places and new people. We just sat here looking at four walls and at each other. Except for a couple of blessed months up at the lake. You love the place up there, Mr. Dollar. It's new and fresh and modern. I had it built over his protests. People, young people came to see us, and it was such a relief from a... Oh, well, I'm sorry. 
This must be so boring for you to hear. Not at all. Now, look. Why don't we call the police in about this thing that has happened to you? Come, we'll go right back into the house and wait we'll a minute, call... Wait a minute, no, let's not. A bunch of policemen prowling around would scare him off, whoever he is. But suppose you're attacked again. Well, at least I'm ready for it now. I just don't like your taking this chance. Of course, we could leave. Go up to the lake. Run away from him? Well, yes. Oh. Of course, it might prove whether he's interested in the statue. If he follows us, I mean. Oh, dear. Why don't you let me call the police? Only if you think they ought to be around here to protect the house while we're gone. No, no, that isn't necessary. We have a very efficient burglar alarm system. Well, it doesn't look as though it was working very well last night, does it? Unless it was someone in the house who attacked me. Who else is there besides you and Eric? No one, except the cook. Male or female? Oh, no, no, Mr. Dallin, not Martha. Why, the poor dear is nearly as old as I am. And a real companion for me. Sounds strange, I know. But we're real nice friends. All right, let's go back in, have our breakfast, pack our things, and go on up to the lake. Eric, who served the breakfast, and whom I hadn't seen since dinner last evening, kept giving me a rather strange look. And as soon as breakfast was over, I quickly stuffed my things into my handbag and headed down to the garage. Eric was waiting for me there. He insisted that he put my things into the trunk of the car, which killed any chance I might have had to pry open the box with a statue. I started to question him about the night before, but as it turned out, my questions were quite unnecessary. Uh, yes, Mr. Dollar, it was I who carried you back to your room and put you to bed. Oh? You see, I was making a final inspection of the house, as I always do after everyone else has retired. I'm always concerned about the many valuable things we have. I don't blame you. Well, I was on my way up the main staircase when I heard you fall. I was slugged. Uh, forgive me, sir, but uh, when I found you there at the head of the stairs, I thought your condition was due to... Uh, uh, you must pardon me, sir, but... Was due, perhaps, to having imbibed too much brandy after dinner? Not a bit of it. Somebody barged out of that guest room and struck me from behind. But I saw no sign of anyone else about. You're sure? Most certain, sir. Was this fancy burglar alarm system you have turned on? Yes, sir. Well, then whoever did it either stayed in the house until this morning or knew the place well enough to get out without setting off the alarm. But I don't see how that would be... Have you called the police, sir? No, and we're not going to. Mrs. Winters and I are leaving for the lake just as quickly as possible. Uh, but don't you think this is sufficiently serious to warrant... Don't forget one thing, Eric. It was pretty dark in that hall. The attack might have been intended for you. Good heavens... But why, sir? I don't know. Oh, dear. Oh, there you are. Eric, you may fetch my bags from my room on. Mr. Dollar and I planned the trip. Uh, very well, madam. Oh, you don't know how glad I'll be to get there. It's such a relief from this place. And all the things associated with it. I'll be so glad when Charles' estate is settled and I can sell this old house and just Martha and I can stay at the lake. Oh, I know all the paintings and things are all very fine and valuable. But I'm so tired of looking at them. Well, then why do you take this so-called... I beg your pardon, this statue up to the lake? Well, this is different. Oh, yeah, I'll grant you it is a bit different from the other things that... Oh, well, let's talk about it along the way. But we didn't simply because I didn't bring up the subject again. Why not? Because a couple of pretty wild ideas had begun to peck away at the back of my brain. Ideas just crazy enough to have some basis in fact. The 1928 Pierce Arrow ran like a dream in spite of its advanced age. And Mrs. Winters, in spite of her advanced age, kept the conversation going at a merry clip. There was a sparkling, almost buoyancy about her. And the hunch that had hit me began to grow. We crossed the Delaware River at New Hope on Route 202, and in Lambertville, we stopped at the sign of the Flying Red Horse to gas up the car. That's item 2470. While the attendant was busy with that and checking the tires and battery and so forth, I made some excuse or other and stepped around to the telephone booth at the back. Harry Branson here. Harry, I want you to drive out to the Winter's home at Bryn Mawr again. Oh, what for? Just do it, right away. Then call me up at the lake. Well, whatever you say, John, but I wish you'd tell me... Gotta go now. Goodbye. The rest of the trip through the pretty North Jersey countryside was uneventful. 
And finally, north and east of the little town of Andover, we came to Lake Wawayanda. We drove along a private road to the far end of it, and there, perched on a little cliff above a deep basin, was a real smart, modern brick-and-glass home. Right. Straight up the little hill in the park in front of the garage. Little hill? I just hope we can make it. Right here. I hope the brakes will hold. Or this thing could roll right on back into the lake. Oh, and the lake is so deep right there. Nearly a hundred feet. An old mine or something before the water came up. Oh, well, this is a pretty dangerous driveway. Here now, let me help you. Thank you. One of the first things I'm going to do is have this driveway built up and leveled off in a big stone wall built around. Yeah, you'd better. Careful now. This is pretty steep. Oh, listen. Yeah? The telephone is ringing inside the house. Oh, well, let me have the key and I'll go in and answer it. For you. I'll answer it. You can unpack the car while I do. I suspected the call was from me, but didn't want to say as much. So I opened the car trunk and proceeded to take out the luggage and the big clumsy box for the statue. The box was heavy, very heavy. And I wondered how Haskins, the chauffeur, had been able to pick up and carry the statue so easily back in Bryn Mawr. I finally got the box perched on the edge of the car trunk when Mrs. Winters called to me. It's for you, Mr. Dollar. It's Mr. Branson. Oh, okay, I'll take it. Leaving the box there on his precarious perch, I went on up to the house. Here in the front hall, Mr. Dollar. Oh, all right, thanks. I'll go on out to the car and get my coat first. Yeah. Johnny Dollar. John, this is awful. Terrible. As I just told Mrs. Winters, this is... Well, I, I couldn't believe it. But how, how did you know? How did I know what? Eric, the butler. Yeah? Dead. He's dead. And John, dead I... Dead from what? How did he die? He apparently fell down the main staircase. The poor cook, Martha, is the only other person in the house. She's beside herself. Yeah, I'll bet she is. But whatever made you suspect something was wrong out here? Call the police, Harry. Make sure they look for a possible blow on the head that might have been delivered before he fell. Mr. What? Dollar! Mr. Dollar! It's going to fall! Uh, so long, Harry. Oh, dear. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Oh, dear. Ah. Uh. Fell off the back of the car, huh? Yes, the big box. I must have bumped it when I reached into the trunk for my weekend case. Bounced right down into the lake, huh? Yes, my beautiful little statue is at the bottom of the lake. Oh, well, don't worry, Mrs. Winters. We'll get it back. I'll have a diver come up here. No. No. It's all right. We'll leave it there. Huh? No, no, you were right. It'd only be another memory of the musty old house in Brenoir. It really has no place here where everything is so fresh and new and clean. We'll get it back. But it really had no actual value. You were right, Mr. Dollar. It's better to just... Yes, we'll leave it there. Sorry, Mrs. Winters, but that's where you're wrong. Why, Mr. Dollar... We'll get it back, all right. And whatever's in it. Oh, dear... I suppose I might have known. Expense account item three, $290 even for the diver who came over from New York and retrieved the box from the deep hole in the lake. Two boxes, as a matter of fact. One with Haskins' body in it, and the other with the body of Charles Winters. The body that was supposed to have been washed out to sea after a car accident. The story... Well, of course. After Haskins got rid of Charles for me, I had to do something about him. Or rather, we did. Martha, you know. He's such a wonderful friend. Was Haskins the one who slugged me? Yes, yes. So foolish of him, wasn't it? But he'd heard Mr. Branson say you were an investigator and it frightened him. Worried me a little, too. Well, he might have killed you, too, if Eric hadn't stopped him. And, of course, Eric knew that Haskins had unwittingly made the second marks for his own body. So now Eric's gone. Martha, huh? Yes, she did it. But she had to put him away. Oh, yeah. You see, he was the one who took care of Haskins for us. And we couldn't have him around knowing everything. Oh, dear. Martha and I had planned so many wonderful things together. But now... Oh, dear. Mm-hmm. 
expense account total, including incidentals and transportation back to Hartford, three hundred sixty-five fifty. Remarks? Well, I'd rather not say how I feel about a case like this, Harry. A whole crime wave by a couple of apparently sweet old ladies. The legal procedures, and there'll be plenty of them, are up to you and the company, as well as recovery of the insurance paid on poor old Charles Winters. Hey, next time, give me a case that doesn't turn my stomach, will you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a taste of the Old West and a taste of lead from a 38 Colt. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Eric Snowden, and Frank Gerstle. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Joe Walters speaking. is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Time now for Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny Universal Adjustment Bureau. Hi, Pat. What's new? At the moment, Cooper's Bend, Nevada. Never heard of it. Neither did I till this morning. They're having a big celebration out there, Frontier Week. So what do you want from me? A beard? It might help if you started growing one, Johnny. And how about a ten-gallon hat? You got one of those? Oh, sure. And my horse is tied up in the bedroom. Now look, what's this all about, Pat? From what I can gather, Cooper's Bend was just a sleepy little western town dying on its feet. That is, until last week. So what happened last week? A publicity man named Bill Williams organized this Frontier Week to uh, wake the town up. I guess somebody out there doesn't like being waked up. What do you mean? Oh, looks like somebody's trying to put Bill Williams to sleep. The hard way. I'll be right over. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the killer's brand matter. 
Expense account item one, a dollar twenty. Cab fare from my apartment to the office of Universal Adjustment Bureau. Fred McCracken was waiting for me. Not too much to go on, actually, Johnny, but I figure it's worth your taking a trip out to Cooper's Bend to see what's what. One of the companies we represent is a hefty policy on Bill Williams' life. Who is this Bill Williams? What's he do? Uh, little of this, little of that, I guess. Sort of a fly-by-night type. Freelance publicity, that sort of thing. Now, you suggested over the phone that there'd been an attempt on his life out there. Well, at least somebody took a shot at him. Oh? You have any idea who? No. That's what I want you to find out. Could have been an accident, Pat. Maybe somebody got carried away during oh, the celebration. Oh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, Johnny. Even during Frontier Week, people in Cooper's Bend don't stay up that late. Okay. Where do I find Williams? There's only one hotel. You look for him there. And, Johnny, yeah? watch yourself. Some of those characters out there can shoot pretty straight. And one of them is pretty riled up about something. Shoot straight? He missed Williams, didn't he? Oh, yeah. The first time. Expense account item two, $187.50. Incidentals and transportation by plane and a rented car to Cooper's Bend, Nevada. The town was baking in the sun when I arrived in the middle of the afternoon. Aside from the fact that there were cars parked on the main street instead of a string of horses, the place could have easily passed as a set for a western movie. A saloon, a general store, one weather-beaten hotel, the works. I kept wanting to go around behind the buildings to see if they were real. There was even a big horse trough in front of the hotel. I stopped for a moment to take a look at it, and that was my first mistake. <laughs> Suddenly, I heard a crowd hey. banging down on me. Come on, let's get him. Hey, look at him, a real dude. I'll ah, lay off him. This is kid stuff. What do you mean, lay off of him? You know the frontier we grew. Hey, look, look, what's this all about? Come on, mister, off with your shirt. My shirt? Now, uh, just I a minute. I partner. Anybody on the street without a 10-gallon hat during frontier week gets sunk in the horse trough. Yeah, well, look, I just got into town. How am I supposed to know the rules? Well, this is one good way of finding them out, stranger. Hey. Anybody want to sell me a 10-gallon hat quick? Too late, buddy. Well, he's got a sense of humor anyway. I want to help you off in your shirt, stranger. Okay, okay. That's it. Now, just take it easy, partner. Take it easy. <laughs> Welcome to Frontier Week, Marjorie. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Item 3, 50 cents. Replacement of three buttons on my shirt. I bid a fond farewell to the horse trough committee and went to the hotel to find Bill Williams, the publicity man. He wasn't there at the moment, but the clerk told me I might find him at the newspaper office. That was three doors down the street, the Cooper's Bend Sentinel, no less. Bill Williams wasn't there, but for the moment, I didn't miss him at all. Oh, hello. Well, hi. You must be Miss Cooper's Bend Frontier Week. Ha, uh-huh. ha. You run the paper? Wrong again. I just work here. Well, I'm not doing very well so far, am I? Oh, I don't know. Don't give up. Oh, I won't. Uh, my name's Johnny Dollar. Uh... Lois, Johnny. Well, I'm looking for a guy named Bill Williams, Lois. Do you know him? Yeah, I know. Where can I find him? Well, this is as good a place as any. He ought to be here soon. Last I saw him, he was with Fred Kirby. Kirby? The editor of this paper. The two of them were all wrapped up in further plans for our glorious Frontier Week. I gather Frontier Week doesn't appeal to you. It's a two-bit idea, like everything else about this town. Oh, here's Fred. This is Johnny Dollar, Fred Kirby. Oh, thanks, but we've already met. Mr. Kirby was one of the boys who helped me take a swim in the horse trough a couple of minutes ago. <laughs> All in fun, Mr. Dollar. Part of Frontier Week. Yeah, sure. Kirby, I'm looking for Bill Williams. Oh, he's out making some final arrangements for the rodeo this afternoon. He ought to be back in a few minutes. Okay. Any place I can get a cup of coffee while I'm waiting? Oh, sure. Four doors down the street. You can't miss it. I'll show you where it is, Johnny. Fine, thanks. Um, I, uh, I thought you had some, uh, work to get out, Lois. It'll keep. You don't mind, do you, Fred? Oh, no, of course not, Edgar. Well, take your time. As we left, I could sense an undercurrent between Lois and Fred Kirby. And I could see his point. Matter of fact, though, undercurrent was too mild a word for Lois. Item 320 cents, coffee for Lois and me. You gonna be in town long, Johnny? Oh, it depends. How long does Frontier Week last? This is the last day. Oh. Rodeo this afternoon, dance tonight. That ends it. Then the town goes back to sleep, huh? Probably. I won't be here to watch it, though. Oh, where are you going? Away. As far away as I can get. For long? For good. Well, how about your job? 
You mean the paper? That's a job? I think I can get along without it. How about the editor? Can he get along without you? Fred Kirby? Sure, why not? I don't know. I thought he'd... Where you been, Lois? I've been looking for you. Having a cup of coffee, obviously. This is Johnny Dollar, Dan. Dan Biggers, Johnny. Owns a ranch near here. Darling? Hi. I look, Lois, about the dance tonight. What time will I pick you up? Oh, I don't know about the dance, Dan. I don't know if I'm going or not. We're going to go, Lois. Look, Dan. I said we're going to go. Oh, for heaven's sake. Thanks for the coffee, son. Lois! You know, Biggers, if you don't mind my saying so, that approach doesn't seem to go over so well with her. Yeah? Well, I do mind your saying so. I don't need any advice from you. Okay, okay. And just for the record, Lois and I are engaged. Oh, congratulations. Don't get funny with me. Oh, now, easy, Biggers. Simmer down. You simmer down, Dollar. What do you mean? I mean, stay away from Lois. Are you kidding? So I bought her a cup of coffee. Anything wrong with that? You heard me. Stay away from her. One thing about Lois... She sure had the knack of stirring people up. The news that she was engaged to Biggers was quite a surprise, though, and I wondered if she was as eager about it as he was. If so, she didn't show it. But all of this wasn't getting my job done, which was to find out who'd made the attempt on Phil Williams' life. I went back to the newspaper office, and pretty soon he came in. He turned out to be the gent who'd supervised my dunking in the horse drop. Well, you're probably not feeling very kindly toward me at the moment, Dollar. Why not? You come all the way out here to protect me and get thrown in the trough right off the bat. I, I didn't know who you were. Look, you better get yourself a 10-gallon hat so it won't happen again. Don't worry, I'm going to. As I understand it, Williams, this Frontier Week was your idea. Yeah. Yeah, I was driving through here on my way to Frisco a few weeks ago. The town was dead on its feet, but I could see the possibilities of waking it up. So I cooked up this scheme, the town went for it. How come you were so interested in waking the town up? For the dough, what else? I get 10% of the gross on the rodeo, dance, and other celebrations. I figure to get close to a 1000 out of it, and frankly, I can use the money. I see. Well, how about this attempt on your life? Come on. Now back, I'll show you. Show me what? My car. There it is. Take a look at the windshield. Yeah. Bullet hole. Mm-hmm. How did it happen? I was driving along the road just outside of town the other night, and all of a sudden, whammo! And I got a pretty good idea who did it. Oh, the rancher, Dan Biggers. Oh, why? I smiled at Lloyd. Oh, now look, touchy as big as is about Lois, that's not enough reason oh, for Oh, wait, you. wait, she smiled back at me. Is that all there was to it? Of course it was. You think I'm crazy or something? The trigger-happy Biggers is so jealous of her he can't see straight. I'm not stupid enough to get mixed up in anything like that. Yeah, he's jealous, all right. Lois and I worked together at the newspaper office on some of the publicity for Frontier Week. Biggers didn't like that. Speaking of the newspaper, do you know the editor very well? Oh, Fred Kirby? Uh, I met him when I first came here, is all why. He's been keeping an eye on us through the window ever since we've been standing here. Oh? Huh? You think he might be interested in Lois? It wouldn't surprise me. He makes that job of hers on the paper pretty easy for her. After all, it wouldn't be hard to be interested in Lois. No, no, I'm sure it wouldn't. Well, you'd better quit driving around the roads at night, William. Don't worry. Ever since it happened, I've been staying right here in town at night with the bright lights. I think I'm home free now anyway. Yeah? The dance tonight winds up, Frontier Week. Tomorrow noon, I get my share of the dough, and then I'm leaving. Yeah, Lois mentioned something about leaving town then, too. <laughs> yeah, she used to make noises about leaving when we were working together. I doubt if she means it, though. I think she's just trying to get Biggers riled up. That isn't hard. Now, wait a minute. Hmm. Remember now, she said it once in the office when Fred Kirby was around. What was his reaction? He didn't say anything at all, but he, he gave her a real funny look. I see. Well, I got to go make the final arrangements for the dance tonight. You going to be there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, Williams, you better keep your eyes open. Don't worry. Since that attempt on my life, I sprouted eyes in the back of my head. Oh, and speaking of head. Yeah? You better get yourself a 10-gallon hat. Very good advice. I had no desire to get dunked again. I started across the street toward the general store, then realized my mistake. There was the reception committee again at the horse shop. I had to get to that store fast. I almost made it, too. Sorry, fellas. Oh, well. Expense, item six, 15 bucks for a too-late ten-gallon hat. The dance was in full swing when I got there. I didn't see Lois the figures. Looks like he didn't get that date after all. Pretty soon I spotted Williams near the bandstand. When he saw me, he came over. 
Third crowd, Dollar. There are more people in Cooper's Bend tonight than ever heard of the place before Frontier Week. Man, I'm really going to clean up. I stayed around a while watching Williams happily counting noses and adding up his 10%. Then I went back to the hotel. There was a message there from Lois. She wanted to see me. This I didn't get, but she left word it was important. She's also left directions for getting to her house, so I drove out. It was outside of town on a back road. The lights were on. But nobody answered my knock. I waited a while and tried the door. There was a fire burning in the fireplace, and the room looked very cozy. All except for one thing. Lois. She was lying in front of the hearth. And she was very dead. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. For a long time, people have been saying that the earth is shrinking because transportation is getting faster and faster. And because this is true, people are getting closer, too. Today, our neighbors are not only the ones who live next door to us. They're all over the world. It is axiomatic that one should help his neighbor. But Americans have gone a step further. In addition to individuals helping individuals, now many American cities help many other cities through the Sister City program. Now, perhaps you've heard how it works. If not, here's an example or two. In the fall of 1959, a large area of Nagoya, Japan, was struck by a devastating typhoon. Her sister city, Los Angeles, California, sent tons of relief materials to Nagoya by way of an Air Force plane headed for the area. The Marines and the Navy rendered vital emergency aid during the disaster. When earthquakes shook Villa del Mar, Chile, during the summer of 1960, her sister city, Sausalito, California, spent hundreds of dollars worth of relief materials to help out. Another case in point, the school children of Clovis, New Mexico, sent a number of cultural exchange packages to students in their sister city of Adana, Turkey. There are hundreds of such examples because there are hundreds of sister cities. By using this means of diplomacy, friendship and understanding have increased throughout the world and paves the way for permanent freedom. The right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the killer's brand matter. Lois, dead, lying on the floor of her living room in front of the fireplace. There was a poker near her hand that had been pulled out of the fire and scorched the rug. At first, that's what I thought she'd been hit with. But then I took a closer look and see she'd struck her head on the heart. There were signs of a struggle in the room. Then, suddenly, I heard a noise outside. I ducked into the next room, found a side door, and eased outside. I listened. Nothing. Then I heard the car. By the time I got around in front of the house, it was just disappearing around the bend in the road, running without light. It looked like a station wagon, but that's about all I could make out. I went back into the house and put in a call to the sheriff. He arrived about 20 minutes later. Okay. Looks like there was a fight. She got thrown down, hit her head on the heart. Yeah, that's the way I sized it up. Now let's size you up for a minute, Dollar. Me? You mind telling me what you were doing here tonight? I don't know. Oh, come on, come on. No, I mean it. Lois left a message at my hotel that she wanted to see me. You don't know what about? No. Except it's a good bet this killing ties in somehow with that attempt on Bill Williams' life. Williams thinks it was Dan Biggers took that shot at him. Yeah, that's right. Well, it could be. Dan's always been awful jealous. I had trouble with him once before for the same reason. Oh? A month ago, he beat up a guy pretty bad. On account of Lois? Yeah, yeah. Seems the guy had asked Lois for a date. Trouble was, Lois never discouraged guys asking either. Hey, look, Sheriff. Lois told me earlier today that she was planning to leave town tomorrow. Now, if Dan Biggers learned about that... Yeah. Well, come on. we better drive out to his ranch and have a talk with him. There's the gate, Johnny. 
ranch house is up on the rise. Yeah. No lights on up there. You think Dan might have cleared out? Hey! Came from that clump of brush over there. Hold it right where you are, Sheriff. I've got you covered. Now, don't be a fool, Dan. You drop that gun and come out of there. I said hold it. Had to take me in, huh? Well, I'm not going just now, Sheriff. Look, Dan. First, I'm going to find out who killed Wallace and take care of him. Then you can question me all you want. Very interesting you should know about the killing already, Dan. I can think of one reason you might. Yes, I can, Dollar. I was in town when the call came in. One of the deputies told me about it. I figure it differently, Dan. You found out Lois was going to leave town tomorrow. Lois, leave? You're crazy. That's what she told me. She'd never do that. She'd never leave me. You tried to stop her. She grabbed a poker and swung at you. You threw her down on the heart. That's a lie, you hear me? Dan, you're acting like a fool. Now, now give me that gun. I'm not coming in now, Sheriff. I can put these shots where I want to. Don't make me put him in you. Okay, Dan. You got the drop on us now, but I'm coming back. And I'm going to take you one way or another. You know, Sheriff, I can't help feeling kind of sorry for Dan. Yeah, he always did have a knot in his brain where Lois was concerned. You really think he killed her? I don't know. Dan's pretty smart sometimes. That routine he was just giving us might have been a cover. Sheriff, you happen to know if Dan drives a station wagon? He drives a pickup around town mostly, and I think he's got a coupe, too, but no station wagon. Why? That's what I spotted pulling away from Lawson's house. He didn't get the license number? No, it was running without lights. Not much help, Johnny. There's a lot of station wagons in this part of the country. <laughs> Expense account had to make one dollar, two drinks for me, while I tried to put some pieces together. However much I shifted them around, they still seemed to add up to Dan Baker. But somehow I wasn't convinced. If he was the killer, why hadn't he taken off? Of course, maybe he figured he couldn't very well leave his ranch. So I went round and round again and ended up nowhere. I started thinking of other possibilities. Bill Williams, for instance. I'd seen him at the dance, but he could have left for half an hour and nobody would have missed him in the crowd. But why? I couldn't figure any motive for him. And then I thought of Fred Kirby, the editor. Yeah, he might be worth talking to. So I went to the newspaper office. Kirby and Bill Williams were there. Any idea who killed her, Johnny? I don't know, Williams. That's what I want to talk to the two of you about. I'll bet anything it was Dan Biggers. What makes you so sure, Kirby? You saw him around, Lois. You know the way he was. Question is, if he did it, why? Lois said she was leaving. Maybe he couldn't stand any idea. He claims he didn't know she was planning to leave. Well, that's a lie. Oh, is it? I heard her tell him once right here in this office. You know, it's quite a coincidence. What's that? Lois was going to leave town tomorrow, Williams. So were you. You uh, weren't by any chance going to leave together now, were you? Now, look, G-Man, I told you there was nothing between us. You think I'm a jerk to go fooling around with her knowing what Biggers was like? Sure, she kidded me about, uh... Uh, well, what was it, Kirby? Hitching a ride to Frisco with me? Yeah, here in the office once. Williams just laughed it off, and that's all it was to it. Hey, wait a minute. If Biggers happened to hear about it... Yeah, maybe. No, Dollar. I was smart enough not to get involved with her. Matter of fact, I guess I'm one of the few guys in town who can make that statement. Hey, you don't have to talk that way about her. I'm sorry. I guess I'm tired. There you go, turn in. I'll see you in the morning, Dollar. You'll be around, huh? Yeah, to pick up my money. Night. You know, Kirby, you're trying pretty hard to pin this on Dan Biggers. Why? Because I think he did it. He didn't want Lois to leave. There's someone else didn't want her to leave either. Who? You. What? You've been carrying the torch for Lois quite a while, haven't you? What's that got to do with it? And what business is it of yours? I think it all ties in. Well, I didn't kill her if that's what you're thinking. You drive a station wagon, don't you? So what? After I discovered her body, I spotted a station wagon leaving her house. But a lot of guys drive station wagons around here. I wasn't near her place. I... Why, well, didn't use the wagon at all tonight. You're lying. Now, look, Come Dollar. on, open up, Kirby. Well, I... Okay, Dollar, I... I drove out to her place to try to talk her out of leaving. Go on. Well, that's all there is. When I got there, I changed my mind and came back to town. Sure. I didn't go inside, Dollar. I didn't kill her. I swear it. <laughs> I 
I called the sheriff, and he took Kirby in for further questions. But by morning, he hadn't changed his story. Oh, he admitted being at the scene of the murder, but that's all he'd admit. He was still a big question mark, and we were still nowhere. The sheriff went out to Bigger's ranch again, hoping Dan would give himself up peaceably, if he knew Kirby was in custody. I had a cup of coffee and went outside. Bill Williams was in front of the hotel. Anything new on the killing, Johnny? Well, you know Kirby was being questioned. Yeah. Surprised me at first, but then I got to thinking, you know, he's a strange guy, he doesn't say much, but there's a lot going on inside, particularly about Lois. Yeah, yeah. Did you get your cut of the dough from Frontier Week, all right? Yeah. Well, I'm sure glad it's over. That killing last night turned the whole deal sour. I'll be glad to get the taste of this town out of my mouth. Uh-huh. When are you leaving? I told the sheriff I'd be around in case he wants me for further questioning. I'll leave when he says the word. There he is. There he is. What's with the crowd heading this way? I don't know. Okay, well, we got it last. What are you talking about? You ain't wearing your ten-gallon hat, and that sure looks like a horse trough you're standing next to. That's right. Now, what? Frontier Week is over. You brought that in the first place. We thought you'd like to try it. I'm in no mood for jokes this morning. I'll lay off. No, not this morning. I'm sick of the whole idea. I said lay off, and I mean it. The crowd broke up and drifted away, and the street went to sleep again. But all of a sudden, I woke up. I thought of that hot poker I'd found lying near Lois's body, and a couple of things added up fast. Sure, it was a wild idea, but it was worth a chance. A bunch of jerks. Hey, you know, Bill, when I first arrived in town, you ducked me in this horse trough because I wasn't wearing a 10-gallon hat. Yeah, it was part of Frontier Week. Well, you're not wearing a hat now. Look, like I told those guys, Frontier Week's over. I still want to return the compliment. Am I going to have trouble with you too, Dollar? I guess you are, because I'm going to duck you in that trough. Take off your shirt. Now, look, stay away from I me. I said take it off. Get your hands off of me. What's the matter? You afraid to take it off? What are you talking about? Let go. I said let go. What do you know? A nice big burn on your chest and on your arm. A few scratches, too. Lois did that just before you killed her. Branded you. Okay, smart boy, there's a gun in my pocket and it's pointed right at you, so just relax. You were a lot more involved with Lois than you were letting on, Williams. Why did you kill her? I was trying to shake her. She wouldn't shake. She wanted to go with you, huh? Yeah, and that would have been just great, dragging a... Well, dragging something like her with me to San Francisco. That's a real sweet thing to say. I suppose you said it to her, too. That's when she grabbed the poker. Come on, Dollar, we're getting off the street. Now move. My hand was beside the horse trough. I scooped the water right into his face. The shot went wild, but his chin was wide open. Yeah, Bill Williams got ducked after all. Expense account item 10, $183.50. Transportation and incidentals back home. Total expenses, $528. Remarks. About Dan Biggers. He really wasn't such a bad guy. Except that, like the sheriff said, he had a knot in his brain about Lois. He sold his ranch and moved away. About Bill Williams? Well, you better cancel out his policy, Pat. He's due to go on trial soon. And in my book, he's a pretty bad risk. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Oklahoma's state flag depicts an Osage warrior's circular buckskin shield from which hang seven eagle feathers. Across the shield is the Indian's calumet, or pipe of peace, crossed with a white man's peace symbol, the olive branch. On the shield are small crosses, the Indian's graphic sign for stars indicating lofty ideals or a purpose for high endeavor. The background of the flag is a field of blue, the blue of the Oklahoma sky signifying loyalty and devotion. The important symbols, however, are the calumet and the olive branch. These override the shield, the symbol of war, and bespeak a predominant love of peace by a united people. Oklahoma's state flag the flag of the 46th state to enter the Union was adopted on April 2nd, 1925. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. 
Next week, a terrible storm that yields up a body from the deep. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Fred Larkin, Johnny. New Jersey fire and casualty. Hope I didn't get you out of bed. Well, you sure did, Freddy, but how are things in Trenton? In Trenton, fine. In the little town of Vineland, I'm not so sure. Vineland? About halfway between Philadelphia and Atlantic City? That's the place. What goes down there? Fire. Arson? That's what I hope you can find out. Well, uh, any reason for suspicion? Yes. The man who holds the policy on $83,000 worth of bedding. Bedding? Mattresses, box springs, it went up in smoke two days ago. Okay, Fred, I'll grab the first train. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Jersey Fire and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Trenton, New Jersey. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Smoky Sleeper matter. Expense account item one, 1075, fare and incidentals, Hartford to Trenton. Item 280 cents taxi to Fred Larkin's office on West State Street. He lost no time in getting right to the point. That's right, 83,000 total loss. Well, who's filed the claim, Fred? Name is Ben Murray, sole owner and manager of Ben Murray Furniture Sales in Philadelphia. Sort of a small chain scattered around all over the city. I thought you said the loss was in Vineland. It was. That's where he had a big warehouse. Well, if his stores are in Philly... He claims it's cheaper than maintaining a big warehouse in the city. Also, apparently, it's close to a couple of sources of supply. He's been a good account, Johnny. We've made a lot of money on his policies. Well, it sounds like you've issued him quite a few. Well, we have. You see, in addition to the usual coverage on his stores, we've issued him a lot of short-termers on warehouse contents from time to time. I don't quite see what you mean. Uh, His whole business is based on special sales. Free inventory, going out of business, distressed merchandise, fire and water damage sales, summer, winter, spring, and fall sales. Anything you can think of. No kidding. Periodically, he loads up his vinyl warehouse with stuff he's accumulated for the next big sale. And we insure it. This time, it was $83,000 worth of box springs and mattresses. Wow, that's a lot of betting for just one sale. Eh, Don't worry. He'd have got rid of it. His salesmen are the sharpest bunch you ever saw. Too sharp, if you ask me. Almost like a bunch of con men. You know what switching means in the retail trade? Isn't that when they advertise a well-known item at a very low price? That's it. Then when you try to buy it, they just uh, happen to have sold the last one. That's it. But by that time, they've got you in the store where they can use the high-pressure pitch to sell you some inferior item at an even higher price. And on a no-return basis. Yeah, by the time the customer gets wise, it's too late. Exactly. I suspect they're not above using the label switch, too. You know, have some local manufacturer make up a cheap item, then put a nationally recognized label on it, or a pretty good copy. My, my, what nice clients you have, Freddy. Well, what can we do, Johnny? As long as we don't catch them red-handed in something that directly affects us. Well, you don't need to write any more policies. Well, the company says different. At least until such a time as they try to pull something on us. Or we find proof of such doings. I see. Well, where will I find this, Ben Murray? Either his main office in Philadelphia or down in Vineland. Looking over what's left in the shell of that warehouse. On what exactly does Murray base the amount of his claim? Face value of the policy. Which, in turn, was based on the cost of the goods to him. Huh? You mean you used the figures he gave you? Mm-hmm. Hardly. We got the figures from the actual bills sent him by the manufacturer. Well, I wondered. I don't blame you. 
No, Johnny, that 83000 is exactly what the mattresses and box springs cost him. It was a special order from one manufacturer, made up especially for one big sale. Can your secretary check on Murray's whereabouts for me? Sure. All right, then let me use your phone. I may be able to save us all a lot of time, labor, and soap. I call my old friend Adam Bowles, who lived within a few miles of Vineland, who, before he retired, was one of the top arson men in the country. Investigator, I mean. He wasn't home, but I left word for him to drive to Vineland and meet me in the lobby of the East Landis Hotel whenever I got there. Meanwhile, Fred's secretary had learned that Ben Murray was in his Philadelphia office. Expense account item 3560 for a train to Philadelphia and cab to the main office of Ben Murray Furniture Sales. The place was a madhouse. Okay, Dollar, go ahead in. It's that first office on the right. Thanks. And listen. Oh, wait a minute. Sales department, call me back. I'm busy. Listen, Dollar, if you can get a word in edgewise with Ben, ask him where's the contracts for that West Philadelphia deal, will you? Oh, sure. Sales department. Yeah? I'll turn a hose on some of that stuff and call it a flock sale. Look like that. Make the picture in that advertisement look good, see? Put a lot of stuff around. Pictures on the wall, rug on the floor, stuff like that. Yeah, make the suckers think they're getting a 25-piece dining room suit, not just a table, four chairs, and 20 crummy dishes. Dollar, sit down. Thanks. Yeah, make it look like they'll be getting everything they see in the ad. Yeah. Now, did you get them sofas in from Sterling? Okay. Put a price ticket of 95 bucks on them, and then mark it down to 49.95, and we'll clean out the whole... Mr. Murray. Huh? He what? Sterling charges 25 bucks for those lousy sofas. Listen, we're giving them twenty-two fifty for them, except for the demonstrator we show on the floor, the good one. Who does he think he is telling me the price he's going to charge me? Oh, the lousy bunch of chiselers trying to hike the price on me. Holy, what a business. From the looks of that outer office, you've got plenty of it. Yeah, yeah, volume, Dollar. That's what does it. I work on a narrow margin, see? Oh. Yeah, sometimes I even lose money, just to keep the volume up. I got nine stores, see? They're all over Philadelphia. Hey, Ben. Yeah, what's the matter now? Hines Street wants to know the sale prices on those three grades of night cloud mattresses. What'll I tell them? What are the cost prices? All the same. Thirteen bucks a piece. Cost us thirteen bucks, huh? Well, price them at, uh, at, uh, thirty-nine ninety-five, forty-nine ninety-five, and sixty-nine ninety-five. Okay, Ben. Hey, Larry. Narrow profit margin, huh? And hey, now look, Dollar. Your card says you're an insurance investigator. That's right. Well, if it's about that fire I had down in Vineland a couple of days That's ago... That's exactly what it's about. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, oh, for... Yeah, what is it? Oh, yeah, well, listen. Hey, pick that other phone off the hook, Dollar. That noise is killing me, would you? Why not? I might learn something. Well, you tell him I don't care if he's the Department of Internal Revenue in person. Hello. We pay hey, the Ben, guys I like got him. a dame here and in the store found out that bed we sent her wasn't the same that? one she saw on the floor. Well, no. Wait we just a minute. I, uh, uh, she threatens okay. to go see the, the Better Business Bureau. Well, look, uh, this what isn't Ben. Huh? That's what I mean. Just hold on a minute, will you? Hold on. you tell that bookkeeper we got there, he either keeps the books the way I tell him, or either he... Well, look, I'll call you back, see? Did you hold that call for me, Dollar? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hello? Yeah? Yeah? Well, don't take any chances. Give her anything she wants. Give her the one she saw on the floor. Go out and buy her one, a good one. Just make her happy. Keep her from... Uh, from well, you know what I mean. Yeah. Troubles, troubles, troubles. Well, now, look, Dollar. You think there was anything wrong with that fire, you prove it. I'll give you this whole business. What do you think I am, a crook? I haven't said that. Yet. Then, then what's the idea investigating? Not you, but that fire. We always investigate when a claim this large is involved. Oh, yeah? Do it automatically. Look, I'm trying to run an honest business here. Just barely scraping by. That phone call just now. A customer ain't 100% satisfied. We make her satisfied. Oh, sure. To keep her from blabbing about the way you rooked her. Oh, look, look. Get out of here, would you? Can't you see I'm busy? I try to run a decent business here, and punks like you come in and... Oh, if I'm... Yeah, hold on. Look, you got some legit reason to investigate, Dollar. You come around then. Maybe I will. Now go on. Get out, will you? Gladly. Listen, Charlie. You tell him he tries to outsmart me, I'll sue him for every cent he's got. Expense account item four. $50 deposit on a drive-your-own car. I crossed the Delaware River Bridge and finally picked up Route 47 for the 35-mile drive down to Vineland. 
flat country, this, with plenty of beautiful trees and rich farmland and occasional cranberry bog. The soft smell of ripening peaches greeted me from the vast orchards I passed. It was all very pleasant. Certainly a complete contrast to the noisy, unhealthy joint I just left. And I could see only too plainly why Fred Larkin suspected arson in the warehouse fire. Sure. If a character like Ben Murray didn't resort to arson, he'd feel he was missing a good bet. Proof of arson, however, is a different matter. And not always easy to come by. That's where I wanted the help of Ed Bowles. But Ed hadn't got to the hotel when I arrived in Vineland. So I drove over to the police headquarters at 610 Wood Street, a block north of Landis Avenue, the main drag. There I found Sergeant Louis Tommaso, who'd been working on the case. Be glad to take you over there, Dollar. Just the other side of Chestnut Avenue. That's over south of town. All right, Sergeant. I'd like to see that warehouse, or what's left of it. Oh, there's plenty left of the warehouse. All metal construction. Come on. That in itself might make it hard to spot our... Dollar, we went over the... Lieutenant, Mr. Dollar and I are going out to the Benmer warehouse. We went over that place with a fine-tooth comb, both during and after the fire. Came up with nothing, huh? Nothing that would give any cause for suspicion. Sergeant, do you know a man by the name of Adam Bowles? I certainly do. He's been giving me a lot of help with this. You know, just to sort of keep his hand in. And he's found nothing? Not a thing. Of course, he's the kind that never gives up. Yeah. Well, let's get on over and take a look at that place. It was obvious that the whole contents of that warehouse was damaged beyond repair. And apparently the big steel building had been packed to the roof. I looked over some of the damaged mattresses very carefully. Sometimes with the aid of my pocket knife. And I learned some rather interesting things. Things that showed the best possible reasons for wanting to burn up a lot of merchandise like this. Hmm. Wow. Well, have you seen enough, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, I guess so. But I still want to talk to Adam Bowles. So let's go on back to... Wait Tom. a minute, wait a minute. Looks like Ed pulling up in that car there. Huh? Oh, well, so it is. Hey, Ed! What? Johnny! Yeah, well, hi, Ed. Sergeant, don't tell me you sent for a half-wit <laughs> like Dollar. Just here. a minute now, Stinky. Why, the greenest rookie on the force would get further Ed, than... I'll brain you. You two know each other. <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> Johnny, how are you, baby? Great, just great. You got my message, huh? Yeah, but I hereby inform you that, as usual, you got here too late. Oh, is that so? When I found out you were coming, I decided I'd better get to work, if only to show you up. <laughs> so I did, and I found out who started the fire. Well, I've got a pretty good suspicion myself. Who did it, Ad? Poor old Jerry Cumber. Who? Jerry? The old town ne'er-do-well? Yep, that poor, foolish old wino. Wow. How'd it happen? Oh, he was just wandering around that night, as he often does, with a bottle to keep him company. Found the back door of the warehouse open, thought he'd take a little nap, or rather sleep it off. He certainly had his choice of nice soft beds. Yeah. So he went to sleep with a lighted cigarette in his fingers. And there you have it. And a funny thing, Sergeant. Yeah? The only charge you can really hold the old bum on is being drunk and disorderly. And, of course, trespass. What? Well, you look it up. You'll see I'm right. As for you, Johnny, you can just go on back to your company and tell them to pay the claim. Oh, that's so? Yes, sir. Case is closed. At least for you. That's where you're wrong. Huh? After a couple of things I heard at the Benmer office, plus a couple of things I've seen here... Adam, I think this case is just starting for me. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. For a long time, people have been saying that the earth is shrinking because transportation is getting faster and faster. And because this is true, people are getting closer, too. Today, our neighbors are not only the ones who live next door to us. They're all over the world. It is axiomatic that one should help his neighbor. But Americans have gone a step further. In addition to individuals helping individuals, now many American cities help many other cities through the Sister City program. Now, perhaps you've heard how it works. If not, here's an example or two. In the fall of 1959, a large area of Nagoya, Japan, was struck by a devastating typhoon. Her sister city, Los Angeles, California, sent 
tons of relief materials to Nagoya by way of an Air Force plane headed for the area. The Marines and the Navy rendered vital emergency aid during the disaster. When earthquakes shook Viña del Mar, Chile, during the summer of 1960, her sister city, Sausalito, California, sent hundreds of dollars worth of relief materials to help out. Another case in point, the school children of Clovis, New Mexico, sent a number of cultural exchange packages to students in their sister city of Adana, Turkey. There are hundreds of such examples because there are hundreds of sister cities. By using this means of diplomacy, friendship and understanding have increased throughout the world and paved the way for permanent freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Smoky Sleeper Matter. <laughs> From the looks of things, the case was practically over. The fire at the warehouse full of box springs and inner spring mattresses had been accidental. And it looked, I underline that word looked, as though Ben Murray's claim for reparation to the tune of $83,000 was entirely justified. Ed Bowles, the finest expert on arson I knew, had produced the man who started the fire as proof. So, on the surface, there was nothing for the company to do but pay Ben Murray's claim. But I smell a rat, a big one. Expense account item 5, 75 cents for a person-to-person call to Fred Larkin and Trenton. Well, Johnny, if you're satisfied with Bull's conclusion that it wasn't arson, well, that's that. We'll have to pay off the claim. Uh, what if I could prove fraud? Fraud? What do you mean? Look, Fred, you told me you saw the bills, the manufacturer's bills to Murray, giving valuation on the bedding that was stored in that warehouse. Yes, I have photostats of those bills right here in my desk. But what... Good for you. Dig them out, will you? Oh? Why? Go on, go on. Dig them out, Fred, and read them to me. What if there was no arson? I failed to see what you're driving Look, will you do what I ask you? I'm trying to save your company some money. All right, all right. Ah, here now. Uh, Now, what do you want to know? Well, the labels on the remains of the mattresses I looked at at the scene of the fire, those labels indicated there there was a model called the Night Cloud Sleep Rest. And that checks with these bills. Now, let's see. Uh, There were... 3,500 mattresses called Night Cloud Sleep Rest. Well, forget the quantities. What was the manufacturer's price to Ben Murray on that Night Cloud Sleep Rest? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Johnny, they cost Ben Murray exactly twenty-five fifty apiece. And there's an equal number of box springs to match. Twenty-five fifty. That's right. But I overheard him say in Philadelphia that he only paid... Hmm. What, Johnny? Uh, nothing, nothing. What other models are on those bills? Uh, Night Cloud... Cloud Super Sleep. And the price? Uh, just a second. And look while you're figuring, you might be interested in knowing that the labels on that sleep rest indicated a retail price of $69 each. Some profit, huh? Ah, uh, here now. Johnny, the Night Cloud Supers cost Murray $26.20 apiece. Wow, hey. All right, I got it. And he claimed to be working on a narrow profit margin. Now, the Night Cloud Perfection Sleep cost him uh, $27.14 each. Good. Any more? No, uh, those were the only ones he bought and stored in the warehouse. All right. Now, give me the name and address of the manufacturer. Easy. Golden Bedding Corporation, Woodvine, New Jersey. Good. Now, one more thing. Can you think of the name of another big chain of furniture stores, you know, like Ben Murray's, only in uh, New York or Chicago or some other big city? Well, of course, there's Glauder Brothers in New York. Glauder Brothers. Only they're such a disreputable outfit that when they try to talk insurance with us... Freddy, we... that's all the better. Thanks a lot. Now, wait, Johnny. You still haven't told me... Oh, I will, Freddy. Don't you worry. I will. <laughs> Why I didn't get pinched for speeding somewhere along Highway 49, I'll never know, because I certainly didn't hold back the horsepower. Just short of the town of Tuckahoe, I turned off on 557, and then a few miles later pulled into Woodvine. Although it's a small community surrounded by farms that boasts a big hat factory, a couple of clothing factories, a vast, sprawling state institution, and on the far edge of town, the Golden Bedding Corporation's huge plant. I figured the best thing to do was put on a bull front and pull my way into the president's office. But any such tactics proved entirely unnecessary. Barney Glauder, huh? Uh, yes, Mr. Golden. Uh, but just Barney's good enough. Well, I should say it is, because you must be Barney Jr. I've known your papa for years. <laughs> Sit down, my boy. Would you like a cigar? <sighs> Why, uh, no, no thanks. You don't look like your old man, though. You know that? Not a bit. Of course, I haven't seen him since 42. <laughs> Barney Glauder. Yeah. <laughs> well, what are you doing in this part of the country, huh, Barney? Oh, um... Business? Uh, pleasure trip. Business, huh? It's 
the matter? We haven't had any orders from you people lately, huh? Well, up to now, I haven't really had anything to do with the business. <laughs> Living off the old man's million, huh? Smart boy. Did you go to college? Yeah, full four years. Yeah, that's the way. Smart boy. Now you are in the business. Buying, maybe? Well, if you mean from you, that depends. <laughs> if you're as sharp as your papa. How old is he now, huh? Pop? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, let me see. Yeah, how's your mama? Mama? She... Uh, look, Mr. Golden, if mm-hmm. you if you don't mind, uh, we'll talk business first. Huh? Yeah, chip off the old block. Sure, business always first. After maybe you come out to the house and have dinner, huh? Talk over old times, your family. Sure, maybe. All right, you go right ahead. Tell me what you want to order. A thousand mattresses and box springs, huh? Ten thousand? Anything you want, my boy, and at a good price. Well, like I said, that depends. Uh-huh. What kind of a deal, is that what you mean? Yeah. All right, I'll tell you. Your papa's a very smart man, you know that? He's a good businessman. I know what he's thinking, so I know what you're thinking. All right. If you want to give me a nice big order for a lot of merchandise, I'll name you a price that you... Listen, Barney, I've got such a good customer in Philadelphia these days, not mentioning any names, but you'll pardon me, I don't even miss your papa's business. Understand me? But to get your business back again, I'll make you the same type deal I give this man. For a firm order, that is. You understand? No cancellations. You'll, uh... You'll uh, pre-ticket the merchandise. That mm-hmm. is, uh, put the list price on the labels for me, uh, for us. Any price you say, regardless of the cost to you. Uh, look over here, my boy. The pictures of our merchandise here on the wall. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Night Cloud Perfection Street. Well, we'll put on any name you like. One should sound like some national brand, we'll think up a name for you. Not a bad deal. So far. And we make up as many models as you want. You know, we change just the ticking. They look different. All 196 springs, I personally guarantee it. Only 196? That's all you need, sure. Nobody can tell the difference. Except, of course, the demonstrators you keep on the floor to show the customer. <laughs> the demonstrators have 392 springs. Those you can jump on and bend them anything you like. Yeah, and the customer thinks that's the kind he's getting. What else? <laughs> I tell you, Barney boy, just as smart as your old man. Yeah. Now, uh, what about the price? Ah, the price. Now, Barney, this you can't resist. You understand, out here in the country... Low overhead, no labor problems, nobody snooping Yeah, around. yeah, I know. How much? Well, for you, my boy, how many? Well, uh, say uh, 10,000 units. 10,000 units. All right, I'll give you a special price. How much? Well, now, this depends on the ticking material. Hmm? You look here. See? First class material looks like twice the money. Go on. Plain blue and white ticking, that cost you, and remember, Barney, this is very special because of your papa and getting back his business, so at 10,000 units in this ticking, $14.93, and you never saw such a buy. That okay? Eh, strikes me as a little high. A little high? I'm not making a thing on it. Look at here. This, the fancy ticking, this is real class. $15.06 a unit. Now, you can't beat that. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, of course, Barney, my boy, if you want to order a few no, more... No, no, no. I, I, I think maybe I can do better up in New England. In New England? Who? Tell me who. Well... All right. All right. Now, look. I told you, I've got a big customer in Philadelphia. Well, all right. Never mind. We'll do it the same way for you we do for him, all right? On the books. How do you mean? Well, I mean fourteen ninety three cents, huh? Only what would you think if the bill I send you says twenty nine ninety six? hmm? Double? Mm-hmm. You'd make it look like I paid twice as much? So? Yeah. Yeah. For tax purposes, I'd only be showing about half the profit I was actually making. <laughs> Smart boy, Barney. Or, uh, suppose I insured the stuff for the amount your bills showed, and something happened to it. Well, there, that's huh? right, sure. However you want... Excuse me. Hello. Oh! <laughs> Hello, Ben. I was just thinking of you. I hear you had a lucky fire up there. What? Oh, no, not now. Listen, Ben, I've got a customer. I've got... No, I've got an important customer here. The son of a very dear old... What? Yes, he is. Yes. A blue shirt and a bow tie. Oh, no. Oh, no. Ben, I'll call you back. Mr. Dollar? That's right. Johnny Dollar. In person, Mr. From the Golden. insurance... Oh, no. Oh, no, no. Too no, bad no, Ben Murray's no. call interrupted our conversation. Oh, what have I said? That was a very interesting lot of facts you gave me, and I strongly suspect it'll not only put Murray out of business, but you too. 
And a lot of people you've been oh, dealing with. A dollar. Brother, I hate to think of what the Better Business Bureau oh, will do when they get hold of these facts. Bureau. To say nothing of the Federal Trade Mr. Commission. Mr. Dollar, listen to but me. But I have a notion it'll help to clear up one of the dirtiest chip rackets in years. There's no need Even to Even the long-suffering with... public understands this sort of shady operation when it's brought to their no, attention. not at all. As for the decent, Did legitimate you national firms you've been practically now, stealing from. Me, Dollar, will you please listen a minute? Yeah, go ahead. Business has been good. I've made a lot of money. Oh, now, wait Maybe a minute, you, you could use a little bit. You know, we'll call it the commissioner. Say $10,000. In cash, it wouldn't show. Gold and I wouldn't even spit on that kind of money. Oh, I could maybe persuade you. You couldn't persuade me to have any part of it. Brother, you've had it coming for a long, long time. And believe me, I'm going to see that you get it. Understand? Yes, Dollar, you make it... I understand. I understand you, too. You dirty crook. You faker. You liar. You cheating, dirty, conniving, chiseling liar. You ruined me, you hear? You ruined me. Yes, Fred? I'm afraid that your nice client, Ben Murray, based his insurance claim on a lot of values that didn't exist. On the hiked up prices. Hiked up to cheat you and the income tax boys. And if that is not right fraud, I'll eat my shirt. So you can just forget about paying that claim or any part of it. And I hope that you and the company will take whatever legal steps are necessary to put these guys out of business. Expense account total, including incidentals, and the trip back to Hartford, $130.49. And cheap at half the price. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Kansas state flag is dark blue, and in the center is the state seal, surmounted by a large sunflower, the official state flower. The seal reflects the history of Kansas, the train of ox wagons going west, for most of the great roads passed through Kansas. An Indian is depicted chasing a herd of buffalo, recalling the words of the official state song, Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam. For this truly was the home of the buffalo and Indian. The east is represented by a rising sun, and the promise of future prosperity is indicated by the steamboat on the river and the farmer plowing the field. Above a mountain range are 34 stars, for Kansas was the 34th state admitted to the Union. Over all is the state motto, Ad Astra Per Aspera, to the stars through difficulties. Kansas state flag, the flag of the 34th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 23, 1927. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the case of a girl who is willing to kill for money she didn't need. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Russell Thorson, Jack Edwards, Will Wright, Paul DeBob, Lawrence Dopkins, and Vic Perrin. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Bert Major, Masters Insurance and Trust. Oh, hi, Bert. What's up? Poor little rich girl in California wants to take out a $200,000 straight life policy on her husband with herself as beneficiary. A lot of dough, but not too unusual, if you can afford it. Effective in two weeks and hush, hush, a surprise. But who'd want to... Why? Exactly. Nice piece of change for the company in commissions or for her in payoff if she's playing that kind of a game. You talk like you don't know her. Name only. Deal was arranged pending through her lawyer in Los Angeles. Hmm. You could be out there in the morning, Johnny. All right, Bert. Who gives me the filling? Our agent out there, Roger Hackey. He'll meet you at International Airport. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Masters Insurance and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the poor little rich girl matter. Expense account item one, $280, round-trip plane ticket and incidentals, including sunglasses, Hartford to Los Angeles. I arrived, rested, ready, and right on schedule. Also on schedule was Roger Hackey, Masters Los Angeles agent who turned out to be a repressed comedian, become insurance salesman. Yep, I said to myself, that's Johnny Dollar, I said. You are Johnny Dollar, aren't you? In person. You Roger Hackey? In person. <laughs> you got the old feel, haven't you? Simpatico, we call it out here. <laughs> uh, have a nice trip? Yeah. Uh, good, good. Airplanes scare me. Don't like being up there in the wild blue yonder. Terra Verma is my dish of tea. <laughs> Slow but sure, they call me. Yeah, well, look. Now, I... if you just follow me, we'll jump in my jalopy, and I'll have you at the Beverly Hilton before you can say happy hooligan. You said. Huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, here we go. Cloud of dust and all that. The ride from the air terminal to the hotel was hot, silent on my part, and unproductive so far as the case was concerned. Roger Hankey kept up a running commentary on everything from bad actors to the Zodiac. It wasn't until I was settled in my room with drink in hand and shoeless feet propped up that I could get him to switch to the $200,000 surprise. Her name is Cynthia Durbin. Now, how much do you know about her? Nothing. Bert Major said you'd give me the background. Now, well, she's a strange one. You know what a chameleon is? Well, sure, a lizard that changes color, so what? So, that's the kind of a gal Cynthia Durbin is. At least she is now. You're losing me, Roger. Begin at the beginning. Now, well, you're the doctor. As the Siamese twins said after the operation, what's missing? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. How did you meet Cynthia Durbin? Well, she came into the office yesterday. No call, no appointment. There she was. Oh, what's she like? A trim. Real trim. And expensive. Just casually announced she wanted to buy $200,000 worth of insurance, huh? Well, not exactly. She started asking about various policies, you know, endowments, straight life, etc., and how and when they paid off. And she kept giving me the big eye and cross-leg routine. Hmm. She tell you anything about herself? Oh, didn't have to. I already knew. She's practically a fixture in the society section of the Sunday papers. Garden parties, opening nights and all that. Yeah, but only lately. Her husband? Peter Durbin. He's been a public figure ever since they got married about three years ago. But she hasn't. No, no, just the last couple of months or so. Uh -huh. How old is she? Oh, around 25. Blonde, blooming, and gorgeous, if figuratively speaking. <laughs> I take it she has the money, huh? Yeah, right. He was a well torsoed movie bit player with a champagne appetite. I see. Now, uh, what about this surprise angle? Well, she came right to the point. Said her husband had just had a complete physical. Asked if his doctor's report would be acceptable. If so, okay. But she didn't sign her up. Why? Well, she didn't give me the chance. What do you mean? All of a sudden, she reached in her purse and pulled out a piece of paper with a name and address on it. Announced this was her attorney. See him, she said. Smiled big and walked out. Did you go and see the attorney? Right away. A guy by the name of uh, Crane Collins has big plush offices downtown. Old senior partner type. What did he have to say? Oh, nothing except routine questions about filling out the forms, uh, expediting the procedure, importance of secrecy for the surprise. Oh, why didn't you ask a few questions? Couldn't. What do you mean, couldn't? She was there. Doing what? Sitting back in a corner all huddled up like a mouse waiting to be pounced on. Didn't say a word while Collins and I filled out the papers. Hmm. Yeah, she signed them as if they were a death warrant. Went back to the corner and stared at the wall. Now I see what you meant by that comedian remark. Yeah, she's too much for me. Yeah. A leopard can change its spots, too. <laughs> Expense account item two, $3.25 taxi fare to the offices of Crane Collins. So far, all I knew was that the wealthy young woman wanted a pot full of insurance on her husband. If it hadn't been for the surprise request, it would have been routine. Now it wasn't. And the people involved, one of them at least, were not routine. I was ushered into an oak panel office high above the streets of Los Angeles. Good afternoon, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Collins. Your card identifies you as an insurance investigator, Mr. Dollar. I don't believe I understand. Cynthia Durbin is your client? Why, yes. You represented this client yesterday in the signing of an application for a $200,000 straight life insurance policy on her husband. Yes? I represent the company. 
Everything is in order, is it not? Insurance is a, a lot of things, Mr. Collins. A surprise to the insured is one of the things it isn't. My client is adamant in this respect. Call it a, a quirk, if you will. You expect the company to issue a $200,000 policy on a quirk? <clears throat> well, How long now, have you known Mrs. Durbin? Since she was born. Then you know her father? Knew him. I am his executor. Uh-huh. Mother? Also deceased. Both parents died when Cynthia was 17. I was her guardian and have been her legal advisor since she came of age. Was she well provided for? Very. What kind of a man is her husband? Young, about 30, tall, good-looking. No, no, Mr. Collins, not statistics. Your impressions. He plays an excellent game of golf. Gets along well with people when he wants to. But you don't like him, do you? In this profession, Mr. Dollar, I neither like nor dislike people. I represent them, and that representation is based on fact. Well, in my profession, we go by feel as well as fact. Well, tell me candidly, Mr. Collins, do you think there's anything strange about this request for insurance on her husband? As I said, I deal in facts, not feelings. As a client, she sought professional assistance. Ergo, I supplied it. Where do the Durbans live? I'd rather Oh, not. now look, I can get it from any society editor in town. My secretary will give you the information. All right, thank you. By the way, don't tell Mrs. Durbin or anyone else that we've had this discussion. If you do, there will be no insurance issued. Interference with investigative procedure. Fact, Mr. Collins. I understand. Expense account item three, $2.60, phone call. Then taxi to Roger Hackey's office. A neat one-story building in the Miracle Mile on Wilshire Boulevard. Purpose? To borrow Roger's company car. The Durbins lived in one of those colonial mansions out in Beverly Hills, surrounded by curving driveways, spacious lawns, swimming pool and cabanas, all of it enclosed by thick high walls and electronically controlled gates. The mention of insurance on the intercom got me in. Cynthia Durbin was everything Roger said she was. The first time he met her, that is. Please excuse my appearance, Mr. Dollar. I've been swimming. Oh, I, I, uh, I don't mind at all, Mrs. Durbin. <laughs> really, you shouldn't have come here to deliver the policy. What if my husband had been home? No surprise. No, and that would have spoiled everything. Well, may I have it, please? Uh, the uh, paperwork has not been completed yet. Then what are you doing here? What do you want? Get to the point. Well, just a few questions, Mrs. Durbin. My colleague, Mr. Hackey, should have handled these details yesterday, but he was somewhat uh, rushed. Oh, then there's nothing wrong with... Would you care for a drink, Mr. Dollar? Thanks. The bar's out by the pool. Shall we? She was wearing a bikini and high-heeled beach sandals, and she led the way. I was hoping it was two miles to the pool instead of the 75 yards it turned out to be. I mixed the drinks, and we settled down in a couple of sun lounges. Ah, oh, those details, Mr. Dollar. Mm, just formalities, actually. You are to be the beneficiary? Yes. That was discussed yesterday. Ah, oh, yes, so it was. What does your husband do, Mrs. Durbin? He doesn't work, if that's what you mean. He doesn't have to I have enough for both of us. Johnny. Yeah? Freshen my drink, please. Oh, sure. sure. So tell me, did you ever contemplate divorce? Divorce? What if I make you ask a question like that? Well? Of course not. We've had our differences, minor ones, but a couple hasn't. Yeah, I suppose you got a point there. Here you are. Thank you. Johnny... Why did you pick two weeks from today to be the effective date of the policy? Isn't that my business? His birthday, Mrs. Durbin? What? Your husband, the surprise. Well, yes, yes it is, but all these questions... Plan to throw a big party for him? Yes. No, I don't know. Johnny... Your husband would be worth a lot more to you dead than alive, wouldn't he, Mrs. Durbin? Hand me that robe, please. Sure, sure. There you are. But you haven't answered my question. I'm sorry, you... You'll have to excuse me. I have a headache. Terrible headache. Something was definitely wrong here. 
A girl of her age should have flared at my questions. Should have snapped back at me instead of blindly running away. Yeah, something was wrong, all right. But I'd seen what I'd come to see. Both facets of Cynthia Durbin's personality. And was one of them actually thinking in terms of murder? My job, find out. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. An interesting parallel hit me the other day. When a baby takes its first three steps, everybody is happy and gives a cheer for its progress. The same thing happens when a country takes important steps toward lasting world peace and freedom. That great American patriot, Benjamin Franklin, outlined three important steps in the drive toward a lasting world peace and freedom of mankind. The last and most important of these steps was, and is, to get the people of the world to talk to each other and to help each other. This is the essence of the people-to-people program that Americans have put into operation all over the world. It has been such a great success that it is beginning to work both ways. Not too long ago in Korea, Tom Lawrence, a yeoman in the United States Navy, lost his wallet on a street in Seoul. The wallet was found by a 15-year-old Korean boy who gave it to his father. The father promptly returned it to Lawrence with nothing missing. Tom Lawrence decided that this kind of honesty should pay off. He visited the seven members of the Korean family and gave them 80 pounds of rice. He then promised to bring the family 50 pounds of rice each month he remained in Korea. The Korean father said, I think this is much more than I deserve. Maybe it was, and maybe it wasn't. But who can put a price on better understanding among the peoples of the world? For through better understanding of each other comes an understanding of freedom, the right of all men, everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the poor little rich girl matter. I sat beside one of the plushest swimming pools in Beverly Hills, alone. I finished my drink slowly. Cynthia Durbin was a strange one, all right, but her actions seemed compulsory rather than natural. If she really was thinking about murder for $200,000 in one chunk, she was pretty crude about it. If she was trying to impress her husband for some unknown reason, she'd selected a mighty offbeat way to do it. If she was going off a rocker, well... The extension phone hung on a post beside the bar. I don't ordinarily listen in on other people's conversations, but this one. Anything wrong, darling? Eric. Oh, Eric, I've got to talk to you. Something has happened. I thought... No, Cynthia, not on the phone. Meet me here in half an hour. But, Eric... Half an hour. Here. Goodbye, Cynthia. Hello, Eric. As I strolled to my car, nobody asked me to come back again sometime. Not that I expected it. I parked a block down the street, adjusted the rearview mirror, and got comfortable. A cigarette later, she came zooming out in a CAD convertible and headed my way. I've tailed a few cars in my time, but this kid was either scared silly or she'd learned her evasive tactics from Bull Halsey. I lost her in the first ten blocks. So I drove Roger Hackey's car back to his office and prepared for the horse laugh I had coming. It came. <laughs> She lost you, huh? Oh, that's a dandy, a real dandy. Hey, tell me, do you always <laughs> laugh when you're about to lose the commission on a $200,000 policy? Yeah? Oh. Well, uh, what are you going to do now, Johnny? Who is Eric? Well, he's not a brother, that's for sure. Uh, oh. I don't know. You know, for two cents, I'd turn in a negative report and go on back to Hartford. Oh, wait now. You can't do that. This is a big deal. For you, for me, it's a pain in the neck. But you can't turn in a negative report just because she's got an extracurricular boyfriend. You don't even know who he is. And what about her husband? Yeah, what about him? Here, here. I got the dope right here. Today's paper, and it's a good picture of him. Read what it says. Peter Durbin, one of Los Angeles' better amateur golfers, plays out of Silver Oak Country Club, where the state open is being held this week. He's expected to finish in the top. Roger, what time is it? Uh, 4.30. Thanks. Huh? Hey, where are you going? I'm going to try my hand at being a reporter. What? 
What are you talking about? Roger, I'm going to interview Mr. Peter Durbin for the, uh, the Interstate Publicity Press Association. Huh? Expense account item four, $2.40, cab fare to the Silver Oak Country Club, which nestled in a big ravine north of Sunset Boulevard, some 15 minutes from Roger's office. The last players were coming in for the afternoon round when I got there, and Peter Durbin was among them. I waited until after the radio and TV boys had got through and then caught him in a corner of the locker room. Yes? Who are you? Johnny Dollar, Interstate Publicity Press. I'd like to ask you a few questions for you. Well, I've already given my interviews. Well, sure, I know, but this is uh, feature stuff. Best part of the day. There's the gallery body and stuff like that. Oh. Oh, all right, but make it quick. Yes, sir. Is your wife here? No, she never watches me play. Oh? Where is she now? Well, at home. Where else? But now, see here, don't uh, you think... You're playing a great game, Mr. Durbin. You figure you're going to win this tournament, huh? Well, yes, I think so. McMahon has turned into 69, of course, but I'm still three strokes up on him. I, um, I play a much steadier game than he does. Oh, yeah, sure. This is your home club, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's one of the best in the country. Yeah, mighty fine course. You must be pretty well healed. Well, I... Uh... <laughs> That's none of your readers' concern. Oh, I'm sorry. Say, you have a birthday coming up soon, haven't you? How did you know? Oh, well, you're a prominent personality, Mr. Durbin. We keep a file on this sort of thing, on important people like you. Oh, oh I see. Oh, sure. I suppose you're going to have a big affair. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, the annual Western Road Races fall on my birthday each year. As a reporter, you should recall that I won both last year and the year before. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, happy birthday, Mr. Durbin, and uh, good luck. Well, is that all you want? That's all I need to know. Thanks. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. No folklore could be all boastful and dynamic. Some of it is about the man at the bottom of the pile. Like the one they tell of the traveler who just had to get across a river. He argued with the boatman, but that boatman wasn't about to move. Nope. Not with the spring thaw making it a mighty ugly river. The traveler was insistent. Finally, the boatman agreed. But it was going to cost a whole quarter to get across. But I ain't got but 15 cents. You gotta take me for that. Your regular fare's only 10 cents. The boatman stood firm. I ain't going, that's all. Anybody that ain't got but 15 cents, it just don't make no difference which side of the river he's on anyhow. <laughs> Folklore belongs to every nation's legendary past. And I guess we Americans have our share of some good ones. Like the one about... Ah, but we'll have to save that one for the next time we travel your way. See you then. And now, Act Three of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Poor Little Rich Girl Matter. Expense account item five, six dollars even. Taxi fare to the office of Attorney Crane Collins, with whom I could now agree on one point. I didn't like Peter Durbin either. It was 6.15, after hours, when I entered the office of Collins, Douglas, Walsh, Hanley, and James. The senior partner was still there. His door was slightly ajar, and I heard voices, which stopped abruptly when I entered. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Rather late in the day, isn't it? I don't keep office hours, Mr. Collins. I'm very busy. Then I'll wait. Very well, as you wish. I wished, so I waited. But not for long. Because about three minutes later, Collins came out, carefully closed the door of his office behind him, and strode easily toward me, oozing his most charming professional smile. Now, Mr. Dollar, what can I do for you? Why didn't you tell me the first time I was here that Peter Durbin, in addition to being a first-class golfer, was also a racing enthusiast? Why, it just didn't occur to me. Do you know any insurance company in the world that would issue a $200,000 policy on a man who risks his life in a racing car? Then your company will not issue the policy? What do you think? Now tell me something. Who is Eric? Eric? That's right. Well? The name is not familiar to me. Now look, Mr. Collins, I have a feeling that even you will admit that withholding information in connection with a possible murder is punishable by law. Fact. I am fully aware of that. But I fail to see what that... Ha what are you doing? You didn't invite me into your office. I just wondered why is all. Have you no ethics, man? Cynthia Durbin was in there a few minutes ago, wasn't she? Mr. Dollar. Wasn't she? If it is the intention of your company not to issue the insurance to my client, I will so inform her and that will end the matter so far as you are concerned. 
Now, please be good enough to leave. You really don't know or care what's going on, do you? You are so wrapped up in the letter of the law that preventing a possible murder doesn't even occur to you. Another one of your feelings? Well, I don't have the remotest idea what you're talking about. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Mr. Collins. Expense account item six, nine dollars and fifty cents. Cocktails and dinner. I should have written my report negative and hightail it back to Hartford. But when you see in your mind's eye the possibility of a racing car careening off the road at 125 miles an hour exactly two weeks from now, you don't just stick to business and call it quits. Eric, wherever he tended bar, was the key. But how to find it? I was on dessert in the evening paper, giving my subconscious mind a chance to work it out when all of a sudden I was looking at it on the society page. Expense account item seven, nineteen dollars including taxi fare to Los Angeles Police Headquarters, where I had a pleasant chat with the captain on duty. Then a tuxedo rental in the same taxi to the Statler Hotel. A special pass let me in as guest at a crowded and bejeweled society benefit. Enjoying the party, Mr. Collins? Dollar, what are you doing here? Enjoying the party, too. Have Mr. and Mrs. Durbin arrived? You are the most annoyingly persistent individual I please, have ever... Please, no compliments. See you later. After a few minutes, I spotted her, dressed to the teeth. She turned suddenly and saw me. I expected surprise, chagrin, fear, most anything but what I got. Mr. Dollar, Johnny, I am glad to see you. I was such a bore this afternoon, forgive me. Well, your exit was rather sudden. <laughs> My headache's all gone. Isn't that wonderful? Fine. Will you dance with me? Pleasure. Dollar. That's such an exciting name. Is your husband with you tonight? No, poor dear. He's playing in a golf tournament and has to get his rest. You came alone? Yes. Don't you find it warm in here, all these people? Let's go out on the terrace, hmm? Sure, why not? Once more, I was following her. And it was just as interesting as the first time. But my mind and eyes were elsewhere. Somewhere in this crowd was the Eric I was looking for. He had to be. Then I spotted him. 35, big and broad, hawk nose, circling toward the terrace from the left. She threaded her way to a potted palm in a far corner of the terrace, turned and looked at me. Her eyes were feverishly bright in the moonlight. She was beautiful. You're a very charming man, Johnny. I wish. You wish what? Mm. Do you find me interesting? You haven't answered my question. Oh, I find you interesting, Cynthia. Who is Eric? Eric. The man you went to see this afternoon after you left me. This afternoon. You know who I'm talking about. Because you and Eric, I don't know how, were planning to kill your husband two weeks from now and collect $200,000 insurance. Two weeks from now in the road race. Make it look like an accident, no doubt. No, Eric! No! I ducked and whirled around as a fist grazed past my ear and brought up one from the floor with all I had. <laughs> Cynthia stood there a moment, then quietly folded up and lay on the floor in a heap sobbing. <laughs> Oh, there you are, Della. Oh. What have you done to this poor girl? And that man? Very simple, Collins. I've been combining feel and fact. The house dick and I got them out of there. Hawk nose to police headquarters, Cynthia to a hospital. Eric turned out to be a quack psychiatrist who preyed on unstable rich women and who was wanted in both New York and Florida. He had a perfect setup in Cynthia Durbin until he went for murder and the big money. Mrs. Durbin, well, the doctors tell me she ought to be normal mentally in a couple of years with proper psychiatric treatment. Expense account total, $317.75. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Star will return in just a moment. 
Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag, representing one of the 50 states. North Carolina state flag bears the initial of her name on either side of a white star. Above, on a yellow scroll, is the date May 20th, 1775. Below, on a similar scroll, is the date April 12th, 1776. The 1775 date stands for an early declaration of independence, known as the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence. April 12th, 1776 was the date of the first constitutional convention held in Halifax. The Halifax Resolve was a document that placed the old North State in the front rank, both in point of time and spirit, among those colonies which demanded unconditional freedom and absolute independence from any foreign power. North Carolina state flag, the flag of the 12th state to the Union, was adopted on March 9, 1885. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a beautiful yacht, a beautiful, charming girl, and a man who wished he'd never heard of either of them. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dunn. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Alan Botzer, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Herb Ellis, Frank Nelson, Marvin Miller, and Peter Leeds. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Bud Sewell speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Byron Kay at Intercoastal Maritime and Life in Boston. Hello, boy. Remember Hurricane Audrey? Back in the latter part of June? Sure. Must have hit your company pretty hard. Yes. But if anybody ever needed help, it was those people down in Louisiana and neighboring states. Yeah. So we've paid up the claims just as fast as they've come in. Except for one. Oh, what's that? One we received only a couple of days ago. Okay, bye. Give me the dope and I'll head for Louisiana on the first plane. Wrong direction, Johnny. Huh? Texas? No. Oklahoma? Arkansas? Buffalo, New York. What? And I think you'd better run over here and let me give you some facts. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd better. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of a man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. 
to the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Boston, Massachusetts. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Sharmona matter. Expense account item one, 1845. Plain fare and incidentals, Hartford to Boston and a cab to Byron Kay's office in the Little Building. Glad to see you, Johnny. Hi. I'm glad you can take this on for me. Uh, sit down. Okay, thanks. Ever hear of Charles Francis Keeley? Ah, uh, Keeley? A very much reformed man, Johnny, who was apparently making a valiant try to live down some of the things he did earlier in his life. Like what? Well, he was a... I guess you'd call him a promoter, stock manipulator, that sort of thing. The point is, he made himself a lot of money a few years back until the authorities, the Securities Exchange Commission and so forth, put a stop to his fancy dealing. Sounds like a real nice guy. In any event, he had enough money by the time he quit to live pretty well. Nice home, beautiful wife, 62-foot cruiser, and that, by the way, is our biggest problem. Oh, I wish my biggest problem was a 62-foot cruiser. It is, Johnny. Now. Then tell me all. Yes. Early in June, he took his boat across Lake Erie to Detroit to have some work done on it at the Detroit Yacht Basin. And then, a couple of days before the end of the month, he started back for Buffalo. Oh, yeah, that hurricane was moving north about then, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And his failure to appear in Buffalo within a reasonable time didn't worry his wife a bit. Often before making that same trip, he'd stopped off in Cleveland to visit some of his old cronies. Uh-huh. But by July 20th, she began to get worried. She called the friends in Cleveland. They hadn't seen him. Then she called the Coast Guard. No word. A few days later, a couple of the life preservers from his boat washed up on the south shore of Erie near the little town of Lindsay. Ah. That enough for you, Johnny? How much insurance did he carry? On himself? 35000 On the boat? 106000 I see. Okay, bye. I'm on my way. <laughs> Expense account item two, transportation to Buffalo, where I signed in at the Stadler Hotel. Item 3, 520 for dinner. Then taxi, that's item 4, to the Keeley home north of Delaware Park on Colvin Avenue. I don't know just when I'd expected Keeley's wife to look like. Suffice it to say, I was pleasantly surprised. She was young, tall, blonde, and beautiful. With eager, sparkling eyes and none of the signs of grief I'd anticipated. I don't know why you registered at the hotel, Johnny. May I call you, Johnny? Why, uh, sure. Please call me Mona. May I pour you another drink? No, no thanks. As I started to say, you could have stayed here. There's plenty of room, as you can see. Uh, Yes, yes. This is a very beautiful house, uh, Mona. Yes, but so, so empty now. I get terribly lonely, Johnny. Well, I, uh, of course I don't blame you. But now suppose we talk, if you don't mind, about the Johnny, if you have to be around for a few days, why don't you move out of that hotel and... Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. I guess I'm just... I'm sorry. It's all right. But I am lonely. Sure, sure. Now, Mona, you realize this investigation is, uh, well, it's just routine. Of course, Johnny. Now, as I understand, every effort has been made to find your husband. Of course. And to find the Charmona. Charmona? The cruiser. Oh, yes, yes. It was a beautiful thing, Johnny. But now it's gone... And Paul. Paul? Yes. Paul Matthews was the pilot. Only he was more than that. He... He was very nice. Yeah. Well, now as I... Oh, excuse me. Every time that phone rings, I... I hope it's some word, some news that perhaps... Well, you know. I'm not sure that I do. What? But by all means, answer it. Yes. Just excuse me. There was something distinctly wrong with this whole setup, that was for sure. The Coast Guard, yes. Yes, this is she. This is Mona Keeley. Perhaps Charles Keeley wasn't the only one in this family to arouse suspicion. What? Say that again. Especially now, with nearly $150,000 involved. Yes, well, how about Paul? I said, how about Paul? Then, when she finally finished with the phone call, came a couple of other surprises. Thank you. Thank you. Johnny, he's all right. Huh? That was the Coast Guard. They found him. He's all right. Isn't it wonderful? That was the real surprise. Not what she said. Isn't it wonderful? Nor even the way she said it. But something deep back in her eyes that gave her away, that told me beyond the shadow of a doubt that she was lying through her teeth.
Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. It is a rare event when a young man decides to leave civilization behind and hide himself away in the steaming jungle just so he can help his fellow humans in a remote corner of the world. The late Dr. Tom Dooley did just that when he left the United States to help the sick and starving jungle people in the little kingdom of Laos in Southeast Asia. Dr. Dooley's story is well known to nearly everyone. And all over the world, people talk of his little jungle hospital on stilts. That's where he treated the dread diseases of the jungle and trained native medical technicians so that they might help their own people. Dr. Dooley wrote and lectured to many people so that the work of his medical assistance program, Medico, might go on. It was not easy for someone so young and so talented to give up the bright lights of the city and plant himself down in an unknown jungle just for the purpose of helping unfortunate people he didn't even know. But through Medico, Dr. Tom Dooley wanted to help people. They wanted to help people to help themselves. Today, the work of Medico is going forward in a number of countries besides Laos. Young men are being sent to the United States to be schooled in medicine with the idea of returning to their own countries to help their own people. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of medical supplies have been donated by American businessmen and pharmaceutical companies. Today, Dr. Tom Dooley's work is being continued for him. It is helping to create better understanding. It is an injection of the spirit of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Charmona Matter. The news that her husband was still alive came as quite a surprise to Mona Keeley. Isn't it wonderful, she said. But I didn't believe that she meant it. On the south shore of the lake, Johnny, near the little town of Lindsay, west of Cleveland. He was picked up on the beach by a farmer who's been caring for him ever since. Isn't it kind of funny that you haven't heard from him before? That hurricane was a couple of months ago. Well, he was out of his mind from the shock of what happened to him. Did the Coast Guard say anything about the yacht? No, Johnny. I'm afraid the charm is at the bottom of Lake Erie. Well, where is he now? In Cleveland, in a small private hospital. Well, hadn't you better go over there and get him, bring him back here? I told the Coast Guard we would. Mona, you're not really glad that he's been found, that he's still alive, are you? No, I'm not. I guess I never really loved Charles. I'm not sure he really loved me. He was a big shot, always out in the town, doing a lot of entertaining, that sort of thing. I was, well, I was very pretty then. Kind of a business asset for him. When were you and Charles married, Mona? Nine years ago. It looks as though he's done pretty well by you. I never had any reason to complain. About that, I mean. But the things he did to make his money, it was... Well, I guess it was legal. But it wasn't right. It was almost like stealing, the way he promoted a lot of worthless inventions, penny stocks, worthless real estate, that sort of thing. But he always did all right. And you. Well... Who worries about conscience when things are going well? A lot of people, Mona. But then they made him stop his... Stop the things he was doing. And Charles became very strange. He took up religion like a fanatic. Oh? Kept giving his money away to a lot of crazy charities. Money I could have used. And he got moody. He'd go off alone for weeks at a time, pay no attention to me. That's what I meant when I said I was lonely, Johnny. Not just since the accident that lost the boat and... And Paul. Paul again, huh? Don't you understand? These crazy things have been going on for over a year now. That's why I'm not jumping with joy that Charles is alive. Do you blame me? (sighs) Hadn't we better drive on over to Cleveland and get him? All right. I'll run upstairs and change my clothes. Excuse me. I'll be ready in a minute. Maybe I should have felt a bit more sympathetic, but I didn't. Maybe Charles Keeley did marry her simply because he could afford to keep a smart, pretty ornament around at his beck and call. Yeah, but the chances were she'd married him solely for the things his money could buy her. She took a long time changing her clothes, which didn't surprise me, so I poured myself a drink. I glanced over some of the magazines on the coffee table. 
I got up and stared out of the window for want of something better to do. Wandered about the room. Wandered into the oak panel den. I looked over the shelves of fine books, the gun collection, and the cabinet in the corner. And almost idly, I reached out toward the leather-topped desk to shove back a slip of paper that stuck out of one of the drawers. Until I saw what it was. It was an unpaid bill, several months old, from an exclusive New York shop for some very expensive gowns. And inside, the drawer was packed with unpaid bills, thousands of dollars worth of them, and statements bearing a polite, firm warning to pay up or else. No wonder Keeley's sweet, charming wife had hoped she'd never hear from him again. Gone, he was worth 35000 to her, and the yacht 106000 Perhaps somehow, Mona Keeley had even had a hand in the wrecking of that yacht. I wondered. And I decided I didn't care much for people like this. But my meditations were suddenly interrupted by a sound from the doorway. And there she stood. A pretty little pearl-handled twenty-five caliber Colt in a dainty gloved hand. I'm ready, Johnny. Are you... So I see. Ready for what, Mona? I guess that depends, doesn't it? Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Wisconsin's state flag bears the state motto, Forward, and a likeness of the state mascot, the Badger. The word Badger was a nickname for the miners in southwest Wisconsin. During the mining boom just prior to 1830, the people who came from Illinois mined only during the good season and left during the bad. They were called suckers, just like the fish in the streams. But the busy Wisconsinites, with either too little time to leave or to build a house, moved into abandoned mine shafts to live as badgers. The Wisconsin banner pays tribute to these industrious natives. Wisconsin's state flag, the flag of the 30th state to enter the Union, was adopted on April 26, 1913. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Charmona Matter. Mona Keeley stood there in the door of the den, a twenty-five caliber Colt in her hand. For she'd caught me going through the drawer of a desk, through papers that showed only too clearly why the loss in a storm of a hundred-thousand-dollar yacht might well have been carefully planned. Why she wished that her husband had gone down with it. You shouldn't have done it, Johnny. You shouldn't have looked in that desk. Pretty good proof, isn't it, Mona, that the wreck of the Charmona was no accident. I don't know how your husband worked it and still managed to get back to shore alive. You don't know what you're talking about. But he almost didn't make it, if what you've told me is the truth. Maybe that's because he didn't anticipate that the storms from Hurricane Audrey would hit Lake Erie. Maybe it's because... Well, we'll soon find out. Will you? Yes, when we drive over to the hospital in Cleveland and talk with him, if he's really there. Oh, he's there, all right. And you and I are going for a drive, but not to Cleveland. All right, now. Oh, put that thing down, Mona. Sorry, sweetheart. That little thing in your hand is about as accurate as a slingshot. Now, why don't you... No, don't move. I still don't get it, though. Oh, what? And I'm sure you must have been in with your husband on his deliberate sinking of the yacht. If you think Charles sank it deliberately, Johnny, you're all wrong. Then I certainly don't get it. Because if... Oh, now, wait a minute. You've made a couple of cracks about... What was his name? Paul? Do you want to know the truth? Paul was the pilot for Charles, and there's been no word about him. So he must have gone down with the Charmona. That's why I'm lonely and feel the way I do. Mona, this whole thing smells worse to me every minute. He was young, and he was kind, and he loved me. I was glad when they found the Charmona had gone down because the money for it would be mine. And I could get free of Charles, and Paul and I could... That's why I hope Charles was gone. Yeah, another $35,000 for you. You're about the crummiest lot I've ever run into. Look at this, Mona, here on the desk. What? This solid gold table light. What about it? And there, beside you, that expensive mirror. What are you talking about? Well, look. Why did you do that? To get this gun away oh, from you. No, you... Oh, oh, you... A lot of good this would have done you with the safety on. I'll kill you for this, Johnny. No, I don't think so. And I don't think the police would like it if you try. Oh, no. Do you think they'd blame me for trying to stop you from going through the papers in my desk? For shooting you? No. Wait. I didn't mean that. 
I couldn't have shot you, Johnny. I... Johnny? Before we go, is there anything you'd like to tell me? Go? Where? Is there anything you'd like to tell me about why Charles really sank the Charmona? No. And I don't think you'll ever know how and why the Charmona went down. Want to bet? No, no, stay right there. Now I've got the gun, remember? Hello? What? Charlie? No. This is a friend of the family. Oh, well, this is Harry Nelson. He gave me a real start. I thought Charlie would come back from his watery grave. He has, Mr. Nelson. What? Yes, he's in a Cleveland hospital. He's okay. Oh, well, then I'll talk to him when he gets back. You see, I'm the man who was going to give him 98000 for the Charmona when he got her back from Detroit. Oh? Oh, yeah, sure. But since the Coast Guard tells me she was a complete loss, well, naturally, I think I ought to have my deposit back. I'm sure you'll get it, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, okay, Mr. Uh, uh, what did you say your name is? Bye. Who was that? Someone who threw some very interesting light on this whole matter. Come on. Where? Our little drive, remember? To Cleveland. During the five-hour drive to Grace Hospital on the outskirts of Cleveland, I questioned her, using every trick I could, but she refused to talk. The theory that Charles Keeley had deliberately sunk his yacht had gone up in smoke. If he had a buyer for it, he wouldn't need to try to collect the insurance on it. But I still knew the whole case was anything but Lily White, and hoped that Keeley could explain a few things. When we arrived at the hospital, there was a police lieutenant in Keeley's room and a stenographer. When she saw them, Mona gasped slightly and sank into a chair, to which the lieutenant promptly handcuffed her. As Charles Keeley talked, the whole case became crystal clear. And at the same time, about as sordid as anything I'd ever heard. I should have realized what was up when Paul Matthews suddenly refused to make the trip back to Buffalo with me. He was my pilot, Lieutenant. I phoned the Coast Guard about him as soon as... Yes, sir, it was on the Coast Guard's tip that we ordered Paul Matthews picked up. Picked up? Then he's all right. Shut her up, Lieutenant. Or get her out of here. As I started to say, they not only picked him up, but found where he bought the various parts for the little uh, device he used. Good. Device? What are you talking about, Lieutenant? Let me tell him. Sure, go ahead, Mr. Keeley. The Miss Sonographer will have it all down on the record. I should have known what was up when Paul suddenly decided not to go back with me just before sailing time. You see, I've suspected for some months that he and my wife behind my back... Shut up, you rotten little... Go on, Mr. Keeley. I I should have known then, but I had to get the cruiser back to Buffalo to a friend who'd offered me cash for it. Harry Nelson. Yes. Enough to get me back on my feet again. And I didn't know why Paul had left me to make the trip alone until the explosion about five hours out. What? Yes, Mr. Dollar, up forward, where there couldn't possibly have been anything explosive. A bomb of some sort? What else, Dollar? It was luck, sheer luck, that I was sailing in close that I'd put on a life preserver because of the storm. That was the tail end of the hurricane down south, you understand? Yes, and it was luck that she went down right off Palace Rock. Yeah, that's exactly where the Coast Guard divers found her early this morning. A hole as big as a house blown out of her front end. Yes, that storm, that hurricane may have taken a lot of lives, but it saved mine. All I can say is I'm glad there are courts to take care of situations like this. I myself would hate to have to dirty my hands any further. Yeah, it probably does take all kinds to make a world. But believe me, the world would be a lot better off without some of those kinds. The claim on the yacht, sure, it'll have to be paid. And to a man I honestly think is trying to live a decent life for a change. Expense account total, including incidentals, and the trip back to Hartford, 10380. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. An old English proverb states that a friend in need is a friend indeed. We've all heard it before. But how many of us have realized the full import of its meaning? When José Lara Valverde, an eight-year-old Spanish boy, was in need, he found out what real friendship could be. Stricken by a rare glandular disease, little José began to lose his fight for survival when his vital supply of drugs ran out. 
in a desperate call for help, an amateur radio operator named Conte broadcast a weak signal over the European airwaves. The plea was picked up by a ham operator, Hans Ketterle, in Germany, who relayed the urgent message to a nearby United States Air Force unit. The American airmen quickly dug up the only available drugs of the kind needed. They flew the Mercy package by jet to Madrid. From there, an ambulance screamed its urgent way 190 miles to Andujar, Jose's hometown. The medicine saved his life, but only temporarily. Another source had to be found, and it was again in Germany. The two rare drugs were again rushed by American jet fighter pilots, by helicopter, and by Air Force staff car through high winds and thunderstorms to the bedside of the stricken boy. The medicine was given to Jose, and again he responded. This same life-and-death drama was repeated elsewhere in Spain when men of the United States Air Force came to the rescue of another young Spanish boy in need of another rare drug. People-to-people giving is more than a program. It is an act of friendship. It is a fight for freedom. The right of all men everywhere. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. This is Dan Coverley speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Reed here, Johnny. Uh Uh-oh. What fantastic character is Floyd's of England insured this time? Now, what is that supposed to mean? More singing mice, wayward cats, and how about the counterfeit money problem? Johnny... No, no, let me guess. John, if you'll just listen to me... I got it. You're in trouble because you've done a switch. You've insured somebody against living instead of the other way around, that it? Of course not. No, I must admit we do have one policy of that sort in effect. There, I knew it. However, that is not the one I called you about. Okay, George, what is? We've issued a policy. Well, I guess it is a little unusual at that. I fear the worst, but go on. Well, it's on a small brewery over near... Brewery? You mean a beer factory? That's right. It's over near the town of Tamaqua, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah, I know that country pretty well. Good. We've insured the Dortmund Brewery against possible damage from a nearby construction project. Well, you said unusual. What's so unusual about that? Uh... Perhaps you'd better come over here and let me tell you. Yeah. When you say it that way, I guess I'd better. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the JPD matter.
Expense account item one, $1.10. Taxi from my apartment to George Reed's office, where he promptly dragged me over to a large map tacked to one of the walls. Here it is, Johnny, between the towns of Tamaqua and Frackville, Pennsylvania, on a little river that's called uh, Pinksatawney Creek. Old Indian name, I believe. Uh-huh. Well, the Dortmund Brewery is just about here. Yeah. Well, okay, I'll rent a car in New York and drive over there. Now, wait. By making a couple of train changes, you can get most of the way over there by rail. Anything to save the company a buck, is that it? Why not? When that freewheeling expense account of yours gets into operation... Okay, okay. What's the face value of the policy? Coverage for the whole plant, $820,000. Wow, we. So I'll rent a car in New York. All right, all right. Now, as I told you, we've insured the Dortmund Brewery against possible damage from the building of a plant right next to it. What kind of a plant? Competition. Another brewery. Oh, I see. Possible malicious damage. Is that what they're thinking of? Well, that's what J.P. seems to be worried about. J.P.? J.P. Dortmund. Owner, manager, president, brewmeister, and anything else you can think of. Has anything happened yet? No, but I want you to go there and be sure that nothing does. Is this J.P. my contact? Yes. Okay, George, I'm on my way. <laughs> Expense account item two, nine thirty-five, fare and incidentals, Hartford to New York. Item three, fifty dollars, deposit on a drive your own car. Item four, fifty cents, toll through the Holland Tunnel. I cut straight across the top of Jersey, crossed the Delaware at Phillipsburg, and finally pulled into the little town of Tamaqua shortly after six p.m. Items five, six, and seven, twelve twenty. For dinner, a place to rest my weary head and breakfast the next morning. The Dortmund Brewery sat on the western bank of Pinksatawney Creek, about five miles out of town, and looked as though it had been sitting there for a thousand years. It was a small affair, and the old frame buildings were badly in need of a coat of paint. Just north of it rose a towering cliff, and on top of that cliff stood an array of cranes and machines and bulldozers that are used on modern large-scale construction jobs. I parked my car at the entrance of the office building and was greeted at the door by a large, raw-boned woman of about 50 with straggly yellow hair and wearing a faded blue cotton dress that looked as though it hadn't been ironed in years. Something I can do for you? Oh, why, uh, I'm looking for Mr. J.P. Jordan. Mister? That's a laugh. Is it? Why? Because I'm J.P. What? That's right. Anything wrong with it? Well, I... Hey, uh... wait a minute. You another of those lawyers from that job up on the cliff come to fancy talk me about no. not having to worry in the world about what they're doing to no, me up there? No, no. And how I... I'd better mind my own business. What do you mean, no? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm here on behalf of Floyd's of England. The insurance company? Well, now, that's different. You come on into my private office, Johnny. Her private office was furnished with a battered walnut desk, some ancient filing cabinets, and a couple of straight wooden chairs. Nothing else. Hardly the kind of an office you'd expect for the president of a company worth $820,000. There's nothing fancy about it, Johnny, because there's nothing fancy about any part of my brewery. But that isn't what counts. We've been here ever since my great-great-grandfather built it up. And all we've cared about is making the finest beer in the country. Gretchen? And we do make it, too. Gretchen, can't you hear me out? Yes, J.P.? Gretchen, I want you to bring Mr. Dollar a pitcher full and a glass. Yes, ma'am. Well, look, I'm afraid I'm not much of a beer, You man. will be when you've tasted this. It's the creek that does it, you know, Pinksatawney Creek. Finest water for beer in the whole United States. That's what makes good beer, you know. Yes, so I've heard. That's why that dirty Clarkson Kemper bunch are building up on the cliff to get at that water. I understand they'll be your competitors. Ha! Ah! All their fancy modern equipment and methods can't produce the brew the way I can. The long, slow, easy way. With all the good old-fashioned apparatus. The old country methods. Yes, I see. Why, Johnny, we make our own barley malt. And we grind it by hand. And we come up with a wort that's second to none in the world. The old-type sparger, too. And the hop jacks. And the finest strain of yeast there is. Yes, I'm sure that Three full months we age before we rack a drop. Sure, we take more time and more trouble, but we come up with a better brew. Better than any modern plant can ever make. Well, then what's your problem? They're getting ready to blast up on that cliff. Blast? A whole big chunk of it away. And when they do, that whole thing will come crashing down here. Thousands of tons of rock. Well, surely there's some state authority or something to prevent that. Oh, they bamboozled the authorities. And your insurance company, too. They'll say it was an accident. A miscalculation. And when that rock comes crashing down here, it'll wreck this whole plant of mine. Well, you do have insurance, remember. It'll wreck all my fine old equipment that can never again be replaced because there are no such things anymore. 
Well, when's all this blasting supposed to take place? Who knows? Tonight, tomorrow, next week. Who knows? That soon? Yeah. So, Johnny, if there's anything you can do, you'd better do it now. What's insurance money if I have to lose this for it? Who knows? Maybe she was right suspecting her rivals might try a stunt like that to put her out of business. But it all seemed a little too far-fetched. And yet when I think of some of the unscrupulous things that have been done to put down competition, maybe she was justified in suspecting this Carlson Kemper crowd of... Yeah, maybe she was. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Massachusetts state flag, bearing a green pine tree, is the descendant of the famous Liberty Tree flag that came out of Boston to serve all the original 13 colonies. It was under the Liberty Tree flag that the Sons of Liberty met and planned the Boston Tea Party, that our floating batteries on the Delaware River defended Philadelphia, and on the Charles River defied Howe's cannons. Beneath the tree is inscribed the state motto, En petit placidum sub libertate quietum. By the sword we seek peace, but peace only under liberty. These words were originally written by the famous English patriot Algernon Sidney about 1659. This was a message intended for King George III. Unhappily, it went unheeded. Massachusetts state flag, the flag of the sixth state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 18, 1904. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the J.P.D. Matter. If J.P. Dorpen was right, if there was the least possibility she was right in her suspicion that Carlson Kemper would blast thousands of tons of rock down on a little plant in order to put her out of business, well, there was only one thing to do. I got back into my car and drove by a roundabout way up to the top of the cliff overlooking the Dortmund Brewery. There in the middle of the vast array of heavy construction equipment, giant cranes, trucks, huge cement mixers, and so on, I found the main construction shack. And by a stroke of luck, one of the partners in the proposed new brewery, Mr. James Carlson. <laughs> oh, that crazy old lady's being absurd, Mr. Dollar. If you really want the truth, well, I think she'd welcome our smashing that antiquated brewery of hers out of existence. Is that what you plan to do, Mr. Carlson? Can you be serious? By blasting a few tons of rock off the face of the cliff into the river? Or a few thousand tons? Or a few thousand tons. Won't do that place of hers a bit of harm. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Only thing I'm not sure of is why she stays in business. What do you mean by that? Well, she can't be making any money. The methods she uses were out of date in this country 50 years ago. The product's good, sure. But today, you've got the snowball. Did you know, Dollar, that out of the goodness of my heart, I offer to take that crummy plant of hers off her hands? Or because her location is better, down next to the water supply. Oh, partly, sure. I offered her nearly half a million for her spot. To 400,000, to be exact. But no dice. She just kept bothering us, trying to get out a lot of injunctions against our building there. I assume you have the necessary permits for this blasting operation. <laughs> whole draw for them. Hey, look at them yourself. At the same time, appreciate the volume of red tape necessary to do anything these days. But suppose that something should go wrong. That quite by accident, the top of that cliff should drop down on J.P.'s brewery. Mr. Dollar, it's to obviate any such possibility that I called in one of the foremost blasters in the country. Who, uh, purely incidentally, is top man for one of the biggest makers of explosives in the world. You talk to him, Mr. Dollar. Maybe I will. Believe me, I can understand why you might not take my word for the safety of the operation we're about to undertake, but certainly you can't question his word. You say about to undertake. When? I believe he's planned the big blow-off for tonight. Tonight? Yeah, come on. I'll take you to him. We found this expert, a Mr. Sidney Crutchfield, in a small, tidy shack set out near the edge of the cliff, working over a series of complicated diagrams with a busy slide rule in his hand. And I must confess, he turned out to be one of the most interesting men I've ever met. Tall, slim, and gray-haired, he had a quiet, easy, yet confident manner that completely belied his hazardous occupation. This was the man who had done the dynamiting for some of the biggest jobs in this country, had moved mountains and rivers in the construction of huge dams, had blasted the way for some of our vast highway networks. As you can see by the dates on these sheets, I finished planning this blast over two weeks ago. 
But I find that constant checking and rechecking never does any harm. Mr. Carlson tells me you plan to set off this blast tonight. Yes. Actually, I shall push the plunger at exactly 2 o'clock tomorrow morning. If Mr. Carlson is ready. Don't you worry about it, Mr. Crutchfield. We're moving the equipment and the shacks away right now. <laughs> Excellent. And at the time of the blast, no one is to be here but me. That's what your contract says. And that's the way it must be. For safety, Mr. Crutchfield? <laughs> well, call it a fetish of mine. Uh-huh. And there'll be no damage to the brewery plant down below? I'll stake my reputation on it. Come, Mr. Dollar. If you like, I'll show you how I've made the sets for this blast. We spent the rest of the day inspecting every tunnel, shaft, and drill hole into which the explosives have been packed and fused. And the artistry of this man was evident from the word go. By 6 p.m., all the machines and shacks and equipment had been moved back from the edge of the cliff that was to be blown off. The place was deserted, except for Mr. Crutchfield and me. And now, you must get into your car and leave, Mr. Dollar. But if there's no danger... Please, I prefer it this way. Surely you're not still concerned about the blast? <sighs> to be honest about it, no. Not one bit. And I wasn't at the moment. Yeah, this amazing man simply couldn't do anything wrong. I would have staked my life on it. But by the time I'd driven the long, curving road to the Dortmund Brewery below, had found the place not only deserted, but completely shut down, a funny little hunch began to grow in the back of my head. Even the office building was dark, as far as I could see. With the help of a business card, I slipped the lock on the front door. And then I saw the thin streak of light under the door of J.P.'s private office. I thought I heard something in there. The office was a shambles. Account books and papers scattered all over the place. A couple of cartons. The drawers of the crusty old files were open and, for the most part, empty. Somebody had been hastily packing and removing all the important papers. But why? I'm sorry, Johnny. Oh, uh... Sorry! Oh! And you seemed like such a nice boy. Come on! Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Anyone who has survived the rigors of basic training is familiar with a great variety of milk that is dished out periodically in the armed forces. Now, there's frozen milk, concentrated milk, frozen concentrate, and good old powdered milk. But sometimes, supplying wholesome, fresh, real milk has been a problem when servicemen have been stationed in out-of-the-way places. The United States Air Force came across that problem some time ago in the island of Teixeira, in the Azores, those Portuguese islands that dot an eastern portion of the Atlantic Ocean. The air base there was considered powdered milk country for a long time. Although cattle have played an important role in the economy of the island of Teixeira, the herd was badly inbred and milk production was very low. Modern milk processing was not a part of the picture. And with the help of Portuguese veterinarians, the men in the United States Air Force unit worked out a free breeding service by using a small herd of milk cows acquired in England and the cattle there at Teixeira improved. Then, a complete pasteurizing, homogenizing, sterilizing, bottling refrigeration plant was flown in from the United States. As soon as this activity got underway, milk production began to climb steadily, and thirsty Air Force men and civilians were soon buying and drinking the new fresh milk. When economy of the island began to rise rapidly, the people were happy and grateful. You might say that a little milk of human kindness increased understanding on an island of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the JPD Matter. When I came to in the office of the Dortmund Brewery, my head fell as though it had been split wide open. The sash weight had been used on it lay beside me. But why had JP struck me down from behind the door where she'd been waiting for me? And why before that had she been hastily packing a lot of business papers, bills and so on, to take away? A couple of them still lay under me where I'd fallen. 
It was several minutes before I found strength enough to roll over and try to push myself to my feet. As I did so, two things. I saw two things. One was a bill she'd overlooked in her haste to get away. A bill from Frank Line Powder Company addressed to her personally. A bill for 21 cases of dynamite and some other explosives. The other was my watch. I'd been out for hours, too many hours. For according to my watch, it was 1.52 a.m., exactly eight minutes before the tremendous dynamite blast on the cliff above was to be set off. And suddenly I knew where, somehow, by her plan, those thousands of tons of rock would land, and not harmlessly in the river below. And I knew why J.P. had left me here. So I'd be crushed by them. Oh. 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 Oh, come on, come on, come on. Oh, please, please, come on. Hello, hello. Oh, please, hello, hello. Operator. Operator, this is emergency. Yes, sir. Hey, look, now, I'm, I'm calling from Dortmund Brewery. It's between... Yes, I know where it is, sir. There's a big construction... Carlson Kemper, that's the name. Well, sir, Up on the I... cliff above this, this sir, brewery here. Sir, sorry, but those lines were disconnected late this afternoon. What? But look, surely there's some way to... Operator. I'm sorry, sir, but there's no way to ring them. Oh, no. Oh, I... I've got to get out. I've just got to get out of here. Somehow I've got to get out there and get it. Oh, no, I'm... Please. I got it. I got to get in that car. Get in. Sorry. Oh, no. My head. My head. I can't. I told you Don't push that plunger. I'm sorry, Don't set Mr. off Dollar. that blast. That's no. That's exactly what I'm going to do right now. No, you're not. No, no. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. You have no right to interfere. You now stand hear back. hear what I said. Dollar, put down that gun. You touched that plunger and so help me. I'll pull this trigger. Oh, wait a minute. Dollar. Dollar, what's the matter with you? Oh. What's happened to you, man? Oh. Good heavens, man. I guess it was just luck that I was still hanging on to that bill for the dynamite that I'd found. I guess it was luck that made Crutchfield grab it when he tried to keep me from falling. Made him look at it carefully by the light of his flashlight. But it was his good sense that kept him from going ahead and setting off that charge. When daylight came, he found the spot on the face of the cliff where J.P. had another charge planted. It was set to go off by concussion from the blast that Crutchfield had set. It would have diverted the rock from Crutchfield's blast to smack dab on top of her little beer factory. Nobody would ever have known who'd really done it. And J.P. would have collected 820000 insurance for it. Incidentally, when the police caught up with her, which wasn't hard, they also found the book she'd taken from her office. Yeah, J.P. Dortman was broke. Stony. Expense account total, including a handful of doctor bills for my aching head, and all the incidentals I could think of... $204.80. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star, there stands yet another flag, representing one of the 50 states. The origin of Hawaii state flag has been the subject of much debate. It is now believed that it was the work of foreign advisors to King Kamehameha. Legend also has it that it was designed at the request of King Kamehameha by George Beckley, an English sea captain. The flag consists of eight horizontal and alternating stripes of white, red, and blue, representing the eight major islands in the chain. 
Also represented is the British Union Jack, a reminder of Captain Vancouver, who on his voyage around the world in 1794 gave King Kamehameha a British flag and the promise of British protection. The Union Jack is also a reminder of Captain James Cook, who discovered the Hawaiian Islands in 1778. Hawaii State Flag, the flag of the 50th state to enter the Union, was adopted in 1845. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the ideal vacation matter. But believe me, it turns out to be neither ideal nor a vacation. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Eleanor Audley, Jean Bates, G. Stanley Jones, Alan Reed, and Austin Green. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Oh, hi, Pat. Hey, I thought you were on vacation. I was. I got called back right in the middle of it in the count of Ned Grant. You know him? Grant, the Broadway columnist? That's the one. Well, what's he got to do with your vacation? He's heavily insured by one of the companies we represent. And right now, he's taking his vacation. Wow. Well, Ned has made a lot of enemies in his time. I know. I read his column. Yeah. And it looks like one of those enemies is trying to make Ned's vacation permanent. Savvy? I'll be right over, Pat. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the ideal vacation matter. Expense account item one, a dollar twenty for a taxi from my apartment to the office of Universal Adjustment Bureau. Where Pat McCracken was waiting for me, his face covered with sunburn and worry. Just when I was beginning to relax and enjoy my vacation. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. Now, what's the deal about this Ned Grant? When you say you read his column, you know he prints some pretty blunt stuff sometimes. Yeah. I've often wondered how he gets away with it. A couple of years ago, he dug up some evidence on a bad boy named Willie Bemis. Bemis. Bemis, yeah. The stuff he printed helped get Bemis convicted, didn't it? Yeah, but he swore he'd get even with Ned. Oh, well, a fellow in Ned Grant's position hears that kind of threat all the time. Besides, with Bemis in jail, what's the problem? None at all, Johnny, if he were in jail. He broke out last night. 
Oh, I see. Does Grant know that Bemis is on the road? No, I told you, Grant's on vacation, probably as far from a newspaper as he can get. So you think he's in danger? Well, what would you think? Oh, but if Bemis has any sense, he's heading in some other direction as fast as he we can. We can't afford to take the chance, Johnny. Well, look, Pat, I still don't see where I figure in this. Why not just arrange for police protection for Grant until Bemis gets picked up? <laughs> want to protect the guy, i got to find him first. Find him? Yeah. You mean you don't know where Grant is? Apparently nobody knows. Oh, great. And I'm supposed to find him. That's right. Oh, and do me a favor, huh? Like what? Find him before Willie Bemis does. <laughs> enough about Bemis to realize he wouldn't hesitate to gun down anybody who got in his way, including me. So I headed for New York. That's item two, $23.40. I located the apartment house where Ned Grant lived and had a talk with the manager in his office at the rear of the first floor. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I really don't have the slightest idea where Mr. Grant went on his vacation. Well, didn't he leave a forwarding address? No, he just told me to hold all his mail for him here until he got back. And he didn't say anything at all that would give you a clue as to where he might have gone. Huh? None at all. Oh, great. I don't know if you know Mr. Grant very Not well, personally. but... Uh, well, he's unpredictable, let's put it that way. Of course, the kind of life he leads would make a character out of anyone, I guess. You mean batting out that column every day, huh? Yes, and his phone ringing every ten minutes and strange people traipsing up to see him at all hours. Really, I can understand his not telling anyone where he went on his vacation. He just wanted to get away from it all. He kept saying that this time he was going to have an ideal vacation. Ideal vacation. That could mean anything from a trip to the moon to... Well, Lord knows what. Tell me this. Did he take much luggage? Well, I don't even know, but he hadn't been gone ten minutes before my phone started ringing with calls for it. Your phone? Oh, yes, Mr. Grant had his disconnected before he left. Uh, tell me, Mr. Dollar, what's so uh, urgent about finding Mr. Grant? There's an escaped convict named Willie Bemis who has it in for him. Oh? He could be looking for Grant. If so, I have to find Grant first. I see. Well, I wish I had more information for you. Oh, I tell you, you might try Miss uh, Anthony. Huh? Possibly she could help you. Well, who's Miss Anthony? Uh, Doris Anthony. Uh, well, uh, a close friend of Mr. Grant. Oh? You know where I can find her, where she lives? Well, as I understand it, she has a small apartment somewhere on uh, East 73rd Street. Good, I'll find it. Thanks, Mr. Crothers. I walked outside and hailed a taxi. But then, just as I was about to step into it, I froze. Because I caught a glimpse of somebody walking quickly into the service entrance at the side. And there was just enough light to tell me it was none other than Willie Beamer's. I headed back in fast and straight to the door of Crothers' little office. The door of it was locked. Crothers, open up. Crothers. Okay, then I'll open it. Hey, Crothers, what happened to you? Oh, oh, Mr. Dollar. That's right, what happened? This man, right after you left, he came barging in. That was Willie Bemis. What did you tell him, Curtis? Only, only what I told you. And it looks like he and I are starting out even. Huh? But this is one race I don't want to end up in what you'd call a dead heat. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the ideal vacation matter. I looked up Doris Anthony's address on East 73rd and took a cab. That's item three, $1.75 to her apartment. She was tall, rangy, dark hair. And somewhere along the line, I'd seen her before, but I couldn't remember where. Ned Grant? How would I know where he is? He isn't exactly the sort of guy that lets you in on his plans. Hey, listen, Doris, this may be the oldest line in the book, and I know it, but haven't I seen you somewhere before? Could be. I've been around a while. Like where? Oh, I used to sing in a couple of clubs around town. That's where I met Ned. He liked me, so he helped me. In his column, is that what you mean? Yeah, that's what I mean. His apartment manager says you're a very good friend of Ned's. He has a lot of girlfriends. My main claim to fame is I'm always handy. Well, look... Grant told the apartment manager he was going to take an ideal vacation. Any idea what that would mean? Or where? Sure. Wherever there are girls. What do you want him for? Somebody's out to get him. 
What do you mean? Who? Willie Bemis. That name mean anything to you? Bemis is in prison. He was. He's out now. What? When? You didn't know? Uh, I haven't read the papers today. Does that change your mind any about helping me find him? Look, really, I don't know where he is. Honest. There is one thing that might help, though. Yeah, what? Well, a week or so ago, while I was out with Ned, he stopped in at a travel agency. Uh, Davis, I think the agent's name was, on 50, 51st Street, around there. Okay, I'll follow it up. Johnny, if Ned doesn't know, Bemis... Yeah. And if I don't get to him first, he's in for a real nasty surprise. There was still something about Doris that stuck in my mind, but I couldn't quite peg it. So I decided to do a little quick research on her. I dropped in to see an old friend who worked in one of the newspapers. We dug through a lot of clippings in the morgue. Doris had sung at half a dozen spots around town and there were a lot of pictures on her. Then I came to one that rang a large size bell. It was a shot of her sitting at a nightclub table. And a man sitting there with her was Willie Bemis. I headed back to her apartment fast. But she was gone. The manager told me she'd left in a hurry and with a suitcase. Now I didn't know where I stood. If Doris was still friendly with Bemis, it could very well be that she knew where Grant was and was helping Willie Bemis find him. In that case, the lead she gave me on the travel agent was only a bum steer to throw me off the trail. But the way things stood, I didn't have anything else to go on at the moment, so I had to take a chance she'd been on the level. I headed for West 50th Street and the travel agent she'd tell me about, a man named Davis. Ned Grant. Look, customers like him I can do without. Well, what do you mean by that? Here, I'll show you. Here we are. A reservation at Nassau. Here's one in Bermuda. Oh, and here's one for the Virgin Islands. He had you make all those for him? Every one. That sort of thing doesn't make me very popular at those resorts, believe me. Well, it's a sense he can't be at all those places. If you ask me, he's not at any of them. He's always doing that sort of thing. Well, that's a lot of help. Just the same, I'm going to call those places. Where's your phone? Right there on the desk. But I tell you... Excuse me. Hello? Who? Oh, yeah, just a minute. Uh, it's for you, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Johnny Dollar. It's Doris Anthony, Johnny. Well, well, I didn't think I'd be hearing from you again. Why not? After I found out you were an old friend of Willie Bemis, I went back to your apartment. You'd cleared up. Johnny, I'm no longer a friend of Willie Bemis. Oh, now, wait a minute, sister. It's the truth. But I was afraid he might come to see me. That's why I left. Oh, sure. Johnny, the reason I'm calling, I think I know where Ned could be. Where? Well, I'm not sure, but a few days ago, he went to see a friend of his named Mike Hastings. Mike owns a ski lodge up in Vermont. Ski lodge? There's no skiing this time of year. I know. The lodge is closed, but Ned's gone up there once or twice before when he wanted to get away from everything. <sighs> okay, where is it? It's called Hastings Lodge, about 20 miles beyond Bradbury, on a little country road. Now, look. I have no choice but to go on up there. Have you told anyone else about this? No, of course not. Okay, Doris. Don't. Expense account item four, $38.50. Transportation by plane and rented car to Hastings Ski Lodge. As I jounced over the bumpy road up in the Vermont woods, I couldn't help thinking this might be strictly a wild goose chase. But at the moment, I couldn't afford to pass up any lead. It was after dark when I finally drove up to the lodge. It sprawled on the side of a hill way out in the middle of nowhere. There were no lights on, no sign of life about the place at all. The door was unlocked. Inside, the room was pitch dark with all the curtains drawn. I couldn't find the light switch, but I had a real funny feeling. Like maybe there was somebody else in the room with me. Grant? Grant? Sorry, buddy. You got the wrong party. Bemis. That's right. Willie Bemis. Just hold it right where you are, boy. How'd you find out about this place? What difference does it make? Yeah, I guess you got a point there. Except I have a nasty little idea who might have tipped you off. Well, where's Ned Grant? He hasn't shown up yet. So what happens now? So I'll wait for him. What about me? I'll give you three guesses about you, but I figure you're only going to need one of them. (laughs) 
Act Three of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. It is... And now, Act Three of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Ideal Vacation Matter. <laughs> My gun is on the left, if that's what you're looking for, Bemis. Yeah, thanks. So Doris tipped you off, huh? I had a little talk with you. And I thought she was a friend of Grant's. You never know, do you? I guess you're right. Dollar, I'm afraid you're in my way around here, and that means... Well, you get the message, don't you? Yeah, I get the message. You see, you made just one mistake. What's that? You should have stayed at home. Yeah. I should have stayed at home, all right. And if it weren't for Ned Grant, I could have. And then it hit me. Sure. Suddenly I knew what the ideal vacation meant for that crazy Broadway columnist. The answer had been right under my nose from the start. Yeah. I'd finally figured out where Grant was. But it wasn't doing me much good. I had to get out of here, and at the moment my chances didn't look too good. You know, Dollar, you got a very funny look on your face. Have I? Yeah, like something just rang a bell with you. Oh, sorry, Bemis. It's just my normal delirious expression. Okay, funny boy. Play it your way. Over against the wall. Move. Hold it. Listen. There's a car outside. Friend of yours? I don't know. I'm not taking any chances. Now you answer the door, Dollar. I'll be right behind it, and this gun will be staring at your back. It could be Ned Grant who'd driven up, in which case I'd have to warn him somehow. Or it could be somebody else, in which case I had to grab their car and get out of here. One thing's sure, whoever it was, I had to move fast. Johnny? I pulled the door open wide, then threw my weight against it. It slammed into Bemis and flattened him against the wall. He was off balance, so I could He crawled and his gun went flying. But I couldn't see where and I couldn't take time to look. I grabbed Doris. Come on. Come on, I went to the car. Now, you're going to help me for a change. That was Bemis. Don't tell me you're surprised. You're the one who tipped him off about the ski lodge. But Johnny, I had no choice. He pushed me around. Yeah, sure. Johnny, where are we going? New York. Do you think Ned's there? Doris, I think he's been there right from the start. We stopped at the nearest town to call the sheriff. I wanted his boys to try and intercept Bemis. He was a cinch to be following us by now. Then we headed for the city. The sun was rising when we pulled up at Grant's apartment house. The manager didn't answer. Maybe he's still asleep. Looks like I have to take another chance on you, Doris. I tell you, I'm on the level, Johnny. I sure hope so. I got to get up to Grant's apartment fast. Now, there's a payphone over there in the lobby. Call the police and then meet me upstairs. Go on. Okay, Johnny. I went upstairs and pounded on Grant's door, but no answer. I went to the end of the hall and out onto the fire escape. Yeah, there was a ledge. Carefully, I worked my way along it to a window. It was Grant's bedroom, all right. And there he was, sound asleep, with an empty bottle on the bed table. So my hunch had been right. Sure, it was the ideal vacation for a guy who was pestered by everybody in town. Tell everyone you're leaving the city, then disconnect your phone and hole up in your apartment for some real peace and quiet. I went to the front door. Doris? Yes, Johnny, let me in. Okay, just a second. Well, Doris, I was... Well, well. Well, well. But ain't Johnny Dollar. Hello, Bemis. Now, ain't this nice? So you did it again, Doris. Honest, Johnny, I couldn't help it. He has a gun. He made me. Yeah, sure. Pretty smart, huh, Dollar? Finding Ned Grant for me? You know, I don't think I'd ever thought of looking for him here. But you did, so you're a smart boy. Okay, now look, Bemis. Don't interrupt me while I'm talking. Like I was saying, I'm much obliged to you for helping me find Grant. Now that I got him, okay. So I don't need you around anymore. No, don't! Slowly and with a smirk on his face, Bemis raised his gun until it pointed straight at my head. It flew out of his hand. The shot had come from outside, down the hall. The cops! 
Suddenly, the corridor was swarming with police. Bemis still for his gun. Well, you don't get me. Instead, he collected the butt of one over his left ear. Oh, oh, thank goodness they got here. So you did call the police after all. You bet I did. Now, do you believe I'm on the level? Yeah, Doris, I guess I do. And you took a mighty good way to prove it. Uh, what's going on here? Ned. So you finally woke up. Or yeah. took it up. Who... Hey. That's Willie be, Mr. Cartier. It sure is. Well, what's he doing here? What's going on, huh? Hey, look, Bright Eyes, you better go on back to bed. But I don't understand. Just write the whole deal off as a bad dream, huh? <laughs> Expense account total, $115.25. And look, the next time you send me out to protect a guy, don't pick one who's going to sleep all the way through the deal, huh? I don't know. It, it kind of takes the sport out of it. And, Pat, since I didn't find a man who ran away for you, on account of he never really ran away, well, how about sending my fee on this one to the community chest? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our... And now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, an old, old racket comes to light and nearly cost me my life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Robert Rice, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Mary Jane Croft, Lawrence Dobkin, Joseph Kearns, Jack Edwards, Barney Phillips, and Byron Kane. Be sure to join us next week, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Peter Hardy at Tri-Western Property and Casualty Insurance. Hi, how are things at the Golden West? You still in Reno? Sure am. Good boy. What goes, Pete? A little trouble with a big dairy farm out here, Johnny. Amenian dairy. Okay, Pete, tell me all. A year and a half ago in a fire, Armenian lost one of his silos. You know, one of those big towers where they store and cure a lot of chopped up corn and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I know. Cost us $21,000. 21000 for a silo? This time it's a compound silo and the claim is for 56000 Oh. But I don't want to pay it. I don't blame you. Sure, because Johnny, I think it was arson. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-Western Property and Casualty Insurance Company, Reno, Nevada office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the doubtful dairy matter. Expense account item one, 141.20. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Reno, Nevada. It was about 9 a.m. when I arrived, so I checked into the Mapes Hotel, then walked over to Pete Hardy's office. Armenian dairies are just north of here, Johnny, in Warm Springs Valley off Route 33. Well, then I'd better rent me a car. Or you can use mine. Now, now, Pete, how can I run up my expense account unless I have something to run it up with? Johnny, for once... Uh -uh. 
Anyhow, the reason why these silos Amenian has are so expensive. Is that the owner's name, by the way? Yes, Aram Amenian. And I take it he's Armenian? Strangely enough, no. Now, he's had all his silos very specially built. Oh, how specially can you build a silo? Just a concrete base, a lot of long wooden staves to get the circular shape, and a good roof on top. Well, he has some trick with them inside. Like what? That's his deep, dark secret. But he claims it makes better silage for his cattle than is possible anywhere else in the world. And one of these things burned up a year and a half ago. The word exploded best describes it. Yeah. And as I said, cost us 21000 And now the replacement has gone up in flames. Right? Yes, day before yesterday. He filed a claim the same day. Well, why do you suspect arson? Did the local authorities find anything suspicious? No. But you go out and talk with Amenian, Johnny. And if you don't end up with the same kind of feeling I have, well, I'll leave my shirt. <laughs> Expense account item two, fifty dollars deposit on a drive your own car. Finding the Amenian Dairy and Ranch some twenty miles north of the city was easy. It was spread out all over the countryside. Hundreds of acres of well irrigated lush green pastures. Square in the middle of the ranch sat one of the cleanest, most modern dairies I ever saw. Aram Amenian gave me the grand tour, and I must say I was impressed. There was close to 200 well-kept Guernseys in the main barn, which was clean as a whistle. The milking machines, coolers, separators, clarifiers, and so on were the same. Yep, a prosperous-looking setup. Finally, Mr. Amenian took me out to where a small group of workmen were cleaning up what was left of his compound silo. As you can see, Mr. Dollar, only the concrete base is left. That must have been a pretty big silo, Mr. Amenian. That's the largest and most efficient in the entire West. Still, $56,000. Oh, the size had nothing to do with that. It was the inner construction, known only to Barnwell, the man who built it for me, and to myself, of course. Well, what was so special about it? Principally a method of venting. Venting? Yes. It increases the phosphorus and lactic acid content. Well, I thought the point in the silo was to keep it pretty well sealed up. Venting within, Mr. Dollar. But that's all I'll tell you about it. It cost me 56000 to have Barnwell build it. And I wish the company to pay my claim as quickly as possible, because I'm starting construction on a new one immediately. Of the same type? Oh, vastly improved type. Oh, then it was to your advantage to lose the old one. Just what do you mean by that? Your loss came at just the right time, didn't it? Not well, just a minute, though. With the insurance money, you can build a new and better one. And when it gets out of date, I suppose you'll have another fire. Oh, I see. You, uh... You think perhaps these last two were deliberately set? Were they? Ridiculous. Is it? But if they were... Yeah. If they were, I, I certainly wouldn't know it. Oh, come on now. After what you've just said... And what's more, Mr. Dollar, I'm sure you'll never be able to prove it. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. We sometimes wonder, what is the life of a human being really worth? Not too much? Or maybe a great deal? Does it depend on whose life it is? Whatever the answer, one thing is certain. Fred Hargesheimer, since World War II, has felt that his life is worth quite a lot. Quite a lot of gratitude. During the war in the Pacific, about June of 1943... Lieutenant Hargesheimer had his P-38 fighter plane shot out of the sky. Badly wounded, he bailed out over a tiny island, New Britain. It looked pretty small from where he hit the silk, but he found it much bigger when he hit the ground. It was bigger, and in complete control of the enemy. But Hargesheimer was lucky. After a month of lonely hiding, he was found by a group of friendly natives from the village of Nantambu. They cared for him and successfully hid him from enemy patrols for the next four months at the risk of their own lives. Then Hargesheimer was able to make it back to civilization. For the next 17 years, Fred Hargesheimer thought about those wonderful people of Nantambu. 12,000 miles away in the United States of America, Hargesheimer put a great plan into effect. He made speeches, took up collections, sold jewelry belonging to his family and worked out a way to bring a bit of civilization and happiness to the little village of Nantambu. Needless to say, the villagers gave him a spectacular welcome upon his return. Fred Hargesheimer showed his gratitude to the people who had saved his life. But life is worth little without freedom. The right of all men. 
everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Doubtful Dairy Matter. By what he said and the way he said it, Aram Amenian was practically challenging me to find out how arson was involved in the destruction of his $56,000 secretly constructed compound silo. Expense account item three phone call from a gas station on Highway 33 to Reno Police Headquarters. But Lieutenant Brady of the arson squad assured me he'd failed to find anything indicating the fire was set. So dead end. Until I remembered a little trick that had worked for me before and might work again. Item four, 27 cents for a loaf of white bread at a grocery store along the highway. Then I drove back to the Amenian Ranch. If I'd known you were hungry, Mr. Dollar, I should have had something provided for you at the ranch house. In spite of your rather nasty attitude about this loss of mine. Food is the last thing I'm thinking of, Mr. Amenian. Well, then why this loaf of bread, if you're not... Whoop. Now, let's see. Oh, now, surely you're not going to eat the piece that dropped in the ashes. No. No, no. Well, then get it out of your mouth, man. Well, no. mm-hmm. Whatever in the world are you doing, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Yeah, I knew it. You knew what? A sure, a sure test for kerosene, Mr. Amenian. What? Yeah, fresh bread dropped in the ashes of a fire even days after the fire is out. I don't understand. I can still taste the kerosene. And, mister, it makes things look pretty bad for you. Me? Oh, good heavens, man, you can't... Dollar, I resent this... this completely unfounded accusation. Go right ahead and resent. Or better still, let me get hold of a stenographer and you can dictate a confession. Get out of here. Want to do it the hard way, huh? Get off this ranch, Dollar. Now leave. Immediately. Sure. And I warn you, don't come back. Because if you do... Better be careful, Mr. Armenian. The kind of a threat you're about to make wouldn't sound very good in court. Get out. Get out. Out on the highway, I stopped at the mobile gas station again and made another phone call. Adam, five, another 20 cents. It was to my old friend, Herb Carlbert, cashier of Reno's Farm Trade National Bank. It was past closing time, but he promised to leave a door open for me. So I grabbed a sandwich and a Coke along the way. That's item six, 80 cents, including tip. Then at the bank, Herb led me back to his private office. Oh, sit down, Johnny. Tell me all about yourself. Yeah, later, Herb. We'll go out on the town and talk our heads off. Right now, I need some information. I hope you can tell me where to get it. Oh? Information about what? The Armenian Dairy. Or better still, Armenian himself. You know him? Oh, I certainly do. We're his bank. His happens to be one of the best accounts we have, especially in our investment department. You mean it's big? <laughs> Funny big. Like how much? Well, now, Johnny. I'll tell you this. If I had a quarter of his net worth... I'd have retired long ago. No big outstanding debts on his place? Anything like that? Not a penny. Aram's financial condition is his... Now, wait a minute. Yeah? That fire and explosion of his compound silo? Yeah, that's right. Herb, I've found evidence indicating arson. Well, certainly you aren't accusing him. Who else? Oh, no, 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 you're wrong. Oh, now, look, Herb, he filed that claim so fast. It's the most natural thing in the world for him. It's the way he does everything. Like paying his bills immediately on receipt. He works that way. You expect everybody else to? Well, he gave me the impression he wanted to collect quickly in order to have money for rebuilding. Of course. Rather than cash in some of his blue chip investments. Herb, somebody fired that silo. Well, it certainly wouldn't be Aaron. Ah, you sound like you're in cahoots with him. (laughs) What about his employees? From my impression of the man... They love him like a father. Every one of them. And if every employer was as generous as he is, there wouldn't be any labor troubles in this country. Well, the fact remains that somebody somehow stood to profit by destroying that silo and the one before it. Well, I can't imagine who. Even his competitors like and respect the man. Oh, so they say. No, 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 they do. He's helped them stay on their feet during hard times, develop new ideas and methods, then pass them on to them. Oh, the fact remains... Well, Johnny, Johnny, I've had a rough day. How about a nice, cool, casual drink? Then we'll have dinner and take in the town. Item 7, 2130, for drinks and a good dinner back at the Mapes. But I didn't enjoy either. Because Herb and his defense of a median was no help at all. Except perhaps for giving me a list of all the people he could think of who did business with him. I decided to check them all first thing in the morning. Finally, about midnight, having lost our share at a couple of nearby gambling clubs, we parted. Herb drove away to his home on the outskirts of town. I went back to the Mapes. Uh, take Mr. and Mrs. Kenworthy to room 314, boy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What can... Oh, Mr. Dolly. Uh, oh, just my key, please. Certainly, sir. 
Here you are, sir. And I hope you enjoy a pleasant night's rest. Thanks. Oh, by the way, there was a gentleman here looking for you early this evening. Uh, hung around quite a while. Said he'd be back. Well, who was he? He didn't give his name, sir, nor did he wish to leave a message. Mr. Armenian? Mr. Armenian the dairyman? Oh, no, sir. I'm quite sure. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Good night. Good night, sir. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. There he is. There. Huh? Going out the door, the dark brown coat. You're sure? Yes, sir. The same man. I wonder. Yeah, so do I. But, but if he knows you, sir, and saw you, sir. By the time I get out the front door, the man in the brown coat was halfway down the block and walking fast. Faster and faster, as a matter of fact, as I gained on him. He turned the corner, and by this time, both of us were running. Hey! Hey! Were you looking for me? By the end of three or four blocks, it was a real foot race. Then suddenly, he turned into an alley, and like a darn fool, I plunged into the darkness of it after him. Hey! Hey! Right here! Oh, no, you... Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. New Hampshire state flag carries its state seal on a field of dark blue. The seal is surrounded by a wreath of laurel leaves, the symbol of peace, interspersed with nine stars because New Hampshire was the ninth state to join the Union. The heart of the state seal is a representation of the frigate Raleigh, recalling the glory of the early days of sail. New Hampshire state flag, the flag of the ninth state to enter the Union, was adopted on April 29, 1931. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Doubtful Dairy Matters. If it hadn't been for a big interstate moving van that drove into the alley where I'd been waylaid, well, I have a strong hunch I wasn't supposed to have lived through that beating. The truck driver, who absolutely refused a tip, incidentally, half walked, half carried me back to the mapes. And the desk clerk had a doctor in my room within a few minutes. A terrible thing. Terrible thing, Mr. Dollar. You're being attacked like this? And, of course, I'll have to make a report of it at the police. Oh, do anything you like, doctor. Just, oh, just get me patched up, with you? And you eat. You know. Yeah. You, uh, you have no idea who could have done this to you. Believe me, I intend to find out. Judging by this swollen hand of yours, you've got in some good licks, though, and whoever... <laughs> What's the matter? Well, this is a very unusual ring you're wearing. Oh, some kids in the YMCA gave it to me a couple of years ago. I helped them with a the softball team. Oh, yes, of course. That's the Y insignia. Yeah, one of them made it. And the three raised points stand for spirit, body, and mind. Yeah, right? that's right. Well, now, if you just... Oh, wait, what's that for? Make sure you get plenty of rest. Oh, no, no. Now, wait, I'm the doctor. Roll up your sleeves. Here. Yeah, I'll do it. Look, if this shot leaves me groggy in the morning... You wake up feeling fine. There you are. Incidentally, that ring... Listen, before you notify the police... Ooh, hey, this... This shot works pretty fast. Yep. As I started to say, uh, if that ring of yours didn't leave a mark on whomever you defended yourself against out there in the alley, I'll be very much surprised. In a few seconds, I was out like a light. But then a whole set of weird dreams began to plague my somewhat battered mind. And questions about who would attack me and why. Only the why was only too obvious to keep me from finding an arsonist who... Yeah... Yeah, who probably bore the mark of my ring on his kisser. I thought of the names Herb had given me and his insistence that none of them could be guilty. Wait a minute. There was one name he hadn't mentioned, but a median had. Of one man who stood to gain a lot by the destruction of the silos. Or maybe it was just a crazy hunch, part of the wild dreams that came from the beating I'd taken. In any event... In the morning, as soon as the bank was open, I was in Herb Carlbert's office again. Well, yes, he has an account here, too, Johnny. At least he did before. How about loans? Has this man we're talking about taken out any loans? Well, yes, but, oh, Johnny, you know I can... Yeah, I know, I know. The fact remains, he's pretty hard up for dough, isn't he? Well, I didn't say that. 
Although, of course, if that's the conclusion you choose to draw... Tell me this. He owes the bank money now, doesn't he? Yeah. All right. Did he also owe the bank a lot of money about a year and a half ago? Johnny. Yeah. Well? Johnny, you're right. But who would have suspected? And when you consider that Aram Aminian is the one man who has given him money for all the work he's... I can't believe it. Herb, it started out as a pure hunch, but right now I'd bet my... Where can I find him? Well, if Aaron plans to go ahead with new construction, sure, he's probably over... Sure, out there at the dairy. You want to come along? Well, maybe I'd better after the way Aram threatened you. I guess I owe him an apology for the way I tore into him. Let's go. Johnny. Yeah? What... What if we're wrong? What if this man we think is the arsonist... Will you agree that the firebug is the same man who attacked me in the alley? I suppose so. Then we'll soon know. Because believe me, he's a marked man. We made the Amenian carry in 30 minutes flat, and we're told at the gate that Aram Amenian was in the pasteurizing plant. Maybe you better let me talk to Aram first, Johnny. It's not Aram that I'm interested in, Herb, and you know it. Hold just a minute. Huh? What's the matter? Hold it a second, will you, while I tie my shoelace? Yeah, sure. And I've been thinking, Johnny, on the way out, you know, we could really be terribly, terribly wrong. Herbert, Herbert, old man. Aram, we're just looking for you. Well, when I heard the car pull up, I thought it was Joe Barnwell. He's due here to show me final plans for the new silo he's gone to. Well, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Meaning. I want to apologize for... Well, what's the matter? That dressing on your cheek. What about it? Just what is that little bandage hiding? Johnny. Well, Amenian? As a matter of fact, I cut myself shaving this morning. Well, I'm sorry, mister, but that bandage is going to have to come off. Look, Johnny. Now, just a minute, Dollar. Ah, here you are, Aaron. Here's the final blueprint for it. Why... What's wrong, Joe? Uh, gentlemen, this is Mr. Joseph Barnwell, Herb Carlbert. We know each other. And Mr. Johnny Dollar. Yeah. I think we know each other, too, Barnwell. <laughs> oh, do we? Joe, did you have an accident of some sort? Your face. What's going to happen to him now won't be any accident, Mr. Amenian. And I apologize for doubting that you cut yourself with a razor. What? I'm afraid I don't understand. But that bandage on your face doesn't hide any razor cut, does it, Barnwell? For <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. All right, then let's rip it off. You certainly won't. Good heavens, Johnny. Yeah, look. The mark from the ring on my hand where I struck him last night. Okay, Barnwell. Now, now stop. Don't don't touch me. Start talking. <clears throat> Tell a median how you burned up his fancy, expensive silo so you could build another one. <clears throat> how you burned the other one up. <clears throat> Talk. I swear I... Talk. <clears throat> Talk. <clears throat> Talk. Talk. <clears throat> Talk. <clears throat> Yeah, he talked all right, plenty. About a rank it's so old, I hadn't heard of it in years. A crooked builder who burned out his own clients to get himself more work. And in this case, a natural, because he was the only one who shared Aram's secret construction plans. And by the time I was through with him, he blabbed about some of the other clients he'd taken the same way. Expense account total, including incidentals and the trip back to Hartford, $418 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star, Bob Bailey, will return in just a moment to give you a hint about what's in store for you on next week's program. Meantime, listen carefully. There is a biblical verse which promises life is going to be better for everybody in the world when mercy and truth are met together and righteousness and peace have kissed each other. When the people of the United States of America express that thought, it is not in idleness, but in deeds. Today, it is common knowledge that when the gigantic earthquakes and tidal waves struck the Republic of Chile and South America not too long ago, thousands of lives were lost and tens of thousands were left homeless, hungry, and suffering. Immediate aid in the form of food, medicine, clothing, supplies, and professional and technical help were flown to Chile by the United States Air Force in a Mercy airlift. When the work was done and the suffering people made happier and more comfortable, American servicemen received such grateful thanks from the people of Chile that they felt increased pride in being able to wear the uniform of the United States of America. 
This same pride has come to other Americans in uniform when mercy and truth have come together to follow the wake of disaster in other parts of the world. After the earthquake in Agadir, Morocco. After two devastating cyclones swept across the Bay of Bengal into East Pakistan. After a typhoon rocked and battered Japan. As mercy and truth got together, so did peace and righteousness to form a pact for freedom. The right of all men everywhere. And now, here is our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story on yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Next week, while I get into cattle country again, and a Hereford steer solves a case for me. So join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Paul Duboff, Will Wright, John Daner, Harry Bartell, Harley Bear, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, howdy, Mr. Dollar. My name is Jake Denham. I own a cattle ranch out here in Craig, Colorado. How'd you like to come out here and see me? Colorado? That's right. I have a policy with one of your companies, Tri-Western, office over in Denver. Well, what seems to be the trouble, Mr. Denham? Uh, trouble? Oh, oh, nothing like that. Not at all. Then why have you called me? Well, you see, the brand I use in my beef cattle is a Lazy J.D., yeah, you said your name is Jake Denham. That's right. But J.D. is your initials, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the lazy part fits me to a T. But now, why have you called me? Well, you see, I listen to your radio program every week. All those insurance cases you handle all over the country. Glad to hear it. And I just... Well, I thought the lazy J.D. being your initials, too, and and uh, all the local color out here, and... Well, maybe you'd like to come and uh, get some local atmosphere for one of your stories. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Denham. If you have some insurance matter you'd like me to investigate... Well, no, no, no. I told you why I thought you ought to come. So can you, right away? You sure there's nothing wrong out there? No, like I said, a lot of local color. Nice place to stay here at the ranch. Now, how about it? Well, I have a couple of days' work on some reports to finish up. Then right after that, huh? Well... Good, good. I'll be waiting for you. Goodbye. Oh, uh, look... And everything's really okay, huh? Goodbye. Hmm. Mr. Denham, I think you're lying through your teeth. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar. 
And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-Western Life and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Denver, Colorado. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the bum steer matter. Expense account item one, 370, long distance call to Hal Versky, my contact at Tri-Western in Denver. Johnny, good to hear from you. You out in this neighborhood? Nope, still in Hartford. Hal... I want you to okay an expense account for me. Well, now that depends. Listen, do you know a client of yours by the name of Jake Denham? Uh, yes. As I recall, he owns a big cattle ranch over near the little town of uh, Craig. Uh-huh. He carries a straight life of something like forty, fifty thousand. Well, look, I got a phone call from him begging me to come out there and see him. Oh? Something wrong? He says not, but I don't believe him. Well, have you any reason to think something is wrong? Well, only the half-baked excuse he gave me for wanting to see me... Look, Hal, I realize this is just a hunch, but... Certainly sounds like it to me. But my hunches have saved your company a lot of dough on occasion. So how about it? Okay. Put it this way. If you run into something out there and clear it up, we'll pay the freight. If not, well, you just go ahead and have yourself a vacation at your own expense, okay? Oh, now, why don't you relax that iron grip on the purse strings for a change, huh? Why? What would you do? Okay, okay, but I warn you, Hal... If this does turn into a case for your company, my expense account is going to knock you right off your feet. Oh, now, wait a minute. Bye-bye. Johnny! It took me nearly four days to clear up the reports I had to finish. I wish now it hadn't, that I'd left Hartford immediately. Expense account item two, $133. Plane fare and all the incidentals I could think of, Hartford to Denver. I got there shortly after 7 a.m. Item three, fifty dollars deposit on a drive-your-own car in which I promptly headed north and west on Highway 40. That is, after getting out of the traffic in Denver itself, and believe me, that town has it. The 200-mile drive to Craig was routine, except for the lush green hills, the snow-top mountains, the vast meadows and forests. Colorful Colorado, they call it, and it sure is. Finally, about noon, I pulled into Craig and stopped at the Cosgrove Hotel for lunch. That's item 4, 350. From the waitress, I got directions to the Lazy J.D. Ranch. About eight miles south on the Yampa River, just off Route 7, 8, 9. You want some dessert? Oh, no, thanks. This is fine. Hey, you, uh, you one of the relatives? Relatives? Oh, of course not. You're too late. Too late for what? It was real beautiful, though. Half the town turned out for it, and most of the big ranchers. What are you talking about? Oh, my gosh, it's after 1.30. Look, I'm not supposed to be on duty now, and I got a date with my boyfriend. Hey, well, now... Excuse me, now, I wait gotta a go. second. Just pay the cashier in the lobby. Well, but look, I... Okay. I paid my check to the cashier, went out to my car, climbed in, and headed for the Lazy J.D., There must have been several thousand acres to the ranch. All rich, green, healthy-looking pasture land. And Lord knows how many head of beef cattle. The main ranch house was a rather small but well-kept affair near the gate to the road from the highway. And then I saw it. A long piece of black crepe hanging on the doorframe. I, uh, how do you do? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny Dollar. Why didn't you come before? What? He begged you to come, didn't he? To come right away? Mr. Denham? Yes, but I told him... Then why didn't you? You might have saved him. Saved him? Yes, saved him. We buried him this morning. And I think he was murdered. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. The American writer Christopher Morley once wrote, When you sell a man a book, you don't sell him just 12 ounces of paper, ink, and glue. You sell him a whole new way of life, unquote. Now that goes double when you give, not sell, a book. But the gift 
of 550 books to little children increases the legacy tenfold. Near the end of 1960, the employees of the Chase Manhattan Bank started a people-to-people -people program with such a gift to school children of a town in Tanganyika. That's on the southeast coast of Africa. And to give you an idea how the books were received by the children, let me first quote from Francis Bacon. He's an English writer of a few centuries back. He said, Some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few to be chewed and digested. In the past, children in Tanganyika may have done a little tasting and chewing and a little swallowing and digesting, but there's one certain thing. They wound up devouring the books they received from the United States. And they did so much of it that they, the ones in high school anyway, were able to reach the level of English children their age and pass the exams at the same time. That takes a lot of book learning, as they say. Now, the gift of these books from the United States of America may have seemed a small thing to the senders, but the boys in Tanganyika who received them know that they've opened a whole new way of life. They've greatly increased understanding in the classroom of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Bum Steer Matter. The tall, beautiful girl standing in the doorway of the ranch house at the Lazy J.D. outside of Craig, Colorado, was dressed in black. The red about her eyes showed that she'd been crying. But there were no tears in them now. Jake Denham was my father, Mr. Dollar. I'm Virginia. And you think he was murdered? Why do you think he called and begged you to come out here? Any idea who might have done it? Yes. Big Mike. Mike Craven. Who's he? He owns the Sea Lucky Star and wants to own every other ranch around here, and he will unless somebody stops him. How did your father die? Anthrax. That's what they said it was. I thought that was a disease of cattle. People, too, if they get infected from the cattle. And that's what happened to your father? That's what they say, but there's no anthrax around here. Our ranch is clean. Look, let's go inside and sit down and talk about this. Sure, I'll talk about it. If only somebody will listen. In here, John. Oh, thanks. Are you, uh, all alone? Now that Dad's gone, he and I ran the ranch. Now it's up to me. Sit down. Thank you. Virginia, were you trying to tell me out there that you think somebody tried to infect your herd with anthrax? What would you think? Who is your father's doctor? Dr. Regis Ross from in town. Who are you? Well, my name is Dollar, insurance investigator. Say, you fellows act pretty fast, don't you? Sometimes. You're in all right now, honey? I guess so. I told the hands that you're in full charge now. They'll take their orders from you. Or from me. Or from... Sure. Oh, sure, I guess that's best. Thank you, Pete. They might as well get used to it, because after we're married... Look, honey, why wait any longer? I know this is a bad time to talk about yes, it. Yes, But please. I also know, and you know, that this is no time for you to try to go it alone. But what about your medical school? I'll give it up. This is a lot more important than... Well, you're a lot more important. Oh, look, Jenny, you stalled me for a long, long time. I know, Pete, because I... Don't you see I can run this ranch alone? No. You need me, honey. And I'm here to help you. Do you know how Dad felt? Sure. That all I wanted was this ranch. The same as he felt about anybody else who ever came here. Just who are you, Pete? This is Pete Kermer, Johnny. My fiancé, I guess. That's right. Didn't I see a Kermer ranch on the way out here, a small one? That's right. My pa's. He's Carl Kermer. Well, what do you think caused the death of Virginia's dad? Just what everybody says, Mr. Dollar. Galloping anthrax from that Hereford. Then why did he send for Mr. Dollar to come? I'm afraid we'll never know, honey. Well, I do. It's because he knew something was going to happen to him. Where is that steer now? Buried. On orders from the vet and the state inspector. Uh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? You said investigator. Hadn't you better talk to Dr. Ross? Yeah, I guess so. Want to let me have his address? Sure. I'll write it down for you. And, uh, while you're at it, tell me where I can find the veterinarian. And that state inspector, too. Sure. Why not? When I left them a few minutes later, Pete was still making a quiet, but I must say effective pitch for Virginia's hand. Expense account item five, ten cents for a phone call to the state inspector. 
He told me he'd never seen the infected steer on the Lazy J.D., that he was confined to his bed at the time. I called the vet's office, and he was expected back shortly. So I sat around the hotel lobby and glanced over some magazines. And then, in one of them, I found an article that made my eyes fairly pop out of my head. Item six, I called the vet again. He was in. You caught me just in time, Mr. Dollar. I was about to drive over to the Sea Lucky Star Ranch for dinner. Mike Craven and I are old friends. That's so? Yes, ever since we roomed together at college. Oh, I see. I understand you're the man who spotted the anthrax out at the Lazy J.D. Yes, sir, that's right. Just that one Herford. How it ever got to him, I'll never know. The rest of that herd is absolutely clean. That poor old Jake Denham, too. You think he became infected from that steer? Well, how else could it be? Galloping anthrax. Just like that. Doctor, where is that steer buried, do you know? Yes, I had it buried myself. It's some miles out in the far corner of the lazy J.D. property. Then phone the sea lucky star and call off your dinner date. You and I are going out to take a look at that carcass. Oh, no, just a minute, young fellow. <clears throat> Uh, investigator, did you say you were? Uh, that's right. Uh-huh. Uh, I suppose you have some authority. What I don't have, I can get. Tell me, Doctor, is there some reason why you don't want me to see the carcass of that steer? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, let's, uh, let's go. Along the way, we picked up two fellows who were handy with pick and shovel. It was almost dark now, so I bought a couple of powerful flashlights at one of the local hardware stores. That's item 7925. It took a couple of hours for the two men to dig down to the carcass of the steer, but they finally exposed one flank of the unfortunate animal. Yeah, so you, you sure planted this critter deep, Doc. There's part of him. Give us a few more minutes, and we'll have uh, it. No, wait. Huh? Uh, Mr. Dollar, come down here into the hole. Sure. What's the matter, Doc? The color of that carcass. I don't understand this. What are you talking about? Well, this doesn't make sense. The deterioration and putrefaction that always occurs when it simply isn't here. You mean it's possible it wasn't anthrax killed this steer? But I'm sure that all the symptoms, the swellings and the subcutaneous connected tissues in the interstices of the muscles and lymphatic glands, and in the membranes of the mouth and tongue. They were all there, and they were edematous, too. I Could some just... poison have possibly produced those poison. symptoms? Poison? Yeah, look, I read in a magazine this afternoon that strychnia often produces symptoms very much like those of tetanus, lockjaw. Yes, that's true. But a poison that would... Good heavens. Yeah? Why, I haven't heard of it since my college days. Quintanogen sulfide. But why? Good question. Uh, no, Dollar. Because it, it wouldn't explain the death of old Jake Denham. If it was anthrax. What? Huh? Or was he poisoned too? Good heavens, you mean you wait think a minute, that he... Wait a minute. Doctor, the brand on the rump of this animal. Well, that's Denham's own brand, the Lazy Jake. Yeah, but it looks to me like it was put on over another brand. Yes. Yes, you're right. Any way of finding out what the original brand was? No, no. Yes. Yes, Mrs. Dollar. The other side. The inside of the hide might show it. Then, Doctor, you got a skinning job to do. All right. Uh, hand me my bag there, please. Okay, here you are. Go to it, Doctor. Thank you. Oh. That poison. How much to infect a man? Well, even a, even a small scratch on the skin could absorb enough to be fatal. No wonder the Dr. Ross... Ross was the one who treated Jake Denham. Yeah. No wonder we couldn't understand why death came so... Well, no. can you see what the original brand was? Yes. Yes, I can. I'm afraid so. Let me hold the light a little. Oh, I see. But I can't believe it, Mr. Dollar. Pretty clear, though, isn't it? See Lucky Star. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. A couple of thousand years ago, the ancient sage Diogenes remarked that all things are in common among friends. Well, he didn't mean that only material goods were in common among friends, but that they shared their troubles as well. For a long time, the United States Armed Forces have been a friend in time of need. 
during fires, floods, and pestilence all over the world. Many peoples of the earth have come to believe in the friendship which the U.S. military personnel have spread for so many years and the calls for help they answer in time of personal emergency, a response which has always been immediate. Not long ago, a Korean Buddhist nun was suffering from beriberi, an advanced form of acute malnutrition. But she was living in an isolated monastery deep in the Korean hills and valleys. Her sister nuns contacted the nearest Army Signal Corps relay station, and wheels began turning. In no time, an Army helicopter landed at the station's helipad. American soldiers carried the stricken nun to the copter. She was flown to a waiting ambulance and whisked away to the hospital. Her recovery was rapid, thanks to the United States Army, her newfound friends. Army helicopter men helped in many other ways. Over the 108 islands of the Ryukyus that spread from southern Japan to northern Formosa, Army helicopters are constantly whirling their blades as they hop from one island to another on missions of mercy. They bring food donated by American women on Okinawa, or they bring vital medicine to save a life. They also bring friendship and understanding and freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Bum Steer Matters. Looks pretty bad, doesn't it, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, Doc. It looks as though this Herbert Steer was brought over from the Sea Lucky Star was rebranded with a lazy J.D., was given the poison to make it look like it died of anthrax. Yeah, but Mike Craven owns the Sea Lucky Star. I know him, Dollar. I've known him ever since our college days. Medical college? Oh, no, just during the preparatory years. But, but Big Mike couldn't have done a thing like this. Big Mike has wanted to get his hands on the lazy J.D. for years, well, hasn't he? of course, he? over a lot of other big ranches, but... I'd take my life on it. He'd never do it. Hey, wait, wait. wait. Yeah? You should have taken that left turn to get to the Sea Lucky Star. That's not where we're heading. Yeah. Well, then where? If I remember correctly, it's this road to the right, here. Well, you mean the K-Bar K? Got any better ideas? Well, I'll be... The ranch house is dark. It won't be for long. Would you call this a good ranch, Doc? No, old Carl has been just a hanger on. He hasn't made the place pay for quite some... What's going on out there? Who is it? Johnny Dollar, Pete. Oh? I want to talk to you. Oh, sure. Door's open. I'll be right down. Come on, Doc. Let's see if I can find the light switch. The splash light'll do. And we're going on upstairs. Huh? Down there. I'll be right down. We'll be right up. Well, now, wait a minute, if you don't mind. Wow, wow, wow. Nice place you have up here. Look, I asked you to wait down. Dr. Cummings. Uh, I'm sorry, Peter, but this... How'd you make out with Virginia Denham, Pete? Convince her to marry you? That's not your business, Mr. Dollar. Now, just what do you want? Pretty nice ranch to get your hands on, that lazy J.D. I beg your pardon. Hmm. Combination bedroom and study, huh? As Virginia told you, I've been going to college. Yeah, medical school. I set a book you have here. Of course, I'll have to give that up now. Well, you're going to have to give up a lot of things. What? Where did you get it, Pete? What was the name of that stuff, Doctor? Quintanagen sulfide. What do you know about... Well? I don't know what you're talking about. Then why the marker in this book on toxicology? Marker? That was a foolish thing to do, Pete. A dead giveaway. Yeah, I told you. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Yep. Right here. Intelligent sulfide. I, I... I never heard of it. You're lying, Pete. Uh, no. Giving it to that Herford was probably a cinch. Listen, you... But how did you give it to Jake Denham? Dollar, that's something you'll never live to know. Oh, look, now wait a minute. Put the thing away. No! I'll stand back! I said look out. You... Thanks, Doc. I, I guess he'd forgotten all about you until you landed that chair on his head. Yes. 
Now I suppose I'll have to patch this... Uh, patch him up a bit. Oh, absolutely. He'll have to look nice for the trial, won't he, Doc? <laughs> Expense account item 8, fifty-five ninety-five. Living expenses in Craig while waiting for the autopsy on Jake Denham. And yes, the same drug was used on him as on the Herford Steer. A small bottle of the rare drug was found in Pete Kermer's trunk. So Pete's not only lost a chance for a nice ranch, but for living very long. Expense account total, including incidentals and fare back to Hartford, six eighteen fifty. Um, on second thought, how's about just sending that check to the community chest? Then I'll feel a little better about this case. And about myself, too. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, an old ghost town out in Montana. But one of the ghosts carries a 38 Colt. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum, Will Wright, Jack Edwards, Howard McNear, Sam Edwards, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Reed here. Well, hi, George. Haven't heard from you in a long time. Skip the formalities, Johnny. I have a problem. <laughs> you and everybody else. $25,000 problem. Possibly $50,000. Double indemnity clause, huh? Right. Who's insured? Name is Mercedes Crabtree. Crabtree? An elderly woman lives out in Montana. Uh-huh. And how long has the policy been in effect? Almost 30 years. And you're crying because you have to pay it off? Well, that's it, Johnny. We aren't sure. What? A few days ago, somebody took a shot at her. They missed. But... Yeah? Well, last night, she disappeared. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Floyd's of England, American Branch Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Silver Bell matter. Spell B E L L E. 
Expense account item 185 cents. Taxi from my apartment at George Reed's office. He was on his feet waiting for me. His suit looked like he'd slept in it. Close the door, Johnny. Yeah, sure. Johnny, I'm not going to mince words with you. This one's important. Not only to me, but to Floyd. Oh, how come? Because Mrs. Crabtree was one of our first American clients. And because Murdoch Morton sold her that policy. Murdoch Morton? Who that? My goodness, Johnny. Mr. Morton's the president of our company. You should know that by now. Oh, yeah. I suppose I should. Yes. Well, at the time Mr. Morton sold her the policy, he and Mrs. Crabtree became very close friends. And where was Mr. Crabtree while all this was going on? He'd been killed in an accident in his mine six months before. Johnny, you have a very suspicious... I know, George. Prettier people than you have told me. Yes. Well, anyway, since that time, Mr. Morton and Mrs. Crabtree have corresponded regularly. And when Mr. Morton heard that someone had taken a shot at her... Now, wait a minute, George. Mr. Morton's in London, right? Yes. Well, just how did he happen to hear about the shooting? Through Mrs. Crabtree? No, uh, Mrs. Henrietta Scott wrote to him. Oh, and just who is Mrs. Henrietta Scott? According to her letter to Mr. Morton, she claims to be Mrs. Crabtree's only friend in Silver Ghost. Silver Ghost? Montana. It's where Mrs. Crabtree's lived for over half a century, and it's where Mr. Morton wants you to go immediately. Oh. When did Mrs. Crabtree disappear? Well, you received a telegram from Mrs. Scott early this morning. She was supposed to have dinner with Mrs. Crabtree last night and got up to her house, but it was empty. Oh. Well, she waited until midnight, checked again this morning, then wired us. Hmm. Who's the beneficiary on that life policy, George? Doesn't mean a thing. No? Why not? Well, only a couple of people know the policy exists. Also, the beneficiary happens to be Mrs. Crabtree's favorite charity. Good luck, Johnny. Oh, thanks, pal. I'm going to need it. Expense account item two, $178, air transportation to Butte, Montana. Item three, $14.90, bus fare, Butte to Silver Gulch. Like George had said, it wasn't much of a town. I checked into the Silver Queen Hotel, rented a battered Model T, and drove out to the home of Mrs. Henrietta Scott. Oh! Oh, you startled me out of a day's growth. I'm sorry. Mrs. Scott? Yes. Oh, you must be from Grandma's trunk, yes. I uh, beg your pardon? Grandma's trunk. They sent you, didn't they? Well, come along with me. It's in the house. Uh, Mrs. Scott, wait a minute. I'm afraid you've made a mistake. You mean you're not from Grandma's trunk? I don't even know Grandma. It's an antique shop in Butte. Uh. They said they'd send a man out to offer me a price for my hand-carved rosewood headboard. You're not him, huh? No, no. My name's Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Well, why didn't you say so right off? Come on inside. I suppose you're here about poor Mercedes Crabtree. God rest her soul. Yes, that's right. Is she still missing? Rest her soul. Uh, sit down anywhere. Oh. No, not there. Uh, over on the settee. That's it. You comfortable now? Oh, uh, fine, thanks. The sheriff and a couple of men who worked for Charlie Greenpaw were out looking for her most of yesterday. They're at it again today, but they won't find her. Leastwise alive. Well, can you think of anyone who might have reason to kill her? Well... Now, that's hard to say. Most people in this town right now, they ain't got no use for her. Uh, they say she's stopping progress. Now, just what do you mean by stopping progress? Well, Charlie Greenpaw's busy getting some of the old buildings fixed up so they're livable again. He's planning on turning the whole town into a tourist attraction. Uh-huh. Well, Mercedes, she won't hold still for it. She won't let him set foot on any of her land. Won't sell none of it, neither. Does she own very much of the property around here? A little more than half of Main Street. Mm -hmm. And the thing that Charlie wants most, the silver bell. The silver bell? Which is silver mine in Nevada. Leastways, it was once. George Crabtree discovered it. Yes. When oh, the no. vein ran out, he was killed trying to find it again. After that, the mine was closed. Uh, Mrs. Scott. Of course, the town closed down when the mine did. Uh, Mrs. Scott, were you with Mrs. Crabtree the day someone tried to shoot her? No. He was walking up toward her mine, alone. Thought it was just a stray bullet. Uh, just where is this mine? Oh, you can see it from the window right behind you. It's about halfway up the hill yonder. Here, here, you come over here and take... Well, I'll be first cousin to a stink bug. Why, what is it? Up there on that hill, going toward the mine. It's Charlie Greenpaw and Slim Richards, the sheriff's deputy. I wonder if they think she's down inside that mine. A few minutes later, I caught up with Greenpaw and Richards. They'd stopped near a large, newly painted no trespassing sign about 20 yards from the mine's entrance. I introduced myself. Hey, Mr. Dollar, you see that sign says no trespassing? Yeah. Well, folks around here take the signs Mrs. Crabtree had put up mighty seriously. That right, Slim? Sure is. 
You mean you're not going in there, Greenpaw? Well, now, we didn't say we weren't going in. We just thought we'd better consider it before we did anything hasty. But she could be dying in there. Providing she's in there. Right, Mr. Greenpaw? Yeah, that's right, Slim. Now, Dollar, you want to go on in? Why, there's nothing to stop you. No, sir. Not a thing. I left daylight behind as I followed the narrow tunnel deep into the side of the hill. About 50 yards down, the tunnel branched off in two different directions. I stopped for a moment, then took the one to the right. I hadn't gone ten feet when it happened. Holy jump. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. It is a rare event when a young man decides to leave civilization behind and hide himself away in the steaming jungle, just so he can help his fellow humans in a remote corner of the world. The late Dr. Tom Dooley did just that when he left the United States to help the sick and starving jungle people in the little kingdom of Laos in Southeast Asia. Dr. Dooley's story is well known to nearly everyone. And all over the world, people talk of his little jungle hospital on stilts. That's where he treated the dread diseases of the jungle and trained native medical technicians so that they might help their own people. Dr. Dooley wrote and lectured to many people so that the work of his medical assistance program, Medico, might go on. It was not easy for someone so young and so talented to give up the bright lights of the city and plant himself down in an unknown jungle just for the purpose of helping unfortunate people he didn't even know. But through Medico, Dr. Tom Dooley wanted to help people. He wanted to help people to help themselves. Today, the work of Medico is going forward in a number of countries besides Laos. Young men are being sent to the United States to be schooled in medicine with the idea of returning to their own countries to help their own people. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of medical supplies have been donated by American businessmen and pharmaceutical companies. Today, Dr. Tom Dooley's work is being continued for him. It is helping to create better understanding. It is an injection of the spirit of freedom. The right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Silver Bell Matter. I wasn't alone in the mine, that was for sure. But whoever was in there with me wanted to be alone and resented the intrusion. I wondered if they could hear, so I picked up a rock and tossed it on down the side of the tunnel. Mrs. Crabtree, is that you? You're trying to trick me. No, 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 wait a minute. My name's Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. I've got a feed on you now, mister. So don't you move, because you can prove what you're saying. Oh, no, I don't intend to. What are you doing in my mind? Looking for you. Your friend, Mr. Morton, is worried about you. Oh. Walk up this way, Mr. Dollar. But you be mighty careful about it. Yes, ma'am, I sure will. Say, my Doc Morton sent you all the way out here. That's right, ma'am. Your friend, Mrs. Scott, wrote to him. I declare. I seem forgot she even knew. You know my Doc? No, ma'am. I've never had the pleasure. Oh, he's such a fine gentleman. I remember years ago when I first met him. Oh, he was so kind and understanding. Hey, what's the matter? Oh, crazy fool thing I did coming in here and falling. Hurt myself bad, too. Mr. Dollar? You're just going to have to carry me out. It'll be a pleasure. She couldn't have weighed more than 80 pounds, six-shooter and all. I carried her out of the mine and down the hill to her cabin. I had just finished making her as comfortable as I could when Mrs. Scott arrived. Oh, dear. Oh, you poor old dear thing. Uh, you ever hear such sick garbage, Mr. Dollar? Woman, stop looking like you buried me yesterday and run and get the doctor to take care of my ankle. Your ankle? Well, what's the matter with it? Well, it's busted. Ooh. 
Now, why do you think Mr. Dollar had to carry me? Oh, dear. Is there a doctor in Silver Gulch? Doc Weaver, he's pretty old. Oh, he's... he doctored me for almost 40 years. Go get him, Henrietta, before I get mad at you for tattling to Mr. Morton. Yes, dear, yes. Yes, I'll do it. I'll do it right now. <sighs> now then, Mr. Dollar, you come over and sit by me. Keep company till the doc gets here. Yeah, sure. Hey, you know, you really ought to rest. Why don't you start asking me questions, Mr. Dollar? You came all the way out here to do that, now, didn't you? <laughs> well, there are a few things I'm curious about. Like what? Now, for one thing, why you took those shots at me in the mine. Huh. Thought you might be one of Charlie Greenpaw's friends. Oh, he's the man who's trying to buy your mine, isn't he? But I ain't going to sell it. No, sir. No matter how much he offers. You believe the mine could be worked again someday? Might be. Somebody could find the vein again. But that ain't why I won't sell. It's because my husband, he's buried in there, Mr. Dollar. Him and the others that were caught in that cave-in. Oh, I see. I've told them all. If they set one foot on my property, I'm going to shoot first and ask questions later. Aren't you afraid someone might shoot back one of these days? Oh, I haven't so far. That's not what Mrs. Scott told us. I know what she told you, and she's mistaken. Why, that bullet missed me by a good two feet. You don't think it could have been a warning? No, I don't. People in these parts, if they want to fight me, there are better ways of doing it than that. Well, if that's so, I sure hope they don't try any of them. No one, at least so far as she knew, had reason enough to try killing her. Not even Charlie Greenfall, although she refused to cooperate with the Silver Gulch Improvement Committee. I waited until Mrs. Scott returned with the doctor, then left and drove back to my hotel. I had finished supper and was heading toward my room when someone called me. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Oh, Mr. Greenpaw, I was just thinking about you. That's so? Yeah, yeah, I was wondering why you hadn't thought to take a look in the Silver Bell mine when you first heard that Mrs. Crabtree was missing. Well, to tell the truth, I'd left the search up to the sheriff until today. Then this morning, Isabel, that's my wife, she said if something did happen to Mrs. Crabtree, it sure looked like I did it. Good thing you listened, because she was right. Yes, I know. Say, Dollar, I hear Mrs. Crabtree's taking quite a shine to you. Oh, where'd you hear that? Doc Weaver said that's all she talked about. Hey, look, if you'd like to pick yourself up a few hundred dollars, you sure could do it easy. Oh, how's that? Just get the old lady to sell me her mine and the acreage along next to Mrs. Scott's place. Uh -huh. I'd give her full value for both. And then come to enough money for her to live on the rest of her life real comfortable. Now, you do that, Dollar, and I'll give you $1,000 cash. You know something, Greenpaw? What's that? I could have been mistaken about you. You want that mine and the land around it real bad, don't you? Sure. I spent a good deal of money fixing up the old buildings here in town. If I can get the Silver Bell and enough land out there to put a dude ranch on, why, this town will be able to make Virginia City look second rate. Now, uh, what do you say? I don't know. I'll relay your proposition to Mrs. Crabtree. The rest is... What's all the excitement out there? Well, it sounds Mr. Green like... Paul! Mr. Greenpaw! What is it, Slim? What's going on? Fire! Miss Crabtree's cabin. It's blazing like fury. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. For thousands of years, the oceans of the world have taken their toll of the treasures of the people who live near them or travel over them in calm and in storm. And for an equally long time, these same people have dived to the bottoms of these oceans seeking those treasures, gold, silver, jewels, and emblems of tradition or symbols of history have been the sought-after prizes. Late in 1959, a group of English divers, seeking underwater specimens of fish and plant life off the coast of the island of Teixeira in the Azores, came across a group of some 17 ancient cannons. They'd been swept off the walls of the old fortress by a tidal wave sometime during the middle of the 19th century and sank about 100 feet to the bottom of frequently storm-swept waters. News of the discovery was relayed to the Portuguese government, which gave permission for the raising of the relics. American skin divers, stationed at the Air Force base on Teixeira, volunteered to do the job on off-duty hours. In cooperation with the Portuguese Museum, the men made a few exploratory dives to determine the situation. Then the salvage work began. After cleaning the cannons, some made of brass, others of bronze, 
it was discovered that they had been forged in England, France, and Portugal more than 110 years before. Now the shiny symbols of history are on view in a Portuguese museum. The Portuguese people are happy because of an unselfish American gesture that brought back to them their symbols of the defense of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Silver Bell Matter. By the time we reached the cabin, it was all over. For a moment, I was afraid Mrs. Crabtree hadn't managed to escape. And I saw her on the ground in the sheriff's car, wrapped in blankets. Hey, you! Get back over there! It's all right, Sheriff. This is Mr. Dollar. Oh, I heard you're in town, Mr. Dollar. This is Sheriff Wilkins, Johnny. Sheriff, do you have any idea how this fire started? Not yet, I don't. I asked her, but... I'd rather not talk about it now, Johnny. Maybe, maybe some other time. Whatever you say. She's pretty done in. Johnny? Yeah? You tell Mr. Greenpaw. Tell him I'll sell. Will you do that for me? Well, I... Well, look, I'll talk to you about it in the morning. No. I want to sell now. Nothing to stay here for. Nothing. We'd better get it down to Mrs. Scott's place. Doc Weaver's given us some morphine. You go ahead, Sheriff. I'm going on back to town. Sure. See you later, Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Is she going to be all right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Greenport, do you have a map of this area, including all the land you're planning on buying? Not on me. It's down at the office. You want to see it tonight? Yeah, I sure do. I took a look at the map. Got a little sick at my stomach. Then drove back to Henrietta Scott's. There was a light on in the front room, so I got out of the car and walked up to the door. Yes, who is it? Johnny Dollar, Mrs. Scott. Oh? Isn't it a little late to come calling, Mr. Dollar? I mean, after all, Mrs. Crabtree's sleeping sound, and I'm all ready for bed. I want to see Mrs. Crabtree. I want you to wake her up. Well, I just couldn't do that. The doctor told me she should have as much sleep as she can get. Yeah, you took his orders a little too literally, Mrs. Scott. Why, whatever do you mean? I mean trying to burn her house down with her still in it. What? Yes, she trusted you. She thought you were the only person she could trust. Then when she found out different, she decided to sell her land and get away from here. Why, that's a pack of the biggest lies I ever did hear. Now, what reason would I have for wanting to hurt the poor old dear? Money. Money? You own most of the land adjoining the Crabtree property, including that around the Silver Bell. Greenpaw wouldn't buy your land unless he could buy Mrs. Crabtree's. When she refused to sell, you decided to see that that property changed hands the hard way. If that's so, why would I be so concerned about her? Now, why would I write Mr. Morton telling him she'd been shot at and then wiring when she disappeared? Why? To protect yourself. You purposely missed her that day. You had to set up your alibi. You've got no proof. No, no, you're right. I haven't. But Mrs. Crabtree has. She knows who and what started that fire in the cabin. Now, get out of my way. No. Oh, oh. Crabtree. Mrs. Crabtree. Huh? What is it? All right, Mr. Dollar. You move away from her. Not until I find move out. Move away now or I'll shoot. Oh, well, when you put it that way, Mrs. Scott, I'll, I'll have to. You were right about me missing her on purpose. Anybody's lived up here long as I have. They don't miss with a rifle good as this one. Mr. Dollar... Now, Mr. Dollar, she started the fire. Mr. Lee, you shut up. You you try and make me. Maybe I will, like I should have before. You see that... Oh, no, you don't. No. No. Give me that rifle, Eddie. No. no. Why? Why did you have to ruin it? Why? Somebody had to. You okay, Mrs. Crabtree? Did I, did I do good getting her attention? You, you did just fine. I was ready to leave Silver Gulch the next day, but I stayed over for another week, waiting for a little English gentleman by the name of Murdoch Morton to arrive and claim his bride. Yeah, just about everybody in Montana came to Mrs. Crabtree, pardon me, Mrs. Morton's wedding. Everybody that is but her old friend. 
This is Henrietta Scott. Expense account total, $317.10. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a beautiful girl is killed. And with her goes a big part of my own heart. It's one of those things that... Well, join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles B. Smith, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, D.J. Thompson, G. Stanley Jones, Frank Nelson, Sam Edwards, and Will Wright. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Randy Singer, Johnny. Oh, hi, Randy. How's the New York City Police Department these days? Well, the department's fine. Me, I'm not so sure. Well, then maybe I'd better run on down there and cheer you up a bit, huh? Yeah, you'd better come down here on account of Mary Grace Marshall. Hey, how do you know Mary Grace? The point is, you do. Well, matter of fact, I just got back from a weekend in that town of yours... Yeah, Mary Grace and I had a ball. We took in a couple of shows, did the nightclub routine. Yeah, I know. Even spent Sunday afternoon together out at the... What do you mean, you know? Johnny, your little girlfriend's been murdered. What? Yeah. Randy, have you got any leads, anything to go on? Yeah, Johnny, plenty. Then I'll grab the first plane. Yeah. You'd better. <laughs> In the exciting adventures of a man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Mideastern Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Mary Grace matter. Expense account item one, 10 cents, phone call to the airport to reserve a seat on the first plane to New York. Item two, phone call to Ben Perrin at the Claims Department of Mideastern Life. 
Ben, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh, hello, John. Now, listen, I'm on my way down to New York at your company's expense, though the expense part is beside the point. Oh, uh, no, no, just wait a minute. Mary Grace Marshall has just been murdered. Marshall? Your company holds a policy on her, and I'm going down there to investigate. Well, now, wait, John, until we issue proper authorization for you to conduct the investigation. Don't give me that, Ben. I'm going down there now. Well, then it's completely without sanction from this or any other office. Okay, okay, forget it. I was trying to save time, and I thought I was doing you a favor. Well, I suppose you are, but until a request for your services can be rooted I said forget it, didn't you hear me? I gotta go, gotta catch a plane. Well, for heaven's sake, man, what are you so up in arms about? Why are you so concerned about this particular... Because that girl was a personal friend of mine. A very dear friend. Oh. John, I'm... John, I'm sorry, I can see now why you're so upset. Yeah, I'm upset. By all means, go ahead, officially. And if there's anything I can do... Yeah, there is. You can stop all this yammering so I can hang up and get out of here. Goodbye. John. Yeah, what now? You really cared for that girl, didn't you? Yeah, Ben. I cared. Expense account item 3, 920. Cab to the airport and plane ticket to New York. The trip down there gave me time to think. And thinking about it hurt. Mary Grace Marshall. Tall, brunette, and very beautiful. And as straight a girl as I'd ever known. There was a time a few years ago when I'd hoped she might marry me. But she wanted to stay with her successful career as a fashion designer. And she was right. I'm not the marrying type either. So we just remained friends. We had a lot of fun together. Theaters, dancing, an occasional nightclub. Sometimes the long hair stuff, a recital or the opera. Or we go to the zoo or the circus, a boxing match or a baseball game. Or just go for a quiet walk in the park. And often, just a long, quiet evening in her apartment over a tall, cool drink and good conversation. A good night kiss... But that was all. Now she was gone. And believe me, somebody was going to pay. Item four, six dollars even for a fast taxi to the 18th Precinct Headquarters and Sergeant Randy Singer. Come on in, Johnny. Close the door. Sure. Hi. Better uh, sit down, huh? Yeah. All right, when did it happen, Randy, and how? You said on the phone you have some leads. Clues all over the place. They all point toward one person. Oh. Toward the one person known to have been with her at about the time the coroner says she was killed. How was she killed? Struggle. Fell and struck her head on the base of the fireplace. Cigarette, Johnny? Oh, yeah, thanks. Incidentally, so far I've been able to keep this thing out of the papers. Oh, hey, give me a light, will you? Oh, I seem to have forgotten my lighter. Yeah, you have. Here. Thanks, now, the coroner says she was killed Sunday night, late. What? By somebody who must have spent several hours with her. You said late Sunday night. That's a... Go on, Johnny. Hey, look, stop snapping that lighter and... Wait a minute, where'd you get that? According to all the evidence, it was left behind by whoever murdered Mary Grace Marshall. Here. Look familiar? Are you crazy? This lighter is mine, I... Yeah, Johnny. I know. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Mary Grace Matter. Mary Grace Marshall, an old friend, a very dear one, murdered in her New York apartment on East 77th Street. Sergeant Randy Singer, my old friend at 18th Precinct Homicide, had called me immediately. And when I got there, showed me a very damning piece of evidence. Presented to Special Investigator Johnny Dollar by the International... Sure, Report. of course it's my lighter. And I must have left it in Mary Grace's apartment Sunday night. But that certainly doesn't mean that I killed her. Coroner says she died about the same time you were there. Oh, how do you know what time I was there? Wife of Charlie Walker, the building superintendent, Johnny. She saw you leave. That isn't enough evidence to convict a fly, and you know it. There's plenty more. Yeah, like what? Your fingerprints all over the place? Well, sure, I told Cigarette you. butts, same brand you smoke. So what is that? A for? lot of them, Johnny. Like a very nervous smoke. Well, I was with her all evening. Doing what? 
Oh, now look, Randy. Surely you can't be serious. You can't think for a minute. You that look, I... Johnny. This is my case. Nobody else's. I'm keeping it that way. I've kept it out of the papers. I think you know why. Oh, sure, sure I know why. Because we've been buddy-buddy for so long, you want to be sure that if anybody hangs me, you will for old times. I asked you what you were doing. Well, let me tell you something, Randy. That girl meant a lot to me. What were you so doing shut Sunday up and night? tell me what other evidence you have, what you know that can help me find out who... Uh, I- I'm sorry, Randy. Sure, it's, it's your job. I'd probably do the same thing to you under the circumstances. If you didn't, I wouldn't have any use for you. But don't you see? Okay, look. Look. We spent Sunday afternoon at the zoo, the Bronx Zoo. Went up on the subway. We walked a lot. Got pretty tired. I promised her a dinner at the Chambord over on 3rd Avenue. But she said she had some food at the apartment, so we went back there. Then we just sat around and talked, played some music, that's all. And had some drinks. Yeah, I picked up a bottle of scotch on the way. How many drinks? Oh, one or two light ones is all. Sorry, Johnny, that bottle was nearly empty. But that's him. Who discovered the body? Mrs. Walker, wife of the apartment super. The one who saw you leave shortly after hearing the screams that made her... Screams? Yeah, that made her finally go up and look in the Marshall girl's oh, apartment. she's crazy, Randy. You're lying. Can you prove it? I'd like to talk to that woman. I think you She's off her rocker if she told you she... What'd you say? I think you ought to see her. Huh? But if I'm your big suspect... Well, sure you are. Until you can help me prove I'm wrong. <laughs> We drove over to the place on 77th Street in a prowl car. Everything was exactly as it had been when I'd left Sunday night, except that there were signs of a struggle, as Randy had said. A chair and a lamp had been knocked over. The hi-fi shoved aside when she'd fallen at the fireplace. Even the bottle of scotch from which I'd poured a couple of small... Hmm. What's the matter, Johnny? Well, I'm not sure, Randy, but... Well, I'd have sworn I left this bottle out in the kitchenette where I... Huh? Hey, are you making more prints? Yeah. Look, this bottle of soda, three quarters full. You don't kill most of a bottle of scotch with only this much soda. Unless you're drinking it straight. Oh, who drinks it straight these days? An alcoholic? Or somebody who needs a jolt for his nerve? Well, maybe. Want to go downstairs and talk to the super's wife? Yeah, let's. <laughs> superintendent's wife turned out to be a living doll. Young, pretty, with too much makeup. The sort of looked like she decided to get out of the chorus line for a quieter life as the wife of a building superintendent. I noticed a peculiar, spicy kind of odor when she first let us in, but thought nothing of it at the time. Now, you sure this is the man you saw leaving Miss Marshall's apartment, Mrs. Walker? I was standing right here in this doorway. It was after I heard her screaming up there around midnight. You sure you heard her scream? Well, my husband heard it first. He woke me up, pounding on the wall between our bedrooms. Well, didn't he get up to investigate? Oh, no, the lazy... Well, he's been sick. He's still sick. But then I heard the screaming, so I run into his room and ask him what to do. Go back to bed and forget it, he says. It's probably just a party upstairs. Then you went up and found the body, huh? Well, first I tried to sleep, but I kept thinking I heard noises. From upstairs? Well, no. You sure? It was like maybe my husband was getting up or something. Go on. Well, finally, about 2 a.m., I went up to her apartment. When she didn't answer my knock, I let myself in. And there she was, dead. Who called the police? You or your husband? Him? Besides, I told you he was sick. He still is. I'd like to talk with him. Oh, sure. If he's sober enough. Come on. That was a funny crack. If her husband really was sick. She led us toward the rear of the apartment, and I mistakenly started to enter her bedroom. That peculiar odor again, only more pronounced. And believe me, it was an arpege. Here, mister, this way. Her husband's bedroom was pretty much of a mess, untidy, with pictures of bathing beauties, calendar art, and some striking pictures of Mary Grace Marshall plastered all over the walls. This room had an odor about a two of stale booze. Here you are, Charlie. No. No, I, I tell you, I don't want any more of that stuff. Well, you seem to think it'd make you feel better. I did. What did you... Oh. Oh, the cop again. That's right, Mr. Walker. And this is the guy seen coming down from your girlfriend's apartment after all the screaming. 
His name's Johnny something. You actually heard screaming up there, Mr. Walker? Yeah. Yeah, awful racket. Woke me up. Scared me. What do you mean? That poor girl up there, all alone. Only she wasn't alone. But then it stopped. I figured maybe I'd been wrong. Had a nightmare or something. Yeah, sure. A dream about her. You think about me for a change instead of dreaming about shut, that dame. Shut up. Talking about her, dreaming about her, sneaking around to have a look at her when she came shut in and out. If you wasn't sick, I think you'd sneaked up there and done her in because you couldn't have her. Will you take her out of here? It wouldn't be the first time a drunken bum has killed somebody. Shut because... up! It. Shut up! Mrs. Walker, I thought I told you this man was supposed to be kept quiet. Oh, well, now, look, Doctor, I... Doctor, yeah. yet I walk in here and find this sort of thing going on. Go on, all of you. Out of here while I attend this man. Just a minute, Doctor. Out immediately. This is a heart case complicated by a very serious virus infection. Doc, if I can have just one Later, minute. officer. I must save this man's life. Come on, Randy. You too, Mrs. Walker. Yeah, sure, sure. He's been getting alcohol again, strictly against my order. Now, look here, Mrs. Walker. No, no, wait. Huh? Come on upstairs with me again. Oh? What'd you think of? A couple of things, Randy, that I believe will clinch this case so fast. Come on. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Mary Grace Matter. What do you mean, clinch the case, Johnny? Didn't you hear enough from Charlie Walker and his wife? Yeah, I heard plenty, Randy. Well, then what's the point of coming back here to the dead girl's apartment? Let me show you something here in the kitchenette. A scotch bottle. Uh, you shouldn't pick that up, Johnny. Print. Yeah, prints. And where your boys dusted over them to show them up. But look. Yeah? Right here they're smeared, see? By a piece of cloth. Sure, he tried to erase them when he killed that bottle. Now, come on back to the living room. And here, take a look at this. Well, what's the hi-fi set got to do with I it? I told you, Mary Grace and I sat here Sunday night talking and playing records. So? This record on the turntable is the same one we were playing just before I left her. Look at it. Hmm, Dolorima by Vingetti. Never heard of it. We shut it off because it got too noisy in the death scene from that opera, huh? Listen. Yeah, here it is. Holy... It sounds like somebody... Shut it off! be done. Sure. The screams that Walker and his wife said they heard. And that record's what gave him the idea. And now it's a matter of pin it on him. All right, what have you got for his motive? Motive? Are you kidding? Didn't you see those pictures of all those beautiful half... Those those babes he has on the wall of his room? And the pictures of the Marshall girl? All right. He was gone for Mary Grace, talked about her, dreamed about her, had her pictures all over his room, but she wouldn't give him a tumble. All right. All right. So he hits the bottle heavier than ever on account of this frustration over the Marshall girl. Wouldn't be the first time that sort of thing has happened. Happens all the time. So if he can't have her, he's going to kill her. You see my point? Yeah, and it's well taken, Randy. All right. Last weekend, you're taking his dream girl out on the town, having a good time with her, doing all the things he wished he could do. Go on. Well, it's too much for him, driving him out of his rum-soaked mind. Then he hears that screaming on that opera record. It gives him the idea. He wakes up his wife so she'll hear it too. So his wife will think somebody's getting killed up there. But he doesn't let her go up there, right? Sounds good, Randy. After his wife goes back to bed, that's when she saw you leave, he goes up there and kills the girl. But if he was as sick as he appears to have been... John, the time like that, a man gets superhuman strength. Strength of a madman, they call it. And listen... I'm listening. His wife said she thought she heard him walking around, remember? I remember. So that's it. She finally got up, came up here, and found the body. So naturally, she tied it all in with the screams her old man woke her up to hear. And that suited him perfectly. She couldn't help but alibi for him. Come on, let's get downstairs again. I realize, Johnny, it's all circumstantial, and I still have to pin it on him. Or her. But I'll hold him on suspicion. Or her. The same circumstances would work just as well for Walker's wife if she were the killer. Yeah, but what about the motive? Jealous wife. Jealous of somebody taking that drunken bum out of her hair. That funny odor I noticed about her when I first stepped into this place. I finally remembered what it is. Hey, 
I noticed that, like a uh, like a cooking spice. Well, it is sometimes. Cardamom seed. Cardamom? Yeah, they used to call it the drunkard's friend. A man could booze all night, chew a couple of cardamom seeds, kiss his wife goodnight, she'd never be the wiser. Well, I'll be... That odor was so strong in her bedroom that... Well, maybe she's the lush, huh? Hey. And tried to make the same thing out of her husband. On the excuse it would make him feel better. You... You mean he isn't a heavy drinker, Doctor? No, he is not. Doctor, you said he has a heart condition. A very serious one. Complicated by a... Yeah, yeah, I know. Could he possibly have got out of bed, climbed those stairs Sunday night, struggled with and killed someone? The odds against his surviving such a thing are a million to one. A hundred million. All right, I heard it all. That means you're going to start accusing me of killing that girl up there. Mrs. Walker, I told you to stay out of your husband's room. Yeah? Well, he's dead, Doc. Dead? I don't know what you give him, but he's dead. Did you give him more liquor? No. But you gave him enough before I came to... Wait here, all of you. Well, you're going to try to pin that Marshal Dame on me now that Charlie's gone? You've already pinned it on yourself, Mrs. Walker. What? You thought you'd left no fingerprints on that bottle up there. Well, I didn't. I used a handkerchief. Yeah. I... That's what I thought. No, 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 wait a minute. I, I, I didn't mean that. Too late, I'm afraid. Oh, no, it ain't. Put down that gun, Mrs. Walker. All right. So I kill that dame on the second floor. And if I have to kill you, I... Oh! Ooh. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. It's... It's quite all right, sir. Well, Randy, there's your killer. Happy. Yeah? I guess I ought to be. You? It doesn't bring back Mary Grace. <laughs> Expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford? No, no, wait. I took on this case myself because of Mary Grace and, well, whatever she may have meant to me is none of the company's business. Oh, sure, you'll have to pay the claim on her policy. But let it go with that, will you? The rest is on me. I want it that way. Understand? For old time's sake. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Johnny Dollar. Earl Foreman, Johnny. Oh, hi, Earl. How are things down in sunny Florida? I don't know. You what? I'm calling from Green Mountain Falls, Colorado. What under the sun are you doing out there? Fishing trip? Hardly. Because if it is, I'll join you. I want you to join me, all right, but no fishing. I got a problem, Johnny. One of my important clients has disappeared. Ah, I see. Okay, Earl, I'll grab the next plane. <laughs> Bob 
Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> and now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company Attention Earl Foreman. Following is the account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Three Sisters matter. Expense account item one, $151.80, transportation to New York, then airfare and incidentals to Colorado Springs. Earl met me at Peterson Field, the municipal airport. I'm glad to see you, Johnny. All right. Toss in your bags and pop in. Okay, sure. Huh. Now, where's this Green Mountain Falls you call from? A little place about 12, 13 miles east of here. Uh, I'm staying at the Lucky Four Ranch. One of the last places Rolinov was seen. Rolinov? Uh, Misha Rolinov, the concert pianist. Rolinov. Oh, sure. Yeah, I've heard of him. He has a little place up on the mountain just back of the Lucky Four where he and his daughters live when he's not on concert. Daughters? How many? Olga, Maria, Ada. Now, here's what happened. Rolinov and the girls, well, they're really stepdaughters, by the way. Oh, where's the mother? Uh, she died some years back. Well, anyhow, they arrived up here about ten days ago, right after his last concert swing over in Europe. Well, what does he do when he's up here? He and the girls just low. Oh, he has a piano in his cottage to keep him practice, that's all. And now you say he's disappeared. You see, Johnny, he was fond of taking long walks. This is pretty good hiking country. Oh, you can see that all right if you're part mountain goat. Yeah. Well, anyhow, three days ago, right after breakfast, he started out on his usual morning walk. He stopped in for a second cup of coffee with Ray Schmishny and his wife. Who are they? Uh, Ray and Glee has run the lucky four. Oh, yeah. Well, go on. Well, uh, that's all. That was the last time Rolinov was seen. Well, was any kind of a search been made? Yes, and that's not easy terrain to search. There's been quite a bit of snow, too, enough to cover up any tracks he might have made. All right. Do you know of any reason he might have wanted to disappear? No, I don't think so. I, I knew him very well, Johnny. I've known him for years. Of course, he uh, occasionally got fed up with having three girls around his neck all oh, the time. Silly man. Well, that who wouldn't, but he loves it, I'm sure. Especially Ada, the youngest. She's a brilliant pianist. Hey, Earl, tell me, uh, how did the girls feel about him? Really feel about him? Oh, no, just a minute. Well, Johnny. you said yourself they aren't his own blood. Well, just wait till you meet them and decide for yourself. Yeah, Earl, I will. Lucky Four was on a level spot on the side of a mountain. It consisted of half a dozen neat, modern, comfortable cottages, and from the front window of the one we shared was a beautiful view of Pike's Peak. Huh? Oh, come in, Ray. Come in. You see us come up the drive? I want you to meet the man I've been telling you about. Ray Smishny, this is Johnny Dollar. Hi, Ray. Johnny? Only, I'm afraid he got here too late, Earl. Oh? Well, what do you mean? Well, just a few minutes ago, before you got back here in a gully up on the West Meadow, way up where I dumped the trash, you know what I mean? Yes. Remember the bear cave I pointed out to you one day when you went up there with me in the Jeep? You mean that bear got Rolinoff? No, but that's where I found him. Rolinoff? Dead, Earl. Dead? A bullet hole in the back of his head. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Question. Was Misha Rolinoff, the eminent concert pianist, murdered? Or was he shot accidentally up near the bear cave on the mountain back of the Lucky Four Ranch at Green Mountain Falls, Colorado? We went up there and raised Jeep. A careful inspection of the body and the gully in which he found it revealed nothing by way of clues to the river. One thing, Johnny. Yeah, what's that, Ray? Well, like I told Earl here, I was planning to shoot that bear myself. Yeah. And letting him get nice and fat on the garbage from the ranch. So what? What's that? Guy? He used to come down every day, regular as clockwork, and tip over the pails and gorge himself. Well, what are you trying to say? It's been over a week now since I've seen him. Well, I, I don't see what you're getting at, Ray. Well, it could mean only one thing, Earl. Somebody else got to that bear before I could. And it must have been some time before Rolling off disappeared. That's right. 
So his being killed here couldn't have been accidental by somebody gunning for that bear. Look here, Johnny. This cartridge case I picked up. Oh, let's see. Here. 257 Roberts. Where'd you find it? Behind that tree there down the slope. You know anybody around here who shoot the 257 Roberts? All the hunters in these parts use a 30 six or a 270 or a 30-30. Only 257, I've... Well, what's the matter, Ray? You look sick. Yeah. There's, there's a 257 up in the Rollinoff cottage, and one of the girls, she's a pretty good shot. Ray, you know what you're saying. Which one, Ray? Olga? Maria? Ada? No. No, I won't do it, Johnny. I, I won't accuse you. Look, look, this is no guessing game. This is murder. No, Johnny, I can't believe it. Not one of them. Besides, I... Look, I, I got to drive into Colorado Springs, notify the coroner and the police. But if you know something that'll help us... No, quit. no, Johnny, because if I was wrong, I'd never forgive myself. Don't you understand? Oh, all right. Earl, do you know the way up to the Rollinoff place? Yes, Johnny. The road all right for my car, Ray? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Then let's go. <laughs> Take it easy, Earl. This road isn't much wider than the car. I know it. Rolling off cottage is right up in that clearing, middle of that big meadow. You know those daughters, stepdaughters. You figure which one of them might have wanted to kill Rolling off? Oh, no, Johnny, no. Well, who's the beneficiary of this policy? Well, it's a very unusual policy. Now, what do you mean, unusual? There's no beneficiary specifically named. What? The beneficiary or beneficiaries are to be the same as the heirs that are specified in Rolinov's will. Well, who? Nobody knows. Well, where is his will? Same answer. Well, now, look, here. he's always made it very clear that his will would show up at the proper time. I assume, of course, his stepdaughters will be his heirs. Oh, but if they're not... Oh, this is the Rolinov cottage. Well, quite a lot of cottage. And just as nice on the inside as it is on the outside. <laughs> Rolinov used to complain now and then about some of the feminine frippery all around him, but, well, he liked it. And you're sure they all got along well together? Well, of course, every family has a little spat once in a while. Uh, Johnny, Johnny, now listen to me. Oh, well, we shall see what we shall see. I know that after what Ray said, the evidence kind of seems to point to one or all of them, but, well... Yes? Oh, hello. To say the girl who stepped through that door was beautiful would be the understatement of the week. Tall and striking, dressed in something that looked like Schiaparelli or Christian Dior. As though she'd just stepped out of Charles of the Ritz. And if her two sisters were anything like this. Hmm. Johnny, I said this is the older sister, Olga Rolinov. Johnny? Hmm. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Johnny. Hi. Daydreaming? Yeah, I guess so. Well, you're the investigator Earl told us about. Come in, won't you? Sure, thanks. Have you found out anything about Daddy? Uh, Olga, that's what uh, we... No. Uh, no, Olga, we haven't. Oh, dear. It's such a terrible thing. Oh, wait a minute, Johnny. Oh. You wait. Ada, we have guests. Oh. Hello, Earl. Oh, hello, Ada. And this good-looking man is Johnny Dollar. Hi. Hello. Well, that's a nice, warm welcome. Ada, why don't you go in and fix your hair? You look a fright. That plain old house there, really. What's that you're playing, Ada? It's the last thing Daddy wrote. He wrote it frantically in the morning. It was almost as though he knew something was going to happen to him. Oh, come now. And he had to write it before it did happen. Oh. Where were you, Ada, the morning he left? Right here, Johnny. Saying this for the first time. Ever since he's disappeared, I've been trying to figure that it has some special meaning. Oh, Ada, that's such a silly idea. Is it? What did you mean by that, Olga? Oh, it's really... Well, it's like a lot of other silly ideas she gets over her music. Yeah, like what? A lot of things. As though she should be the concert artist in the family instead of Daddy. Maybe now that he's gone, I will be. I'll be greater than he ever was. Oh, sure. And, and I'll do it in memory of him. You'll do it for your own self-glorification. 
I'm sorry, sir. Well, it's all right. Incidentally, where were you that morning, Olga? In Colorado Springs. I went shopping right after breakfast. Or rather, window shopping. Oh. I need some new things so badly. And... Well, you know, I have to keep up with the styles or I'd look like our poor little artist here. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, where was your other sister, Maria? I don't know. Oh, Ada, stop that. When I left the house, she and Ada were doing the dishes. Well, you weren't helping me. I told you, Johnny, I had to go into the spring. Oh, where is she now? Oh, Maria's probably out in the hills somewhere, camping all Maria's over. Maria's right here, Olga. Hello, Earl. Well. Oh, come in, dear. This is Johnny Dollar, the investigator Earl said that you were getting. Earl. So I see. Well, investigator. I saw two. And I didn't like what I saw. Maria was dressed in khaki shirt, breeches, and honey boots. And hanging in the crook of her arm was a high-powered hunting rifle. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the three sisters matter. <laughs> How about aiming that rifle the other way, Marie? Oh, sure. I'll set it down in the corner. It's empty, needless to say. Uh, better let me see it, huh? Oh, I told you, it's empty. Are you a hunter, too, Johnny? You talk as if you were, dear. Are you, Maria? Do you do a lot of shooting? Shooting, yes. Killing. Oh, yeah. Camping around these mountains, blazing away at anything that moves just for the sake of... <laughs> How about that, Maria? Oh, it gives me something to do. Kind of a relief. What else is there to do in this godforsaken place? Have you any other guns? A little twenty-two that I use for plinking. We all use it. Why? I want to see that one you put in the corner, Maria. Oh, sure. And please don't start waving it around the way you did. Here you are. Why are you so interested in it? Oh, I... Hmm. Pretty odd six. That's right. Johnny. And your only other one is a twenty-two. That's right. But why? That's no 22 up there over the mantel. That's Daddy's son. And I'll keep it Oh? Get it down for me, Maria. Why? And why all these questions, Johnny? Better tell them, Johnny. Yeah, I guess. Tell us what? We... We found your father's body. Body? Johnny, you can't mean that. I'm sorry. He was shot by a high-powered rifle. <laughs> Where? Where is he? What happened? It's terrible, Johnny. Tell me. What are you crying for, Olga? I suppose you're glad, Maria. Because now you can do what you please. No more of those boring concert trips all over the world. No more of this God's forsaken place, as you call it. Right, now, I suppose Marie. you're glad, because now you'll have money. Fancy clothes. Europe. The Riviera. South America. Men. Men. Stop! Stop talking like that. Why? Because it's true. No, because it's... Ada, for heaven's sake, stop saying that thing over and over and over. What are you trying to do? Drive us out of our minds? No, I'm trying to find out why Daddy wrote it. What compulsion made him feel he had to write it before he left that morning? Hey, wait a minute. Well, all I have to say... Wait, I said. What is it, John? Ada, get back to that piano. What? Sit down. Play that thing again. Now play it. Slowly. Stop. Johnny, what under the sun are you doing? Listen, Earl. The notes on a piano run from A to G like this. Don't you see? The first three notes of that thing she's been playing are A, D, A. Listen. A, D, A. Ada. Yes. Daddy wrote it as a message to me. Oh, now, wait a minute. The rest of it now, quickly. D, E, F, A, C, E, deface. E, D, G, E, edge. C, A, G, E, cage. C, E, D, bed. What is that supposed to be? Ada, deface, edge. Cage bed. The canary cage. Right. 
And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Tear out the base of that cage. Don't hurt the little bird. Will somebody please tell me what this is all about? Hey, look here. Look. It has a false bottom. Yes. Look, Martin, it's hidden there. Yeah. Last will and testament of Misha Romanoff. Johnny. What? Hmm. What does it say, Johnny? That note with it. Daddy's hand, Johnny. What? Well, it looks like Rolinoff put the finger on his killer. Johnny. Johnny, what does it say? And my reason for deliberately omitting her from my will. Hmm? Omitting whom from his will? What are you talking about? Read on, Johnny. Let me see. It's not only because of the self-centered life she's always led. Hmm. Not only because of a constant, completely selfish extravagance. I'm afraid that could apply to all of it. An extravagance which finally led her to forging my name on checks. Oh, Ooh, Johnny. Then when I discovered that she was sneaking out and practicing with the old rifle that's kept over the mantel. The 257. It was kept over the mantel. Don't move. Oh, right. no, put it down. All right. So he cut me out of his will. And if I can't have what I wanted, you won't have it either. Now look here, I'll this gun holds five shots. I know because I reloaded after I killed him. Oh, God. And now you all know that I killed him. All right. One shot is for you, Maria. Oh. One is for Ada. <laughs> one is for you, Earl. And one for Johnny. Oh, God, listen. And that leaves one for me. So that when I finish, no one will ever know. Olga, you're out of your mind. Maybe so. But what difference does that make now? Because now there's no other way out for me. There's nothing else I can't... Stand still. Because it's the end. It's all of it. No. No. It's empty. It's empty. The gun won't stop me. There's Maria's gun. Not for you, I'll not do anything. You treat me. Oh. Thank God somebody emptied the bullets out of that gun. Yeah. Maria? Ada and I, we didn't want to believe it. We tried not to, but I guess we knew that when Daddy disappeared, she must have somehow... Somehow... That something like this might happen. And she did kill him. And she did. Oh, Johnny! <laughs> Why? Why? What kind of a mind would be so twisted? Expense account total, including fare back to Hartford, three fifty one twenty. Remarks? None. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment to tell you about next week's story. Star, to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a beautiful girl. A model, in fact. And, unfortunately, a model crime to go with her. Join us, won't you? Cracking Johnny Universal Adjustment Bureau. Oh, hi, Pat. What's on your mind? A beautiful model, name of Dorothy Blair. Ooh, hey, wait. The girl with the million dollar face? That's the one. Well, you probably got company. Hmm? She's on a lot of people's minds. Well, she's no daydream to me. She's a nightmare. Oh, go. Well, that face of hers may not be worth quite a million, but it's worth at least a hundred thousand. That's what we've got it insured for. So? So it looks like somebody's trying to tear it up. The policy? No, her face. She got slugged last night. Want to look? At her? Sure, I'll be right over. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar.
Bank account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the model picture matter. Expense account item one, $1.20 for a taxi from my apartment to your office, Pat, where I picked up Dorothy Blair's address then headed for New York. That's item two, thirty-six twenty. I arrived at her apartment just as the doctor left. Even with a couple of bandages on her face, I think you got a bargain, Pat, insuring it for only a hundred thousand. I guess I'm lucky, Mr. Dollar. My doctor says there won't be any permanent scars. Well, uh, just what happened, Miss Blair? Well, I came home last evening about dinner time. I opened the door to my apartment here and started to reach for the light switch, then suddenly I saw a shape beside me in the dark. Uh Uh-huh, and? Before I could do anything, he he hit me on the side of the head. I think it was a gun. It stunned me and I fell to the floor. Then what? I... I remember hearing the door slam. When I could get on my feet and turn on the light, whoever it was had gone. I see. You think it... Could have been a burglar looking for money or valuables? I don't think it was a burglar, Mr. Dollar. You mean you have some idea who it was? Well? Jerry Dunsmuir. Who's he? A fashion photographer. A creep, Mr. Dollar. Oh? The real article, believe me. They ought to put that guy's eyes in jail. You modeled for him before? About a year ago. I swore I'd never do it again, and I didn't until yesterday. It will go on. Jerry'd gotten a commission to do a spread on winter fashion. He wanted to make some street shots with me and Tweed. Things like that. Street shots? Well, I figured the street would be a lot safer for me than his studio. But it didn't turn out that way, huh? No. After the second picture, he started in again with the same old line. And he's not very subtle, believe me. So? So I walked out on him. He didn't like it. But is that enough reason for him to break into your apartment and slug you? It wouldn't be for most people. But like I say, he's a creep. (sighs) Yeah. Okay, Miss Blair. Thanks. I'll have a talk with Dunsmuir. And that was easier said than done. I took a cab to his address. That's item three, $1.60. But his studio was locked up tight. So I contacted my old friend, Detective Lieutenant Al Rico, at 18th Precinct Headquarters. You think you got troubles, Johnny? Try some of mine on for size. Oh, like what, Al? Like an unsolved murder I got tossed in my lap. Oh, that one I've been reading about. The girl up in... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Edith Summers. No lead. Sure, real fat lead, except it's no good. Her ex-boyfriend, Ed Chatsworth. Lots of motive, but no case. Alibi? Airtight. So I got troubles. Now tell me yours. Mine? Well, I'm trying to get a lead on a fashion photographer named Jerry Dunsmuir. Dunsmuir? I never heard of him. How come you're interested? Dorothy Blair got slugged last evening. Oh, yeah, yeah. The girl with the million-dollar face. I heard about it. She thinks Dunsmuir might have done it. I went up to his studio to have a talk with him, but it was locked up. Well, I'll have her files checked, but if we had anything hot on them, I think I'd remember. Yeah. Well, it was just a chance. Uh, excuse me. Rico. What? Yeah. Okay, I'll be right down. That was about your Jerry Dunsmuir, Johnny. Oh? A couple of my boys have found him. Great. Yeah. They found him floating face down in the river. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the model picture matter. (laughs) Expense account item four, a dollar eighty, cab fare back to Dorothy Blair's apartment. She had company. I'd like you to meet Edward Chandler, Johnny. Hi. Glad to meet you, Mr. Dollar. Dorothy, I wonder if I could talk to you for a few minutes. Why? Certainly. Well, I've got to be running along anyway. Is it still okay for dinner, honey? Uh, sure. Eight o'clock. I'll pick you up. Bye, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, so long, Chandler. 
Dorothy. Did you talk to Jerry Dunsmuir? Now, look, you say Dunsmuir tried to get a date with you when he was taking some fashion shots of you on the street yesterday. That's right. He was pretty persistent about it. That's putting it mildly, John. And you think Dunsmuir is the one who was hiding in your apartment and slugged you last evening? Yes. I think he must have been the one. Why, who else could it have been? And why are you asking me all this again? There's... There's nothing you haven't told me, Dorothy. Of course not. Why? Well, the police just fished Dunsmuir's body out of the river. He was... murdered. I haven't seen the medical examiner's report yet, but it's a good bet. People don't usually go for a swim with all their clothes on. But who could... Johnny, you... You certainly don't think I had anything to do with it. I didn't say that, Dorothy. But... You told the voice, the question. Look, I'm telling you the truth, Johnny. Can you prove it? I can prove the part about him taking pictures of me yesterday. This manila envelope. It came in the mail today. Here. It's from Dunn's Muir Studio. He always sends me prints. See? Here's one of me in a tweed coat. Here's one in the fingertip lens. Okay, okay, so he took pictures. I still want to know why you think it was Dunsmuir who slugged you if you couldn't see his face in the dark. Why? I guess because of the way he looked at me yesterday afternoon when I told him to stay away from me, not to call me again for a job. Oh, Johnny, believe me. You didn't see him after that, huh? Unless, of course, he was the one who slugged you in the dark. No. I didn't have anything to do with with what happened to him. And I don't know who did. It's the truth, Johnny. Okay, Dorothy. If it is, I'll find out sooner or later. But if it isn't, I'll find that out, too. Maybe Dorothy Blair was leveling with me. But there were a few pretty important facts I didn't know. Was it really Dunsmuir who'd slugged her? And who killed Dunsmuir? And why? Also, this fellow I'd met at Dorothy's apartment, Edward Chandler. Where had I seen his face before? Item 5, $1.75, cab fare to Dunsmuir's studio. A blonde secretary named Susan Billings was just closing up when I got there. She looked pretty dragged out. Please, please, Mr. Dollar, I've already told the police all I know. Right now, I don't exactly need any more questions. What you need right now, Susan, is a drink. Come on. Feeling better, Susan? Oh, yes. Thanks. But I I really don't know anything that would help you, Mr. Dollar. How long did you work for Jerry Dunsmuir? About a year. And you can't think of anyone who would have reason to kill him? Nobody. You know he had uh, quite a reputation for being sort of uh, eager with some of the models. That was a long time ago, Mr. Dollar. He changed. Not according to Dorothy Blair. I'm not interested in Dorothy Blair or lies about Jerry. Tell me, do you happen to know a man named Edward Chandler? I met him at her apartment. No. Did Jerry Dunsmuir ever mention him? Not that I remember. Hmm. So you think Dunsmuir had straightened himself out, Daddy? I know he had. How can you be sure? He told me. Oh, but you see, Mr. I... Dollar, Jerry and I, we were going to be married. Either Dorothy had been lying to me about what kind of a guy Dunsmuir was, or else Susan had been living in a dream world. Either way, I was fresh out of leave. I headed back to Lieutenant Rico's office, hoping I'd find some there. Johnny, the only thing we know for sure about Dunsmuir is that he sure had a weakness for women. Yeah, but Susan Billings believes that she was his one true love. I know. And I've been thinking about her. Maybe she found out about Dunsmuir's activities and didn't like it. It's a possibility. But if she knows more than she's told us, she's a pretty good actress. Uh -huh. The same goes for Dorothy Blair, which reminds me I want to have another talk with Dorothy. I picked up a couple of names out of Dunsmuir's past, and I want to see if they mean anything to her. Want to come along? Sure, but we'll have to hurry. Hurry? 
Why? She has a dinner date with a guy named Chandler at 8 o'clock, and it's a quarter to two right now. Okay, let's go. that Dorothy coming out the front door? Yeah, with Chandler. Come on, we can still catch Hold him. Hold it. What's that? Who'd you say he was? A friend of hers. His name is Chandler. I met him in her apartment this afternoon. Johnny, remember when you came to see me today, I told you I had a murder case in my lap? I mean, before the Dunsmuir murder? Sure, a girl, Edith Summers. I told you her ex-boyfriend was the logical suspect, except that he had an alibi. Ed Chatsworth. Oh, hey, wait a minute. I knew I'd seen that guy's picture somewhere. It was in the paper. Dorothy introduced him as Chandler. But his real name is Chatsworth. And now it turns out he's a friend of Dorothy's. <sighs> Al, you said either Dorothy had told us all she knew or she was a pretty good actress. Yeah. Well, it looks to me like she's a pretty good actress. <laughs> of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Marble Picture Matter. Well, it had started out as a real simple assignment, but it hadn't stayed that way long. All of a sudden, we had two murders on our hands, and it looked like there was a connection between them. Now, watching Dorothy Blair leave her apartment with Ed Chatsworth, we realized that she was somehow right in the middle of them. They're driving off in his car. Going to tail him, Al? That won't be necessary. Ever since I questioned Chatsworth about the Edith Summers killing, I've had a tail on him. No, Johnny, what we better do right now is start putting some pieces together and see what they add up to. Okay. The first victim was Edith Summers. Killed in her apartment, the Blackton Arms. And you figure that her ex-boyfriend, Ed Chatsworth, had the motive. Well, we heard that Chatsworth wanted to drop her, but she wouldn't drop. But you say he has an alibi. Two people swear he was out of the city the day that she was killed. All right, all right. Dorothy Blair gets slugged in her apartment. She thinks the photographer, Dunsmuir, did it. Then Dunsmuir winds up dead that night. Right. And now we find out Dorothy and Chatsworth are friends. Begins to add up, Johnny. Uh, you think Chatsworth was trying to drop Edith Summers for Dorothy? If so, maybe they rigged a deal. Chatsworth was to get out of town while Dorothy handled Edith Summers. Ah, in that case, you're figuring Dunsmuir found out about the deal and came to blackmail Dorothy. Right. She won't go for it, so he slugs her. Then either she or Chatsworth, or both of them, decide to close Dunsmuir's mouth for keeps. Ah, it's a possibility, Al. Yeah. It is a possibility, isn't it? Al dropped me off at my hotel and headed back to his office. Item six, two dollars, drinks. While I thought about the picture Al and I had built up to explain the killings. Well, it was all pretty logical, but somehow I couldn't buy it. Maybe like Al had hinted, that million dollar face had gotten to me. If I could only talk to her alone, I felt I could find out if she was lying. About ten o'clock, I went back to her apartment. Probably still out to dinner. I was about to leave when she stepped off the elevator. Why, Johnny, what are you... Hello, Dorothy. I'd like to talk to you. Well, I'm afraid I haven't time right now. Oh? Mr. Chandler's just parking his car. He'll be up in a few minutes. We have business. Your friend will have to wait. I want to talk with you. Why? All right. For just a minute... I don't understand all this, Johnny. Well, let's start out calling your friend Chandler by his real name, huh? Why? Ed Chatsworth. I don't understand. I thought his name was Chandler. Oh, yeah? What's this all about, Johnny? Oh, drop the act, Dorothy. I suppose the name Chatsworth doesn't mean anything to you. Why, no, it doesn't. How about Edith Summers? Wait. She was the girl who was killed. 
the day before yesterday. She sure was. I read about it in the papers. But I didn't know her, Johnny. You're sure you and Chatsworth didn't happen to arrange her death? Johnny. What's this all about? And your friend Dunsmuir, he wasn't by any chance trying to blackmail you? I don't know what you're talking about. Please, believe me. I didn't have anything to do with either of those killings. Johnny, I swear it. Okay, okay, Dorothy. I I guess I never could buy it. But I don't get this buddy-buddy routine, you and Ed Chatsworth. I only met Ed Chatsworth, or Chandler, as he called himself, yesterday. You? Let's say that again. That's right. He said he was organizing a big promotion and wanted to feature me in it. Why would he give you a line like that? I didn't realize it was a line. He sounded very convincing. He said he wanted to see some of my pictures to see if I... Pictures? I'd... Pictures? Wait a minute. Those pictures Dunsmuir took of you. Ed's coming up any minute to see them. He wanted to see some outdoor shots, he said. When did Dunsmuir take those shots? The day before yesterday. The day Edith was killed. Where did he take them? We moved around from place to place. You still have the pictures? Right there on the table. Come on, let's take a look. Are these all that he took? As far as I know. Yeah. Oh, nothing here except you. Why? Hey, wait, wait. This shot looks like the front of an apartment house. Part of the name in the picture. Black. Blackton Arms. The apartment where Edith was killed. Johnny... Look, in the background, a man stepping out of the apartment house. Yeah, out of focus, hard to... Hold it. What is it? Is there a service entrance to your apartment? Yes. Somebody just came in. Get down. I shoved her to the floor and hit the light switch. None too soon. I eased out my gun but couldn't see a thing. And I knew I had to locate him before he located us. There was a cigarette lighter on the coffee table. I heaved it toward the kitchen and my aim was pretty good. The flash of his gun pegged him for me. I turned on the lights. It was Chatsworth, all right. I'd hit him in the shoulder, but he'd keep for the state. Johnny. He's the one who killed us, Edith Summers? Yeah, sure. He had an alibi rig, but he spoiled it by walking out of her apartment into the background of that picture Dunsmuir took of you. Then he's also the one who was in my apartment. He probably recognized you by your face. Figured he could find the name of the photographer here. Slugged you when you came in. And I thought it was Jerry Dunsmuir. Poor Jerry. Yeah. Well, I imagine when Chatsworth comes to, we'll find that he killed Dunsmuir to get the negative. He certainly wanted that picture. Yeah. Most pictures don't do people justice. But I guess this one will do him all right. Item eight, thirty-six dollars eighty cents transportation back home. Expense account total one hundred three dollars even. Remarks? Well, there's a little snapper to the story, Pat. You know that picture Chatsworth was knocking himself out to get. He didn't realize it, but his face in the background was far too blurred to make an identification. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, well, the darling of me heart comes back to plague me again. My old friend, Meg McCarthy. So join us, won't you? Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Oh, is it you 
right to me heart to be hearing the voice of me lover boy. Meg McCarthy. Faith, and how could you tell from so far away and so long ago and answer me that? Oh, Meg, I'd recognize that soft, dulcet voice of yours anywhere. How are you? Oh, Johnny boy, I've got trouble. And where are you, by the way? Port Hopeful is the name of the place. Port Hopeful, huh? You just can't stay away from the sea and ships and sailing men, can you? And whose leg would you be after trying to pull now? <laughs> Port Hopeful, Nevada. Nevada? Right out in the middle of the desert. Well, what are you doing there? And why do they call it a port? Then were the very same identical things I'll be telling you when you get here. And if you take to my advice, you won't waste no time along the way. There's trouble out here. Insurance troubles. Oh, what company? Western Life and Trust, they call it. The very same identical company that's insured the life of this blessed man what's laying dead at my feet. Dead at your feet? Meg, you... you don't mean... Just a minute. If you're by way of implication that I done him in, you're just an evil-minded, suspicious young... Oh, forgive me, sweetheart boy. Huh? Well, you was worried about me, wasn't you? Well, certainly, of course, God but... love you, but me skirts are clean. Now, will you get moving and come out here? Uh, well, it kind of depends. Oh? Right? And just what kind of fancy double-talking is that supposed to... Oh, no, you don't. What? Get your dirty, filthy, conniving hands off. Meg, what's the matter? Take them braces Meg. out of here and you... Meg! Meg! Well, I... I guess I was wrong, Johnny. I guess I am in trouble. Now. I'll grab the first plane. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Western Life and Trust Insurance Company, San Francisco office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Alkali Mike matter. Expense account item 1375, telephone call to Bill Kemper at Western Life and Trust, who talked only long enough to order me onto the first plane for the coast. Item 2, 153.50, transportation on a late evening flight to San Francisco. Item three the next morning, 425, cab from the airport to Bill Kemper's office in the Lawson building. Ever hear of Alkali Mike Murphy, Johnny? Yeah, sure, Bill. Well, at least I think so. Isn't he the kind of legendary character who found so much gold somewhere out here? Over in the Black Rock Desert, Nevada. Yeah, a place called Port Hopeful? That's right. The original Alkali Mike had been the skipper of a sailing ship before he got the lust for gold back in the last century. Yeah, well, what about him? Finally found it. Plenty of it. Out there in the desert, near the little town of Winnemucca. And? Built himself a regular palace out of rocks from the nearby mountains. Named it Port Hopeful. Settled down to spend the rest of his days enjoying his money. But then he died. Legend says it was suicide. Yeah, well, what's that got to do with you or me or the company? Alkali Mike Murphy Jr., his son, who spent the last 40 years living there. But now he suddenly died. And how he died affects payoff on the insurance policy we're writing. Oh, how much? 200000 straight life. Ah, we oui. Beneficiaries? Two nephews, one niece, and an old housekeeper, all sharing equally, provided, of course, that one of them didn't help him on his way to the great beyond. And you think maybe one of them did? 50000 apiece is a lot of money, Johnny. Which one? I'll grant you it's only a hunch. But if I were you, I'd make a pretty careful check on that housekeeper. Meg McCarthy? She's an old... Oh, yes. What do you know about this McCarthy woman? Oh, funny, Bill. Then you think my hunch is right? No. Why? Because if it is, I'll handle this case for nothing. But according to the police officer... What's more, I'll quit the insurance business. Item 4, 1320, cab to the airport, plane fare and incidentals to Reno, Nevada. There I rented a car, that's item 5, and headed north and east on Route 40. After about 165 miles of nothing but sagebrush and cactus, I pulled into the town of Winnemucca. I dropped off my bags at the motel Winnemucca, then headed for the local police headquarters. I was introduced to a Sergeant Otis Framley, 
There's no point in driving out to Fort Hopeful, Mr. Dollar. We've got the number one suspect right here. Picked her up last night. Her? Meg McCarthy? Right. And you suspect her of what? Murder. If she didn't poison old Alkali Mike, I'll eat my shirt. Then you'd better decide right now if you want it baked, boiled, or fried. Where is she? In her cell. Come on. You mean you've got some reason for thinking she didn't do it? I know, Meg McCarthy. Yeah, but don't you see she's the only one who was anywhere near him? Besides, look at the motive. Yeah, suppose you tell me about it. Well, she's only been out there at Hopeful taking care of him about six months. Yet she gets under the skin of the old codger enough to make him turn over a big hunk of his insurance money. And that takes care of motive, huh? Well, doesn't it? Let's go talk to Maggie. Now, look, she's a pretty tough customer when she wants to be, so... Right, right. She's a pretty tough customer. And if you silly, stupid income poop starts... All right, right Meg, take it easy. Oh, take it easy, is it? If you blink an idiom, think you can keep a decent self-respected lady... I said take it easy. And I say, and I... Oh, Johnny darling. Me ever loving boy. <laughs> Hi, Meg, oh, you old rascal. Sweetheart, I know you'd come to save me out of this horrible place. Yeah, well, that pretty much depends on you, on what you're able to tell me about this whole thing. You bet I'll tell you. Only, only Johnny. What's the matter? Sure, I'll tell you. All I know is it'll be the honest truth, Johnny boy. But don't you see? The only evidence I can give is enough to hang me. Meg. Oh, Johnny, I need your help. I need it bad. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Alkali Mike matter. <laughs> Sergeant left Meg McCarthy and me alone there at the jail in Winnemucca, Nevada. And she told me all she knew. Johnny had just plain got fed up with all the noisy, roistering, drunken sailors that used to come to me fancy cafe back on the East Coast. So when I heard that Alkali Mike Murphy was looking for a nice, quiet, respectable lady to be his housekeeper, out here in the peaceful, quiet desert, where I took the job. You've been out here about six months? Yes, Johnny boy. And me and Alkali, we just got along fine. I cooked good meals for him, and we played cribbage together in the evenings. And I got me a real bang out of keeping that old palace of his all neat and tidy for him. Yeah, sure. But now, Meg, I understand he named you as a beneficiary of his big insurance policy. I told him I didn't want it. And besides, I have plenty of money of me own from sending out me cafe back east. Do you know the other beneficiaries? Huh? Do I know them? Them nephews and that niece. Just hanging around, waiting for him to die these last 20 years. That's all they've been doing. Except maybe Edgar. Edgar? Edgar Murphy, the oldest nephew, the nice one. He's had the fine job over to the bank in Lovelock. Uh-huh. Any others? Margaret! Oh, she's a disgrace to me fine old name. Playing around with every Tom, Dick, and Henry she can get her hands on. Looking for the one with the most money so she can snag him and live the easy life. Where is she? It's for Danny. Well, he's another no count. Spends all his time horsing around and gambling. Where are they now? Out to Port Hope, but where else? Each of them trying to chisel the others out of all the fine furniture and old silverware and lovely china. You know, when the estate gets settled. The sneaky, snivelly... All right, little... Meg, all right. If I'm going to try to help you, there are some things I have to know. I'll tell you everything, Johnny boy. <sighs> How did Alkali Mike die? Poison, the doctor said it was. In something that he ate... And who could have given it to him? Uh, there's the trouble, darling. Huh? I was the only one with him. I was the only one ever touched his food. Uh, could it have been poisoned before it was brought into the house? No, never. Everything I bought for him and me come from the markets right here in Winnemucca. Besides Johnny. I always had the same things he did. Even the day he died? Yes. Even that same fateful morning... Well, did the doctor say what the poison was? Yes. Uh, Quintanogen? Quintanogen? Yes, that was it, sulfur or something. Quintanogen sulfonate? Yes, it's quintanogen sulfonate. Now, that's strange. Because if I remember correctly, that's related to one of the old Indian arrow poisons. Ah, but Johnny, there ain't been no Indians around here for years. 
At least the wild one. Look, Meg, I want to go out to that so-called palace, Fort Hopeful, but I want you with me. Well, of course, lover. Only how can I get out of this jail? Let me worry about that. It took the help of a local attorney to send him five hundred bucks, but I managed to get Meg out of the clink. As long as Sergeant Framley stayed with us, that is. We headed out across the desert over a road that should have been traveled only by jeep. And finally, after about 60 miles of it, we came into a bare, rocky valley. And there in the middle of it sat the palace, Fort Hopeful. Only it should have been called Fort Hopeful. Ain't it a beautiful spot, Johnny boy? It was an atrocity, a huge, rambling jumble of native stone badly cemented together. There were almost as many doors sagging on their hinges as there were windows. As though the whole place had been put together one room at a time. Windows were set in at cockeyed angles, and most of them were dirty. Three fairly new cars were parked out in front. Yeah, the relatives, Dollar. They've been here ever since the old coot died, like a bunch of buzzards. Folks, you... Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, come on, let's go in. Yes, and see how they've messed up our lovely palace whilst I've been languishing myself away in that hoose car. Hey, look, Sergeant, if old Alkali was murdered... Well, of course he was. How else would he get that poison? Well, how about these relatives? That's what I've been trying to tell me here, Brains. All right, all right, Meg, please. These bird-tailed idioms around here seem to think I'm the only one. Meg, I... shut up. Yes, dear. You know I love you when you talk to me like that. Just like my dear departed husband, God. Yes, yes, all right. Well, what about it, Sergeant? Oh, you mean his own kin? No, no, Mr. Dollar. People out here in this part of the country have too much respect for their own kin. Even when there's a lot of money involved? Yes, I even go so far as... What do you mean, Sergeant, bringing that killer back here? Well, it's, uh, it's this way, Edgar. Yes, Sergeant, how dare you? Now, look, it's all perfectly legal. Legal? This woman killed our uncle. Now, look, will you? Mr. Dollar here is an insurance investigator. Johnny Dollar? That's right. Oh, I've heard about you. Well, I haven't. I'm Margie. And believe me, Edgar, everything will be all right with him here. Won't it, Johnny? Will it? I'm sure it will. Uh, we'll see. Uh, you want to come in? What do you mean, do we want to come in? You think we're going to stand out here on our feet all day? Why don't you drop dead? Oh, better scum. All right, Meg. Come on, come on. Sit down, Johnny. Here. Uh, incidentally, where's the other nephew? Uh, Danny? I'm Danny Murphy Dollar, and I agree with Ed. You've got no business bringing that old witch that murdered our uncle back into this house. Oh, that's so? She had no business ever being here. Chiseled her way into his affection so she could cut in on whatever dough he'd leave. And then to make sure he'd leave it in a hurry, she knocked him off. Uh-huh. Wouldn't that same reason make all three of you want to see him out of the way? Now, just a minute. Now, just take it easy, Danny. Well, what do you mean, take it easy? He's practically accusing us of killing Alkali. If the shoe fits, Danny boy. Why, you dirty... You lay one hand on Johnny Dollar and I'll tear your eyes out from limb to limb. I'll okay, Meg. Meg! Meg! Yes, darling. Mr. Dollar's right, Danny, Margie, and you know it. You know it as well as I do. Sure, we wanted him gone. We wanted his money, that insurance. If Danny here hadn't talked him into that insurance, we wouldn't even have that to look forward to. Well, can you blame us, Johnny, for not wanting her to share it? But she will, unless you can prove she killed your uncle. What she ever done, knowing him for only a few months, to make her deserve a share. Margie, I suspect Meg is the only one who showed your uncle any kind of care and consideration in years. Well, what did you expect of us? Mr. Dollar's right. Why kid about it? Heaven knows she deserves his money as much as any of us, whether we like it or not. The fact remains, Dollar, somebody killed our uncle. And you've all carefully made sure that Meg would be suspect. Well, yes. Johnny. Look, I'm going to play a hunch that maybe he wasn't murdered at all. But the evidence, Dollar... What evidence, Sergeant? He was poisoned. Yeah, all right, we'll accept that. But I'm still going to play that hunch. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Alkali Mike Matters. Now, look here, Dollar. We know that old Alkali Mike was poisoned. If that isn't murder, what is it? Have you ever thought of suicide, Sergeant? Suicide? Oh, of course not. This money-grabbing old bitty here did him in. Now, just a 
Ten minutes, Margie Murphy. Uh, sure. Why would old Alkali ever commit suicide? I don't know, Danny. Disappointment over you three, his only relative? He paid no attention to us. Or was it the other way around? You paid no attention to him. He didn't want us around. Except maybe Edgar. <sighs> well, offhand, I can't say that I blame him. But he did welcome the care and whatever affection Meg may have given him. Yes, Mr. Dollar, that's true. She was after his money, that's all. I told him I didn't want his money. And if you don't shut up, you little squirm and conniving... Meg! All right, Johnny Mike. What are you looking so thoughtful about, Edgar? Suicide. Old Alkali's father chose to go that way. Yeah, I know. No one understood why. He had everything he wanted, money, even this so-called palace, this atrocity that he named Fort Hopeful. You mean he had no more reason to take his life than your uncle? Well, that's what I mean, Sergeant. How did his father take his life? By drinking poison, an old Indian poison. Quintanagen sulfonate. Oh, oh yes. no. Oh, the cup. What? The old cup that his father used. What are you talking about, Meg? Come here, all of you. Come here in the dining room. What for, Meg? In here, where he keeps all the old silver and china and brickety-brac. Here. Now look here in the china closet. There, you see. That cup or mug on the top shelf, Dollar. Is that the one his father used to drink the poison? Yes. But it's never been used since. Oh, no. No, Mr. Edgar, that's where you're wrong. What? Oh, it seems preserve it. This is terrible. What is it, Meg? Get oh, to the point. Oh, yes, Johnny, but it scares me. Well... Every night after his dinner, Alkali, God rest his poor soul, he'd have his whiskey from one of the clay mugs on that shelf, a different mug every night. Yes, that's Except true. Except that never would he touch that one. The lavender one. Oh, so what? Called it the death cup. Only he joked about it. But then the night before he died, he, he talked about it again. Let me see that mug. Well, I'll get it for you. He said it was making a superstitious old fool out of him. Uh, here. He said his father drank from it and died. But that he would bring from it and live. That he'd show he weren't superstitious about it. Oh. Good heavens, look here. And I'd hard to drink for him. What is it, Dollar? Yeah, what, what is, is it? it? The heavy deposit in the bottom of this mug. Hard as a rock. But still the poison? Yeah. The same deep purple color of quintanogen sulfonate. Oh. After 40 years? Oh, oh, I tried to wash it out, Johnny, before and after she used it. Oh, water wouldn't touch that stuff. Oh, that's why I thought it was part of the clay. But the alcohol in this whiskey would. Oh. It released enough of that poison to kill him. Oh, if only I'd have known. <laughs> <laughs> police took a long time over this one, but they finally reached the same conclusion I had. Accidental death. So, the relatives will collect the insurance and make, bless her heart. But I'm afraid that mere money will never take the place of a friend, Alkali Mike. Expense account total, including incidentals and fare back to Hartford, $525 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Hollywood. It's time now for Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny. You have our blue job from Bureau. Well, hi, Pat. What's new? I've got a problem. This is new? Pat, every time you call me up, you've got a problem. What is it this time? Johnny, did you ever have any trouble getting rid of money? Getting rid of... Look, Pat, this is the thing I do best. Well, not so here. What do you mean? I got $25,000. I've been trying to give it away for two weeks, but I can't. Uh, just a minute. Let me take the phone. Huh? For a minute, I thought you said you were trying to give away $25,000 and couldn't. You heard me correctly. Boy, you have got a problem. I'll be right over. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. 
America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the shy beneficiary matter. Expense account item one, a dollar twenty for a cab from my apartment to the offices of Universal Adjustment, where Pat was waiting for me, looking very snide. Oh, this is a real twist, Johnny. Usually beneficiaries are beating down my door to collect. This one is playing at real court. What's the deal, Pat? Oh, it starts out real simple. Two weeks ago, a Miss Helen Gazeworth died. Huh? Insured for twenty-five thousand. Beneficiary, a man named Elijah Summers. So, yeah, well, that's where my trouble starts. No Elijah. Can't locate. Can't locate. No trace whatsoever. Well, what have you done so far? Well, the usual, Johnny. We checked death lists, advertised in the newspapers. All I've come up with is nothing. Where did you advertise? New York. That's where Miss Gazeworth lives. Uh huh. Do you have any relatives? None, as far as we can determine. Any idea who this Elijah Summers is or why she picked him as beneficiary? Well, the only lead we've got is something Miss Gaysworth's landlady told us. Oh, what's that? Well, apparently this Miss Gaysworth was something of, uh, well, an eccentric. Lived alone in a dingy apartment, felt that the world was pretty much against her. Oh. All except Elijah Summers. Landlady heard her mention him once or twice. It seems he's been nice to her sometime in the past. How? But that I don't know. Neither does the landlady. She have any idea where he could be? What he's doing? If he's even alive? No. But if he is, he's entitled to 25000 bucks. so we've got to find him. Hey, you know, you don't have much to go on, Pat. <laughs> Correction, Johnny? You mean you don't have anything to go on? Expense account item two, $36 even. Transportation and incidentals to New York City. I saw the landlady. Miss Gaysworth had moved in six months ago from somewhere a few blocks away. Three hours later, I'd located the somewhere a few blocks away. There, I learned only that she'd, yep, moved in from somewhere else a few blocks away. Gradually, however, a picture arose before my mind of a sweet little old lady drifting from place to place alone, and, well, I felt sorry for her. I also felt sorry for me because nobody along the line had ever heard of Elijah Summers. Finally, I turned up her first landlady in New York. She remembered Miss Gaysworth mentioning something about having come from San Francisco. She thought. Item three, $167.20, plain fare and incidentals to San Francisco. Item four, nine dollars and a half newspaper ads in the San Francisco papers. Frankly, I wasn't very optimistic, but that's where I was wrong, because the very first day I got results. The results, incidentally, were blonde with brown eyes. Mr. Dollar? Yeah. I'm Janet Blake. May I come in? Oh, I sure. Thank you. What can I do for you, Miss Lee? You're the one who ran the ad about uh, Elijah Summers. Yeah, that's right. Has he answered it? Not yet. Do you have any idea where he is? No, none at all. That's why I advertise. Look, are you related to Mr. Summers? No. I'm a, uh, a friend of his. Well, have you any idea where he might be, Miss Blake? Have you ever heard of a little town called South Fork, California? No. It's on the Yuba River, up in the Sierras, in what used to be some of the gold rush country. You think Elijah Summers might be up there? Maybe. What makes you think so? Just call it a hunch, Mr. Dollar. Just a hunch. Item 5, 2750, a rented car to take me to the town of South Fork. There was just enough inhabitants to keep it from being called a ghost town, a collection of ramshackle buildings at a fork in the river hemmed in all around by the mountain ranges. I looked up the local law, a big, beefy, slow-talking deputy sheriff named Rollins. Elijah Summers? Yeah, that's right. I'm looking for him. Well, who's I? My name's Dollar, Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Looking for Elijah Summers, huh? That's the general idea, yeah. Well, good luck, Dollar. What do you mean? I'll tell you. You find Elijah, you let me know, huh? Okay. Why? He's wanted for murder. 
Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag, representing one of the 50 states. Rhode Island state flag is white with an anchor, first used as a colony symbol in 1647. The motto Hope was added in 1664, when the government was organized under a charter from King Charles II. A circle of 13 gold stars were added for the original 13 colonies. This is the flag of a unique colony and state, which carried out a most noble experiment in freedom. The Royal Charter of 1663 reads, to hold forth a lively experiment that a most flourishing state may stand and best be maintained with full liberty and religious concernment. Rhode Island state flag, the flag of the 13th state to enter the Union, was adopted on May 19, 1897. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the shy beneficiary matters. <laughs> Now I knew why Elijah Summers was so hard to locate. After all, a man who's wanted for murder isn't exactly going to make himself conspicuous. How come you want to find Elijah Dollar? He's a beneficiary of a life insurance policy share of $25,000. Afraid the dough's not going to do him much good. Uh, maybe not. Oh, sure, he's got to be brought in, tried, and convicted, but I figure that's largely a question of time. When did this uh, killing take place, Sheriff? Last year. Here in South Fork? A ranch about three, four miles east of here. At just Tyler's place. Is Tyler the one who was killed? Yeah. Well, what happened? Well, Sir Elijah always was a funny old duck. Just Tyler had kept him around the place a couple years, sort of a hired hand. I see. Now, from what we could piece together, Elijah and Jess got in an argument about some work Elijah wasn't doing very good. Elijah went plumb crazy, shot Jess, and took off in the hills. I see. Jess has really took it pretty hard for the better part of a year. I guess it was Ben Watch finally pulled her out of it. She was married just a month ago. Oh? She and Ben are living on the ranch. Straight out of town to the east up on a rise. Okay. Can't miss it. Figure I'm going out there. Yeah, I thought I might. You any idea where Elijah might have gone? Matter of fact, I got a pretty good idea. Yeah? Over the next range of mountains is a place called Tough Luck Canyon. A couple of hermits in there panning gold. Gold? Well, they get maybe three, four bucks worth a day. Enough to live on. Now, I got me a hunch when I just hold up somewhere in there. Have you been up there after him? Two, three times. Well? Well, so has got to be careful. That Elijah's mean shot with the 30-30. Jess Tyler found that out. Side, there's a lots of places up in there for man to hide. Uh-huh. So you've given up on him? Dollar... I don't give up on no man. Elijah stays up there long enough, he's going to get careless. One of these times I go up there, I'll get him. I got into my car and drove out to the Tyler Ranch where his widow Clara and her new husband Ben Watts were living. They were expecting me. Sheriff Rollins phoned us you were coming, Mr. Dollar. I doubt if there's much we can add to what he's already told you about Elijah and the killing. Well, I'm sure you don't enjoy talking about it, Mrs. Watts, but I... Uh... I don't mind anymore, Mr. Dollar. Time has a way of taking care of most things. Of course, I still can't help feeling sort of bitter about Elijah. But I also can't help feeling sorry for him. Yeah, sure, I understand. I, uh, I gather that Mr. Tyler always treated Elijah pretty well. Yes, he did. It kept him around here when it really didn't pay to. Uh-huh. Then how could Elijah turn on him that way? Well, Elijah was always pretty unpredictable, I guess. No one really knows what the argument was about. Mr. Watts, how would I get to Tough Luck Canyon? You? You mean you're going after Eliza? I'd like to try. I don't think that's a very good idea, Mr. Dollar. Probably not. But why not? Could be dangerous for you. Maybe. Then why do it? My job. Hmm. I've been thinking about Eliza a lot lately. An old man like that, somewhere up in that canyon out in the open, in the cold. It just isn't right. Yeah, well, uh, anyway, how do I get there? Uh, as the road takes off a mile or so from here, you'll see it marked. Winds up through the mountains to about three hours' hike from Tough Luck Canyon. Okay, thanks. Uh, just one thing, Mr. Dollar. This Elijah, he's a good shot. 
I know. Yeah, so do I. Put a 30-30 slug in my shoulder once. When was that? Night of the killing. I was living on the next ranch over at the time. I was one of them that took off after him. He winged me from 200 yards. Oh. I tell you for a fact, Mr. Dollar, he can shoot fast, he can shoot straight. With those cheerful words from Ben Watts ringing in my ear, I drove back to town. Item six, thirty-five dollars forty cents for some camping equipment. I figured I'd be spending a couple of nights out in the open. I found the so-called road they told me about. Finally, it just sort of petered out among the trees and rocks up near the timberline. I started hoofing it. Three hours later, I was over the ridge and working my way down the western slope of Tough Luck Canyon. Suddenly, I stopped. Yeah, somebody was turning me. I crouched behind some brush and waited. Then I run. Hey, wait a minute. You're the girl who answered my ad about Elijah in San Francisco. Mr. Dollar. Janet. Janet Blake, isn't it? Well, I'm afraid I lied to you about my name, Mr. Dollar. Really, Janet Tyler. Tyler? Just Tyler, the man Elijah killed. He was my father. Well, what are you doing here? Decide to take the law into your own hands, maybe? You don't understand. I don't want to harm Elijah, but he must be found and brought back. Well, I'm with you there. Then stay with me, because I think I can lead you to him. Look, Janet. We're nearly at the upper end of this tent. Now, what makes you think Elijah's around this neck of the woods? Four years ago, Elijah brought me up here. There's a little pocket in the rocks. It's almost a cave. Yeah. He likes it. Said it was his place. I recognize the landmark. Get down. Well, Janet, looks like we finally located Elijah. The hard way. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. It is a very well-known fact that symbols are important to men everywhere. Whether they be symbols of country, religion, or honor, they're a cherished part of the culture and tradition of all people. As in almost all countries of the world, the people of Spain are very religious. And in the Spanish town of Vendrell, the people were having difficulty with a symbol. A 300-pound angel sitting on top of a 150-foot church steeple. The angel had been there since 1784 and needed repairs to keep it from falling down on the heads of the parishioners. But 150 feet is a long way up, and 300 pounds are a lot of weight to bring down. Now, there was a great deal of head-scratching over the problem until someone casually mentioned the problem to someone else who happened to be stationed at the United States Air Force Base in Zaragoza, Spain. It wasn't long before visions of a helicopter came to mind. Because Americans like to help other people everywhere, the Air Force Whirlybird lifted the angel from the church steeple, brought it down for repairs, and later returned it to its perch. So grateful were the people of Vendrell for this act of friendly cooperation, that they held a mass celebration of American Day to show their appreciation. Television and newsreels carried the story of kindness, so did the newspapers and magazines throughout Spain. This gesture on the part of the United States Air Force created a new symbol, a symbol of friendship and understanding that became a symbol of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Shy Beneficiary Matters. Yeah, we'd found Elijah Summers, all right. He was somewhere in the rocks above us there in Tough Luck Canyon. And I knew the minute Janet and I poked our heads up, we'd collect a slug. He had us pinned down, but good. Johnny, you think maybe it's... Stay down. Now, look, Janet, I still don't understand why you were so anxious to find Elijah. Johnny... You've heard him shooting at us. Yeah, you're right. 
What kind of shots do they sound like? Rifle. Matter of fact, a small caliber rifle. A twenty-two, maybe? Like this? Where'd you get that twenty-two slot? This came from Elijah's gun the night my father was killed. But he was killed... Hey, wait a minute. That's why I want to talk to Elijah. That's a good idea, and so do I, but how? I think you'll still remember my voice. Let me try. Okay, but be careful. Elijah? Elijah? Who's that? Yeah, go on. It's Janet, Elijah. Janet Tyler. Miss, Miss, Miss Janet? That's right. Who's that with you? Dollar, Elijah. Johnny Dollar. I want to talk to you. I'm your friend. I know you don't. Please, Elijah, he's telling you the truth. We don't want to hurt you, but we must talk to you. That's the truth, Miss Janet? Yes, you know I've never lied to you. You there. Dollar. You got a gun? Yes. Toss it out in the open when I can see it. What if we get wrong about Elijah with dead? I guess no, I'm not wrong about him. I sure hope not. Okay, here it is. Now stand up and come out. Into the open. Okay. Elijah. Hello, Miss Janet. Oh. Elijah, you look terrible. Have you been up here all this time living like living like an animal? Oh, don't you worry about me, Nuna. I've been getting along pretty good up here. By the looks of you, you haven't been getting much food. Uh, enough to keep my eyes sharp, mister. Oh, I see that deputy sheriff fella come poking around here time or two. He didn't even come close. And if he had a... F- <laughs> I could have potted him easy with this. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about, Elijah. That rifle of yours. It's a good one, Miss Janet. I remember when you gave me it two, three years ago for the grounds crew. Elijah, have you ever had any other rifle besides that twenty-two? Nope. You're sure about that? Of course I'm sure. You see, yeah, I've took good care of it, too. I kept it clean and polished. Ah, uh, yeah. Look now, Elijah. Have you ever used any other rifle besides that one? Nope. Janet, your father was killed with a thirty thirty. I know, Johnny. That twenty two slug you showed me a while ago. You said you got it the night your father was killed, that it came from Elijah's gun. I saw someone pry this slug out of his own shoulder the night of the killing. He threw it away. He didn't notice I was watching. Later I heard him tell it around he'd been hit with a thirty thirty slug. You mean your stepfather, Ben Watts? I was confused at first. I I didn't understand. Then it came to me. Ben Watts was the one who'd killed my father. Elijah... Elijah was probably trying to protect Dad and shot Ben with his twenty-two. Yes, there was a big fight, Miss Janet. I I don't just remember what all happened, except all of a sudden they was chasing me. I... I run. Sure. Ben figured he could pin the killing on somebody like Elijah who wouldn't have a chance proving his innocence. Elijah, have you seen Ben since you ran away? Oh, sure. Oh, Ben's come poking around here, too, every so often. But I ain't too smart for him. Yeah, sure, it figures, Janet. Elijah's a threat to Ben as long as he's alive. So Ben comes hunting up here every now and then. It's horrible. Well, of course, I've got to be real careful, because I only got a twenty-two, and he's got a thirty-thirty. But he'll never get old Elijah. Believe you me, he won't get old. Ah! Elijah! Get down and keep quiet. The shot had come from a clump of rocks more than 100 yards away. I scooped up my automatic where I'd thrown it on the ground and started circling slowly, trying to get around behind the clump of rock. I'd almost made it when my foot slipped and sent a rock down the slope. He popped up then, ready to shoot, but lucky for me, his first look was toward the rock instead of me. He saw his mistake swinging his rifle toward me, but he was too late. Johnny! Johnny! Yeah, right here, Janet. How's Elijah? Shoulder. He's all right, though. Johnny. Yeah. It's Ben Watts, all right. Is he? Is he still alive? Oh, yeah. He'll keep. Long enough. Mm-hmm. Expense account total, $410 even. Remarks? Well, I turned Ben Watts over to the local law. And I helped old Elijah fill out his claim for the $25,000 insurance money Miss Gaysworth had left him. 
It ought to keep him real comfortable for the rest of his life. You know, Pat, once in a while I get the feeling that this job of mine is worthwhile after all. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Alabama's state flag is white with a crimson cross of St. Andrew, the symbol of the Confederacy and the national flag of Scotland. Alabama's state capital, Montgomery, served as the first capital of the Confederacy. And it was on the steps of its capital building that Jefferson Davis took the oath of office as President of the Confederated States of America. The Scottish cross is in the form of an X, or saltier, and is also found on the state flags of Georgia and Mississippi. Perhaps it is the independent, rugged spirit of the Scots that recommended its national symbol to the Confederacy as a symbol of its rebellion. Alabama's state flag The flag of the 22nd state to enter the Union was adopted on February 16, 1895. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the most cockeyed case I ever worked on. Not one of life, but death insurance. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Robert Rice, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, Larry Dobkin, Jack Crucian, Russell Thorson, and Howard McNear. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is uh, this is George Reed. Well, nice to hear from you, George. Especially when I have no assignment. That, uh, that's fine. What's fine about it? No expense account to pay it means how do I keep the wolf in the door? Unless, of course, Floyd's of England has a case for me. Huh? Well? Uh, Johnny. Yeah? I, uh, well, a few weeks ago, you were kidding at the time. Oh, now, George, how could I ever kid you? I'll uh, let that one go. Yeah, you better. The point is, you... Well, you rather jestingly asked me if instead of selling life insurance... Oh, no. Don't tell me. I'm afraid so. I'm afraid the company is saddled with what you might call a death insurance policy. You mean, instead of insuring somebody against dying, you've insured him against living? Yes, John. Okay, Georgie. Say no more. I'll be right over. Bob Bailey. In the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the hope to die matter. <laughs> Expense account item one, a dollar ten taxi from my apartment at George Reed's office, where I found him pacing the floor and wearing an even more worried expression than usual. And believe me, that's something. This thing has me so so riled up, Johnny, I can hardly see straight. Well, you should have known better than to issue a policy like that, George. I? It was Harry Baxter. Baxter? He filled in here for me while I was on vacation. I should have known better. What did he do? Sell a lot of policies that you shouldn't have to handle? No, just this one. And I swear I don't understand it. He of all people. All right, you said on the phone that it was kind of life insurance in reverse. That's exactly what it is. Explain, please. Well, usually, of course, we pay the face value of a policy when the insured dies. Right. In this case, however, the company will have to pay the $250,000 that the insured doesn't die. 250000 Yes. How under the sun can a man be crazy enough to issue a policy like that? John, you know how it is. The company prides itself on the fact we'll insure anything. Not only life and property and health and so on, but the 
voice of a singer, the feet of a dancer, hands of a pianist, even the dimples on the knees of a chorus girl. Yeah, and singing mice, an old alley cat, a sick whale. Of course, I can't say that Harry wasn't in position to do it, but... Johnny, you've got to help me. First, you better tell me who and why and what it's all about. It's just the trouble. I don't know. Well, in that case, you don't know. I only got back here to the office this morning. I found our copy of the policy lying here on my desk. But if you don't even... Oh, look, I've handled some pretty screwy cases for you, George. Yes, but they've all finally made sense one way or the other. And, Johnny, we have paid you some very nice fees. You can't deny that. George. Tell me, have I ever questioned your expense accounts? But death insurance, it doesn't make sense. Have I? Insuring somebody against living. Have I? I'm sorry, but this time the answer is no. Listen. If you take this on, I'll okay your expense account without even reading it. Death insurance. Expense account unlimited. Johnny? George, there are some things even a conniving, chiseling, unprincipled rascal like myself won't even... Unlimited? Johnny? Okay, George, I'll take it. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hope to die matter. Lloyds of England insure anything. At least that was their boast. And now it looked as though it had finally backfired on them. Because somebody in the organization, some character named Harry Baxter, had issued not life, but death insurance. If it hadn't been for my friendship for George Reed, <clears throat> well, plus his promise of unlimited expense account, I'd have thrown the whole problem right back into his face, as it was. Thanks, Johnny. From the bottom of my heart, I'll never forget you for this. Believe me, George, I'll never forget you for this. And if you can get us off the hook... All I can do is try, so come on, give me the dope on it. Yes. Now, here. The name of the insured is Miss Mary Ellen Markham. Oh. Yeah, I got it. Where does she live? 514 East 52nd Street, New York City. Oh. Pretty fancy address. Yes. Okay. Now, tell me why this Mary Ellen has insured herself against living. Well, that's the point, Johnny. She hasn't. Well, now, wait a minute. You... Albert Schwinner has. You mean somebody else took out this policy on her life? Or rather, death? Yes. Holy. Well, what is this guy, a professional gunsel who's going to wipe her out and then collect? I suppose he's the beneficiary, too. Yes, he is. Oh, fine. Well, come on. Who is... I don't know. As I told you, the policy was lying here on my desk when I got back this morning. I do know this much about him. It's Dr. Albert Schwinner. Doctor? What kind? Well, those are the things you've got to find out. Who he is, what he is, why he's bought insurance against this woman's living beyond November 10th. The 10th? Well, that's only a few days from now. Oh, George, this gets worse and worse. Well, if only Harry Baxter hadn't issued that policy. But he has. Oh, boy, you sure picked a dilly to fill in for you while you were away. Picked him? What else could I do? After all, he never did anything like this before. You've known him before? Are you serious? Of course I have. Why, how? Harry Baxter. All right, now look. Times are wasting and we haven't got much of it. I take it you want me to see if I can find some legal grounds for canceling this policy. Yes, immediately. Now, have you got an address on the beneficiary, this uh, Dr. Schwinner? No, I've been so upset about this whole thing, I haven't even looked. And yeah, let me see. According to this, he lives at. Hmm. What's the matter? Dr. Albert W. Schwinner, C.L. C.L.? What kind of a doctor is that? I don't know. The address is 14327 E Street, Union City, New Jersey. C.L.? Well, I'll soon find out. Where can I reach this uh, Harry Baxter who sold the policy? In New York at the... Uh, here, I'll jot down the address. I still don't see how Baxter could get away with this. Well, after all, when you consider his position... Here. Here. He offered no explanation at all. Well, I'm afraid I didn't give him much chance. I practically threw him out of here. Oh, I can't say that I blame you. And that's another thing. Look, Johnny, perhaps you can reason with... Oh, don't worry, George. He's number one on my calling list. I'll be talking to you. <laughs> Expense account item 2785, fare to New York and taxi to Harry Baxter's address. A real snooty one over near Sutton Place. And people don't live in that joint unless they've earned or chiseled a lot of money from somewhere. In the case of Baxter, I suspected a big chisel. My suspicion was considerably heightened when he opened the door. His apartment was luxury from stem to stern. As for Baxter himself... Dollar? Well, of course, old boy. I've heard a great deal about you from my dear friend and colleague, George Reed. Dear friend, huh? Well, you say that as though who doubted it. Oh, I know, that filling in for him while he was away, well, 
I really should have done better for the old thing, but I've had so many social obligations to meet these past few months, and after all, one must keep up with those things. Oh, I'm sure one must. Well, I did so one policy, you know, a real dilly. Ah, that's the understatement of the week. I suppose I can't really blame him for being a bit excited about it, but he gave me no chance to explain why I assumed the policy. Why did you? Oh, now, really? Well? Well, I made it very clear to George that I would tell him when he calms down enough to be reasonable. Really, Mr. Dollar, he was in quite a tizzy. Brother, he still is. That's why he sent for me. But when he calms down, he'll be sorry he bothered you. Suppose you tell me why you issued that policy. You? No. What? No, I'll tell George when he's ready and when I'm ready. Oh, now, just a minute. And you may tell George I said exactly that. Goodbye, Dollar. You'll tell me, Baxter, right now. I'll do nothing of the sort. And what's more, since my plane for Europe is leaving shortly, I have no time to do... To, to... Would you kindly remove your foot from the door? Not until I get an answer from you. Now start talking. If you can show some legal cause... Legal why... cause? Furthermore, your behavior at the moment constitutes trespass, illegal entry, you know, call it what you like. And believe me, unless you leave here immediately, I shan't hesitate to ring up the police. All right, all right. Now look, just tell me one thing. I might. What? What is your connection with the beneficiary of this policy? Dr. Schwinner. That's right, Albert Schwinner. But Albert happens to be a... Very close, personal friend. Oh, I might have guessed as much. All right, then tell me this. No, I'm sorry, just one question. I've given the answer. Goodbye. Right, sir. Are you hard of hearing? Look I here now. Goodbye. Well, there was no point in trying to batter down the door of Harry Baxter's apartment, so I left. Downstairs in the lobby, I put in a phone call. That's item 355 cents to George Reed's office in Hartford. Dollar, but he seems to have stepped out for a few minutes. Oh, well, uh, then please tell him when he gets back that I want a complete rundown on Harry Baxter. Well, that shouldn't be difficult. Right. Having hired him, George shouldn't have much trouble getting that for me. Well, that isn't what I meant, Mr. Dollar. As a matter of fact, I think I can tell you just Now, let George do it. I'll call him back. Item 4, 65 cents taxi to Mary Ellen Markham's apartment on East 52nd Street. A uniformed nurse met me at the door, told me I could stay with Miss Markham only a very short time, then led me into the bedroom. And there, carefully propped up in bed, lay a pale, wan, tired woman who looked to be 65 or 70. The room was full of flowers. You may leave us, Mrs. Haskell. I'll ring when I need you. Yes, Miss Markham. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I'm... Sorry, I won't be able to speak with you very long. But as you can see... Yes, yes, I can, of course. I'll get right to the point. You must know, I'm sure, that someone has just taken out a policy on your... Well, an insurance policy on you. Yes. And it was so smart. And so... And so helpful with Harry Baxter... Oh. You see, I am suffering from a rare, incurable disease of the blood. I'm sorry. I don't have long to live. A few days, perhaps. A few weeks at the most. Excuse me. This is such an effort. Well, you, you're getting the best of care, I trust. Yes. It's the very best. Now, now, what do you wish to know? You know a Dr. Albert Schwinner, don't you? I have known Albert for many years. He's been great friends. Then why does he take out a policy that... Well, that indicates he hopes that you'll die. Hopes? I'll die? Yes. What else could it be? Oh, you don't understand. Don't you see? Schwinner has bought insurance against your living beyond November 10th. Yes. Yes, my 50th birthday. You mean to say you're... The reason... The reason so. Yes? I'm sorry, you, you mustn't. Oh, I know, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, But just one more thing. Your doctor, the doctor who's taking care of you. Albert. Albert? The same Dr. Schwinner? Yes. Now... Oh, now you must leave. Act 
three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hope to die matter. The little that Mary Ellen Markham had been able to tell me left me more puzzled than ever. I've never been given such a runaround in my life, deliberate or otherwise. But I didn't dare tax her strength further, so I left. Item five, another 55 cents for another call to George Reed in Hartford. This time he was in. Yes, Johnny, I must confess I'm calmed down a bit, but the first shock of learning that Mr. Baxter had issued that seemingly absurd policy... What do you mean, seemingly absurd? George's whole thing has been a tizzy, now a double-barreled one. Well, I tried to call Mr. Baxter a few minutes ago, but got no answer. I wanted to apologize, of course... Apologize? For well, after all, since he's chairman of the board... Chairman of what board? The company, this company... What? I tried to tell you that this morning, but you didn't give me a chance. Harry Baxter is also the majority stockholder. Oh, brother. In any event, as I'm sure you can see, he must have had some good reason for that policy. And as soon as I can get him by phone... You won't. What? He just left for Europe. Where? I don't know, and right now I don't care. But if I can't contact him, Johnny, I don't dare cancel this policy until I've talked to him. And if Miss Markham should die before the 10th... Yeah, 250 G. You've got to carry on. Would you like to tell me how... If Mary Ellen Markham dies on or before November 10th, Floyd's of England pays Dr. Albert Schwinner $250,000 on a policy taken out by him. And he is her doctor with her life in his hands. And if there isn't something wrong with that setup, Expense account item six, eight dollars for a taxi to Schwinner's address in Union City, New Jersey. And there at last I learned what the CL meant behind his name. It was an abbreviation, for this was the Albert Schwinner Clinic, devoted to the study of rare diseases of the blood. But Schwinner wasn't there. He'd gone to New York to see Miss Markham. Item seven, ten dollars even for a fast taxi ride back there to Manhattan. As the nurse led me into the unfortunate woman's apartment, he was just coming out of the bedroom door. Oh, Dr. Schwinner, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar, Harry Baxter told me I might expect you. Oh, he did, huh? Yes, he phoned me just before his plane took off for you. You're pretty smart. You're an insurance investigator, aren't you? That is right. Oh, you may go in to see Miss Markham now, Mrs. Haskell. Very well, Doctor. How is Miss Markham, Doctor? Much better, thank God. Oh, why do you say that? What? If she dies before this week is out, you stand to collect a cool quarter of a million, don't you? I? No, the clinic. Isn't that the same thing? Hardly. Uh, sit down, Mr. Dollar. Now, you're concerned about the rather unorthodox insurance policy that Mr. Baxter issued. I certainly am. I think you'd better let me tell you the reason for it. I think you'd better. At the onset of her illness some 15 years ago, the best doctors in the country gave her five years to live at the most. And that's when you came into the picture? Yes. Because of the devotion, the concentration of all our efforts to this one field of medicine, the clinic was able for the first time to give her hope. Her hope was justified. We have given her years of life. But now, wait a minute, Doctor. She told us then that if she could be helped to live until she was 50... And that'll be on the 10th. Yes. That would prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that our methods, our practices were right. That we could prolong and possibly ultimately save not only her own, but thousands, perhaps millions of lives. Therefore, she agreed that if she reached 50, she would make an outright gift of $250,000 to the clinic and its work. Money which is much needed, by the way. But then it began to look as though she might never reach 50. Yes. And she suggested this unusual insurance policy on her death rather than on her life. I see. But why Harry Baxter, chairman of the board of the insurance company, its biggest stockholder, whatever? I don't get it. Baxter's own mother died of the same disease, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Of course. Then... He knew how necessary this money is to the clinic. Yes. And let's face it, Baxter is something of uh, an eccentric. And that's the reason he chose this... this offbeat way to make sure you get the financial help you need. Exactly. Then, if I try to get this policy canceled... 
a great many lives in the future may depend on its remaining in force. Of course, if you feel it your duty... Doctor, my duty as I see it is to do just exactly nothing. Mary Ellen Markham did live to see 50, but only for a few days. Just long enough to make her gift to the clinic. Harry Baxter and the company? Well, Harry came back from Europe and he said he found some, quote, mistake, unquote, in the policy that requires the company to pay off on it anyway. <laughs> Eccentric? We should have more of them like that. Expense account total? Are you kidding? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. its program. Time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, the investigator? That's right, insurance investigator. Yes, well, uh, my name is Frank Skinner, Mr. Dollar. Yes? You see, my wife and I run the Sunny Dream Home up here at Buckton Center. Old folks' home it is. Oh, I see. Well, now, what can I do for you, Mr. Skinner? Well, I'm... I'm afraid there's something wrong here, Mr. Dollar. You see, we've never had anything like this before. Like what, sir? Well, to begin with, all our clients are pretty well insured. Yes. All right. We've been having a lot of deaths here at the home these past months. Too many, Mr. Dollar. Well, after all, if your clients are all very old people... Yes, sir, they are. But you see, these have all been accidental deaths. Yeah, well, don't forget, sir, that older people are very often quite prone to accidents. Yes, sir, that's true, but... Well, if you want the truth, I don't think they've been accidents. Oh? No, sir. And if something isn't done to stop this, well, I think maybe you'd better come up here and see us. Mr. Skinner, I think you're right. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Sunny Dream matter. Expense account item one ten cents for a phone call to Pat McCracken, my old friend and contact at Universal Adjustment Bureau. Oh, say, I'm glad you called, Johnny. Yeah, well, Pat, I just want you to know I won't be available for a couple of days. Oh, yes, you will. And it isn't because of any insurance matter. Yes, it is. What's happened is that I've just received a phone call that's aroused my curiosity. And, well, at any rate, any assignments you may have for me will have to wait until I get... Uh, that's where you're wrong, Johnny. I said we'll have to wait until... What? Just happens you have an assignment right now. As a matter of fact, I was just about to call you. Well, can't I wait a couple of days? Oh, no, no. Johnny, I want you to run over to Buckland Center. 
Huh? I think you heard me. The Sunny Dream Home for the Aged? That's right. How did you know? Never mind that. What's wrong over there that you know about? Oh, the number of deaths over there within the past few months have made our actuarial tables look like a big fat mistake. And the companies that have carried the insurance on them are getting a little worried. All separate companies, huh? Yeah, but they all cleared their policies through us, fortunately. Otherwise, we'd never have gotten wind of this. Anyway, I promised to send you over there. Any particular reason for thinking something's wrong, aside from the unusual number of deaths? Yes. What? The beneficiary of the policies that have had to be paid. Who? The sunny dream home for the agent. I gassed up my jalopy at the sign of the Flying Red Horse, that's item 2, 425, and drove some 30 miles south and east on Highway 2. I found the Sunny Dream home just north of Buckland Center. It consisted of a huge old frame house surrounded by trees and well-kept gardens. In comfortable chairs scattered here and there on the wide porch and lawn, nice-looking, well-dressed older folks sat around reading, chatting, playing cards, enjoying the late afternoon sun. The whole place looked clean, quiet, and restful. After parking my car, I walked slowly up the long, flower-bordered walk under the trees toward the entrance. And as I did so, a little wizened old man in a wheelchair detached himself from a group of the old folks and wheeled over to me. Mr. Dollar? Yeah, that's right. I'm Frank Skinner, the one that called you. Oh, how are you, Mr. Skinner? Uh, Come right along in the office where we can talk. Yeah, sure. Oh, may I give you a hand with that chair? Nope, don't need it. I must say you handle it well. Sure, haven't been on my feet in over five years now. Uh, you uh, can help me up this little ramp, though, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Here you are. Walter, my stepson, built me that ramp. Good idea. Yes, sir. It's a big help to a man that can't use his legs. Now, right around the side of the porch here. Oh, evening, Miss Baker. Good evening, Mr. Skinner. Yeah, here we are. Uh, if you just open the door. Sure. You just sit down there, and I'll get right to the point. Okay, fine. Now, you listen to me. I'd appreciate it if you'd let the folks here think that you've just come to look over the place, like maybe you've got some old relative you'd like a nice home for. In other words, you don't want to alarm your clients. Guests, Mr. Dollar. They're honored guests, all happy and with no worries. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I must say that those I saw outside looked perfectly content. But now, about those so-called accidents... Five of our people have died within the last six months, Mr. Dollar. Five of them. Terrible. And like I told you on the telephone, they looked like accidents. What kind of accidents? Well, now, the first one. Well, maybe it was. That was old Miss Epp. Lived in the little guest cottage out back. What happened? Small fire. Must have started in the wastebasket or something. By the time we got to her, well, she'd suffocated. And I suppose Mr. Perley might have been accidental, too. Food poisoning it was. At least that's what the doctor called it. But nobody else got sick on them. All those canned peaches, Mr. Dollar. Who was the doctor? Oh, Dr. Cherry from town. Of course, Mr. Perley was the only one that had three helpings of them. But my wife never had trouble with her canning before. Well, go on, Mr. Skinner. Well, old Miss Charmley fell down the main stairs to the living room. Look through the door there. You can see the stairs. Well, that's a long stairway for elderly folks. Then Miss Lizzie Bell. We called her Miss Lizzie Bell, though her real name was... What happened to her? She fell out the window of her bedroom. And Mr. Dollar, she just wasn't strong enough to get her window open that wide. She was 94. Then poor old Miss Betzler. She fell down the stairs, too. Well, Mr. Skinner, if those people aren't able to negotiate a stairway like that, you're at fault for requiring them to do it. Well, most of them are. The others have their rooms here on the first floor, like I have, too. How about Miss Lizzie Bell, who was 94? Well, she never left her room until she fell, or until she was pushed by somebody younger and stronger than she was. Well, unless you can prove something like that. I have to prove that those others were pushed down the stairs. Right so. You see, from what you've told me so far, Mr. Skinner, there's no reason to suspect those deaths weren't accidental. Even so many of them, all within a space of only six months. Unless, as I say, you can come up with some concrete evidence to indicate otherwise. All right, then. You can tell me this. Why did all those things happen late at night when those poor old folks wouldn't have any reason to be up and around when there wasn't anybody around who could help them? 
until it was too late. Well, so far as that's concerned... Boy, sure, sure. Folks have got to get up at night sometimes, one reason or another. But they all had their own private baths, and if they want anything from downstairs, like something to read or some hot milk, something like that, why, all they have to do is ring the push button in their room, and my wife gets it for them. We do that all the time. Where is your wife, by the way? Martha? Why, she's right... Right here, Frank. Who's this you're blabbing off your mouth to? Why, uh, Martha, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Investigator, huh? Well, you can march yourself right out of here. Well, now, just a minute, Mrs. Skinner. Just a minute, nothing. You get out of here and leave us alone. Mrs. Skinner. And if you don't, I'll throw you out. And if you don't think I'm young and strong enough, then I'll show you. Strong enough to throw a little old lady out of a window? Or shove a couple of people downstairs? Get out. <laughs> Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now for another episode in the life of Sergeant Donald Bellwether, my husband. Oh, that's what I call a good dinner, Reba. Oh, that was delicious. Well, I'm glad to hear that, dear. More coffee? Uh, yeah, just uh, about a half a cup, please. All right. There you are. Thank you. Now, tell me all about your safety class. Did the boys enjoy your speech? Oh, yeah, they sure did. Thanks to you, I did quite well. My lieutenant complimented me afterwards. Well, good. Yeah, but that same lieutenant threw me a curve, too. Oh, dear. Well, after I gave my talk, he asked the men if there were any questions. <laughs> well, I did it. One of the guys stood up and said, uh, said, uh, look, Sarge, uh, you claim there were over 95,000 deaths and over 9.5 million people injured in accidents in the U.S. last year. Uh, looks to me like all those safety campaigns and slogans are doing no good at all. Well, how did you answer it? I didn't. I couldn't think of an answer. I, I got out of it by saying I'd have more facts and figures at the next meeting. All right. Let's see now. Oh, yeah, here it is. Now, first, Sergeant Bellwether, you start off by telling the boys that since 1913, the accidental death rate has been reduced 35%. percent hmm Or, in other words, if there hadn't been campaigns and safety measures put into effect to reduce accidents, almost a million more people would have been killed in the last 46 years. Hmm, is that right? It certainly is. I'm reading it right out of the National Safety Council record book. Oh, and another thing. Accidents in the farming areas are much higher than in the city. Now, do you know why? Why? Because in rural areas, there are fewer policemen enforcing safety laws and less traffic signs and signals to guide the motorists. Mm -hmm. You know, many more cars travel the city streets, and yet the per capita rate of accidents is much higher in the rural areas. Of course, the reason is obvious. In the city, more safety measures are instituted and obeyed. <laughs> Reba, you are wonderful. That, that's a good logical answer. <laughs> I don't know what I'd do without it. Oh, oh, that's my Donald. That's my Donald. <laughs> Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Sunny Dream Matter. Martha Skinner, co-owner and the real manager of the Sunny Dream Home for the Aged, was a big woman, tall, muscular, and a lot younger than her husband. I don't want your kind snooping around, Mr. Dollar, so get out of here and leave us alone. Your husband seems to think those deaths here in your home for the aged weren't so accidental, Mrs. Skinner. Oh, he does. Yes, I, uh, that's what I told him, dear. If you'd keep that mouth of yours shut, Frank, we wouldn't have this sort of thing. Why don't you and that wheelchair get out of here? You sound as though you have something to hide, Mrs. Skinner. I have nothing to hide. Don't you see what your coming around here will do to our nice place? It'll give us a bad name, that's what it'll do. Folks come here on the recommendation of the folks that live here. If your sort starts prowling around, it'll make our nice home for them sound like a murder factory, and I won't have it. Oh, now, just calm down a Those moment. Those poor old folks, Miss Lizzie Bell and Mr. Pearly and the rest, were accidental, that's all. You got any reason to think they weren't? Well, I didn't have until a minute ago. What do you mean by that? If they weren't accidents, well, it certainly took somebody younger and stronger to push them down those stairs. You mean me? 
Well? No. No, Mr. Dolly, you're wrong. And if anybody started that talk about not being accidents, I guess I did. Yes, you did, Martha. Oh, I was, I was so upset, those fine old people passing away. Why, they were like family to me. I guess I said a lot of things that didn't make sense. Until the doctor and the police came around and told me I was wrong. The police investigated? Yes, and they made quite a stir. I guess that's why your being here has uh, upset Martha. Well, of course, if they found nothing... Mr. Dollar, do you think that I could do anything like what you... that I could harm a single hair of any of these nice old people? What possible reason could I have, and what sense would it make? Why, we're being paid for their living here, and if anything happens to them... Yeah. Yeah, if anything happens to them, you collect a nice, big, fat hunk of insurance money. You know about that. Insurance investigator, remember? No. No, you're wrong. It was their idea to name us in their policies. Now, wasn't it, Frank? Yes, Martha. It certainly was. Well, let's not talk about it anymore now. It's getting late, so I think I'll drive back to Buckland Center and have some dinner. Well, you'll do no such thing. You'll have your supper, your dinner right here. And if you wish to stay overnight... Oh, no. You mean I'll have another room to fix up? Well, I'll help you, of course. Walter, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Dollar? The insurance investigator I hear about all the time on the radio? That's right, son. What's your business here, Dollar? Frank, call in, son. Yes. About those accidents? Yeah, that's right. What do you think about them, Walter? Look, Dollar, Mother's got enough trouble without you coming around. Walter. Here. Well, it's true, Ma. You know it. First, it's the police making a big racket. We've been through all that, Walter. I asked you a question. Well, why don't you get out of here and leave us alone? I'm sick of all this nonsense. I'm sick of this whole place. Oh, Walter. And year after year, working like a dog for a lot of old fogies. Are there only the three of you to take care of this place? That's right. Oh, and of course, Frank here is a lot of help tied down to that wheelchair. Well, I do all the office work. Oh, sure. Big deal. Handle all the money, too. Well, what about the talk that as soon as we get enough money, we can sell out and get away from here? Hey, look, Dollar, what difference is it to you who keeps this place up? Hey, you're a pretty husky fellow, Walter. Yeah, yeah. Would you like a little demonstration on you? Now, what do you mean by that? Well, maybe I'll tell you after I've had a look around. Then you will stay. Oh, yeah, I'll stay until I'm satisfied. Well, you won't be here for long if I've got anything to do with it, understand? Is that a threat, Walter? Take it any way you like. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I'm sure he didn't mean that the way it sounded. Yeah. Well, tell me, do you two have joint ownership of this place, you and Mr. Skinner? Well, uh... Well, it's really in my name. And if anything were to happen to you? It would go to Frank and Walter. I see. Walter said that you've talked about getting enough money to sell out and leave this place. He certainly did. Is that what you plan to do? Yes, sir. Well... I'm not so sure. Of course you are. I've grown to love this place. All the nice people who... Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Enough money, you said. Like a lot of insurance money from... Oh, no. Oh, you, you can't think that Walter would... Oh, oh, no, no. He's spoiled and fresh and impetuous and talks a lot, but... Surely you don't think... Mrs. Skinner, what would you think... Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Do you know who said, Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty? Those famous words were written by Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson knew that human nature tends to cause us to take for granted the freedoms for which others have fought valiantly. He knew that Americans had to be alert, or the essential freedoms of democracy would be taken away. That's why Jefferson gave his warning to the Americans of his era and to their descendants. He set the price for liberty as eternal vigilance. And Americans through the years have heeded Jefferson's warning. They have been alert to detect and resist the enemies of liberty. Remember the words of Thomas Jefferson. They are part of your American heritage. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Sunny Dream Matter. Uh... 
At dinner that evening, I made a point of chatting with as many guests at the Sunny Dream Home for the Aged as possible. Sweet old Mrs. Baker, who must have been in her 80s, pretty much summed things up as we talked together on the porch in the cool of the evening. You're all really kind of sorry for Walter, Mr. Donner. Young man like that doesn't really have a place here among all of us old ones. Yeah, I, I wonder why he doesn't go out on his own then, Mrs. Baker. Because in spite of his brash, noisy way, he loves his mother, Martha. And since she has so much to do taking care of us, why, he just stays and helps her. Isn't she one of the loveliest people you ever met? Well, she certainly seems devoted to you folks. And she is. Makes us toe the line, balls us out sometimes, just like a mother hen. But she's all heart. And Mr. Skinner? Very nice. Handles the business affairs of the home real good, too. It isn't generally known, but he's the one who gave us the idea of making out our insurance to the sunny dream. Oh? Of course, we never told Martha. Oh, there you are. Evening, Miss Baker. What a nice young man this is, Mr. Skinner. We've been having a wonderful time talking away about this and that. Yeah, that's fine. They make you a comfortable room upstairs, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, right at the head of the stairs. Very comfortable. Good. Well, don't let me interrupt you. I, I'd like to talk to you a minute, if Mrs. Baker will excuse us. Why, of course. Thank you. And we'll talk again tomorrow, won't we? Sure, of course we will. Good night. Mr. Skinner, when was the last accident when someone fell down those long stairs? Huh? Why, uh, that was Miss Betzler earlier this month. Why? Well, at the head of them, as I came out of my room, I found something that... Well... They were marks that looked to me as though they'd been made by some kind of struggle up there. Oh. And a tiny piece of cloth from a man's suit caught in a splinter on the new post. Well, uh, what are you going to do about it? Oh, just leave it there. Tomorrow I'll get somebody from the police, the police laboratory over here to look at it. Uh Well, whoever suit that was must have a tear. Oh, no, not necessarily. It was really just a few threads that had been pulled out. But they might be the clue to a killer. I see. Hmm. Well, good luck, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Thanks. In my room, I waited until long after the big home was quiet and wondered. Wondered if my hunch was going to pay off. Hunch? Hunch? Sitting there on the porch talking with old Mrs. Baker, I'd suddenly remembered something Pat McCracken had told me in the very beginning. He had notified the home I was coming here to investigate. That meant he'd notified Frank Skinner. Could that have been why Skinner phoned me? To allay any suspicion the insurance companies might have? Yeah, I wondered. Finally, about midnight, I heard a noise at the head of the stairway. Quietly, I opened my door. And there at the top of the stairs, armed with a flashlight and standing solidly on his own two feet, was the man who said he was confined to a wheelchair. Where? Mr. Dollar! You won't find anything there, Mr. Skinner. Because there isn't anything. See? You lied to me. It got you up out of that phony wheelchair, didn't it? To see if you'd left some trace of your last murder, didn't it? Uh, Now, listen, Dollar. Pretty rotten racket, Skinner. You and only you handle all the finances of this place. You persuaded the old folks to name you as beneficiary of their insurance policies. Then you proceeded to shove them down those stairs. Would you like to see how? Yes, yeah, Skinner. Then I'll show you. Oh, no, you don't. Yeah. He'll live to go to trial. And whatever sentence they hand him will be much too short. The Sunny Dream Home, well, I hope it'll be the quiet, peaceful place his wife wants it to be. Expense account total, including incidentals, $12 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny 
Many Dollars, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Peggy Weber, Junius Matthews, Larry Dobkin, and Bert Holland. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Oh, sure, Jerry. How are you? The name Curtis Randall mean anything to you? Uh, the banker here in Hartford? That's the one. He's also one of our big policyholders. At least he was. Oh, what's happened to him? The day before yesterday, he and a friend of his, a fellow named Byron Peters, they went deer hunting over near Kingman, New York. And? They hired some old character in the neighborhood to act as guide. Randall and Peters didn't know it, but the old goat was an alcoholic. So what happened? At the end of the day's hunt, they raised Cain with Curly because he hadn't found him a deer. Curly, the name of the guide, huh? Yeah. They had a big argument. Over 500,000. Hundred. Wow. Who's Randall's beneficiary? His hunting companion, Peters. Peters? No wonder you want me to investigate. Johnny. Only this one looks too easy. Wait, Johnny. I'll be right over. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-Mutual Insurance Company Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the hapless Hunter matter. Expense account item one, 95 cents for a taxi across town to Tri-Mutual in the office of Jerry Holland. As they opened the door, he met me halfway. Hey, what was the idea of hanging up on me, Johnny? Then when I tried to call you back, you'd left. Well, sure. I figured if this thing only happened a day or so ago, the faster I could get working on it, the better. Well, I'll go along with you on that, but Where's now... this man Peters? In the hospital. Because if anybody should be suspect, he's short. After all, as a beneficiary... What did you say? I tried to tell you on the phone, only you hung up. Byron Peters is in the hospital. Where? Over in Kingman, New York. Why? Because he was shot up, too, by that drunken guide when he tried to prevent him from killing Randall. Oh. Then Curly killed himself. Yeah. You know, if you'd stop going off half-cocked, you might get somewhere on this case. If it really is a case. <laughs> Sorry, I, I guess I jumped to a conclusion you sure before. sure did. Oh, half a million is still a lot of money. Sure it is. If you need it. And Byron Peters doesn't? Well, according to the local police chief who called me, it was in Byron Peters' brand-new Eldorado that they drove over to Kingman 
It was Peters who arranged for the guide service. It was um, he who supplied the guns and equipment. Yeah, okay, was... okay, Jerry. I'll take your word for it. What hospital is he in over there? Angel of Mercy. It's the only one. Any other information I ought to have? Mm, none that I can give you. As I told you, this is just routine because of the money involved. Company policy. Of course, for your report, you might try to find out if this old Curly Summers, the guide, had any reason to have it in for Randall. Randall knew him before, huh? Uh-huh. I thought you said Peters arranged for the guy. Well, I guess I did. But now, Johnny... Let me have Peters' home address, would you? And Randall's. Well, sure, why not? And I hope you don't think... Did you know Randall well? Yes. Was he a drinking man? Oh, one martini before Denny, that's all. There you are. Why? How about Peters? Oh, I don't know. What difference would it make? Oh, just, uh, wondered... Don't kid me, Johnny. You've got something up your sleeve. Why, Jerry? Now, now, what is it? You know something about these people that I don't? Not a thing, so help me. But 500000 is a lot of money. And I tell you that if you suspect Byron Peters, you're crazy. Did I say I still suspect But the way you've been talking. Did I? Well, no. Well, I do. Sure, with so little to go on, I had no reason at all to suspect Peters. Except for a hunch. But hunches have paid off for me more than once. Expense account item 2380, a tank full of gas for the drive across Route 6 to the New York State Line. There I picked up 9W, then 212 to Kingman. I found the Angel of Mercy Hospital on the way into town. The chief resident physician, Dr. Matthews, was completely cooperative and of no help whatsoever. Quite pointless to see him at the moment, Mr. Dollar. Oh, what do you mean, Doctor? Mr. Peters is sleeping under sedation. Oh, I'm afraid the ordeal with the police left him quite exhausted. The police have already seen and questioned him? Yes, and they had no business questioning him so long in view of his condition. Uh, shock, you know. Uh, tell me something. Do they suspect that he killed Mr. Randall, too, then wounded himself for an alibi? You mean that you do? Yeah. Do they? Oh, my boy, you must be joking. Of course not. Oh? Uh-huh. Why not? Whether you realize it or not, and you will, if I permit you to see him, Mr. Peters, see the manner in which he was wounded, see the extent of his wound. I'll realize what? Oh, my boy. I... Uh, I asked you a question, Doctor. You will realize how impossible it would have been for him to shoot himself in that fashion, how narrowly he himself escaped death at the hands of that rum-crazed guide. You're sure, Doctor? Of course I'm sure, and so are the police. <sighs> well... Where does that leave me? If I may say so, with egg on your face. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hapless hunter matter. A hunting guide had run amok near the little town of Kingman, New York. And, according to a report, was responsible for the death by shooting of wealthy banker Curtis Randall for the wounding of Randall's companion, Byron Peters. But Peters is beneficiary of Randall's half-million-dollar insurance policy. So, naturally, the old bug of suspicion began to gnaw away at the back of my brain. Until, that is, I saw Peters, his wounds, the x-rays, and finally talked with Captain McManus at the local police headquarters. Well, sure, we talked to Peters, Mr. Dollar, but only to find out exactly what happened when old Curly went off his rocker and started spraying lead with his hunting rifle, then shot himself. Then my suspicion that Peters might have done the shooting. Well, didn't you see how Mr. Peters was hit by that thirty thirty? Now, look. He saw Curly pull the rifle on Mr. Randall and shoot him down. Yeah. Yeah, so he lunged at Curly like this. Yeah. Curly whirled around, pulled the trigger. Yeah. Well, the x-rays I saw. Sure. Well, then you know. When Peters lunged at him, the bullet creased his head from the top, went right through the muscles in the back of his left shoulder, and landed in the floor. So it's pretty obvious that Peters couldn't have shot himself. Well, it's impossible. He would have had to have arms five or six feet long to shoot himself on the top of the head at that angle. Hey, when did you first learn about this whole thing, Captain? When Mr. Peters came to, he phoned me from up at Curly's cabin where it happened. I went up there right away. And? Curly and Randall were dead. Peters was still lying next to the fireplace where he'd fallen. But if he was able to phone you... He pulled the phone over to him by the cord. Still had a good right hand, you know. Oh, I see. Where were Randall and Curly? Randall by the front door with a bullet in the back of his head. Curly lay between them. Just how much do you know about this Curly character? 
Well, that's the part I don't understand. Why he did it? I heard he was an alcoholic. Sure, he was a town drunk in a harmless sort of a way, except when he'd go off on a rampage and get into a fight or two, but never during hunting season. Uh Uh-huh. Well, uh, what did he do? Mm, Odd jobs of any kind, most anything. People had always refused to pay him until the job was done. To make sure he'd stay sober, huh? Well, at least reasonably sober. And just as soon as he got paid, he'd buy a lot of cheap whiskey and hole up in his cabin. That's where the murder occurred. Except, yeah, except during hunting season. Then he'd never touch it. Uh, He was a good guide, Mr. Dollar. He made a lot of money from the people who came up from New York City and Hartford and such. That's the part I don't understand. His hitting the bottle during the season. Well, did he ever have any trouble with his clients before? Oh, he'd bellyache about them being so rich when he was so poor, that sort of thing. But he'd have to get awfully drunk to... Uh, I swear I don't understand it. Uh, well, look, Captain, I'd like to see the bodies of Mr. Randall and Curly. Are they still hereabouts? Still over at the coroner's office. Then let's go, huh? I wasn't quite sure what I was looking for. Maybe that's the reason I found it. At least found something that started that old suspicion bug gnawing away again. Peter's back at the hospital and had had a bad powder burn on his forehead next to where the bullet had creased him. Okay. He had said that Curly the guide pulled the trigger when he lunged at him. Randall, there at the coroner's office, had no powder burns. Okay. It was apparent that he had been shot from across the room. But Curly, who was supposed to have shot himself upward through the jaw, also showed no sign of powder burn. Sure, the bullet hole indicated he could have shot himself by holding the gun at arm's length. A 30 is fairly short. But no powder burn. I said nothing of this to Chief McManus. Well, it pretty much bears out what Peters told me and I told you, doesn't it? Curly shot Randall, then Peters, Captain, then himself. Captain, uh, suppose, uh, just for the sake of argument, that Randall did the shooting. First, that is. Well, now, Mr. Dollar, hey, say, wait, speaking of argument, Peters said that Randall and Curly had a pretty big one. Uh, you know, because Curly didn't find him any there. Huh? That's when he started to get drunk and abusive. But as for Mr. Randall... On the other hand, suppose that Peters started the whole thing. Oh, now, look, you know that doesn't make any sense. Then try to kill himself? Well, isn't that what you're saying Curly did? Well, sure, but that's different. No good old bum realized he'd gone too far. There was no other way out for him. But a man like Peters, with money, everything he wants... Where is this cabin of Curly's? Huh? Quite a way. Ten, twelve miles. How do I get there? Straight down Pear Street to the mobile gas station. Uh, you know where that is? Yeah, I saw them away in. Okay, you turn left there. You go six miles, uh-huh. then take the first right-hand road right up the side of Deer Mountain until you get there. Okay. Oh, uh, here. Here's the key to it. Oh, good, thanks, Chief. I'll see you later. Uh, you want me to go along with you? No. According to you, this hunch of mine is all wrong. I'm sure of it. Okay, then. I'd better wing it alone. On the outside, Curly's cabin was a shack, nothing more. And there were enough cheap whiskey bottles scattered around the yard to sink a battleship. Inside, however, it was pretty comfortably fixed up. And back under the kitchen sink, I found a case of Prince Francis scotch, nearly full. <laughs> had Curly suddenly changed his taste for the better? Or had somebody decided to bait him with it? By the dark stains on the floor, I could see where both Randall and Curly had fallen. Where Peters had gone down, there was also the rifle slug embedded in the floor. And then I noticed the angle at which that slug had ended, as though it had been fired from the ceiling, certainly from higher than any normal man could reach, and Curly was only five foot two or three. Then I saw something else, a heavy cord hanging down from one of the rafters above where Peters had lain. It was frayed at the end as though forcibly broken. Now, suppose someone had hung a loaded rifle there by the trigger so the slightest pull would set it off Had stood under it holding the muzzle carefully next to his head to one side, just close enough to... Uh... Yeah, hello. Uh, Mr. Dollar? Captain? Yeah, listen. Now, you... Uh, you may be right, though I still don't see how you can be. What do you mean? Look, I... I've got Dr. Matthews at the hospital here on this party line. Uh, you still there, Doc? Right here, Chief. Well, then you better tell Mr. Nolan. Well, it's about Mr. Peters. Yeah? He's left. Left? I thought you had him under sedation. I guess it didn't take hold the way I thought it would. Well, what happened? Well, he woke up and asked me who it was that'd been here to see him while he was drowsy. Did you tell him who I was? Yes, and he seemed to drop off again, so I left him. A few minutes later, I heard his big fancy car pulling away. Doctor. I went back to his room and he was gone. Doctor. Listen, Dollar. Yeah, Chief. 
I don't know what it means any more than you do. But if I was you, I would get away from that isolated cabin. You see what I mean? Dollar? Um, uh, sure, Chief. I'll leave right away. That was very smart, Dollar. Byron Peters? That's right. Byron Peters. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hapless hunter matter. You weren't as badly hurt by that bullet as you pretended. That's right, Dollar. Does that help bear out your absurd suspicions about me? Not nearly so much as your coming up here to this cabin, Peters. What's that supposed to mean? You rigged the whole thing pretty well, but not well enough. Why you wanted to get rid of Curtis Randall, I don't know. You're out of your mind. Randall was a friend of mine. You must have had some reason for killing him. Curly Summers murdered Kurt. We had a big argument because he hadn't found us any game. The only reason it got out of hand was because Curly was drunk. On what? On some of that expensive scotch I found in the kitchen? How should I know? Yes. Where did he get that? How should I know? Well, I do. You brought it here. To help bolster your phony alibi. To indicate that Curly had it up here, had been hitting it. But you pulled a boo-boo. Why don't you talk sense, detectives? Are you trying to tell me Curly would ever have stuff like that? Look. Look at the old bottle scattered around outside. Cheap rot got, that's all. What's more, he never touched a drop during hunting season. That's about as thin evidence as you could possibly dig up, Dollar, and you know it. Peters, why did you come up here just now? Okay, I'll tell you that, too. Lying there in the hospital, nursing your sore shoulder, you didn't plan on that injury, did you? I told the police. Oh, yeah, sure, you told the police. Lying there, you suddenly remember the one thing that could show how you cleverly wounded yourself after you killed Randall and Curly. That piece of cord up on the rafter where you hung Curly's gun up by the trigger. Dollar. You aimed it carefully along the side of your head, then yanked on it to set it off. Dangerous, but a great alibi. I told the police, the doctor, Curly pulled that trigger when I lunged at him, struggled with him. Little Curly held that gun high enough so the bullet would crease your head from above? I was bent over, lunging at him. Then enter the floor from up here where this cord is hanging? <laughs> you're, you're pretty smart, aren't you, Dollar? Curly was supposed to have committed suicide, huh? Yes, he must have, because I heard him shoot himself as I passed out. Oh, sure. The bullet entered his lower jaw, went up into his brain. That's right. That meant he had to hold that 30-30 at arm's length. So, the muzzle right next to his jaw. That's right. Where it would have left powder burn. But, Peters, there were none. Because you shot him from across the room, the same as you did Randall. Yes. Yes, the same as I'll shoot you. If you can. My right hand is still good, Dollar, and so is the 38. You and your fool insurance company should have left things as they were. Chin up, Dollar. Tell me one thing. Sorry, I haven't got time. When I left the hospital, I made sure I was seen heading for New York. And a carefully set up alibi. You still won't get away with it, you know. Any more than you got away with killing Randall. I had until you came along. And I will when I killed you. So if you have nothing more to say... One thing. Why did you kill Randall? You're trying to stall me. Why? All right. All right. Because I forced him to name me in his insurance. I was the only one who knew about some shady operations in his early business career. Oh, the old story, huh? That's right. Blackmail. That's why he's been paying me off, supporting me, until recently. So you threatened to expose him? No. What would that get me financially? Then tell me this. No. I've got to get out of here to New York. Just one I'll thing go. more. I don't know why you're trying to stall me, but it's no use. So if you have any prayers, Dollar... Sure, sure. That Chief McManus standing there in the doorway will slug you before you pull that trigger. Oh, no. Not that old chestnut. Why not, Peter? What? You... Oh, no, no, you... No. No. Doggone it, Dollar. I thought I told you on the phone to get out of here. Expense account total, including gas to get me back to Hartford... $13.13. Remarks? Why? Why don't they ever learn? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is 
the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I want you to come over here right away. What's that again? I want you to come over here right away. And that's what I thought you said, but who is this and where's here? This is Ellis P. Watkins, Mr. Dollar. You've heard of me, perhaps? Yeah, I think so. Manufacturer, aren't you? Well, at the moment, that seems to be a matter of opinion. Over here is Broad Acres at Fairfield, Connecticut. Would you mind telling me what this is all about, Mr. Watkins? It's very simple. I have $100,000 to give away. All? To whom? That is what you are going to tell me, Mr. Dollar. I'll get there as soon as I can. Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the estate of E.P. Watkins, Fairfield, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the happy family matter. Expense account item one, a dollar twenty taxi from my apartment to the home office of the Universal Adjustment Bureau and Pat McCracken. Well, it didn't take Mr. Watkins long to get in touch with you, Johnny. Yeah, I figured he must have got my name from you, Pat. Ah, E.P. Watkins holds a life policy for $100,000. Beneficiary was to have been his wife, but she died several months ago. Now he wants to designate a new beneficiary. You mean he wants me to tell him who the beneficiary should be? That's right. No, thanks. Now, look, You Johnny... look, Pat. I got tangled up in a family matter once before. I still have the scars to prove Johnny... it. Johnny... Why doesn't Mr. Watkins pick his own beneficiary? Ordinarily, he would, but in a case like this, it might take time. So what? From what I can gather, Johnny, Mr. Watkins doesn't have much time left to live. Oh? <sighs> okay, Pat. Item two, four dollars thirty cents, transportation by car to Broad Acres, the Watkins home in Fairfield. It was a big place, and it was old. I was shown into the library. E.P. Watkins was sitting in front of the fire. I could see that he wasn't well, but there was still a lot of strength in his face. Mr. Dollar, according to the medical authorities, I have somewhere between one week and one year to live. I'm sorry. I'm not. Oh. My wife is dead. My business is on the verge of collapse, and my children are strangers. Should I be sorry? Well, I... I don't know. I have three possible beneficiaries. A daughter, Sheila, 28 years old. A son, Michael, 26, and another daughter, Elizabeth, 24. Why not have all three share equally? Mr. Dollar, had I wished to do that, I would not be calling on you. The others will be taken care of elsewhere in the estate, I suppose. There is no estate other than this insurance policy. Oh. Most of it has gone down the drain of an ailing business. The rest will be consumed in estate expenses. I see. Watkins' money should be kept in the Watkins family as I see it. But I... I most emphatically wish the money to go to one member and one member only. And the other two? They're to be left out in the cold, huh? I did not engage you to examine my motives, Mr. Dollar. You have asked me a direct question, and I will give you a direct answer. Yes, I intend, as you put it, to leave the other two out in the cold. Uh, you say there are three of them, Sheila, Michael, Elizabeth. What can you tell me about them? Well, 
Sheila, who lives with me. <laughs> he seems to think that she should be managing my affairs instead of I. Uh -huh. and Michael seems to prefer the so-called life of an artist to assuming the responsibilities of the name of Watkins. And Elizabeth? Stubborn, stubborn. Married to one James Lovett, who is quite convinced that he knows infinitely more about business matters than I ever did. Well, you seem to take a pretty dim view of all of them, Mr. Watkins. I do. I do indeed, Mr. Dollar. You know, one little item occurs to me. And what is that? Whichever two are left out aren't going to like it very much. Obviously. Which means they're not going to like me very much. Also quite obvious. So I intend to pay you a considerable fee. But you will earn it. Every penny of it. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now for another episode in the life of Sergeant Donald Bellwether, my husband. Ariba, is everything packed in this duffel bag? Yeah, everything but these, Sarge. Oh, let me see that bottle. Reba, what in the world would a bunch of guys on our fishing trip want with these indigestion pills? Well, now, you just take them along, Don. Remember, you boys will be doing your own cooking for three whole days. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're right. Oh, boy, I can hardly wait to pop some of those freshly caught fish into the pan. Mm. There, now. Everything's all packed. Yeah, well, we better get going. The fellas will be waiting. Well, I'll walk you to the car. Okay. I'll carry this bag. The rest of the gear is already packed. Here, I'll open the door for you. Oh, thanks, honey. Now, I'll just put this bag in the back seat. Okay. Now, kiss me goodbye right here on the front lawn so the neighbors will know I'm not leaving because we quarrel. <laughs> oh, you're so silly. Good luck, dear. Have a wonderful time. You really deserve this fishing trip. Oh, well, is that all you got to say? I mean, you, you, you usually tell me to drive carefully, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this time I will not say a word. Hmm. Oh. Okay, dear. Well, I guess I better be going. Hey, what's this note on the steering wheel? Dear Sergeant, on one holiday last year in the States, speed was a factor in 71% of the accidents. Drinking was a factor in nearly half. Accidents were most frequent early in the weekend. 82% of the accidents happened in rural areas, and the victims were usually the drivers. Your loving wife, Reba. <laughs> I might have known you'd get to me somehow. <laughs> Goodbye, dear. Oh, I'm going to miss you. Oh, I'm going to miss you too, Reba. And don't you worry. I'll drive safely. That's my Donald. That's my doll. <laughs> Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Happy Family Matter. Well, this was undoubtedly the weirdest assignment I'd ever been handed, and from one of the weirdest characters I'd ever met, E.P. Watkins. And yet I couldn't help feeling sorry for him. He was really alone. And somewhere along the line, he must have been hurt pretty badly. I left the library and started through the drawing room. Mr. Dollar? Hmm? I'm Sheila. Oh, yeah. I'd like to talk to you for a moment. Sure, why not? Mr. Dollar, I know what you must think of my father. Oh, do you? But if you're inclined to judge him harshly, just remember, he wasn't always like this. Oh. So, so very many things have gone wrong for him. Like what? Like, well, I'm afraid the main thing is his feeling that the three of us, Elizabeth and Michael and I, have let him down somehow. He seems to resent us so terribly. Why should he, Sheila? I'm not sure. I think he resents me because I'm not a man. Oh? You see, I'm the oldest. And in many ways, I'm more like father than the others are. If I'd been a man, I could have, well, taken over for him. Yeah, I see. I've tried to do what I could. Help make decisions, that sort of thing. But I think he somehow resents that, too. Well, I... I gather it hasn't exactly been easy for you living here with him. Somebody has to. And the others have lives of their own. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of the others, I'd like to talk to them. Where can I find them? Elizabeth and her husband live in Cranford, New Jersey. 
And Michael's in New York, in Greenwich Village. Okay. Thanks, Sheila. Outwardly, she was poised, but I could tell she was nervous, tense. Her fingers wouldn't stay still. She kept shredding bits of cellophane from her cigarette package. Yeah, she was under strain, all right, and I could understand why. Item three, eight dollars and forty cents. Transportation to New York City to the Greenwich Village apartment of Michael Watkins. Mr. Dollar, you can tell Dad that I do not want that insurance money. Why not, Mike? Because it doesn't... Well, he doesn't owe me anything, and I don't owe him anything. It was a clean break, and that's just the way I want it. You're sure about that? I am. I'm doing what I want to do. I'm painting. Everything is just the way I want it. You know, Mike, you sound sort of like you were trying to convince yourself. I resent that, Mr. Dollar. Our family is split apart, that's all. Sheila's been trying her best to hold it together, but it won't work. Why not? Because I have had it. For years, Dad's been trying to cram Watkins and company down my throat. He knew my heart wasn't in it, but did that matter to him? No. Look, Mr. Dollar, I can make your job real easy for you. Yeah? There's one person in our family really deserves that money after what she's been through. Sheila? Yes. Sheila. <laughs> Item four, six dollars even, transportation to the Lovett's home in Cranford, New Jersey. Look, Mr. Dollar, if sending you here is some scheme of Dad's to, well, to force us into line, you're wasting your time, and so is he. Now, wait a minute, Elizabeth, After please. the way he's treated Jim... Relax, honey. That's all over and done with. Look, Dollar, I can simplify your job for you. Can you? Give the insurance to Elizabeth here. Why? Because then I can get my hands on it. Oh, well, what would you do with it, Jim? Buy a controlling interest in Watkins and Company and put the business back on its feet. You once worked for Watkins and Company. Why did you leave? Because he's still running it the way he did 30 years ago. It won't work, and I wouldn't be a part of it. Jim tried, Mr. Dollar. He really did. But Dad wouldn't even listen to him. For years, he tried to get Mike to take over the business. But Mike prefers to be off in Never Never Land painting those lousy pictures of now, his. Now, Jim... They are lousy, and you know it, Liz. Look, uh, Jim, you say Mr. Watkins didn't give you a chance to put your ideas into effect, huh? No. Finally, things got to the breaking point. Dollar, I sent him a written contract guaranteeing I'd raise the necessary financing. I asked for only six months in charge. Contract? But he wouldn't accept your offer, huh? No. Sheila begged him to sign... Finally, he sent word back for me to tear up the contract and get out of the company. I see. Well, Dollar, you've met all three of us now. Who's going to be the beneficiary? Sheila or Mike or Elizabeth? One thing I wanted to check on was Jim's opinion that Mike was not a good painter. I nosed around until I found an art dealer who'd handled his work. He showed me a couple of paintings and then leveled with me. So far as he could see, Mike was a lousy artist. I went back to my hotel to think it over, but I found a message that Mr. Watkins' attorney wanted to talk to me. He'd taken a room on the floor above, so I went upstairs. Come in. Halfway into the room, I noticed it was dark. Then as I heard the door slam, I felt a gun barrel on my back. All real still, Dollar. Who are you? That don't matter. What's this all about? Dollar... This case you're working on, you drop it right now. And if I don't? If you don't, you get dropped for keeps. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Do you know who said... That man is free who is protected from injury. Those words came from Daniel Webster, one of the most eloquent orators in American history. Webster knew that a man could not be free unless he lived in a country which recognized his right to freedom and created laws to protect that freedom. A slave state may say that its citizens are free, but as long as a single citizen can be harmed by the whim of a country's rulers... True freedom does not exist. A man is free only if his rights to freedom are protected. Remember the words of Daniel Webster. They are part of your American heritage. The free man must be protected from injury. 
And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Happy Family Matter. You get the message, Dollar? Sure. I dropped the case or else. Look, you're obviously not Watkins' attorney. The message was just a decoy to get me here. Who hired you to give me this one? Don't get so nosy, Dollar. You got the warning. It's the main point. Just to make sure you get the message. I'd seen what was coming and ducked, then swung and knocked the gun out of his hand. Hey. He gave me a knee in the stomach and flat. Oh. Oh. By the time I got to my feet, he was gone. I turned on the lights and looked around. And then on the table, I spotted something that stopped me cold. The truth had been right under my nose all the time. I called the various members of the family, asked them to meet me at the Watkins' home. When I got there, they were waiting for me. Mr. Watkins, Sheila, Mike, Elizabeth, and her husband, Jim. There was a stiff, chilly politeness in the air. There was tension, too. Mr. Dollar, I want you to know that I resent your theatrical gesture in assembling us like this. And I'm sorry, Mr. Watkins, but you hired me to do a job, and I'm trying to do it. I'm sure you have reasons for this, Mr. Dollar. But you must know how painful this is to Father. Yes, I know, Sheila, but it's necessary. I don't see why, darling. I'm coming to that, Mike. Now, look, let's face it. This is not exactly the happiest family in the world. It's been torn wide apart. All right. Why is it torn apart? Oh, that's ancient history, Mr. Darling. Maybe some of it is, Elizabeth, but a lot of it isn't. Well, I don't see what's to be gained by rehashing Let all this. Let him finish, honey. Just what are you driving at, Dollar? Just this, Jim. I was hired to find out what I could about the three beneficiaries. On the surface, everybody was very cooperative. On the surface? Somebody in this family didn't really want me to make this investigation, Sheila. They hired a strong arm to rough me up earlier this evening to make me drop the investigation. Nonsense. Sorry, Mr. Watkins, but I've got the scars to prove it. But who? Let's start with you, Mike. I want to know why you quit the family business and started painting. I told you. It was because Dad kept trying to cram the business down my throat. Why, you ungrateful... Well, it's true. I couldn't take it any longer. Sure. But you'd felt that way for a long while. What led you to make the break, Mike? Well, I... When even Sheila agreed it was no use, I... I she encouraged was... you. Of course I encouraged him. I felt he should have the right to a life of his own. But Sheila... You told me that you had begged Mike to stay in the company. She what? Uh, I, what? I was acting in the best interests of the family. Were you, Sheila? Mr. Dollar, I don't know what you're trying to suggest. That brings us to Jim and Elizabeth here. Jim, you quit the company, too. Why? I've already told you, Dollar. Mr. Watkins refused my last offer of help. Kicked me out. Well, that's not true. What offer are you talking about? That contract I sent you. What contract? You never saw it, did you, Mr. Watt? I most certainly did not. But I... Wait a minute. I gave the contract to Sheila. She said it'd be better if she handled it. Then she told me later she discussed it with her father and he refused. Sheila, you lied. Well, Sheila? Stop. I refused to discuss... Sheila, you... You have a nervous habit of shredding cellophane cigarette wrappers to bits. In the hotel room where that hired strong arm jumped me, I found a little pile of shredded cellophane near the ashtray. Sheila. Uh, I, I don't understand. Mr. Dollar, do I understand that you're suggesting it's... It's been I who've torn the family apart? Well... Sheila... Yes, Father. Why? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. Hey, look, I'm an insurance investigator, not a psychologist. But I don't think this is too hard to understand. Sheila, weren't you trying somehow to... to punish? Uh, I'm not sure. Sheila... Oh, Sheila, if that's true, you need help. They... They all had a life of their own. Except me. We'll help you, dear. We'll get help for you. I hated what I was doing. But I just couldn't seem to... to 
help myself. Mr. Dollar, you will understand that I am rather bewildered by all this. I do, Mr. Watkins. Now, you suggest that she was deliberately trying to... to tear the family apart in order to punish someone? Well, that's only a guess, Mr. Watkins, but I think it's probably a good one. Then she was trying to punish me. I think so. Hmm. Should I understand why? Did she ever have a life of her own? Was she ever allowed to have one? Mr. Dollar, I requested you to designate a beneficiary for me. Yes, sir. I now request you to suspend further action for the time being. It appears the matter requires further thought. Yeah. Yeah. Item six, eight dollars and fifty cents. Transportation and incidentals back home. Expense account total, seventy-three dollars even. Remarks? Sheila is now undergoing treatment. And the outlook is favorable. Elizabeth's husband, Jim, is managing the affairs of Watkins and Company. Mike is helping him. And I guess he's doing a good job. Mr. Watkins? Well, he's still alive. And his doctor tells me that now the old gentleman has found some reasons to be alive, he'll probably be with us quite a while. And make all three of his children his beneficiaries. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Tonight's story was written by Robert Wright. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Shirley Mitchell, John Daner, Larry Dobkin, Peter Leeds, and Paul Duboff. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny. How's the weather in Palm Springs? A blonde in a bikini just melted past my poolside window. Goodbye now. Oh, don't hang up. Uh, Johnny, this job's just a few miles north of where you are. It'll take maybe a day to clear it up. Yeah, you said that last Christmas, Pat, and I got trapped in a blizzard. This season, I soak in the sun. Happy New Year. John, boy, we have a bonus list in this office. Your name could be on it. Uh, near where I am, huh? <laughs> it's a ghost town in Calico. An old prospector named Kringle is breathing his last up there. I thought old prospectors never died. He wants to change the beneficiary on a $50,000 policy, but a nephew, Ned Kringle, threatens suit if we let him. So you contact our agent, Gene Craig, in Barstow. Who's the new beneficiary? Uh, Carmen Kringle. Carmen? A borough. A borough? 
Hey, uh, uh, if I don't hear from you, Johnny, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Carmen Kringle matter. Expense account item one, a dollar forty. Telegram to Gene Craig and Barstow telling him where and when to meet me. Item two, fifty dollars even to Al Sterner for his charter plane to the ghost town of Calico. The guidebook says there's something about desert country that's good for the soul. And in spite of the air bumps, I got a panoramic view of the great Mojave that took my breath away. The sun's setting rays hit the weird mineral straighters of the Calico Range and turned them into a patchwork of beauty. Night comes quickly in this country, and I turned to well when a Christmas tree cluster of blinking lights appeared under our wings. By way of answer, he put the plane into a glide and set us down on the smooth surface of a dry lake bed. Me to wait around until your friend shows up? No, no, thanks. Well, there seems to be plenty of company. That's just an old coyote. Don't stand too long or you'll freeze to the spot. Okay. Good luck. Call me when you want to be picked up. I watched Al's plane until it was swallowed by the darkness. Then suddenly I got that feeling in the hair on the back of my neck that I wasn't alone. The moon was up enough to make out shadows, and silhouetted in a circle around me was a strange collection of figures. One of the pack moved toward me, and for a crazy second, I thought I'd bumped into Santa Claus's reindeer. Then a car without lights came rushing at me. The headlights slammed on, and I got a glimpse of a donkey herd scattering into the night. All right, mister. Walk toward me. Slow. With your hands high. I've learned never to argue with a Winchester 94, so I followed orders. I spotted the weaving headlamps of another car approaching and prayed it was the agent, Gene Craig. Close enough, Sonny. I can pop the rattlers off a sidewinder at 60 yards. So don't you make no sudden move. He was maybe 60 with gray sideburns and a frosty goatee. A marshal's badge was pinned to his leather jacket. All right, now, mister. Marshal, Marshal, that's all right. That's Mr. Dollar. Huh? I was supposed to meet him earlier. I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Dollar. I'm Gene Craig. Huh? I you... couldn't get here until I drove Doc Spangler up to Chris. He's had another setback, Marshal. Yeah, some darn fool let down the rail on his corral, and Chris Kringle's whole herd got loose. He don't give a chuck for most of them, though, except Carmen. Now he's fretting because she's running wild. Almost had him tracked down when this here fella showed up. If you vouch for him, huh, Jean? You are Johnny Dollar, aren't you? Well, on a frozen facsimile. Come on, I'll drive you into Calico. You tell Chris that I'll have his Carmen back in the corral before the moon's full. And, uh, Gene. Yeah, Marshal. Tell the old sourdough to stay alive, will you? We need him around here. Sorry about mistaking you, Mr. Dollar. Jean Craig, with a J, knew her way around. She was strictly business and filled me in fast on the old prospector with the odd name and his desire to change the beneficiary of his policy. Everybody calls him Chris because every year he loads up his burrows with toys and presents for the miners and their families back in the hills. Uh -huh. The kids really think he is Santa Claus. I'm afraid it won't be a very merry one for them this year. Well, what makes everyone so sure Chris Kringle is giving up the ghost? Dr. Bangler says there's nothing apparently wrong with him. It's more like he's given up. Oh, what's with this Scrooge character, the nephew? Ned Kringle seems all right. It's the man with him, Willie D'Agostino. He does the talking for Ned. You think he was going to inherit the money? Well, maybe he's expecting to. You know, you're making a good case for Carmen. Can a borough be a beneficiary, Johnny? <laughs> Chris can leave it to a three-masted schooner if he wants, providing a trust is set up. Could the people of Calico be that trust if they promise to take care of Carmen? Yeah, I guess so. Why? 
It's the way Chris wants it. That way, there'll always be a Christmas in Calico. <laughs> what happens when Carmen goes to donkey heaven? Or is it burrows that never die? There'll always be burrows in Calico, Johnny. And one of them could always be named Carmen. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Carmen Kringle matter. Well, here we are, Johnny. Calico. Once the richest silver city in the West. It was unbelievable. Like seeing a page from the past. Walter Knott, famed creator of Knott's Berry Farm and Western historian, had bought the old ghost town's battered remnants and restored it to the way it must have appeared in the wild and fevered days of the Silver Lord. I could make out signs nailed to weathered batten boards that told of a flourishing and colorful past. Joe's Saloon, The Last Chance, Hyena House Hotel, Lane's Mercantile, The Calico Prince. High on a hill at the edge of town, people were gathered at the entrance to a cave that was illuminated by hundreds of miners' lamps. Kind of gets you, huh? Almost like it was planned. They're rehearsing for the Christmas Eve pageant. Maybe you can spend Christmas Eve with us, Johnny. You don't have other plans. I have a day with a steam-heated swimming pool. What? Come on. Let's meet the old man. Expense account item three, a hundred bucks for a quart of perfume or a mink scarf, anything to wipe the hurt look off of Jean Craig's face. She led me up the steps to the rickety porch of Chris Kringle's wooden shack. A tall figure carrying a black bag stepped toward us out of the shadows. Jeannie, I'm glad to see you. Will you drive me back to town? Why, certainly, Doc. Oh, this is Mr. Dollar. Hi, son. Hi. Chris, is he still all right? I couldn't say. Been sitting out here waiting for you. You haven't seen the patient? The medical man owes a duty and all that, but I'm too old to talk back to a gun. They wouldn't let you in? Tired of it. Well, I'm not a medical man. Well, please be careful, Johnny. I told you, Starbone, stay away and leave the old man to... <laughs> well, if it ain't a little genie, the policy fixes. And who are you, mister? Willie D'Agostino. This is Johnny Dollar. He's from the insurance company to see about changing the policy. Who is it, Wally? Who are you talking Relax, to? Relax, will you, and let him give us some tourist directions back to Barstow. There'll be no policy changing at this late date, mister. Ned Kringle is very bereaved at the imminence of his uncle's demise. Just family admitted at this sad hour. So mosey along, folks. I'll leave the young man to his grief. <laughs> your foot is in the door, mister. I don't like your foot. And I don't like you. His hand moved to his shoulder holster, but Jean was standing right beside me. It was Doc who suddenly shouldered past Agostino and fled up the stairs that gave him my chance. I kicked the door wide. <laughs> Threw him off balance. I shoved Jeannie aside, and that was a mistake. Because a million Christmas tree lights blazed up in my skull. <laughs> then slowly the tree lights faded away, and I saw Jeannie fussing over me and looking worried. A young, nice-looking fellow was seated next to a marble top table. D'Agostino leaned against the stone fireplace and dangled his gun, smiling like he had a stacked deck. He's all right, Doc? A nasty cut, but no fracture. I know how to pull my punches, Doc. The old man. How is he? No better, no worse. Just lying up there staring at the ceiling. I want to see Chris. I have a right to, Ned. I'm an old friend. Wooly, wouldn't it be okay if Gene just went no, up? No, let him die in peace. He's past carrying the whole season. Oh, Wooly, these people have I a right. I said no. I'll get a hero boy and a speak and shove off. Go on. Come on, Johnny. Help me, Doc. How's it going to feel, Ned? Sharing blood money with a hoodlum. Your uncle paid for that policy with a pick and a shovel. It took a lot of years, a lot of sweat. And he's had your name on that policy ever since you were born. Oh, man, Kringle never saw pay dirt in his life. Ned had given him money to live on, paid the premiums on his policy. Chris was always tapping the kid, claiming he had a new find. He was going to mine a million. Wait, shut up! The old man's dying. 
Tell him, Ned. Tell him how the old phony was always taking the bars, making like Santa Claus with the money you give him. Willie, haven't you got a... Tell him who owed you the money! I know he's been waiting a long time for this. Me. Willie D'Agostino, that's who. Is that true, Ned? Yeah. I thought my uncle would make a strike someday. I... I honestly thought he'd strike it rich. I know he tried. He did strike it rich, Ned. When he dies, every man, woman, and child in this town will mourn him. He'll live in their hearts. What will people remember about you, Mr. D'Agostino? All right, out, get out, get out and stay up before I... Willie, this rifle will make a hole in your belly big enough to pass a borax team through. So you just drop that gun. I don't know what the shouting's about, but you're guilty of carrying sidearms and you're threatening and violence, Mr. D'Agostino. And ain't nobody does that in Calico, as long as I'm the marshal. Now, you better get. Ed Nuller, I love you. <laughs> so let Gladys hear that. <laughs> well, I'll see how Chris is. Uh, Doc, yeah. and tell the old buzzard that I got his Carmen back in the corral. Jingle bells and all. Yeah, nice work, Ed. Now, what's holding you, mister? Okay. Okay. All right, let's go, Ned. Uh, let the squares have a round, huh? I'm going to stay here, Willie. I want to be here when Chris... Hey, that's a good idea. That way, no fooling around with the will, huh? Smart kid, that Ned. Uh, see you at the funeral, huh? I'll go up now. You were wonderful, Marshal. And you too, Johnny. Oh, yeah, sure. I take a nice sock on the head. Hey, you folks better come up, too. Chris wants to say something. Oh, wait, wait a second. I forget on this. The corral. Come on. D'Agostino must have had another gun in his car. One of the bullets had found the mark he intended. Willie Boy wasn't taking any chances that Carmen Kringle would inherit $50,000. We found the burrow lying on her side, quite dead. Jingle bells and all. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Oh, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Carmen Kringle matter. Johnny, how could he have been so cruel? Carmen, Dad. It's just not right. Yeah, I figured D'Agostino might be mean enough to try killing Chris's pet burro. We can't tell him about it. It would kill him for sure. You'll have to know the truth, Jean. You'll have to decide about the will. Yeah, truth is always the best. And easy this time. Easy? Huh? Yeah. I'll just take these bells off and miss poor little fella. And I'll put them where they belong. Carmen. What? Carmen. Oh. Mosey over here now. Oh. oh, you pulled a switch. You put these bells on another book. Oh. Yeah. I didn't trust that greasy character, and I was right. A nice girl, Carmen. Oh, I'll be. Now, now, you folks going up and see old Chris. I'll keep an eye on this here $50,000 jackass. That's uh, the way it's going to be, ain't it, Johnny? Yes, sir. That's the way it's going to be. But I was wrong. The roly-poly little old man in the four-poster bed with his white whiskers resting on the quilt changed his mind again. Even after hearing about how the marshal saved Carmen. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to scratch Ned's name off of that insurance, Mr. Dollar. I tried to shake that bag of Stino, figuring he'd take his hooks off of Ned. If he thought my Carmen was going to get the money... Oh, I was scared for a while that I just might have to up and die to square my nephew's gambling debts. I, uh, I'm sorry, Chris. I'll work my fingers raw paying every cent I owe, but I'll pay him back with interest. I want you around. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mr. Dyer. Yeah, Chris. Hey, lift the lid on that footlocker and fetch me one of them bags in there. They're, they're pretty heavy, but you look strong. Well, they're sure heavy enough. 
They got him stuffed with silver. Oh, I see, Jack. You see, better than silver. Open it up. Open it up, Jack. Yeah, I see, Jack. Yeah, Jack. Recognize Doc? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you'd better have a good sleep, Chris. This here is plain old gravel. Oh, bless you, gravel. It's uranium, Doc. Huh? The last batch assayed at $900 a ton. And I got a mountain of it staked out. In both our names, Ed. You oh, don't care. Hey, hey, why, Chris? Hey, 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 Mr. Dollar, if you and Jeannie check with the Barstow Bank, you'll find that they'll extend credit on the strength of that assay. <laughs> uh, you reckon you can spend two days buying enough presents so as we won't disappoint the folks hereabouts? <laughs> Expense account item four, $68 even. Telephone calls to five principal cities where I thought Willie D'Agostino might be remembered. The police departments had a long list of reasons why they remembered Willie. That was my Christmas present to them. Expense account item five, another 50. Truck rental to haul the presents we bought for Ned to give away come Christmas morning. And then it was Christmas Eve. We sat on the Kringle's porch and watched the procession up to the Maggie Mine. The flickering lights from the miners' lamps reflecting on the faces of the happy children. Old Chris was bundled up in blankets, his little eyes twinkling, chuckling to himself like he knew all the answers of the universe. Jean was there, too. Kind of nice, isn't it, Johnny? Kind of nice. Marshal Ed Noller was one of the wise men in the procession. I recognized the sideburns. And Doc Spangler couldn't hide his height. Oh, he wore an awful beard. Ned Kringle led the burro that carried the Blessed Mother. Yeah, you guessed it. The burro was Carmen Kringle. Expense account total, including return to Palm Springs and incidentals, $229.75. But forget it, Pat. This is the best holiday I ever had. And I was only cold at the start. From all of us to all of you, may this be your very merriest Christmas ever. Yours truly, Johnny Duff. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I love you. Uh, hello? I said, I love you. Uh, yeah. That does not please you? Oh, uh, pleases me fine. Uh, now, why don't you and I get together oh, and we'll be able... That would be nice. Well, just name the time and the place and, uh... Hey, wait a minute. Who are you? Carmelo Hocaris, Johnny. Oh, well, uh, let's get down to Earth. Carmela? Yes, Johnny. Well, I, uh, well, usually when my phone rings this way on a Sunday night, well... Oh, it... I know. You expect some dull insurance agent to be calling you. Yeah. With a dull insurance matter for you to worry about, no? Yeah, that's usually the case. <laughs> but this one does not need to be dull. You mean you have an insurance problem on your mind? Of course. So maybe you will help me? Well, just name the company, any company, and I'm on my way. The Universal Adjustment Bureau would be interesting. So who cares if they're interested? Come on, Carmela, get to the point, huh? Come see me, Johnny. Tell your friend, Pat McCracken, at the Universal. Yeah, sure. Tell him what? That I called you. Will you, Johnny? Are you kidding? Goodbye. Yeah, well, where can I... 
Hello? Hello? Ah, huh? Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now that the holiday season is with us, there are three different reasons why you should have several packages of Chef Boyardee pizza pie mix handy in the house. The reasons are friends who drop in for lunch, friends who drop in for supper, and friends who come over just to say hello. Because pizza is perfect to serve friends and family any time of the day. And when you use Chef Boyardee pizza pie mix, it's so easy. You see, everything you need is right there in the one Chef Boyardee pizza package that you keep on your cupboard shelf. Needs no refrigeration. You get the flour that turns into crispy golden crust. Chef's own pizza sauce, made according to the very same recipe Chef Boyardee brought with him from Italy. And even mellow Italian-style cheese, already grated to become a delicious, bubbling topping. Serve everybody pizza this holiday season. They'll love it. And you'll find pizza is so easy to make. When you use Chef Boyardee Pizza Pie Mix, get several packages. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Latin Lovely matter. Expense account items 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. 50 cents for phone calls early Monday morning trying to reach Pat McCracken. Item 6, a dollar taxi fare to the offices of Universal Adjustment. Oh, hi, Johnny. Top of the morning to you. Yeah, where the Sam Hill have you been all morning, Pat? <laughs> all morning? You kidding? Look, the clock on this desk says exactly 9.02. For me, that's the crack of dawn. Now, what's bothering you? Carmela. Oh, oh, oh. Carmela Jocares. Yeah, only it's Jocares. Oh, well. Might have known she'd call you direct. I should have warned you, Johnny. You know her, Pat? She's threatened to come down here and camp on my doorstep any minute. <laughs> oh, can you think of a nicer ornament to have around? If she's anything like she sounds on oh, the phone. Oh, she is. She is, Johnny, yeah. That's why I should have suggested that Special Investigator Martha Mayberry Balderdale help her. Balderdale? Uh-huh. Now, how could an old battle axe like her know how to deal with a young, charming, beautiful... Uh, uh, dancer like Carmela? Dancer, is that what she is? Yes, yes. Not very good, oh. but she's just as beautiful and seductive. And... Uh, no. No, no, maybe I'd, I'd better stick old Lady Baldale on. All right, Pat, quit the kidding and tell me what it's all about. Who's kidding? Well, where do I find Carmela, her address? Now, you see, you're already emotionally involved with her. You haven't even met her. Emotionally, Client Pat? relationship in our business should be entirely objective, Johnny. How can I possibly expect you to look at Carmela's insurance problem with an unbiased eye? Oh, mind? Pat, and All what's... she'd have to do is bat those lovely big brown eyes at you a couple of look, times. Look, look, and... will you stop baiting me and tell me what this is all about? <laughs> emotions. All right. I got involved with this little Latin lovely as a favor to the company that issued her the policy, Surety Mutual and Trust. What kind of a policy? Retirement. Pays her 50000 when she's 45. Meantime, if she dies, her beneficiary gets the fifty grand. So what's the matter with it? Ah. Uh, well, like I told you, Johnny, she's a dancer. Night clubs. Always has a partner. Some good young kid who can make up for her shortcomings. Only a different partner every month or so. Well, what's that have to do with her insurance? Well, she has the company name her partner as beneficiary. Oh, I see. And if she keeps changing her policy... Right. And by now it has so many riders attached to it, the company's running out of filing space. And what's more important, the cost of servicing this one lousy policy and the time that's been wasted on it... And the last time... Well, she's been so insistent, you'd think she was planning to die tomorrow. Well, maybe she is. Why doesn't the company just stall on making some of these changes? Well, they've tried that. So what happened? She's on the phone every day, two or three times a day. Nobody has any peace. That's why they finally turned to me in desperation. And you said you'd have me talk to her. I did not. She asked for you. Why? How'd she even know about me? Oh, newspapers, some of the radio programs about the cases you've handled. Johnny, you're her idol. You're her dream boy. Oh, yeah, sure. But what to do about this? Well, you get her to settle with one beneficiary. Get her married, something like that, so her policy will stay set for a while. Yeah, 
married, even if you have to... Oh, yeah. You? Huh? Yeah. Oh, no, you don't. Not me. Oh, no, no, no. It's a great idea. Johnny, her address is 624 East 47th Street, New York. Now, you look, but Just Matt... remember one thing. Universal Adjustment Bureau will not pay for your defense in a breach of promise suit, John. It's all the way or nothing. Oh, yeah, sure. Call me up sometime when you have a case for me. Sucker. Me, that is. Because of item 7, 1940, plane fare and incidentals to New York City, taxi from the airport to 624 East 47th Street, a nice modern apartment building complete with a uniform doorman. Miss Hokaris? That's right. Can I have your name, sir? Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, of course. So, if you'll just give me her apartment number... And may I see your credentials, please? My creden... Oh, sure, why not? Here, take a good look. Oh, oh, seems all right. Thank you, sir. Now, look, she's expecting me. I know, sir. Then what's all this fuss about? Hey, will you step into the lobby, please? Oh, sure. Now, what's the number of her apartment? Uh, one moment, please. She is in, isn't she? Yes, sir, she is. I don't understand about answering the house phone, though. You're certain that she's in? Absolutely, sir. But why she doesn't answer? Where's her I... apartment? It's number seven up the stairs. Come on, show me the way. Yes, sir. She only came in a few minutes ago. And nobody else has called on her? No, sir. Were all those precautions of yours on her orders? Yes, sir. She seemed to be fearful of something lately. Fearful? Huh? Right, right here, sir, number seven. Funny. Miss Ocades. Miss Ocades. Carmela. Listen. I what? That sound inside. Well, there must be somebody you in. You got a pass key? Well, yes, sir. Only... Come on, give it to me quick. But unless you have some authority, Mr. Dunn. I have all I need. Carmela. Mr. Dollar. She's been killed. No, no. No. No, she's alive, all right. But that's about all. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. There is a difference. A great big difference in fix medicated cough drops. There is a difference. A great big difference can be relief with every single drop. Yes, there is a big difference in Vicks medicated cough drops. The medication makes the difference. Only Vicks cough drops are medicated with the exclusive throat-soothing ingredients of Vicks Vapor Rub. Two delicious flavors, Vicks Regular and New Wild Cherry. Next time your throat feels raw and irritated from coughs due to colds, remember... There is a difference. A great big difference in Vicks medicated cough drops. The medication makes the difference. Yes, the medication makes the difference. And for a stuffy nose, just one whiff. With a Vicks inhaler and that miserable feeling of a stuffy nose goes in seconds. Use it anywhere, anytime. Vicks inhaler. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Latin lovely matter. Carmela Hocares, beautiful Latin American dancer who kept changing the beneficiary of her insurance policy to the point where the company was going crazy. Who demanded another change, this time almost desperately. We'd found her unconscious on the floor of her apartment. Bill, the doorman, discovered how her assailant had got in. Through the service entrance into the kitchen, Mr. Dollar. He must have run away when he heard us at the door. Any brandy, anything like that around here, Bill? Yes, a little bar there in the corner. Okay, I see it. Do you know a doctor you can call? I have a list on my desk in the lobby. Well, then go on down and call him. Uh, isn't this a matter for the police? Sir? I'll worry about that. You get a doctor up here. Yes, sir. Camilla. Now... Camilla. Camilla, here. See if you can drink this. Oh, Johnny. That's right. Come on now, drink this. That's good. A little more now. Come on. Oh, no. No. I'm all right now. Help me to the sofa. Yeah, sure. Here now. Hey, uh... Right, how's that? Oh, thank you, Johnny, darling. Are you badly hurt? What happened? He struck me. Who? He knocked on the back door. I thought it was Billy. 
to deliver something. So I opened the door, and he struck me before I could... Oh, Johnny, it was terrible. Well, who was he? Do you know? No, darling. I am still so afraid. Hold me, please, in your arms. Carmela, do you know who it was? No. It was then he heard you and Billy at the front door. And you have no idea who it could have been? Well, he was short and dark and... Johnny. Yeah? The man who has been calling me, first from Mexico and then from here in New York, threatening me. Well, who? I do not know, darling. <sighs> threatening about what? You have done it once too many, he would say. Now you will be sorry. And he would hang up. Done what once too many or too often or whatever he meant? I do not know, Johnny. <sighs> well, I know darn well the insurance company would never carry things this far. The insurance? Well, Johnny, Johnny... You can't do it for me, can't you, darling? Do what? I only ask them to make a little change. But all they do is delay, delay. Oh, now, look, we have more important things to think about now. More important than the insurance? Oh, you do not understand. Please, my sweetheart. How can I work unless Armando is... First, we find out who attacked you and why. <gasps> oh. oh, Billy, darling. The doctor says he'll be here in 15 to 20 minutes. No, Mr. not the doctor. Ah. I love you, Billy, but you're a nice boy, but but not the doctor. Why not? Because, because I am all right now. You're sure about that, Carmela? Oh, yes. Yes, I am all right. You know, you recovered pretty fast. No marks on you. What do you mean? I wonder just how much of a beating you really took. Johnny, my darling, my love. Surely you do not think Oh, that... I'm not sure what I think. Okay, Billy. Call off the doctor until I can find out what's what. Oh, thank you, my sweet. You do care about me. I love you. Oh, yeah, sure. And, Billy Boy, you stay here until I get back. Yes, sir. My Juanito, where are you going? You know something, Carmela? I wish I knew. I know where I was going, all right, to 18th Precinct Police Headquarters and my old friend Randy Singer. If anybody could give me a rundown on Carmela and any of her contacts, he could. If Carmela's attacker left any fingerprints, his boys would find them. Cutting through the alley beside the apartment building, headquarters would only be a couple of blocks away. But all that alley was a mistake. I didn't see the man step out of the doorway behind me. But I did feel that old familiar poke in the small of my back. No. Keep walking, senor. To the next door. All right, now look. If you'll take that gun out of my back. Walk. What is this? A hold up? No. In here. Well? I am Federico, Senor Dollar. Bully for you. So what? I could hear you from the back stairway of her apartment. So you would help her, eh? Carmela? Maybe? No. You will not. Because I will kill you first. <laughs> Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Smoke Kent, smoke Kent, smoke Kent with the micronite filter. Remember this, Kent, filters best of all the leading filter cigarettes. So get the mild Kent cigarette, smoke Kent with the micronite filter. And now, Act Three of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Latin Lovely Matter. You hear me? I will kill you. Do you mind telling me why? I will kill you before I let you help that woman ruin my son. Your son? You are from the company for the insurance, are you not? Yeah, that's right. To make her the change in the policy, to change what you call the, the, the benefit, the, uh... the... Beneficiary, yes. That's what she's asked for. But I will not let you. Well, I haven't said I... Oh, look, put away that gun, will you? No. 
Okay, Chief. What? But be careful. This man is armed. What do you call it? You want to see it? Just a pretty nervous position. No. Give me that gun. No. No, I... All right. Now we're on even terms. Just who are you and what's this all about? I'm... I'm Federico Gomez, the father of Armando. And who's Armando? Armando, my son. He would be the next fly in the web of the spider. The what? That woman, Carmela Hocares. It is my boy, my fine son, that she would make her victim like all the others. Like all what others? Look, Mr. Gomez. He is a dancer, my son. A fine dancer, the toast of all Mexico. And she would do with him what she did with the rest. Charm them, make love to them, bring them here to this city to dance with her. Unless I stop her. Well, I fail to see anything particularly... And like the others, my son would fall in love with her with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind. Yeah, I'm sure, And she... Oh, of course, she would prove her love for him with all the big insurance benefit. You mean that naming those lads in her insurance policy... Oh, now, wait a minute. You do not know what 50,000 of your American dollars can mean to a young man fresh in his, uh, what do you call, career. Mr. Gomez. Is it not true? Well, yeah, it's a lot of dough to hold up in front of a young fellow, but there's a big difference between that much cash and just a promise of insurance money. The eyes of a young man are easily blinded by this beautiful woman, amigo. She has blinded so many. They have danced with her and given her their money because they loved her. All right. But when she got their money, she was through with them. When they begged her to marry them, she spit on them. She turned them out. Pedro Fernandez, you know of him? No, I'm afraid I don't. Because of this woman, he killed himself. So it was with him and as the son of my friend. But she will not do this to my son. And you honestly think the mere fact of a big insurance policy... Was it not true with him and as with Pedro, with Angel, with, with all the rest? These were young men, amigo, like my son. Unwise to the world, unwise to a woman like this. Suicide. I will do anything to keep her from using that insurance to ruin my son. Senor. Uh, the more I live in this world, the more amazed I am at some of the things that happen in it. Things that are implausible, impossible, but that sometimes do happen. I can only beg of you. Humbly. All right, look, Mr. Gomez, I'm keeping this gun. By right, so I ought to have you locked up for poking it in my back for your attack on Camilla. But I... Where are you staying? At the Hotel de Glen Arms. I want you to go back there. Stay there until you hear from me. You will help me, senor. If you'll do as I say. Gracias, senor. Gracias. The scene with Carmela back in her apartment was not a pretty one. She not only admitted to having used the insurance, among other things, to further her shaky career at the expense of those young and better dancers but was quite proud of the broken hearts and broken minds she may have left behind. Until I tore into her, and believe me, I did. Murder? Oh, no, Juanito. Now, you look. No. If you didn't murder those two young kids, well, you might as well have plunged in the knife yourself. Oh. I don't know... I don't know what laws, what legal action may be dragged in to make you pay for what you've done, but there are moral laws, too. Laws of decency. But I did I'll tell you this, know. Carmela. That from now on, the police of this town and of anywhere else you may go, believe me, they'll be gunning for you. And if anything like this ever happens again... No, Johnny. Johnny, please. You must believe me. I did not think. I was thinking only about myself. I did not realize... Well, it's that... high time you did. Your insurance? Oh, baby, that's going to be canceled. Unless you can think of someone far away from your career to leave your money to. Someone you can't hurt. Oh, Johnny, I promised. Don't you see? Never before has anyone made me realize what I was doing. I have only had to think of myself... By the time I left her, she was sobbing her heart out, promising that she'd spend the rest of her life making up for the things she'd done. And who knows? Maybe... Well, who knows? Expense account total, including incidentals and transportation back to Hartford. Uh... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny. Oh, hi, Pat. Well, I just got around to finishing up my report and expense account on that Carmela Hocates thing last week. You can just week. forget the expense account part of it. I got what? Well, for the life of me, I don't know how you did it. What are you talking about? The company just sent me a copy of the rider, Johnny, the last and final rider on her policy. Oh. Naming the new beneficiary and absolutely, irrevocably, can never be changed again. Who did she name, Pat? Some old childhood... Are you kidding? You! What? <laughs> you sly dog. Hello. Hello. Well, I'll be... Yours truly, Juanito Peso.
our star will return in just a moment. Meet movie star Dorothy L'Amour. Actresses can't perform with a rotten cold, so I take four-way, the fastest way to stop terrible cold distress and feel better quick. Right. Of all leading cold tablets tested, four-way's the fastest-acting brand. In minutes, amazing four-way starts to relieve aches, pains, headache, reduce fever, calm, upset stomach, overcome irregularity. When you catch cold, remember my advice. Take four-way, fastest way to stop these awful cold miseries. Four-way, 29 cents. Now let me tell you about another fine product of Grove Laboratories. Imagine a shampoo so effective it gets rid of embarrassing dandruff with one lathering, but won't dry hair, won't split ends, won't leave a medicinal odor. It's wonderful new Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo. One lathering with Fitch removes dandruff, can brighten hair up to 35% too, without harsh medication. Only Fitch guarantees to do all this with one safe, easy lathering or money back. Contains no strong medication, so it's gentle enough for every shampoo. And then dandruff need never be a problem again. Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo, only 59 cents. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, some priceless jewelry, a beautiful girl, and believe me, they add up to trouble. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote today's story. Heard in our cast were Lucille Meredith, Larry Dobkin, Jimmy McCallion, and Harry Bartell. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Harry Branson, John. Hi, and Harry. Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Insurance Company. I said hi. How are you? Oh, 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 yes. Well, I'm fine, thank you. But that's beside the point. John, this thing has me terribly upset. Comes the day you aren't upset over something, Harry. It'll be a miracle. What's it all about? Can you come down here to Philadelphia right away? Don't see why not. But now what Believe seems to me, be... if you can clear up this matter, I shall be eternally grateful. $985,000. Wow. For what, Harry? Of course, anyone, any criminal, that is, could be suspect in the theft. Theft of what? But the murder, it doesn't make sense. What does it? What do you think, John? What do I think? Look, Harry, you haven't yet what given me... What possible the... reason could there have been for firing the shot that... How about the butler? What? The, the butler? Of course, I never thought of that. I... John, what butler? Oh, I'll be down to see you, Harry. Goodbye. Wait, wait. You mean you know something about this case that the police and I don't know? I don't know anything about it yet. I'll be down to see you. But in that case... Goodbye, Harry. But in that case, John, if you don't know anything about it, what leads you to suspect the butler? And what butler... John, you have me all confused. Then that makes us even. Bye. But John... So help me. If it weren't for the big fat expense account I can foist on Harry Branson... Well, here we go again. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Insurance Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the ingenuous jeweler matter. 
Expense account item one, $32.70, train fare and incidentals, Hartford, Connecticut to Philadelphia, cab to Harry Branson's office on Walnut Street. I found him sitting at his desk, his head in his hands. Oh, 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 John, I'm glad you've come. Yeah, well, how's your good health, Harry? Um, no, My health, wait, though, I... as a matter of fact, it's fine, although I did have a touch of laryngitis last week, I could hardly speak about it. John, why do you always try to take my mind away from matters at hand? I simply ask Particularly you... Particularly something as important as this. All right. As what? The Beaufort collection, of course. Beaufort? Oh, yeah. Seems to me I've heard about that. Jewelry? One of the most important small collections in the world. Why, when His Grace the Duke de Beaufort lost them to the Germans back during the First World yeah, War. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. But now let's get to the point. They've been stolen. And we'd insured them for nearly a million dollars. Stolen from where? The jeweler who owned them, J. Harold Whipsett. Oh, hey, I've heard of him, too. Isn't he the fellow who was tagged by the Customs Department a few years ago for trying to smuggle in a Yes, stuff? yes, the same one. But his reputation since that incident has been quite all right, completely unsullied. Oh, I must admit that I had some misgivings about issuing a policy to a man with his past record. But since he's in the clear again, and uh, considering the premiums involved... And, and, John, I had a long discussion with a psychiatrist about the man, about what would motivate Look, him Look, to... Harry, before you go rattling off on another tack... Well, John, I resent that. Look, you said something about murder at the time of the theft. But, oh, oh, yes. So far, however, it's only attempted murder, you see. Of this man, what's it? His secretary, Miss Winkle. Winkle? Perry Winkle. Per... Oh, now, wait. Is that some kind of a gang? It certainly is not. At first, when they arrived, the police thought she was dead. Well, where did all this happen? At the Whipset office. It's on Chestnut Street. When did it happen? Just last night. Oh, dear. $985,000. And maybe a human life. Well, yes, of course. Now, tell me all you know about it, Harry. Well, the Beaufort collection contains several diamond and emerald brooches that date back to, uh... Let me see. Forget uh, the dates. What I want to know no, is... No, the fact that all the stones were rather small and of conventional cut means that once they're remounted, no one could ever identify them. Well, what's that got to do with the date of the collection? Well, as I started to oh, say... Oh, let's go over to the Whipsit's office. Oh, very well. Now, as I started to say, the date of the Duc de Beaufort's acquisition of these jewels... Uh, you say this Perry Winkle was badly hurt. How? Oh. She was shot by the robber. Now, as I started to say, the date at which the Duke de Beaufort... Tell me this. Was Whipson himself shot or shot at? No, and I'm sure he'll tell you all about that when you see him at his office. He's certain to be in this morning. As I started to say, John... John, going down, gentlemen. Yeah, thanks. Come on, Harry. Step in, please. Harry! As I started to say, John... John? <laughs> Whether I wanted or not, during the nine-block taxi ride up Chestnut Street, I got the whole history of the Duke de Beaufort's jewels, from the time of the French Revolution to the present. That cab, by the way, is item two, a dollar even. What I did want to know was more about J. Harold Whipson. After all, a man who had once attempted fraud against U.S. customs. Anyhow, we finally reached his office in the Prosser building. Present was Police Lieutenant Bart Stanley, with whom I'd worked a case two years ago. Uh, glad to see you, Johnny. Yeah, same here, Bart. Well, what do you make of it? So far, Blanco. Is Whipset here? One of the boys took him down for some coffee. He needs it after what happened to him last night. The Beaufort jewels, huh? Yeah. Yes, I told Mr. Dollar all about them, Lieutenant. How the robber took nothing else. How the jewels themselves came into being. Harry, how back in the Harry, 18th, uh, we've got work to do here. Well, I... After all... I... Now, look, Bart. This man whoops it. His reputation in the past. I know exactly what you're going to say. I might have thought the same thing, Johnny, if I hadn't seen exactly what happened. Tell me what did happen. Lieutenant, you look very tired. Yes, Mr. Branson, I am. After all, having been up all night on this thing, suppose I bring Mr. Dollar up to date. Well, sure. Oh, no, you don't. I want to find out now, not next week. John. Go ahead, Bart. Well, Whipsit and his secretary, Perry Winkle. Isn't that a name? Yeah, sure is. Where is she, by the way? Jefferson Hospital. Anyhow, they were here very late last night, working on the books. Came a knock on the door. Whipsit opened it. This man barged in with a gun and demanded the Beaufort collection. And? Well, Whips had argued with him, finally gave in when the guy threatened to shoot him. But Miss Winkle made a dash for the door. The intruder let her have it, held the gun on Whips it, tore out the telephone line, then locked him in and disappeared. And that's it. Wait a minute. 
How could he lock Whipset in his own office? This lock opens from the inside. Hmm? With this, Johnny. What? This little rubber door stop? That's right. But I don't I'll see... I'll tell you how he did it. And why this little rubber wedge is absolute proof that Whipset couldn't possibly have rigged this whole deal. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. For a long time, people... And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the ingenuous jeweler matter. Look here, Johnny. This door. What about it, Bart? Well, this is a real old building. All the office doors open outward into the corridors. See? So? All right. After the robber made Mr. Whips at hand over the jewelry, he shot the secretary, Miss Winkle. Then he yanked out the telephone, beat it, and slammed the door on Whips it. But you said locked him in, and I don't see how... Look, with this little rubber wedge, the door opens outward, right? Don't you see, John? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sure, of course I see, Bart. Sure. He simply jammed the doorstop under the edge of the door from the outside. Sure, so the harder whips it pushed against the door, the tighter it jammed. When the telephone knocked out, all he could do was bang on the door and holler and holler out the window. That's what tipped you off? Uh, the policeman on the beat down on Chestnut Street heard the shot and then the yelling. By a stroke of luck, I pulled up in a prowl car just about then. I see. We came tearing up here and found out how somebody locked whips it in his own office. Whoever did it, Johnny, must have cased the joint to know about the doors opening outward. Yeah, Makes any suspicion of Whipson himself. Well, yeah, yeah, it makes it look a little silly. Anyhow, he was pretty much beside himself, more upset over the girl lying there with a slug in her than he was over losing the collection. Any idea what kind of a gun was used on her? The hospital sent the bullet over to the lab. It was a thirty-eight special. And she was in pretty bad shape, huh? Well, we thought at first she was dead. So did Whipson. Could he give you a description of the, uh, the assailant? Yeah, but it's not much help. Could apply to half a million men in this big city. What about fingerprints? None. Guy wore gloves. Has the girl been able to tell you anything at all? She was unconscious, Johnny. Has been ever since. I'm afraid it's going to be curtains for her. Oh, too bad. She's over at Jefferson, you say? Yeah, but there's no point in going over there. Even if she came to for only a couple of minutes, she might be able to give us something to go on. What could she tell us that Whipsit hasn't already told us? Well, we're back, Lieutenant. You want Mr. Whipsit to stick around? No, I guess not, Conroy. I took him over to a place I know on Pine Street and poured a couple of stiff drinks in him. He needed him. And you too, Conroy? Oh, now, Lieutenant. Mr. Whipsit, this is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Uh, uh, oh, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yeah. You know Mr. Branson, I guess. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. And may I tell you, Mr. Whipsit, how dismayed I am by what's happened here. Oh, thank you, Mr. Branson. It's, it's been a terrible, it terrible... It certainly has. 985,000. I, I, I was speaking of poor Miss Winkle, sir. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, yes. Mr. Whipsett, uh, this girl, Miss Perry Winkle, uh, she was your secretary. Uh, she was, she was more than that, Mr. Dollar. I, well, I, I loved her. H how is she, Lieutenant? Has there been any word from the hospital? Well, yes, uh, Mr. Whipsett, there has, and it's proof that modern medicine is a very wonderful thing. What? Oh, what do you mean, sir? Yes, John. I... It um, may take time, of course, a long time. Yes. As a matter of fact, she hasn't even regained consciousness yet. Oh, I, I see. But uh, it looks as though she'll fully recover. Oh, I see. Well, I, I hardly need tell you how I feel about that. How glad I am. I told that little white lie to see what, if any, reaction I'd get. And I had a strange feeling that his words, how glad I am, were not quite true. Fortunately, neither Harry Branson nor the lieutenant questioned my apparent knowledge of the condition of the girl. Even better, the lieutenant rose to the occasion. Well, as I see it, there's really nothing further we can do here. You look like you could use some sleep, Mr. Whipsett. And Conroy and I'd better get back to headquarters, see if the boys have run down anybody who fits that description you gave us. Yeah, good idea. Let's go, huh? And Mr. Whipsett. You close up and go on home and get some rest. Yes, huh? I will. Thank you. 
Thank you very, very much. You have no idea what a terrible shock this has been for me. Of course, you'll keep yourself available if we need you further. Oh, of course, Lieutenant. Okay, Johnny. What was that all about, telling him she'd recover? Yes, John, I almost interrupted I was afraid you would. That's why I kept talking. Barn, I'm going over to the hospital. Oh, now look, If there's only one chance in a million of that girl regaining consciousness, I want to be there when she does. You still suspect Whipsit? Did I say that? Don't you see, John, the whole thing hinges on that little rubber doorstop. On the fact that he couldn't possibly have locked himself in with it. Branson's right, Johnny. (sighs) Okay, then I won't go over to the hospital. Ring for the elevator, Harry. Oh, sure. John, what will you do? Call him on the phone down in the lobby instead. Dr. Ken Werther. This is Johnny Dollar, doctor, insurance investigator. I'm calling about Miss Perry Winkle. Oh, oh yes. I was about to call the police. She's conscious now? She died, Mr. Dollar, less than five minutes ago. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag, heaven. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the ingenuous jeweler matter. Well, what'd you find out from the hospital, Johnny? The girl is dead about five minutes ago. Oh, dear. And we've got a killer to track down. Now I'd better get on over to headquarters. I'll phone poor Mr. Whips that he left the building while you were in the phone booth, John. Barnes, have you got a key to his office upstairs? Why, sure, right here. Let me have it, will you? Here. You want me to go up there with you? Mm, why don't you go over to the hospital and see if Whips it shows there? Hmm. What do you expect to find up in his office, Johnny? I haven't the least idea. Why, kid about it, I didn't have the least idea what I expected to find. Or even what I was looking for. When I walked into the jeweler's office up on the eighth floor, I picked up the rubber doorstop. The one thing that proved whips that couldn't possibly have rigged the whole deal. But I somehow felt that if only that little wedge of rubber could talk. Then I noticed a funny, a funny sort of burr on one side of it. Just a tiny little rough spot... But it showed me where somebody had pierced a tiny hole through it. Why? After a couple of minutes of rummaging around, I found it. A piece of fine, strong platinum wire, about two feet long. A wire that could be carefully slipped through the hole in that rubber doorstop. Hmm? Well, Mr. Dollar. Well, what are you doing back here, Whipsit? If uh, you don't mind my saying so, there was uh, there was something about your attitude that I didn't exactly care for when you were here with the policeman and Mr. Branson. And when you left them downstairs in the lobby and took the elevator. Oh, I see you found it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it was very smart of you, Whipson. Thank you. Put this rubber wedge on the floor just outside the door with the wire on it leading under the door. Exactly. Then pull the door closed. Then pull the wedge into place with the wire. And the door can't possibly be opened from in here. You've locked yourself in. The more you push in the door, the tighter the wedge holds it. That's right. And you don't forget to retrieve the wire by pulling on one end of it. I suppose those are the gloves you wore when you killed Miss Winkle, so you'd leave no prints. Oh, then she's dead. How fortunate for me. And that's the gun you used? Yes, I'm afraid she was rather averse to my breaking down the Beaufort collection, uh, melting down the mountings and secreting the stones at my home. And, of course, claiming the insurance money, but after all, nearly a million dollars. Why are you telling me all this? Because, you see, this is also the gun that will kill you. After which I shall lock your body in this office using the doorstop again. (laughs) It's a rather nice touch, don't you think? Is it? Well, don't you see? It's now a sort of uh, a trademark of the completely unknown thief, the unknown killer. 
of both the girl and you. Oh, now, wait a minute. Do you think if I found out how you did it, the police can't? Did they, even after their lab crew spent the whole night up here? I guess you got a point there. Yes. Now, turn around, Dollar. Turn around. Well? You see, I'm going to have to shove this gun into your back to muffle the sound. Look, Webster. <laughs> Unless you have a better idea. Well, I have. What? Oh, me. Oh, I suppose I might have known this whole thing seemed too easy. All right, Lieutenant. All right, Conroy, wrap him up. All right, Lieutenant. Hands out, Whipsit. Johnny, I knew you had something up your sleeve when you came back up here. Just wouldn't let me work it out alone, would you, Bart? All right, what was it? What did you find out that tipped you off? Oh, you'll never know from me. Huh? After all, I might want to use it to stump you sometime. Oh, now look, Johnny. Okay, ask Whipsit here. He just loves to explain things. At great length, too. At least it was long enough for you boys to get up here. I know something he's not going to explain his way out of. Let's go, Whipsit. <laughs> I think I'll have to figure out some way to pad my expense account even more than usual in cases like this. I mean, where a 38 slug nearly ends up in me. After all, fun is fun, a job's a job, but some of these laddies carry things too far. Come to think of it, I'll have to run down to New York again to appear against Whipson. So, expense account total, including that and transportation back to Hartford and all the incidentals I could possibly think of, $181 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment with the bigger, more everywhere. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, an inventor with a device that can either save or wreck our country. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote today's story. Heard in our cast were Harry Bartell, Byron Kane, Vic Perrin, Joseph Kearns, and Austin Green. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. <laughs> 